So hi guys, welcome to the marathon lectures from Sreshta for CA and CMA by Sreshta faculties. Okay, so right now you may be watching the accounting or auditing or law, whatever the subject out of eight subjects you may be watching any subject. I don't know. This is just an introduction video from me. Now what what important thing that you need to do right now is don't directly skip to the subject. Don't directly fast forward the video. Please watch this video without any interruption. Even when you are watching the marathon, we have given below the description timestamps. If you click on a particular timestamp, you will go to that, that particular chapter. But what I sincerely advise you, you know, please watch this entire marathon in the same order. Suppose we uploaded 12th hour, don't directly go to the 5th hour and start watching. Watch in the same order because there is a structure that we follow so that you get the best understanding. Getting it? And further, after this one or two minutes, you know, getting it, there is my another video which is merged, which is already merged. Please watch that also because that is an instruction to be followed while watching the marathon, what material to be used, all that. That also I covered. So the initial five, seven minutes of my content, please do not skip. Please do not skip. So you're going to get some guidance on how to watch this marathon. Then you can directly start with the subject. That's it. Getting it? So take care. Continue watching. And please, please, please do not watch at higher playback speed. Some students think watching at higher speed, one and a half time, two times the speed, dangerous approach. See, your object of listening to the marathon class is not to listen, but to learn something. Learning, you should not make it fast. If at all we can cover the video in five hours, we would have covered in five hours, no? See, suppose I uploaded 10 hours marathon. If at all we can cover it in five, five hours, we would have taken it in five hours, right? Why the hell we take 10 hours? Why the hell we take 20 hours? So if at all you are watching at 2 times the speed, 1 and up times speed, you are not actually learning. You are only listening to the words. You are not learning. You are not analyzing. Analysis will not transmit. Understanding. You will not get the emotion exactly. Whatever the emotion, with whatever the emotion or intensity the faculty is teaching, if at all you are watching at higher speed, higher playback speed, you will not, you will never get that intensity. You will never get that connection. You just listen and leave. See, this is the reason why students in spite repeat many a times, they still do not recollect, they still do not understand the content. Some students say, sir, some students may be faster in learning. If at all you are very fast in learning, if at all you are very fast in learning, try to listen the song at one and a half times speed. Take any one particular song, try to listen at a higher speed. See whether you are connecting or not to it. You are listening, no? Music is audible, song words are audible, vocals and music, everything is audible, but why are you unable to connect? Connection is required with the subject. In order to establish that connection, please listen to the subject at standard speed. Even though you, you may be very smart, you may be very intelligent, just try that intelligence while listening to the songs also. Listen to, the, listen to a song at two times the speed. Emotion is important. In anything, any work you do, emotional connection is required. So please watch the entire content at standard speed. And I'm telling you, if at all you want to try one hour, if one hour you watch at standard speed, another one hour you watch at higher speed, you check back yourself where you are learning better. I think that is the best judge, you know, that is the best decision. Just try that and then do. Because many people in YouTube are misguiding students saying, listen at higher speed, revise more number. No, that's not. Listen at standard speed. Your revision number of times revision will naturally reduce. That's it. So continue watching the video. Thank you. Have a nice time. Bye-bye. So hi guys. First of all, thank you very much for, uh, you know, encouraging our institutes, rest of us CA and CMA to this level. Anyhow, so here is a good news for all of you. From Sreshta, again in respect of November 2022 exams, we are going to upload again all updated marathon classes, revision classes. Okay, we are once again uploading the videos or uh, you know uh, revision videos for November 2022 exams. And we are doing it for all eight subjects. We are doing it for all eight subjects. So who are the faculties that first of all taking all these marathon revision classes? And you know, myself, I will take audit and I will take some two or three important chapters of company law. And uh, so nothing but P5, mainly I'll focus on, sorry, paper 6. And Satyaraju sir will focus on paper 1 and paper 5. So you will be getting approximately 20 plus 20, 40 hours of marathon for accounts and advanced accounts put together. Then Subramaniam sir will be taking paper 2 part A, company law main chapters. 
and the harish krishnan sir will be taking paper uh, 7 which is eas and sm marathon and uh, vikita madam is taking paper 2b other loss marathon and samba sir is going to take paper 4 income tax separate marathon for 12 hours gst some 10 hours separate marathon and uh, srinivas reddy sir paper 3 costing marathon approximately we are going to upload for 15 hours and uh, coming to our another faculty paper 8 part b Naga sir is going to take economics marathon and same Samba sir is going to take paper 8 part A financial management marathon class. So from the entire Suresta team we are going to give you all 8 subjects revision marathon classes on YouTube. Now first thing that you might get a doubt. So what are the things or what are the materials that you are going to use for these marathons. So before that where you will find this marathon on the YouTube. Very simple. You just open CA Ram Harsha. Okay, there is a YouTube channel. So go to that home videos and there is a playlist. Here you will find a playlist separately for November 2022 marathons, revisions, CA, inter. So in this playlist you will find all 8 subjects. Now immediately you might get a doubt. Are all 8 subjects uploaded right now? No. Uh, by 10th of the September, you may be watching this video. You may be watching this video. Uh, you know uh, on the date on which it was uploaded or even maybe later I don't know getting it by 10th of September all subjects except auditing we will upload audit related audit subject new marathon we will upload after September 20 after September 20 audit related subject marathon will be uploaded and you know what the all revision classes entire revision marathons are absolutely in English you know because we rest of is having 1500 plus students across 20 states in India, not 20, I can say 26 states I think we have covered. Some 2 or 3 northeast states only we have not covered but 26 states we are having admissions. So obviously from for us the students across, since across India we can't use any we can't use any particular regional language. So we have to stick to English. So entire explanation will be in English. Now coming to a few questions which you need to understand, which you need to understand. Okay, um, one, uh, you know, we have, we have uploaded in May 2022 exams, some video classes, marathon classes, and I'm telling you the same revision classes with slight modifications we are uploading some for, for few chapters, we re recorded like one or two, you know, chapters, wherever there were amendments, but actually speaking for May attempt and November attempt, the, the subject, the material, everything is exactly same. Because right now, right now you are in September month 2022, right? If I tell you, go and check ICA website, what is the latest material available, you know? November 2021 edition, October 2021 edition. So typically for May attempt, whatever material we are, you, we are using, the same material we are going to use for November. I hope you are getting, getting it. And now, then... So we are using a particular material right for marathon where you can download this marathon where you can download this particular material which is used in the marathon classes. So there is an app in uh, Sresta for SHRE, SHTA, Sresta for CA and CMA. There is an application called Sresta for CA and CMA. You will find right side you know above me there are two logos. First logo is there no white color logo? Huh, that logo with the, if you type this name in the play store you will get that logo getting it only from android you can download the material suppose if you do not have an android phone please use somebody's android phone and download the material okay so in this application you just download and login we have given in the main menu if you go to the application there is an there is something called main menu just uh, uh, after opening the app left side top you will find main menu click on that you will find study material inside that november 2022 and may 2023 there are materials please download the materials PDF copies, please download and keep it with you so that it will be useful when you're when you're watching the revision class so that whatever faculty is actually, you know, uh, uh, using the material. So it is with you in hand. That's it. If at all you want to have a hard copy, you can buy that hard copy on the same application. But I don't think I don't think you require a hard copy because it's a revision class. So whatever you already have gone through, whatever material you already learned from, please stick to that material. Take our revision classes as a, you know, additional guidance. And I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy the subject like anything from, you know, 
See, generally in YouTube, you'll find many subject related marathon, but for all eight subjects at a single place with a particular standard, uniform standard, you'll rarely find. So here, our institute's rest of a CA and CMA is giving you that option. Getting it? So I hope you understood what we are going to deliver. Now, uh, what are the topics that we are going to cover approximately if at all you ask me? So if you look at paper one, accounting, we are going to upload two videos. Approximately both the videos put together will be 20 plus hours. So these are the chapters, fundamentals, incorporation, introduction to accounting standard frameworks, AS2 and AS12, financial statements of company, bonus, investment accounts, redemption of debentures. That's it. We are not covering anything else from accounts subject. And paper 2A, company if you look at, me and Supermani sir, both of us are taking in this case, the classes. Like if you look at accounts of companies and dividend, audit and auditors, these three chapters related revision I will take. Rest of the chapters, basic incorporation, share capital, deposits, charges. These chapters revision will be handled by Supermani sir. Then other loss, all these topics are being covered by Vikita madam. And paper 3 costing, all these topics, 100% of all the chapters are being covered by Srinivas Reddy sir. Okay. Then part 2, uh, see costing video will be uploaded in two parts. Both together will be 15 to 16 hours. Then paper 4, your income tax. We are going to cover 5 heads of income, clubbing provision, set of and carry forward, chapter 6a, return of income, TDS and TCS. And GST, we are going to cover almost all the chapters. Then advanced accounts, introduction, few accounting standards, amalgamation, reconstruction, liquidation, partnership, consolidation. All these topics we are going to cover as part of revision and accounting, advanced accounting is also being uploaded in two parts. Accounts, you will have two parts videos. Advanced accounts, you will have two parts videos. Sorry. Company you will have, you will have two parts, sorry, costing you will have two parts videos. Then coming to auditing, ignore auditing right now because I am going to, I have not yet uploaded the, you know, uh, marathon. Then paper 8A, financial management, these chapters, paper 8B, these chapters, even paper 7, A paper 7B also we are going to upload all the subjects. I told you where you will find all these videos, you will find that in the play store, open CR Amharsha, open playlist, inside that you will find November first playlist, November 2022 marathon. So in that playlist, you will find all the eight subjects video. By the way, you will find all these videos by 10th September maximum. Getting it. So uh, actually, I'm recording this video on 4th September. So right now, after this video, I'll be I'll be uploading, you know, uh, the marathon videos. And this video will be a common video in all, uh, you know, in the all uh, what uh, in all marathon videos, whatever I'm going to upload, 12 12 hours videos, in all the videos, this video right now, whatever I'm recording will be a common video. So that uh, every time whoever is watching a new revision class will not miss all this. Now, one more important thing. Now, who should uh, not watch this marathon class? If at all you are a first time learner. Now, many people will ask me, sir, is it useful for a first time learner? No, this is not for first time learners at all. This is for those who are going to write exam. Okay, those who are just about to go and write the exam, no, for them only this is. See, a subject is completely covered in 20 hours. 100 marks paper is hardly being covered in 20, 24 hours. A regular course will be 120, 150 hours. Imagine we are reducing one fifth time. It's a revision. First of all, understand revision is useful. Revision class will be useful only for those who already prepared the subject once. You may have prepared in self-preparation method or you may have taken coaching. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. But those who already prepared once only for them, this is useful. For others, strictly I am saying, not at all useful. Because don't waste your time. But I am telling you, those who already have gone through books, who already wrote one or two attempts, getting it, or who are a first timers, maybe you are first time you are writing in November, but you already gone through the coaching. For you, these marathons are going to be a best, you know, thing, you know, in your preparation. Definitely, after watching this marathon, you will definitely get a new look on the subject, new idea, new perspective on the subject, so that within next to one, one and a half month, you can plan your preparation perfectly. That's it. Okay. Take care. Have a nice time. So, continue the classes. Getting it. So, this is an intro video. First, I'll upload this normally. Then again, I'll upload this as part of the revision videos. Getting it. So, continue. Thank you. Have a nice time. Bye-bye. A very good morning students welcome to the fm marathon classes for may 2022 exams right so in this marathon classes we are going to discuss about all the theory 
and uh, formulate all the important points, right? Uh, we need to keep in mind while doing the problems. Okay, ma'am. So FM, as you all know that it's part of the paper number eight, financial management and economics for finance, right? <laughs> so in which part here you will be having financial management for 60 marks. And then uh, part B you will be having economics for finance for 40 marks. Okay, sir. And in the financial management, total 60 marks portion, out of which the problematic portion is around 45 to 50 marks and the theory portion is for 10 to 15 marks. So if the problem in the portion is given for 45 marks, theory you will get for 15 marks. If the problems is given for 50 marks, theory you will get for 10 marks. Right, sir? So now let's see the list of the chapters for problematic portion. So you'll be having first chapter as time value of money. Time value of money chapter is not actually uh, an, an exclusive chapter in financial management portion, right? Sir? You don't find this chapter called time value of money in ICI study materials. This time value of money, these all the provisions were discussed in the chapter investment decisions as a topic. But in our uh, academy, we are discussing the time value of money as an exclusive chapter because time value of money provisions are very, very important for doing the problems in other chapters. Without having the knowledge of time value of money principles, you cannot do the problems in other chapters. So that's why we are discussing the time value of money as an exclusive chapter. Okay, now, it's because when you are strong in fundamentals, then doing the remaining chapters problems are very easy. Clear? Next, so time value of money, <clears throat> there won't be any question directly from this chapter because as this is not a chapter as per ICI study material, but this is very, very important for doing the problems of other chapters. Okay, now, next. Then after that, the most important chapter, investment decisions. It's actually <clears throat> a very lengthy chapter, sir, investment decisions, very lengthy chapter. And uh, that's why I've converted these investment decisions chapter into the three parts, into three parts. Number one, investment decisions. Number two, advanced concepts in investment decisions. And number three, risk analysis in investment decisions. Risk analysis in investment decisions. So totally you will be having three parts, same chapter. Only because of the lengthiness of the chapter, I've converted them into the three parts. First part, investment decisions. You're going to learn all the basics basics of investment decisions. And here in this part, you are going to discuss about the advanced concepts, advanced concepts like replacement decisions, NPV, IRR conflicts, these advanced concepts. And the third one, this is final level topic, risk analysis and capital budgeting decision. It's actually a final level topic, but recently since last three, four attempts, this uh, chapter becomes a part of CA intermediate. So we are discussing, are you following sir? Right. So technically speaking, all these three chapters are single chapter now. Investment decisions, advanced concepts and investment decisions and risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions. Capital budgeting decisions are now investment decisions are now what the other name of investment decisions is a capital budgeting decisions. Are you following, sir? Right. So investment decisions, as I said, it's a very important chapter. You will definitely get one question from this chapter for eight marks. In every examination attempt, in every examination attempt, you will definitely have a question from this chapter for eight marks. Next, after that, cost of capital, then capital structure, leverages, advanced concepts in investment decisions, working capital management, yet another very, very important chapter where you will get one question compulsory for eight marks, then ratios analysis, yet another very important chapter. One question compulsory for eight marks and then risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions, dividend decisions, analysis, dividend decisions, analysis. Okay, mom, every one of you. So these are the 10 chapters we are having in the CA intermediate level for the problematic portion. Clear. So among these, the most important chapters I've already listed out investment decisions and then ratio analysis and then working capital management.
in every exam attempt definitely you will get one question each from these three chapters so 24 marks question paper is already leaked yes or no and then these two new topics were introduced recently means uh two years back two years back risk analysis and capital budgeting decisions and dividend decisions analysis in every chapter you will get at least one problem so five marks five marks ten marks so totally 34 marks the question paper leaks now coming to the theory portion mainly scope and objectives of financial management and types of financing these two are the very important theory chapters among the theory weightage of 10 to 15 marks from these two chapters you will get a minimum of 10 marks you will get a minimum of 10 marks so 34 plus 10 44 marks 44 marks the question paper is already leaked yes or no so like this you plan accordingly and prepare for financial management every one of you right sir okay now without wasting of the time we will move into the the very first chapter that is a time value of money okay sir so time value of money chapter number one i'm and i'm going to start this topic with the question what happens to the value of money with the passage of the time whether it increases or decreases so with the passage of the time as the time passing on what what happens to the value of the money whether the money value increases or decreases the value of money increases or decreases the answer is the value of money increases and as well as decreases so from which point of view you are discussing are you discussing from monetary value point of view or real value of point of view if you are discussing from monetary value point of view the monetary value of the money increases as the time passing on right sir best example i've given here interest and from the real value money point of view in real terms while you're talking in a real terms the value of money decreases because of the inflation because of the inflation of course at ca intermediate level we are going to discuss about only one angle we are going to discuss about only one angle this is from monetary value point of view real terms point of view we are going to discuss at the ca final level not at the ca intermediate level right ma so financial management at ca inter level is only for 60 marks but at ca final level it will be called as sfm strategic and financial management and where you will be having for 100 marks right sir next right so while the time is passing on the value of the money increases why why so i've given an example here Suppose that on 12th of February 2021, I've taken a loan from you. I have taken a loan from you, one lakh. And I promise you to repay exactly after one year. Exactly after one year. So you've given me one lakh to me. Now, after one year, I am I came to you for repayment. Now, if I repay you one lakh only, will you accept? No, you won't accept because you expect more than one lakh from me. You will expect definitely more than one lakh from me but why see how much you given to me one lakh so how much i need to repay you one lakh only but sir you're not repaying me immediately right you are repaying me after one year so what ma after one year what happens sir as the time passes on the value of money increases no how how it is increases sir okay sir i'll give you examples sir had i been given this one lakh right uh, to a company means had i been invested this one lakh into the company shares and after the one year i would have received dividend no yes or no had i been invested this one lakh into gold i would have received some gain out of it had i been invested this one lakh into any fixed deposit or savings deposits into a bank after one year i would have received interest no right sir opportunity cost opportunity cost right so now because that i am giving the money to you i'm losing this opportunity cost so compensate me clear see if i, I give the amount to you today and you're repaying me tomorrow the gap is just one day so for that one day i don't expect anything from you if i give you the money today after one week you are repaying to me for that one week i don't expect anything from you 
it's enough to pay the same amount of 1 lakh but after one year you are repaying to me one year within this one year a lot was happened clear right so even if i deposit this 1 lakh into a bank where the banker offering me some 8% rate of interest so i would have received 8000 as interest 8000 as interest so if you are repaying me 1 lakh only to me the 8000 is my opportunity cost it will be a loss to me yes or no right so the value of money increased by this one year next inflation is one more reason like sir actually i thought of purchasing gold at the time when you asked money to me money right at that time for every 10 grams of gold it is 50000 rupees so means if i purchase the gold at that time i would have purchased some 20 grams but now after one year after one year 10 grams of gold now becomes 65000 rupees that means with the same amount of the 1 lakh now i am able to purchase hardly 15 grams earlier before one year i was able to purchase 20 grams but now i am able to purchase only 15 grams 15 grams the value the prices of the gold increased so this 5 grams of gold difference is a loss to me inflation because of the inflation rise in prices right next risk risk sir if i given you money to you today and if you are repaying me tomorrow the risk is very less if i given you the money today and if you are repaying me to me after one week the risk is very less but you promise me to pay after one year 365 days the risk is very high sir because within this 365 days i can't do anything like whatever the promise i made i might ignore that promise i might fly to us and settle there itself i might die who knows there is a risk of death also 365 days i will be alive what is the guarantee what is the guarantee nowadays there is no guarantee even for 5 minutes when i was traveled by train there was one person who stand besides the uh, entry right entry door exit door i in all of a sudden he slipped his grip and he fell down from the running train and he died on the spot so before 5 minutes to whom i had a chit chat after 5 minutes he was not there he was died so there is no guarantee to the life 365 days how will i have a confidence on you how will i uh, right believe you that you will be survive for this 365 days if within this 365 days if you die whom will i ask the money so risk is there so whenever you are taking the risk you will expect some returns next satisfaction of the wants sacrification of the wants sir uh, if i had not given the money to you i would have purchased the gold right now because of you one year i am sacrificing my want of purchasing a gold now because of all these you will expect something additional amount from me for opportunity cost inflation risk element sacrification of the wants right sir you will expect some additional amount from me and that additional amount is what we call interest here okay now and there are two methods available for the calculation of the interest number one simple interest and number two compounding interest first look at the simple interest ma example so as and today that means in y0 i have deposited an amount of 1000 rupees and the banker is offering me rate of interest at the rate of 10 percentage rate of interest at the rate of 10 percentage so that means after one year i'll get an interest of rupees 100 right sir now at the end of the first year the amount becomes 1100 rupees now second year also i'll get the interest at the rate of 10% but not on 1100 when it comes to simple interest the interest is always on principal portion thank you the interest is always on principal portion you don't get interest on interest when it comes to simple interest method so what is your principal 1000 rupees into rate of interest 
10 percentage so even for the second year you will get 100 rupees so at the end of the second year the amount becomes 1200 rupees now third year interest again same you will get interest only on principal portion 1000 into 10 percent 100 rupees totally 1300 rupees you are going to receive at the end of the third year so third year you are withdrawing the money so how much you are going to withdraw 1300 rupees so 1000 rupees is your principal portion and whatever the additional 300 you are getting that is called interest okay now now how to calculate this interest and amount with the help of the formula look at here simplest formula says simple interest formula pnr this might the formula you might have learned in your childhood days in your fifth class or sixth class simple interest is equal to pnr p stands for principal n stands for number of years and r stands for rate of interest r stands for rate of interest okay now so now apply the formula into our example simple interest is equal to pnr principal 1000 rupees you have deposited 1000 rupees at the beginning of the year zero and you maintain this deposit for three years number of years three years and the bank are offered 10 percent rate of interest so you'll get my simple interest is equal to 300 rupees got it now how much simple interest you got 300 rupees now while calculating the formula amount is equal to that means the amount which you are going to get at the end of the third year the amount which you are going to get at the end of the third year how much you are getting 1300 rupees which includes your principal portion and as well as your interest portion p plus i now principal portion p plus i i that means simple interest just now we have learned a formula pnr so i place low write down the pnr so p into p plus pnr take the p as common now the formula become amount is equal to p into 1 plus nr amount is equal to p into 1 plus nr that's the formula for the amount. Now apply the example principal 1000 rupees into 1 plus NR. N stands for number of years, R stands for rate of interest. 3 into rate of interest and the ma 10 percentage. When you convert into decimals, 0.1. Clear. Now 1000 into 1.3, then you'll get an amount of 1300 rupees. So this is how we need to calculate the simple interest. Clear now. But from examination point of view, from examination point of view, you don't have this concept of simple interest. From examination point of view, interest means compounding interest only. Compounding interest only. So only for your general knowledge purposes, I've explained you about the concept of simple interest. Only for your general knowledge purposes. Every one of you clear now. Next, coming to compounding interest. Right, sir. So from here onwards, whenever I'm talking about interest, it means compounding interest. It means what am I? Compounding interest. Clear. Now look at here. Same example I'm continuing. In Y0, I have a deposit of 1000 rupees. Y1, interest. At the end of the first year, I'm going to get interest at the rate of 10%, 100 rupees. Amount, 1100. Now, second year, interest at the rate of 10 percentage, 110 rupees. Look at here. I got an interest of 110 rupees how would i got this at the end of the first year my amount is 1100 into 10 percentage 110 rupees or you can also calculate in this way on principal portion thousand into 10 percent plus on interest portion also you will get interest 100 into 10 percentage so you will get my 110 rupees are you following sir so compounding means interest on interest compounding means interest on interest see here in the simple interest concept at the end of the second year you got only 100 rupees interest so in the simple interest you will get interest only in principal only on principal but whereas in compounding interest concept you will get the interest on principal and as well as interest also okay now, now look at the year three at the end of the year three, you have an amount of, sorry, at the end of the year two, you have an amount of 100 and, uh, 1,210 rupees. And for year three interest, it will come how much, Amma? 1,210 into 10 percentage, 121 rupees. Clear, sir. Or we can calculate in this way also. First, just a second, sir. So under compounding interest, we will get the interest on principal portion. 
So thousand into ten percentage, hundred rupees plus on first year interest. Sorry, yeah, into ten percentage, ten rupees on second year interest. Second year, how much interest you got? Amma one ten rupees into ten percentage, eleven rupees. So all put together for the year three, you will get ma one hundred and twenty one rupees. Got it, every one of you. One hundred and twenty one rupees. Clear, sir. So like that also, you can find out. So totally at the end of the year three, you got an amount of one thousand three hundred and thirty one. So, in which the principal portion is thousand and interest portion is three hundred and thirty one rupees. So you can see here when it comes to the simple interest method, when it comes to the simple interest method, you got only an interest of three hundred. But whereas when it comes to the compounding interest method, you got an interest of three hundred and thirty one rupees. Clear. So under compounding interest method, you will get more interest than simple interest. Clear. Complete ma? Right now, let us find out uh, the formula for the calculation of the interest and as well as amount under compounding interest model. Now look at the first amount, sir. The formula is P into one plus R whole power n. Right, sir. So amount P P stands for principal portion. Thousand rupees we made it deposit into one plus R whole power n. This is a compounding interest ma? Compounding no. So we need to make a compounding here. Whole power one plus or one plus or so one plus point one rate of interest point one ten percent when you convert into the decimals it becomes point one whole power n right sir so whole power three n stands for number of years three years no three years compounding you have to take into account so thousand rupees is the principal portion into one point one whole power three so thousand rupees into one point three three one you will get the amount one thousand three thirty one got it now. Right. So at the end of the third year, you are going to get an amount of one thousand three hundred and thirty-one rupees. Next, compounding interest formula. See, if you want to get an interest portion, so deduct your amount portion from the principal, you will get the interest. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Right. So here, amount minus principal will give you compounding interest. You have invested thousand rupees. At the end of the year, you got a three hundred and one thousand three hundred and thirty-one rupees. So three hundred and thirty-one you are additionally getting, and this additional amount is interest. So this is your amount at the end of the third year from which you are deducting principal portion. So A minus P amount formula we know it already. P into one plus or whole power n, right? In the place of the amount, write the formula minus P. Minus P, same as it is continued. Minus P. Now take the P as common. So now the formula will be P into one plus R whole power n minus one. Right, sir. So this is the formula for the compounding interest. Now apply the values. Apply the values. So principal portion thousand into one plus R whole power n one point one whole power three minus one. So thousand is the principal portion into one point three three one. Is the compounding factor minus one, so thousand into point three three one, so compounding interest three hundred and thirty one rupees. Clear now. So this is how we need to calculate the compounding interest. Clear, sir, every one of you. Now look at here. You have the basic introduction and everything regarding the time value of money, right? And here you have some golden principles like the basic concept in finance is time value of money, which means that. One rupee today is not equal to one rupee tomorrow. Other things being equal, right? Sir? The time value of money means worth of a rupee received today is different from the worth of a rupee to be received in future, right? Sir? See, if I give you one lakh today, or after two years I'll give you twenty lakhs, which one will you choose? Ten lakhs as and today. Or twenty lakhs after two years, which one will you choose? If I were you, I will I will opt for ten lakhs as on today. At the end, sir, you can wait for two more years and you will get the double amount twenty lakhs. Right. In order to get the double amount of twenty lakhs, I need to wait for two more years. I need to wait for two more years. But within these two years, anything can happen. Risk is there. See, ten lakhs as on today is certain. Certain, guaranteed, but twenty lakhs after two years is uncertain. Is uncertain, not guaranteed. 
risk element is there are you following or not every one of you right sir and 10 lakhs today's 10 lakhs value is always greater than after 2 years 20 lakhs the worth of one rupee today is not equal to worth of one rupee tomorrow today's one rupee value tomorrow's one rupee value is completely different ma are you following or not every one of you clear that's the time value of money golden principle clear next so methods are models in this chapter right among this total nine models we have already completed two simple interest completed already compounding interest completed already then future value of a single amount present value of a single amount future value of annuity present value of annuity present value of perpetuity present value of growing perpetuity and finally effective rate of interest okay now we will discuss all these models in detail don't worry clear now look at this simple interest that uh, i've already explained you with the help of example simple interest formula simple interest is equal to pnr and amount formula p into 1 plus nr clear then after that model number 2 concept of compounding interest amount formula p into 1 plus r whole power n and uh, compounding interest is equal to p into 1 plus r whole power n minus 1 okay next now coming to the model number 3 calculation of future value of a single amount calculation of future value of a single amount now what is this concept all about right so look at here sir future value of a single amount calculating the future value of a present deposit or a present investment sir in this model we are going to discuss about all about future value if i deposit 1 lakh today what will be its value after 10 years if i invest 10 lakhs in a business today what will be its value after 5 years if i deposit some 20 lakhs in a fixed deposit as on today what will be its value after some 20 years right so we are determining the future value of present deposit we are determining the future value of present investment so if we invest if i invest as and today this much amount if i invest what will be at its value after 10 years are you following or not every one of you right the golden principle so what of one rupee today is always greater than the worth of one rupee tomorrow we know it already now so look at this example sir so year 0 and y0 uh, we are making a deposit of some 1 rupee 1 rupee and the bank are offering us 10% rate of interest 10% rate of interest so that means after one year what will be its value ma 1 rupee is my principal portion 1 rupee is my principal portion and the bank are offering me interest with rate of 10 percentage so for one year i'll get an interest of 10 paise so at the end of the one year i am going to get 1 rupee 10 paise so if i invest 1 rupee today after one year i am going to get 1 rupee 10 paise so this 1 rupee 10 paise is called future value yes or no sir in that scenario what would be the future value if i invest 100 today so 100 into 1.1 110 rupees so if you invest 100 today after one year you will get 110 rupees if i invest 1000 today 1000 into 1.1 so 1000 into 1.1 1100 rupees if i invest 1 lakh today 1 lakh into 1.1 1 lakh 10000 so if i invest 1 lakh today after one year i'll get 1 lakh 10000 as future value are you following or not so what time doing sir i am doing the present values these are all my present values i am multiplying the present values with future value factor and that's the formula for the future value are you following sir so future value of a single amount is equal to present value as and today whatever the investment you are making as and today whatever the deposit you are making that is what you call a present value into you are multiplying all this with future value factor with future value factor so present value into future value factor is your future value of formula future value single amount formula okay now and how to determine this future value factor nothing but 1 plus r whole power n 
वन प्लस आर होल पवर एन आर यू फॉलोइंग सर एवरी वन ऑफ यू राइट दैट विल बी युअर फ्यूचर वैल्यू फैक्टर यू कैन ऑल्सो राइट दिस फॉर्मुला इन दिस मैनर प्रेजेंट वैल्यू नथिंग बट युअर प्रिंसिपल पोर्शन पी इन टू फ्यूचर वैल्यू फैक्टर नथिंग बट वन प्लस आर होल पवर एन सो present value of a single amount you can write either present value into future value factors r percentage n number of years or you can also write like p into 1 plus r whole power n both the formulas are correct both the formulas are correct okay now now sir how to determine this future value factors how to determine the future value factors you have two options ma one you can calculate with the help of the calculator and two with the help of the factors table factor tables means uh, i'll take you there to the factors tables and here you come factor tables ma here table a1 representing the future value of single amount factors future value factors table a1 representing future value factors okay now suppose that if i given you a combination 10 percentage 5 years what is the future value factor 10% 5 years so 10% 5 years so yes this is a factor for the combination of 10% 5 years the future value factor is equal to 1.611 1.611 every one of you following now right sir next i'll give you one more combination like 8% 8 years 8% 8 years what is the future value factors 8% and 8 years so the future value factor is 1.851 1.851 so this is one way of determining the future value factors by using the tables and there is absolutely uh, no problem that you can bring this table to your examination hall absolutely allowed all these factors tables are allowed into your examination hall right absolutely no problem right immediately after entering into your room just give this factors tables to your invigilator and whenever there is a need you can take that factors table from the invigilator are you following now sir if in case invigilator uh, objects then no problem sir for every examination center a practicing chartered accountant a chartered accountant will be there in every examination center as an observer if invigilator objects that factors tables into the room you can simply go to the chartered accountant observer and you can complain to that observer Are you following, sir? Every one of you, right? Or else you have one more option: determining these factors by the help of the table. With the help of the table, uh, sorry, calculator. How to determine future value factors with the help of calculator? Very simple, sir. Very simple, sir. Suppose that if I ask you for future value factors for the combination ten percent, uh, four years. Ten percent, four years, right, sir? Now, every one of you get ready with the calculator. Take the calculators. So, ready, ma? With the calculators, and since we are uh, asking for determining the present uh, future value factors for ten percentage, ten percentage. So, enter one point one in your calculator. Type one point one in your calculator, and then press into, press into, then is equal to, then is equal to. Now on your screen, uh, calculator screen, you will be having the factor one point two one. This is your Y two factor, year two factor. Again, press is equal to. You will find one point three three one on your screen. This is year three factor. Year three factor. Let us let us find out for ten percent five years, sir. Because here we have the answer ten percent five years. Then again, press is equal to. Then you will have year four factor one point four six four one, one point four six four one. Now then, press every one of you press GT button. 
GT grand total GT button on your calculator, you will have 4.0051 as a factor. Right, sir. This is what this is the total of year two, year three, and year four factors. Now you have to add separately year one factor and year five factor. Year one factor and year five factor. What is year one factor? For the first year, you have a factor of 1.10. For the first year, you have a factor of 1.10. And for year five, the factor will be one. For year five, the factor will be one. So for year one, the factor is 1.1. And for year five, the factor is one. You will get it out here. So why for year five, the factor is one? Sir, so for year five, you don't get any interest sir, because you're making, uh, right? See, because uh, on year five, <coughs> just a second, sir. Right. Sorry, ma. I am calculating actually future value annuity factors. Right. Future value annuity factors. But we are in the concept of future value factors only. Future value of annuity factors, this is a process. Sorry, sorry, I have just gone into the thought that I am calculating future value annuity factors, right? So we actually asked for only future value factors, no? So simply future value factors, very simple, ma. Start with the 1.1 in your calculator, every one of you. Start with 1.1, that is your first year factor. Press into, then is equal to. So you will get year two factor as 1.21 then is equal to year three factor 1.331 then press is equal to year four factor 1.4641 and then is equal to year five factor 1.6105 so you can convert into 611 so year five factor how much am i 1.611 get it everyone 1.61 that's it that's it so 1.1 into is equal to whenever you press the is equal to button for the first time, that is your second year factor. You always start with the second year factor. Then press is equal to third year, is equal to fourth year, is equal to fifth year. That's it. So 10%, five years, the future value factor is 1.611. Get it, everyone? So that is how you can find out with the help of the calculator. Right, sir? Next. And after that, you have the problems for the calculation of future value of deposit, right? Uh, with the whatever the theory knowledge I'm giving you, with the help of the theory knowledge, try to solve all the problems. Ma, if you get any doubt while solving the problems, you can ask me. Absolutely no problem. Okay. And uh, next, look at this problem number three. There is an important point. Problem number three, rupees 4,000 is invested at 10% per annum interest. What is the amount after three years if compounding is done annually or semi-annually? So 4,000 we are investing as in today. So this is your present value at 10% rate of interest. R is equal to 10% rate of interest. And what is the amount after three years? So N number of years is equal to three years. Three years. Okay, now, now here, you asked to find out the amount after three years, the future value of this deposit, the future value of this deposit after three years, if the compounding is done annually or semi-annually. Okay, now, now look at the answer, sir. Calculation of the future value of the deposit after three years, if the compounding is done annually, that means yearly once you are getting interest. Yearly once you are getting interest. So given information, deposit as and today 4,000 rupees, the present value of deposit. Then the rate of interest R is equal to 10% per annum. Number of years N is equal to three years. N is equal to three years. Then future value of deposit is equal to present value into future value factors R percentage and number of years. Okay. Present value of deposit 4,000 into future value factor for 10% three years. So calculate your number, you'll get the factor 1.331 into 4,000. So future value of deposit 5,324. So that means in Y0, you are investing 4,000 rupees and Y3 at the end of the third year, 
you are going to get mark 5324 the difference is your interest around 1324 you are getting interest over this 3 years okay now next sir what will be the answer if the compounding is done semi annually ante yearly twice you are getting interest yearly twice you are getting interest two times in a year now you have to make some changes like deposit as on today 4000 rupees rate of interest see the rate of interest given is 10 percentage the rate of interest is given 10 percentage per annum so for 12 months it is 10 percentage but i want the rate of interest for every six months because here the compounding is happening for every six months so that means 10 divided by 2 it will be 5 percent for every six months so the rate of interest now we have to take 5 percentage number of time periods n so yearly two times i'm getting interest yearly two times i'm getting interest so three years and for every year i'm getting two times as interest three into two six is the number of time periods so after making these changes you have to find out the future value of deposit so future value of deposit is equal to present value into future value factors so present value as on today we are depositing four thousand rupees into future value factors for the combination of five percent six time periods now five percentage how to find out with the help of the calculator simple ma five percent kada you should start with 1.05 you should start with 1.05 into is equal to second year factor is equal to third year is equal to fourth year is equal to fifth year is equal to sixth year you will get mark 1.3400956 so that is why i have taken 1.34 so 4000 into 1.34 5360 you will get at the end of the third year see sir here in y0 we are making an investment of 4000 at the end of the y3 we are getting 5000 360 and the difference amount is interest which is 1360 here sir you can see when compounding is happening annually your interest amount is 1324 but when compounding is happening semi-annually your interest is 1360 additional amount you are getting 1360 when compounding is happening semi-annually 1324 when compounding is happening annually you are getting an additional interest of 36 rupees that is why as many times as possible if the compounding is happening then that much of benefit you will get higher the number of times compounding higher will be interest clear next chapter number four now look at the problem number six it's completely a different uh, problem whereby here you will have you know union bank issues reinvestment certificates for a period of four years if six thousand is invested in these certificate their maturity value becomes seven thousand eight hundred what is the rate of interest if it is compounded every year so here we provided with number of years count number of years information present value information and future value information so even future value information is also given so what is missing here rate of interest and that rate of interest we are asking to find out so if we invest six thousand as on today after four years we are going to get seven thousand eight hundred now the question is at what rate of interest we are getting that amount so look at here sir problem number six Four, five. I guess that problem number six I have given on a homework basis at that time. Let me check. No problem. I'll do it right now. Problem number six. So problem number six. Now look at whatever the information given to us. So we have the information of present value, 4,000, number of years, three years, and future value, how much is it? 
seven thousand eight hundred, and uh, present value is also six thousand rupees. Okay, sir. Every one of you. Now we know the formula: future value is equal to present value into future value factors, R percentage, and number of years. We know the future value seven thousand eight hundred, and we know the present value six thousand into future value factors. R percentage we don't know. Number of years three years. Now future value factors is equal to seven thousand eight hundred divided by six thousand. Now the future value factors becomes one point three now. Seven thousand eight hundred divided by six thousand one point three. Now we need to trace this future value factor. We need to trace this future value factor in future value factors table again as to three years. So come to the future value factors table. Yeah, this is future value factors table. Future value factors table again as to three years. At what rate of interest the factor of three percent is lying? So three years now you took you have to go horizontally. One point three is the factor we are looking for. One point three, one point three, one point three, one point three. Yes, it is falling in between nine percent and ten percent. It is falling in between nine percent and ten percent. Okay, sir. Right, and uh, you can write ten percent as your answer. Absolutely no problem because we need a factor of one point three. At nine percent, it is one point two nine five only. It's not one point three. It is one point two nine five only. So you can write the answer as ten percent. At ten percent rate of interest, at ten percent rate of interest, right? The uh, future value factors lying at ten percent rate of interest against to ten years. So the answer you can write here: the rate of interest offered by the bank is equal to ten percent each. Okay, now. So look at the answer. Rate of interest is going seven percent approximately. Just give me a second. Sorry, Mat. The period is four years. No number of years. Four years. I have taken it as three years. I am sorry. Number of years. Four years. N is equal to four. So we need to look at the fourth year, ma. Sorry, third year, choose Anna. So come to the fourth year. Yeah. Go horizontally, fourth year. This is the fourth year now. One point three is the factor we are looking for. Yes. One point three three one at seven percent. The answer is seven. Seven percentage. So rate of interest is seven percent. So the bank offering us seven percent rate of interest. Clear. So at seven percent rate of interest, our present value of investment of six thousand increase it to seven thousand eight hundred after four years. Clear. That's the answer. So with this concept, we have completed the third model that is future value of single amount. Okay now. Now I am winding up the session here. In the next session, I'll start with the remaining models of time value of money. Clear, sir. So till then. Have a good day and good night. Stay home and stay safe. A very good morning, students. So welcome to the FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we have started discussion regarding our first chapter, that is time value of money, and uh, we have completed discussion regarding models simple interest, compounding interest, and then uh, model number three, calculation of the Future value of the single amount, right? Sir. Now, time for the model number four: calculation of present value of a single amount. This model is quite opposite to the last model we have discussed. In the last model we have discussed about the future value of a present investment, the future value of a present deposit, right? Sir. So, for the present value, we have find out the future value. Now, quite opposite. Quite opposite. So we are going to find out the present value of a future investment or a future profits, right? Sir. So look at the notes here, running notes. So look at this first example that you having a plan of buying a new mobile phone, 
after two years, which costs you 50,000 rupees. So in order to have this 50,000 rupees in your account after two years, how much should I invest as and today? Right. So you have a need of 50,000 rupees, but not immediately after two years, after two years. So in order to have that 50,000 rupees in your bank account after two years. So what will be the present investment should I make clear? Now, one more example. X Limited issued 10 lakhs worth of debentures as and today, and the redemption period is 10 years. So X Limited knows that at the end of the 10th year, it's going to have a liability of 10 lakhs rupees. These are redeemable debentures. So at the time of redemption period, these debentures should be redeemed. What do you mean by the redemption? Repaying the amount to the debenture holders. So X Limited knows very well that at the end of the 10th year, it will be having 10 lakhs liability. Okay, so let it be. It is anyhow after 10 years now, we will see at the end of the 10th year, how we are going to pay. No, that's not a concept of, uh, you know, a businessman, successful businessman. Successful businessman always anticipates the future liabilities and he will ready from today, right, to meet that liabilities. So here, in order to have this 10 lakh rupees at the end of the 10th year, no, the company will make investment from now onwards. So how much should I invest as and today in order to have 10 lakh rupees at the end of the 10th year? So we know the future value. We know the number of years. We will know that rate of interest. So what is missing here? Present value is missing here. So how much should I make investment as and today? How much should I deposit as and today? How much amount should I save as and today in order to have a particular amount at the future? Clear. That is what? Finding out the present value. Clear, sir. So look at here example sir uh, at the end of the first year we are in need of one rupee so we went to the banker we went to the banker and we asked the banker okay banker in order to have one rupee in my account at the end of the first year how much should i invest right now what is the rate of interest offered by the bank 10 rupee uh, 10 percentage 10 percentage so if i want to have rupees one one rupee at the end of the first year how much should I deposit as and today? Right. The banker said, okay, sir, uh, you want one rupee after one year. Yes, sir. And my bank is offering you 10% rate of interest. So as and today in Y0 present terms as and today, it's enough to deposit some 91 pies, 0 0.909. If you round it up, 91 pies, 91 pies. So deposit 91 pies as and today. We will give you 10% rate of interest for this one year. Now, at the end of the first year, your account will be having one rupee as balance. So in order to have 100 rupees in my bank after one year, then you have to deposit some 90 rupees, 90 paisa as on today. In order to have 1000 rupees at the end of the first year, then 909 rupees. You need to have 909 rupees as on today. You need to deposit 909 rupees as on today. Then at the end of the first year, you can withdraw 1000 rupees. That deposit value will increase us to 1000 at the end of the first year. Clear. Now, what are you doing here? These are all your present value factor. This is your present value factor. You're multiplying this present value factor with your future value. So that means I can write the formula present value of a uh, single in amount is equal to future value factors. Sorry future value into present value factor for the combination R percentage M number of years. So you're multiplying the future value. This is your future value. You're multiplying with present value factors in order to get the present value of the single amount. Yes or no. So that's why present value is equal to future value into present value factors. Clear, sir. Every one of you. Next. So this is a formula I've already mentioned here. And after that, Sir, uh, how to determine this present value factors? We know that future value factors is equal to one plus our whole power n. Right now, the present value factors become there exists inverse relationship between present value factors and future value factors. Are you following, sir? Now, the formula becomes one divided by one plus our whole power n. One divided by one plus our whole power n. That is your present value factors. Clear. Right. So nothing but you can also write present value factors is equal to one divided by future value factors because this is the formula of the future value of factors. 
So one divided by future value factors. Similarly, you can also write future value factors is equal to one divided by present value factors. They are reciprocal to each other. Reciprocal to each other. So present value factors and future value factors are reciprocal to each other. Therefore, whenever you are multiplying the present value factors with future value factors, you will get answer one. When you are multiplying two reciprocal factors, the answer will always be one. The answer will always be one. Are you following or not? Every one of you. Right now, how to determine this present value factors? You have two options. One, you can use the table. We have the table now at the end of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, I've given you the tables. Table number A1 is a future value factors. This we have seen in the last class. And for the present value factors, you need to look to uh, see the table number A3. Table number A3, this is present value factors. Present value factors, table number A3. This is one option you have. The other option you have is you can find out this present value factors with the help of the calculator and which is quite easy. Quite easy, sir. Suppose that you would like to find out the present value factors for the combination 10 percentage, five years. Now, every one of you get ready with the calculators. Every one of you get ready with the calculators. Now, on your calculator, enter one divided by 1.1, 1, .1. one divided by 1.1. 1 .1. See, when you're finding out the future value factors, you have to multiply. When you're finding out the present value factors, you have to divide division. You have to go for the division, right, sir? You have to go for the division one divided by 1.1. .1. Press the is equal to button. You will have on your screen 0 0.909. That will be your first year factor. Then press again is equal to 0.826. Second year factor is equal to third year factor is equal to fourth year factor is equal to fifth year factor. On your screen, you will be having now 0.6209. Uh, this should be rounded up to 0.621. This can be rounded up to 0.621. So present value factors for the combination of 10% five years, you can see 10% five years. Yeah, here you can see the factor 0.629. Got it, everyone. Simple, sir. So one divided by 1.1 .1, and we need the present value factor for five years. So press the is equal to button for five times. Press the is equal to button for five times. Then you will get the fifth year factor. Every one of you. Right, sir. And you can do one more example like some seven percentage, eight years. Present value factors for seven percentage, eight years. Seven percentage, get ready. One divided by 1.07. One divided by 1.07. And uh, we need the present value factor for eighth year. Press the is equal to button for eight times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now on your screen, you can find the factor 0. 0.582. Let us cross check seven percentage and eighth year. You can see 0 0.582, got it? So in this manner, you can find out the present value factor very easily. Every one of you. Clear now? So look at here. So present value is equal to future value into present value factors for the given percentage, R percentage, N number of years. Right, sir? And, um, and we know the formula future value is equal to present value into future value factors clear right then future value is equal to present value into in the place of future value factors i can also write one plus r whole power n now take the present value here this side present value is equal to so uh, take out this side or else you can also do like this uh, we write like future value is equal to present value into one plus r whole power n so into one plus r whole power n take this side so it will be future value divided by one plus r whole power n is equal to present value. Now we can also write present value is equal to future value into one plus r whole power n. Yes or no? No, that means present value is equal to future value into one divided by one plus r whole power n, nothing but your present value factors. So this is how this formula was derived. Every one of you clear. Next. After that, you have some few theory topics like discounting. Discounting is nothing but 
the process of elimination of the interest from the future value in order to arrive at the present value. Suppose that you are getting 1,331 rupees, right? You are depositing 1,000 rupees in Y0. After three years, you are getting 1,331 where the bank are offering you 10% rate of interest. Okay, now. So this is your future value, 1,331. This is your present value, 1,000 rupees. So that means in order to arrive at the present value, what are we doing, sir? The difference is what you call interest 331 rupees. So present value, if you want to purchase, uh, get the present value, then the formula should be future value minus interest. So 1,331 minus 331, that will give you the present value of 1,000 rupees. Yes or no? So the process of eliminating the interest from future value in order to arrive at the present value is what we call the discounting. Okay, now. And whatever the rate of interest we are using in the discounting process, that rate of interest is called as a discounting rate. So there are our rate of interest we are using now. This is what you should call a discounting rate. You have to call it as a discounting rate. Then after that discounting factor, what is the factor you are using here? That is one divided by one plus our whole power n. That is what we call a discounting factor. Clear now? So this is the topic of the present value of single amount. Clear everyone? Okay, and after that, you have some problems. You can uh, do all the problems with the theory knowledge, sir. Here's the formula for the present value of single amount, right? So future value divided by one plus i whole power n. You can also write one plus r whole power n, i rate of interest. You can represent it with i or you can also represent it with r. So future value divided by one plus r whole power n. Clear, sir. Then next calculation of the amount of the annuity or future value of annuity immediate. So future value of annuity, sir. So look at here, the next model, future value of annuity. Before going to understand the concept of the future value of annuity, first one should understand the calculation uh, concept of annuity. First, let us try to understand the concept of the annuity. Then we will go for the future value of annuity concept. Okay, now look at here. Annuity means an installment, an installment, right, sir? See, majority of the students is of the opinion that annuity means whatever the amount we are paying every year per annum, that is what we call annuity. Answer is wrong. Wrong answer, sir. Annuity means an installment. That installment can be occurred on annual basis or semi-annual basis, quarterly basis or monthly basis. So recently I purchased an AC. I purchased an EMIs, monthly installments. Every, every month I'm going to pay 5,000 rupees as installment. Every month I'm going to pay 5,000 rupees as installment. Like that for some eight months. Right, Ma? So from April, May month till, till the eighth month, May to a uh, December month. May to December month. Every month I'm going to pay 5,000 rupees as my EMI for AC. That is an annuity. That is an annuity, right? And I'm having LIC policy, Jeevan Anand policy, 10 lakhs worth policy. Example only I'm taking. Every six months, I'm paying 30,000 rupees as premium. Every six months. Every one of you. So that is also an annuity. I'm paying since last 10 years. That is also an annuity. And I'm having SIP, see, making investments into the mutual funds. Every month from my salary, some 10,000 rupees will be deducted. That is also an annuity. Are you following, sir? Right. So in order to call a particular series of payments or receipts as an annuity, there are some conditions to be satisfied. Like there must be a series of payments or receipts occurred, should be occurred at the regular intervals in equal amounts. Then it will be called as an annuity. Clear ma. Examples, loan repayments in EMIs, LIC premiums, health insurance premiums, and uh, systematic investment plans, SIPs. These are all the best examples for annuities. Clear. Next. Then after that, you have the concept of future value of annuity. Future value of annuity. Right. So means, sir, every year I'm depositing an amount of one rupee. So year one, one rupee, year two, one rupee, year three, one rupee, year four, one rupee. So like this four years, I made investments. Or four years, I made deposit into a bank. A bank. Now, at the end of the fourth year, what will be my annuity's value? 
sir every year you are depositing 1 rupee yes like that for 4 years yes so means at the end of the fourth year you are going to have 4 rupees only 4 rupees that's my investment yaar 4 rupees what about interest so for all these four years i will also get interest now for all these four years i will also get interest clear right now finding out the future value of these installment is what we call future value of annuity first of all you made an annuity here every year you are depositing equal amount every year you are depositing 1 rupee so there is a series of payments occurring at the regular intervals every year the gap between the the gap between the two installments the gap between the two investments the gap between the two deposits is one year one year and this is what we call payment interval payment interval is nothing but the gap the gap between the two deposits or two investments clear payment interval one year and like that like that like that for you made it for four years this is what we call term of annuity number of years kadamma ikkada manam term of annuity antam term of annuity four years term of annuity four years and what about the equal investment you are making every year this is what we call periodical payments pp periodical payments the amount of investment you are making every year the amount of investment you are making every year in equal amounts is what we call periodical payments clear now and here you can see every installment is at the end of the year y y y1 means at the end of the first year y2 means end of the second year y3 means end of the third year y4 means end of the fourth year clear now this is what we call ordinary annuity sir the last installment will be fetch no interest last installment will not fetch any interest no interest nothing because the last installment was happened in y4 y4 means what am i end of the year 4 that is the last year end of the year 4 so at the end of the year 4 you made an investment of 1 rupee on the same day you are withdrawing the total amount so that's why the last installment always will not fetch any interest to you so the last installment future value remains to be same 1 rupee and what about the investment you made at the end of the third year there is a time gap of 1 year for this 1 year it will get interest assuming 10% is the rate of interest offered by the banker so 1 rupee for one year interest now so this 1 rupee investment at the end of the fourth year the value will be 1 rupee 10 paise and year 2 also you made an investment of 1 rupee right year 2 also you made an investment of 1 rupee and this year 2 will get interest for two years you will get interest for two years okay now so this 1 rupee present value plus two years interest so at the end of the fourth year its value will be 1.21 One rupee twenty one paise, and the investment you made at the end of the first year, it will get interest for three years. One, two, three. So one rupee your present value of investment at three years interest. So at the end of the fourth year, its value will be one point three three one. So your future value of annuity four point six four one. So means if you are depositing one rupee every year, like that for four years you are depositing. like that for 4 years you are depositing at the end of the fourth year its value will be 4 rupees 64 paise so means you made an investment of 4 rupees right over the 4 years end of the fourth year you are getting 4 rupees 64 paise the 64 paise will be interest for you every one of you following now right sir next sir if i deposit 1000 every year so 1000 1000 into this 4.641 so you will get 4641 at the end of the fourth year sir if i deposit 1 lakh every year so 1 lakh is a periodical payment into 4.641 so end of the fourth year you will get ma 4 lakh 64100 so you made an investment of 4 lakhs end of the fourth year you are getting 4 lakh 64100 so that difference of 64100 is your interest so what are you doing sir here this periodical payments you are multiplying with the future value of annuity factor and that will be your answer for future value of annuity so look at the formula sir future value of annuity is equal to periodical payments into future value of annuity factor clear now next here comes a doubt sir uh, what is future value of annuity factors how to determine again you will be having two options ma number one you can calculate uh, with the help of your tables coming to the tables once 
in tables go for the table number a2 table number a2 this is your future value and id factors future value and id factors table number a2 okay now this is one option you have the other option you will be having with the help of calculators with the help of calculators also you can find out look at ma so i've given an example here first example 10% rate of interest and 4 years is a number of years or term of annuity let us find out the future value of annuity factor 10% kada let us start with the calculator every one of you take the calculators and we are finding out what future value annuity factors future value right sir every one of you means multiplication you have to do so 1.1 Start with one point one ten percent rate of interest. No, one point one into is equal to. On your screen, you will find second year factor as one point two one. Again, is equal to third year factor one point three one. One point three one. Then press GT button. Grand total on your screen. GT button. Then you will find two point five four one as a grand total. And what we have done so far is we have added year two factor and year three factor. We have added year two factor and year three factor. Okay now, then we need to separately add first year factor that is one point one, and we need to add separately fourth year factor one. Fourth year factor, the last year, as we all know, know that the last year will not fetch you any interest. The last year will not fetch you any interest, so only one rupee one you have to be add. Then you will get ma how much four point six four one. This is your future value annuity e factor for the combination ten percent four years. Four point six four one. Get it up. Now let us cross check with the table. Ten percent. Ten percent is the rate of interest, and fourth year now. Cross check. Ten percent four year. You will have the factor four point six four one. Get it, everyone. Four point six four one. The same answer we have calculated here. Four point six four one. Okay. Right now, let's go for the one more example. Twelve percent eight years combination. Twelve percent eight year combination. Twelve percent now. You have to start with the one point one two. On your calculator, start with one point one two. Into is equal to. On your screen, you will find one point two four four. One point two four four. That is your second year factor. Then press is equal to up to seventh year factor. We need factors for eighth year now. So. Find out up to seventh year factor. Every one of you press the is equal to button up to seventh year factor. So already I press the is equal to button once. That is second year, third, four, five, six, seven, seventh year factor. I have pressed the is equal to button up to seventh year factor. Then press the GT button. Every one of you press the GT button. Now on your screen you will find ten point one seven nine seven as your factor. Ten point one seven nine seven. That is your year two to. Year seven factors, the grand total of year two to year seven. Now add separately year one and year eight. First year and last year we always have to add separately. First year one point one two and last year one because we all know that last year will not fetch you any interest. So add one point one two, add one. You will get ma twelve point two nine nine seven. Or you can also write directly twelve point three. You can also write directly twelve point three. Clear na. Now let us cross check in the table. Twelve percentage no. Yeah, here is twelve percentage and eight years, no? Yes, you can see twelve point three. Get it? That is how you need to find out the future value of annuity factors with the help of the table. Clear? So that's the concept of the future value of annuity. Okay now, and whatever we have discussed now, it is an ordinary annuity, sir. Ordinary annuity, and we also have the concept of annuity due. But examination point of view, the annuity due concept is not that important, sir. I'm giving you only your general knowledge purposes. Look at here the differences between the ordinary annuity and annuity due. Ordinary annuity, as I said already, the installments always at the end of the year. Each installment is assumed to be made at the end of the year. But when it comes to annuity due, the installments are at the beginning of the year. Each installment is assumed to be at the beginning of the each year. Are you following, sir? Every one of you.
So first year installment at the beginning of first year. So Y zero. Second year installment at the beginning of second year. See at the beginning of second year and now at the end of the first year and now work at a same one and the same at the beginning of the second year or at the end of the first year will be one and the same. That's why I made the second installment at the end of the first year. Third installment at the beginning of the third year. I can also call it as at the end of the second year. Fourth installment at the beginning of fourth year. Nothing but at the end of the third year like this. I can take my OK now next. So when it comes to ordinary annuity, the last installment will not fetch any interest. But when it comes to annuity due, every installment, including the last installment will fetch the interest. Clear. Next, how to determine future value of annuity due factors. I've given you one formula here. Ordinary annuity factors for n plus one year minus one. Suppose that if you happen to find the future value of annuity due factor, future value of annuity due factors for the combination 10% five years. Now in that scenario, what you have to do is future value of ordinary annuity for n plus one year. What is term of annuity five years plus one? So means first you find the future value of ordinary annuity factors, ordinary annuity factors for sixth year. Now from that total direct one, you will get the future value of annuity due factors. Okay. Now next. So after that next model, we will be having present value of annuity. Yeah. Next model, model number six, present value of annuity. So that means here, suppose that we got a business proposal. There was a business, right? And uh, the person is ready to sell that business. And we ask for the purchase consideration. How much you are expecting? That person said to us, I'm expecting some four lakhs for this business. But I asked him, how, 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 why should, why, why are you expecting that much, that much amount? He said to me like, sir, if you purchase this business, I'll give you assurance that every year you will get a profit of one lakh like that for next to four years, I'll give you assurance. So four lakhs minimum profit you are going to get over the four years. So that's why I'm expecting four lakhs. Okay. What you said is right. But four lakhs, am I getting as in today? No, I'm getting over the four years. No, right? Over the four years, year one, one lakh, year two, one lakh, year three, one lakh, year four, one lakh. So, like that, four years, I'll get four lakhs. And you're asking me immediate payment of four lakhs for the purchasing of this business, right? So, whatever the profit I'm getting, one lakh every year over the four years, that representing the future value. We already know the golden principle of time value of money. That is the worth of one rupee today is always greater than the worth of one rupee tomorrow. Right. Whatever the four lakhs I'm going to receive over the four years, right? That four lakhs value is always lesser than the present value four lakh. The present today four lakh. Right. So in order to acquire this business, what is the maximum amount I can pay for? 4 lakh is absolutely no, we are not going to pay 4 lakhs because we are not getting 4 lakhs immediately, right? We are going to get the 4 lakhs, but in a future, right? So how much should I invest as and today in order to get this business, in order to acquire this business? So every year, 1 lakh you are getting. Now, what will be the present values of this periodical receipts? Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Right. So how much should I invest as and today in order to get every year one lakh profit? Or I went to the banker and I, 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 I've given my instructions. Okay, banker, every year I need to withdraw an amount of one rupee like that for next four years. Now, how much should I deposit in lump sum as and today? Clear. So first you need to determine the present value of the future deposits, uh, future receipts, present value of future receipts. So at the end of the year one, you're going to receive one rupee. Assuming the banker offering the rate of interest 10 percentage, 
So the present value will be 0 0.909. At the end of the second year, you are going to get one rupee. The present value will be 0 0.826. How, how are you getting this? One divided by 1.1. Press is equal to button 0 0.909. Is equal to button 0 0.826. Again is equal to 0 0.751. Again is equal to 0 0.683. So you are going to get four, uh, one rupee at the end of the fourth year. Now, this one rupee's present value is just 68 paise only. And what are the one rupee you are getting at the end of the third year, its present value is 75 paise only. Whatever the future value one rupee you are getting at the end of the second year, its present value is just 83 paise only. So like this totally tapma, you will get 3.169 or you can also round it up to 3.17. So you need to deposit as and today 3 rupees 17 paise. You need to deposit as and today 3 rupees 17 paise. If you deposit 3 rupees 17 paise as and today, Every year you can withdraw one rupee like that for four years, like that for four years. Yes, sir. Sir, in order to withdraw one lakh every day, every year. So as on today, you have to deposit three lakh sixteen thousand nine hundred or three lakh seventeen thousand. So deposit as on today three lakh seventeen thousand. Like uh, from next year on, which every year you can withdraw one lakh rupee. Every year you can withdraw one lakh rupee like that for four years. Are you following or not, every one of you? Okay, next. So this is what finding out the present value of annuity. Now, what is the formula? Said? Present value of annuity is equal to periodical payments into present value annuity factors. Present value annuity factors. So how to determine this present value annuity factors? Very simple. Again, you will be having two options. Again, you will be having two options. Number one, you can use a table. Table number A4. Table number A4 is a present value annuity factor table. Look at this present value annuity factor table. And uh, you can also calculate this present value annuity factors with the help of the calculators. So get ready, every one of you get ready with the calculators. So present value annuity factors, let us find out for the combination of 10% five years, 10% five years, right sir. So now uh, get ready with the calculators. So one divided by 1.1, .1, one divided by 1.1. .1. And you need the present value annuity factor for five years. Press the is equal to button for five times. Press the is equal to button for five times. One, two, three, four, five. And then press GD button. Then press GD button. You will be having a factor point, uh, 3.791, 3.791. Now go for the table, 10 percentage, five years. Ten percent, five years. Three point seven nine one. Three point seven nine one. Get it? So in this manner, you can find out the present value and the factor. Right. Let us take one more example. Some present value annuity factor for the combination of 8% 15 years. 8% 15 years. So get ready with the calculator. 8 percentage means 1.0 uh, 1. 1 divided by 1 divided by 1.08 1 divided by 1.08 and we need the annuity factor for 15 years. Press the is equal to button for 15 times. Press the is equal to button for 15 times. And after that, press the GD button. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then press GD button. You will be having the factor 8.559. Okay. Now check out in the table. 8 percentage, 15 years. Eight point five six. You can round it up. Eight point five five nine. You can also round it up to eight point five six. Get the same factor now. Eight point five six. Okay, now like this, you can find out the present value of annuity factors. Clear. Next. After that, the next model will be present value of annuity uh, perpetuity. Here it is. Model number seven. Present value of perpetuity. My annuity forever is called as perpetuity. 
identity forever is called as perpetuity. Look at here, sir. Yeah, present value of perpetuity. Right, concept of perpetuity first. Let us try to understand the concept of perpetuity. Identity forever is what we call perpetuity. Clear, sir. See, identity with a time limit. Suppose that a time limit of 10 years, it's not a perpetuity, sir. It's simply identity. Future value of identity or present value of identity. That's it. But identity with infinite time period. And it with infinite time period is called as perpetuity. There is no end point. Perpetuity means forever, infinite, no end point. Clear. Now, look at this example, sir. I went to the banker. I went to the banker and I asked the banker, okay, dear banker, I would like to withdraw an amount of 1 lakh per annum. An amount of 1 lakh per annum like that for infinite period. Now, tell me what is the amount what is a lump sum amount should i deposit as on today in your bank in order to get this infinite withdrawals so i would like to have infinite withdrawals of one lakh per annum now love tell me how much is a lump sum amount should i invest as on today how much is a lump sum amount as on today i need to invest assume that the banker offering 10 percent rate of interest the banker offering 10 percent rate of interest so, 1 lakh you would like to withdraw every year for an interest of 10 percentage. So, if you calculate, you will get more 10 lakhs. You will get 10 lakhs. Right? So, as and today, you need to deposit 10 lakhs rupees. As and today, you need to deposit 10 lakhs rupees. Like that, right? Uh, if you made that lump sum investment as and today, now, every year you will get 1 lakh withdrawal. See, here you are not going to touch your principal amount. You are not going to withdraw your principal amount. You are not going to withdraw your principal portion. You are going to withdraw only your interest portion. So like that for infinite period, you can withdraw that amount of 1 lakh. How did you get this formula? Sir? Simple. See, in order to find out the interest, no. 10 lakhs is a deposit we are making. 10% is a rate of interest. So, I'm getting interest of 1 lakh. I'm getting the interest of 1 lakh. Clear. Now, in order to find out this principal portion, simple cell into 10%, come this side. Take this side. Okay, now, is equal to get, it wipe this question number. Into is equal to get wipe which same the divided by. So, rate of interest divided by rate of interest. The amount of interest which you are going to get annual cash in close. So annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest will give you the present value of perpetuity. By using the same formula, you can also find out the rate of interest. Rate of interest it touches the present value of perpetuity. It touches the so rate of interest is equal to annual cash inflows divided by present value of perpetuity. Okay, this is the concept of present value of perpetuity. Next, after that, present value of growing perpetuity. Look at here, sir. Model number eight, present value of growing perpetuity. So perpetuity law, you are going to receive the amount in equal. Like this example, in this example, we have seen, if we deposit, if we deposit 10 lakhs rupees as on today, from year one, I'm going to withdraw an interest of one lakh in year one. In year two, one lakh interest I'm going to withdraw. In year three, one lakh interest I'm going to withdraw. And like this for, like this for, I'm going to withdraw this interest of one lakh every year for infinite period. For infinite period. You can see every year I'm going to get annual cash inflows, equal amount of annual cash inflows. Equal amount of annual cash inflows. But if I want a growth in this annual cash inflows, like in year one, I would like to withdraw one lakh. Year two, 1 lakh 10,000, year 3, 1 lakh 15,000, year 4, 1 lakh 25,000. So I would like to see the growth in my perpetuity, in my annual cash inflows. Now, in order to get this growing cash inflows every year, like that for infinite period, how much amount should I invest as and today? How much should I invest as and today? That is what we call a present value of growing perpetuity. Present value of growing perpetuity. So if you have equal amount every year, that is your normal perpetuity. But in your cash inflows, if you find any growth, ma, that is your growing perpetuity. 
that is your what ma that is your growing perpetuity every one of you following now present value of growing perpetuity sir how to find out the present value of growing perpetuity look at the formula sir present value of growing perpetuity is equal to cash flows at the end of the first year take the first year cash inflow cash flows at the end of the first year divided by r minus g r you know very well rate of interest and g is a growth rate adjust the growth rate for your rate of interest okay now so cash flows at the end of the first year divided by r minus g is a formula for the finding out of the present value of growing perpetuity every one of you okay now next the last model in this chapter effective rate of interest ma effective rate of interest we need to find out effective rate of interest only when there is the compounding is happening more than once in a year then only there is a need to find out the effective rate of interest see when compounding is done more than once in a year there is a need to calculate the effective rate of interest means whenever the compounding happening on quarterly basis whenever the compounding happening on semi annual basis for every 6 months then there is a need to find out the effective rate of interest look at this example sir look at this example sir i have deposited 1 lakh right and the banker offering me 10% rate of interest and the banker said compounding is happening annually every year at the end of the every year will pay you interest right so interest how much i'm going to get 1 lakh is my deposit 10% rate of interest 10000 is my interest amount now let us say if the banker offering us compounding on quarterly basis if the compounding is done on quarterly basis now we need to make some changes 1 lakh is my present value of deposit rate of interest this 10% is per annum 10% is per annum now what will be the rate of interest for every quarter so 10 divided by 4 2.5% per every quarter a number of time period 4 yearly four times you are going to get the interest now yearly four times so future value is equal to present value into future value factor r percent in number of years so present value 1 lakh into future value factors rate of interest 2.5% number of time period 4 5 minutes then you will get the future value factor 1.1038 2.5% now so get ready with the calculators and we are finding out future value factor now 1.025 2.5% now so 1.025 into is equal to second year factor Is equal to third year factor. Is equal to fourth year factor. You will have now one point one zero three eight is your future value factor. So multiply it, Emma. You will get future value is equal to one lakh ten thousand three eighty. So principal you deposited one lakh, but end of the first year you are getting one lakh ten thousand three eighty. So what is your interest, Emma? Ten thousand three eighty. Sorry, ah, uh, ten thousand three eighty. So you are getting ten thousand three eighty interest for the investment of one lakh. As a percentage, Emma. 10.38 percentage i think he said the banker offering us only 10% rate of interest but effectively you are getting 10.38 percentage effectively you are getting 10.38 percentage because of the compounding of quarterly basis as i already told you as many times as compounding is happening the more interest you will get more times the compounding is happening the more interest you will get are you following now right if compounding happening on yearly basis means yearly one time you are getting interest so 1 lakh into 10% only 10000 your interest but when compounding happening on quarterly basis so four times in a year you are getting interest four times in a year so that's why the rate of interest becomes 10.38% effective rate of interest normal rate of interest offered by the bank at 10% only but effectively you are getting 10.38% Okay now, now the formula for finding out the for, uh, effective rate of interest is equal to one plus R divided by M whole power M minus one. R is rate of interest. M is equal to number of times the compounding happening, number of time periods. So one plus rate of interest ten percent, so point one divided by M number of time periods. Four times the compounding happening divided by four whole power four minus one. 
So 1.025, 0.1 divided by 4, 1.025 whole power 4 minus 1. So 1.025 whole power 4. So 1.025 whole power 4 kadamma into 1.025. One, two, three. Yeah, you'll get more. One point zero two five whole power four. The value one point one zero three eight minus one. You'll get more ten point three eight as effective rate of interest. Ten point three eight percentage. One point one zero three eight minus one as per the formula. Then you will get point one zero three eight. When you're converting it into percentage, it will be ten point three eight percentage. It will be ten point three eight percent effective rate of interest. This is all you need to find out. Clear now. So with this, we have cal uh, completed our first chapter marathon. That is time value of money. As I already told you that this is not an exclusive chapter in ICA material. So you don't get a question from this chapter. But whatever the formula I have learned, uh, we have learned, right? Whatever the formula concepts we have learned so far, all these formula and concepts will be helpful, useful while doing the problems for the coming chapters without having the knowledge of time value of money you cannot do the remaining chapters problems so every one of you as many times as possible do all these problems learn all this formulae okay so that's it for today sir in the next class i'll come up with the second chapter investment decisions okay till then have a good day and good night stay home and stay safe sir A very good morning students. In the last class, we have completed uh, regarding the time value of money chapter marathon classes. Right, Ma? Now time for the second chapter, the most important chapter, investment decisions. Okay, sir. So examination point of view, investment decisions chapter, very, very important. In every examination attempt, we will get one problem compulsory for eight marks. And apart from the problem, sometimes we also get a theory question from this chapter from three to five marks. So one problem compulsory for eight marks and one theory question we can expect in between three to five marks. So the weightage of this chapter, I can say 10 marks minimum. Are you following, sir? So look at here, chapter number two, investment decisions. So I've already discussed the weightage of the chapter here. One problem for eight marks and one theory question in between three to four marks. Okay, now, now what are we going to learn from this investment decisions chapter? So financial management is mainly about decision makings. Three important decisions we are going to make in the financial management and they are financing decisions, it is a decision regarding the procurement of the funds. Number two, investment decisions. It is a decision about the investment of the funds. And number three, dividend decisions. Declaration of the profits as dividends. Right, sir. Now, investment decisions <clears throat> deals about what, Ma? Investment decisions deals about the investment of the funds. So in this chapter, we are going to make the decisions regarding the investment of the funds. Clear. So we are going to invest the funds in fixed assets and as well as in current assets. So investment of the funds into fixed assets will be dealt by this chapter investment decisions and investment of the funds into current assets will be dealt by the chapter working capital management. So in investment decisions chapter, we are going to discuss about the investment of the funds in fixed assets. Should I purchase a plant and machinery or not? Should I construct the building or not? Should I purchase the land or not? So all the investment decisions in relations to the fixed assets will be discussed in this particular chapter. And all the investment decisions with respect to current assets will be learned in the chapter working capital management. Okay, now, now so whenever you are going to make an investment decision, your objective should be your returns should be higher, right? So whenever you are investing the funds, what would be your objective? Your objective should be the returns from that investment should be higher. Yes or no? So whenever you are making investments into your shares of a company or into the mutual funds or into the gold or into the some bank deposits, what would be your objective? Your objective would be the returns from this investment should be higher. Similarly, whenever you are making investment decisions into fixed assets from that particular investment into the fixed assets, our returns should be higher. Clear, sir. Next. 
importance of investment decisions sir investment decisions you know these are uh, having the substantial portion of our investment suppose that our total investment is 100 lakhs out of which minimum 80 lakhs investments into fixed assets and the remaining 20 lakhs into current assets so out of the total investment 80 percent of the portion 80 percent of the portion in fixed assets investment decisions deals with and it involves substantial portion of your investment huge amounts are involved huge amounts are involved in these decisions and these decisions are irreversible in nature means once a decision is made you cannot take it back right sir once you purchase a plant and machinery worth 10 crores after using it for one month you cannot say to that seller like we don't like your plant and machinery actually we don't thought of this plant this kind of plant and machinery we are in thought of a different kind of plant and machinery so take your plant and machinery back and give us 10 crores no they don't take they don't take back so investment decisions mainly irreversible in nature once you made a decision whether it is a profit with the decision whether it's a loss with the decision you have to accept from that particular decision if you get a profit enjoy the profits if you get the losses face the losses that's it you cannot take back these decisions you cannot reverse your decision okay now and these decisions will have the impact in the long run See, if you are earning profits from this decision, you will earn this profit for a longer period, say 10 years. Similarly, if you are getting losses from this decision, the losses will be last long for 10 years also. So whether it's a profit or it is a loss, it will be for long run. See, if it is a profit, very happy. In the long run, we are going to enjoy the profits. But if it is a loss, you cannot bear the losses. You cannot bear the losses. Sometimes you need to shut down your business clear these decisions are complex in nature yes very complex because of the above features these are involving the huge amount of your capital portion irreversible in nature and this will have impact in your long run are you following sir next and after that you have a example here to understand this concept of investment decisions look at here ma cost of the car 5 lakhs rupees Number of days that the car can be given on lease 250 days per annum. Lease charges 600 per day. Annual maintenance 75,000 per annum. Life of the car 6 years and salvage value 2 lakhs. So at the end of the 6th year, if you sell the car, you will get 2 lakhs rupees. Ma. So from the above information, decide whether it is beneficial to enter into the business of the leasing of the car. So whether buying of this car and running them on lease basis is advisable or not. This is what the decision we need to make here. Look at here, Ma. From a layman's approach, from a layman's angle, what he will uh, think about this decision, sir? How his approach will be? His approach will be like, what will be my cash inflows and what will be my cash outflows? How much I am investing and how much I am getting? Clear. So he is getting right cash outflows. First, look at the cash outflows. How much he is investing? First, in order to purchase the car. He need to spend 5 lakhs rupees. He need to spend 5 lakhs rupees. And then annual maintenance cost. 75,000 per annum is annual maintenance cost. Like, like that for 6 years. 4,50,000. So the total investment he is making on that car. 9,50,000 over the 6 years. Now what is the cash inflows he is getting? So he is running that car on lease basis. Right? In a year he is running that car on lease basis for 250 days. And... Uh, for which every day is getting lease rental 600 rupees. So 600 rupees per day into 250 days in a year, like that for six years. So 9 lakhs is the lease rents he is getting. And at the end of the six year, he is selling the car for 2 lakhs. So totally 11 lakhs cash inflows he is getting. Totally 11 lakhs cash inflows he is getting. So for the investment of 9 lakh 50,000, he is getting an inflow of 11 lakhs. So the profit will be 1 lakh 50,000. So what the layman said, so I'm investing 9,50,000 in return. I'm getting 11 lakhs. So I'm getting a profit of 1,50,000. So the decision should be since there is a profit of 1,50,000, it is advisable entered into the business of running the car on lease basis. But this layman's approach is 100% wrong. There are so many important factors, important considerations missed out in this layman's approach what are they look at here 
drawbacks are loopholes in the layman's approach number 1 he ignores opportunity car opportunity cost see he is purchasing the car for rupees uh, how much am i he is purchasing the car for 5 lakhs 5 lakhs suppose that if the same 5 lakhs invested into a bank fixed deposits where the bank are giving you some 8% rate of interest per annum so that means you will get an interest amount of 5 lakhs into 8 percentage 40000 per annum like that for 6 years so 6 lakh uh, 2 lakh 40000 rupees interest he would have get yes or no if he invested the same 5 lakhs into a bank fixed deposit where the bank are offering 8% rate of interest per annum so per annum he would have received interest of 8 percentage that means 40000 rupees right sir like that for 6 years 6 years into 40000 2 lakh 40000 interest he would have received but by investing the same 5 lakhs into car he is missing this 2 lakh 40000 interest opportunity cost and this opportunity cost was not considered in the decision making the first drawback second drawback time value of money sir simply he is added all the cash inflows and cash outflows of the different years directly which he should not look at here every year is getting a lease rentals of 1 lakh 50000 how much every day 600 rupees into in a year 250 days the car is running on lease basis so every year is getting lease rentals of 1 lakh 50000 year 1 1 lakh 50000 year 2 1 lakh 50000 so on up to year 6 1 lakh 50000 but all these years lease rentals are having the same value no year 1 1 lakh 50000 is completely different from year 6 1 lakh 50000 time value of money we have learned a golden principle the worth of one rupee today is always greater than the worth of one rupee tomorrow yes or no year 1 lo vache 1 lakh 50000 year 6 lo vache 1 lakh 50000 renditiki same value ne untunda undachu so you should not add different years cash inflows directly different in uh, years cash outflows directly you should not add you should not subtract you should not uh divide division multiplication different years cash inflows you should not add directly because they have different values but the layman has not considered this time value of money principle he simply add all the years cash inflows at a stretch that's not correct next number 2 number 3 depreciation car is a depreciable asset and where he is considered the depreciation impact in the decision making he ignored the depreciation impact next tax impact you are doing a business leasing the car on a, a higher basis running the car on higher basis you are doing a business you are earning profits every year now where is the tax element are you considering the tax element on your profits no so these are all the important drawbacks or loopholes in the layman's approach by covering all these drawbacks loopholes by overcoming all these drawbacks and loopholes right scientifically there are some techniques developed and that techniques are called as a project evaluation techniques or capital budgeting techniques capital budgeting techniques are project evaluation techniques right ma in these project evaluation techniques all these loopholes are have been covered overcome all this takes into consideration clear ma so there are two different types of techniques ma traditional techniques also known as non discounting techniques and the second one discounting techniques are time adjusted techniques okay ma first look at the traditional techniques also known as non discounting techniques we have two ma average rate of return and payback period arr method and pbp method clear sir and in the coming to the non discounting techniques you have npv net present value method then irr internal rate of return method then profitability index method then terminal value method and finally discounted payback period method five methods in discounting techniques two methods in non discounting techniques okay now now first let us discuss about the traditional techniques also known as a average rate of return also known as average rate of return arr this can also be called as accounting rate of return the average rate of return and accounting rate of return and both are one and the same so why we are calling average rate of return as accounting rate of return because while calculating this average rate of return mainly we will take into account the accounting profits
while calculating this accounting rate of return mainly we take into account the accounting profit so based on the accounting profit we will calculate this rate of return that is why this is called as a ma accounting rate of return okay now this is the only method this is the only method we are going to consider accounting profit remaining in all the methods we are going to consider fm profits financial management profits both are completely different ma what is the difference i'll tell you later okay now now sir what is the average rate of return it is the maximum rate of return it is the maximum rate of return we can expect from a project so whenever you are making investments in your project you must be having some target in your mind okay from this particular project i should earn this much rate of return so whenever you are making investments you must be having a target in your mind okay from this particular investment i should earn this much rate of return and whatever the target you have in your mind that will be your average rate of return yes or no say i am investing some 10 crores rupees in a project from which i am expecting 15% rate of return and that 15% rate of return is what we called average rate of return and you must have a target sir why because sir for making investments into this particular project i am investing i am involving a cost of 12% i have taken a loan from a bank for which i am paying interest of 12% so from this particular project i should earn a minimum rate of return of 12% yes or no then only the project is viable to me then only the project is acceptable to me are you following or not right so look at this example x limited funds available 10 lakhs rupees right sir now there are three different projects available three different projects available here are from project 1 12% project 2 15% and project 3 18% each clear so generally whenever you are making investments i have already told you the objective should be your returns from this project should be higher so this is the project which gives me the highest rate of return so i will choose project 3 are you following sir i'll choose project 3 and the decision making here is purely based upon you always have to compare your average rate of return with the cost of capital whether this project whether this return is able to cover my cost or not if my return is able to cover the cost yes this project is uh, acceptable to me if my return is unable to cover the cost this project is not acceptable to me so that's why the decision making should be always compare your average rate of return with cost of capital if average rate of return is greater than cost of capital accept the project are you following or not look at here project number 3 where your arr is 18% which is greater than the cost of capital 15% hence project 3 is acceptable clear now sir how to calculate this average rate of return so look at the formula sir accounting rate of return the average rate of return is equal to you can see the formula here profit after depreciation totally there are three versions ma for finding out the arr version 1 annual basis version 2 total investment basis and version 3 average investment basis first look at the version 1 annual basis means you are going to find out the arr per annum not project as a whole per annum first find out the arr per annum then find out the arr for the project as a whole like sir year 1 year 2 and year 3 you find out the arr like this some 10 percentage 12 percentage and 14 percentage per annum arr you find out this is finding out the arr on annual basis now if you want to know the arr for the project as a whole the total of this 3 years arr arr of the project as a whole is equal to this just total up 10% 12% and 14% and there are 3 years now divided by 3 so 10 plus 12 22 plus 14 36 36 divided by 3 so arr of the project as a whole you can say 12 percentage 12 percentage okay now so the formula will be annual basis arr profit after depreciation divided by investment in the beginning of the year right next total investment basis this in this in this version we are going to find out the arr 
for the project as a whole. ARR for the project as a whole. Formula will be average annual profit divided by the investment into beginning into 100. Next, average investment basis. Average annual profit after tax divided by average investment into 100. Right, sir. Average profit after tax divided by average investment into 100. So generally, if the question is silent about the different versions, simply the information is provided to you and asked to find out the ERR. In that scenario, you have to adopt this method, average investment method. Unless otherwise specifically provided, calculate the ARR basing upon average investment basis. If specifically provided, calculate accordingly. Apply the formula accordingly. Yes or no, ma? Every one of you. Okay. So, sir, how to find out the average profit after tax? The total profit after tax divided by life of the project. Okay, now, next average investment. There are two formulas available. Number one, opening investment plus closing investment divided by two. Number two, half of the initial investment plus initial cost minus salvage value plus salvage value and plus working capital. Use this formula, then find out the average investment. Okay, now, next. And while making the decisions with respect to the projects, there are two different types of the projects available, Ma, right? Number one, mutually exclusive. Number two, mutually independent. Ma, mutually exclusive means mutually exclusive means here among the given projects you are asked to select only one project only one project right sir so there are three projects available project one two three and ERR you can see 15 percent 18 percent 20 percent cost of capital 12 percentage you can see that in all the projects p1 p2 p3 here is greater than cost of capital all the projects are acceptable but the thing is the nature of the projects mutually exclusive nature of the projects mutually exclusive that means you need to select only one project now which project will you choose i'll choose project three because i'm getting highest return 20 percentage yes or no so when it comes to the mutually exclusive projects where you have to select only one project right sir selection of a project means we are rejecting all other projects that's the nature of mutually exclusive projects so i'm selecting p3 that means i'm rejecting p2 and p1 so when it comes to the mutually exclusive projects you have to select the projects with the highest err now when it comes to the mutually independent projects right sir selection of one project doesn't mean that we are rejecting other projects we can also select other projects as well depending upon the funds available with you Depending upon the funds available with you. Clear. So look at the nature. Selection of the project. Selection of one project doesn't mean we are rejecting the other projects. Projects are independent to each other. Yes or no. So in these cases, we need to select all the projects whose ARR is greater than cost of capital. In this example, ma. All the three projects here are greater than cost of capital. So we can select P1, P2, P3, all the three projects simultaneously, depending upon the funds available with us. Depending upon the funds available with us. Every one of you following now. Right. So look at here, ma. Decision making. In the case of the single projects, means only one project is giving to you. And with respect to that one project, you need to make a decision. If ARR is greater than cost of capital, accept the project means your average rate of return covering all your costs, whatever you are incurring from that for that particular project. So yes, since I'm getting a huge amount of returns, accept the project. If ARR is less than cost of capital, reject the project. Sir, I'm incurring a cost of 15 percentage, but this project is giving me only 10 percent rate of return. So my returns are not able to meet my costs. So simply reject the project. And if error is equal to cost of capital, you may accept the project. You may reject the project. It's up to you. Okay, now next coming to multiple projects means more than one projects in consideration. More than one project in consideration. And if the project's nature is mutually exclusive, we need to select only one project. So accept the project with highest ERR. In case the project's nature is mutually independent, each and every project is independent of the other projects, then you can select all the projects whose ERR is 
greater than cost of capital. Okay, ma. So this is about the average rate of return. Next, with this theoretical knowledge, you can do the problem, ma. Next one. Next concept we'll have the concept of cash flows after tax (CFAD). CFAT. We call it as CFAT. Cash flows after tax (CFAD). CFAT. Okay. So these are FM profits, ma. These are FM profits, also known as cash profits. FM profits, also known as cash profits. Okay. So what is the difference between the accounting profits and FM profits? Look at here. Accounting profits calculated on mercantile basis, calculated on mercantile basis, and which takes into account all the payables and all the receivables. Paid includes payables and receipts includes receivables. Even if it is a particular expenditure under payable status, it will consider it as payment and it will uh, charge to the profit and loss account. Thereby, your profits will be reduced. Even a particular income is on receivable status, it will be considered as income and made a credit entry into your profit and loss account. Your profits will be increased, right, sir? But whereas when it comes to the FM profits, these are calculated on cash basis. Means only actual cash payments, only actual cash payments and actual cash receipts are considered. Payables, receivables ignored. Okay, now next coming to the accounting pro, which even it considers the non cash expenses like depreciation, non cash expenditure. When it comes to the accounting pro, which you might have seen in the profit and loss account to depreciation, they will charge it as an expenditure. Depreciation is a non cash expenditure, ma'am. You're not incurring anything out of your pocket, yes or no? By booking a non cash expenditure as an expenditure, your profits would have reduced but whereas when it comes to the fm profits depreciation will be simply ignored next accounting profits will not reflect the true financial position of the company yes when you are booking payables as an expenditure when you are considering receivables as income which are not yet received don't know whether we are going to receive in future or not uncertainty is there and when you are booking non cash expenses as an expenditure to your profit and loss account how the accounting profits will reflect the true financial position of the company it won't reflect yes or no suppose that you have a gross profit of yeah look at here example i have already given by sales 100 lakhs all the sales are credit sales ma all the sales are credit sales right 100 lakhs and, and you, you incurred an expenditure of, let us say, 80 lakhs, and you have a profit of 20 lakhs net profit. Now, if I open my cash box, should I find the 20 lakhs in my profit box? No. Because these are all not yet received. These are all credit sales. Yes or no? You have not yet received from the debtors. Whenever there is a debtor, there is a bad debt. Yes or no? But immediately after making credit sales, you have recorded it as income. And you are showing you have a profit of 20 lakhs. But in your cash box, nothing is there. In your bank account, nothing is there. Where is the 20 lakhs profits? Right, sir? Every one of you. Next, look at here. Another example. You have a gross profit of 40 lakhs. And you booked an expenditure of 35 lakhs. And you also booked a depreciation of 10 lakhs. So total expenditure comes out to be 45 lakhs. And you have a gross profit of only 40 lakhs. So you're booking a net loss of 5 lakhs. Now you tell me, sir, whether your company really running in losses. By looking at your accounting profits, your accounting statements, it is showing a 5 lakhs net loss. But which is not your role, correct loss. Your company is in profits, ma. 40 lakhs profit you have, uh, out of which 30 lakhs is an expenditure. So you have a net profit of 5 lakhs. This 10 lakhs is a non cash expenditure. Yes or no? So in reality, you have a profit of 5 lakhs, but as per the accounting financial statements, it is showing a loss of 5 lakhs. Clear? So that's why, that's why accounting profits will not reflect the true financial position of the company. But whereas FM profits reflects 
the true financial position of the company. So that is why while making the investment decisions, one has to consider FM profits only known as CFAD cash flow after tax. Okay, sir. Next. Sir, how to calculate this cash flows after tax? We have a standard format, ma. Right. It starts with the PBDT profits before depreciation and taxes. PBDT profits before depreciation and taxes. From which deduct the depreciation. Then you will get PBT. Deduct the tax element. You will get PAT. Add back depreciation. You will get CFAT. Cash flows after tax. Now, after looking into this, you will get a dot here. So just now you said while calculating the FM profits. You are asking us to ignore the depreciation, but why you consider here? Why you consider here? Right, less depreciation, add back depreciation. Suppose the depreciation amount is hundred rupees. Here I am deducting hundred rupees. Here I am adding hundred rupees. What is the impact? Plus hundred, minus hundred will be striked up. The impact will be zero. So that means I have ignored depreciation while calculating CFAD. Are you following or not? So for the purpose of ignoring the C, uh, depreciation in the calculation of CFAD, why there is a need to subtract it once and adding back again? So we are doing this because of the tax benefit. Because of the tax benefit, depreciation though it is a non-cash expenditure, on that depreciation we can claim tax benefit. Depreciation is a tax deductible expenditure. Tax deductible expenditure on which we can claim tax benefits. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Suppose that my profit after tax thousand rupees, depreciation two hundred rupees. So profit before tax eight hundred. Tax element let us say at the rate of thirty percentage. So two hundred and forty rupees. So profit after tax which comes out to be five hundred and sixty rupees. Five hundred and sixty rupees. Okay, sir. And add back depreciation two hundred. My cash plus after tax seven sixty. Suppose that if I have not considered this depreciation at all, my PBDT would have been it. It is one thousand only, no, and minus depreciation. I have not considered. I have just ignored. So my PBD thousand, and what will be my tax? My tax at the rate of thirty percentage would have been three hundred rupees. Three hundred rupees. But by considering depreciation here, my tax liability is just two forty only. And then I got a benefit of sixty rupees tax benefit. Depreciation is a tax deductible expenditure. That is why while calculating CFAD, you just subtract the depreciation first, and after calculation of the tax element and everything, add back the depreciation again. That's it. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Next, there is one more alternative to calculate the CFAD. This is the other alternative, ma. PBDT from which it is the tax directly. Then you'll get PAD. Add back the tax yield on depreciation. What are the tax benefit you are getting on depreciation? Add back directly. Then you'll get CFAD. Like continue our example. PBDT thousand rupees minus tax at the rate of thirty percentage, which comes out to be three hundred rupees. Profit short of after tax seven hundred rupees. And tax benefit on depreciation. What is your depreciation? Two hundred rupees into what is the tax rate? Thirty percentage. Sixty rupees. So cash flows after tax seven sixty. What's the number seven sixty? Every one of you. So, sir, add this, sir, less this. Yenne odu sir na ko. Right. I just don't want to see the depreciation in CFAD calculation. Okay. Do one thing. You can simply take the tax benefit on depreciation directly. It's a benefit to you. So add back to your profits. So profits after tax seven hundred. Add the tax benefit on depreciation sixty rupees. Then your CFAD is seven sixty. So while you are calculating CFAD in alternative one or alternative two, in both the cases you will get the same profits seven sixty seven sixty. Are you following or not? Clear. So that's how you have to calculate the CFAD amount. Next. So in the traditional techniques, the second one is payback period method. Payback period method. Just give me a second, sir. Second traditional method, 
and second a non discounting technique right payback period method a payback period method explains about explains about in in how many years in how many years we will get back our investment initial investment what is the time required to getting back or for recovering our investment and that time is what we call payback period method pay back what are the amount of paid what is the time required to getting back it what is the time required what is the period required to getting back it getting back it that is what we call payback period method right sir so payback period explains about it is the time required for recovering our investment for recovering our investment is called as a payback period method okay ma suppose that right initial investment look at this ma we made an investment of 10 lakhs rupees in a project and from that particular project we have the cash inflows like this so year 1 2 lakhs year 2 2 lakhs year 3 2 lakhs like that up to 8 years so 8 years we have a uniform cash inflow of 2 lakhs every year right sir now can i call this 2 lakhs as profits from year 1 to year 8 i have a profit of 2 lakhs every year no sir you cannot call it as profits right unless and until your investment is completely recovered right sir that is not your profit sir look at here you made an investment in y0 10 lakhs rupees and the 10 lakhs you are recovering over the 5 years the first 5 years what are the cfat you are earning this you should not treat it as profits this you have to treat it as recovery of your investment recovery of your investment and after your investment was completely recovered from there after whatever the profits you are getting they are your real profits they are your real profits so from year 6 onwards in this case from year 6 onwards whatever the cash inflows i am getting these inflows i have to treat it as profits the first 5 years is just recovery of my investments is just a recovery of investment now in this example i can say payback period is equal to 5 years so what were the investment i have made in y0 that is 10 lakhs rupees it took me 5 years to get back my 10 lakhs rupees so the payback period is equal to 5 rupees 5 years sorry ma 5 years so when you have uniform cash flows throughout the life of the project the formula for the calculation of payback period is as follows initial investment divided by annual cash inflows your initial investment is 10 lakhs divided by annual cash inflows 2 lakhs per annum so payback period is equal to 5 years got it ma in the first 5 years you are able to recover your investment now when it comes to the decision making sir whether it is advisable to accept this project if you ask me i'll say no out of the total life of the project 8 years you are working hard 5 years only for getting back your investment 5 years you are working hard and a 5 years kashtapadte kaani man investment man cheyadi raavatledu and tarvata sare poni inko 5 years anna manaku vache profits ni man enjoy cheddam ante life emo 8 years e undi that means maximum 3 years only you can enjoy the profits out of the total life of 8 years 5 years you are working hard for getting back your investment and only 3 years you are enjoy you are going to enjoy the profits only 3 years you are going to enjoy the profits so uh, logically speaking it's not correct not advisable to accept the project see we need to recover our investment as quick as possible then only we can enjoy the latter part of the life of the project as profits okay now next situation 2 uneven cash inflows throughout the project so equal cash inflows unte straight away you can apply the formula by applying the formula you can find out the payback period method but when the cash inflows are uneven like look at this example you made an initial investment of 10 lakhs so the cash flows after tax will be like this year 1 3 lakhs year 2 3 lakh 50000 year 3 3 lakh 50000 and you can see there are uneven cash inflows right equal ga leva ma a year lo kuda uneven cash inflows when that scenario first you have to find out this cumulative cfad cumulative cash flows after tax like year 1 3 lakhs year 2 6 lakhs 50000 how did you get this year 1 cfad 3 lakhs plus year 2 CFAD three point five lakhs, six lakh fifty thousand. 
ఇయర్ త్రీ క్యూములేటివ్ క్యాష్ ఫ్లోస్ ఆఫ్టర్ ట్యాక్స్ టెన్ ల్యాక్స్ ఎలా వచ్చింది ఇయర్ వన్ త్రీ ల్యాక్స్ ప్లస్ ఇయర్ టూ త్రీ ల్యాక్ ఫిఫ్టీ థౌసండ్ ప్లస్ ఇయర్ త్రీ త్రీ ల్యాక్ ఫిఫ్టీ థౌసండ్ టోటలీ టెన్ ల్యాక్స్ సో లైక్ దట్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు ఫైండ్ అవుట్ ద క్యూములేటివ్ క్యాష్ ఫ్లోస్ ఆఫ్టర్ ట్యాక్స్ ఎవ్రీ ఇయర్ క్యాష్ ఇన్ క్లోస్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు క్యూములేట్ now look at here what is your investment amount 10 lakhs and your 10 lakhs investment is exactly recovering at the end of the third year so you can say the payback period is equal to 3 years okay next look at one more example your initial investment is 10 lakhs and cash inflows are look at here year 1 4 lakhs year 2 4 lakh 50000 year 3 3 lakhs so means uneven cash inflows you are observing uneven cash inflows so whenever i have said already whenever there is an uneven cash inflows find out the cumulative cash flows after tax first so 4 lakhs for year 1 8 lakh 50000 for year 2 11 lakh 50000 for year 3 okay so here you have to find out the cumulative cash inflows first and then look at in which year or in between which years your investment is falling what is your investment 10 lakhs and your 10 lakhs investment you are able to recover in between year 2 to year 3 in between year 2 to year 3 yes or no up to year 2 you are able to recover 8 lakh 50000 the remaining 1 lakh 50000 you are recovering in year 3 you are recovering in year 3 okay ma now in this scenario how to find out the payback period method look at here payback period method is equal to formula year up to which the cumulative cash flows after tax is less than initial investment plus unrecovered investment divided by cfat for the next year year up to which your cumulative cash flows after tax is less than initial investment up to second year your cumulative cash flows are less than initial investment so second year second year plus unrecovered investment what is your total investment 10 lakhs up to the second year you are able to recover 8.5 lakhs so unrecovered investment 1.5 lakhs unrecovered investment 1.5 lakhs and this 1.5 lakhs unrecovered investment you are going to cover from the third year cash inflows what is your third year cash inflows 3 lakhs so divided by 3 lakhs okay now so then payback period should be 2.5 years two and a half years or you can also call it the two years six months two years six months okay ma so this is how you need to find out the payback period under different situations clear everyone now what is the decision making process under payback period method look at here ma decision making process under payback period method yes so when it comes to the single projects if your project payback period is less than standard payback period accept the project what is the standard payback period ma standard payback period anna industry payback period anna okate sir industry payback period see your company is belonging to a particular industry like you are doing a software business you are into software business so means your company is belong into software industry like tcs infosys wipro mahindra technologies tech mahindra right these are all belong into same industry called as software industry clear look at this example when infosys is finding out the payback period method and it is find out that the payback period is equal to 4 years now this payback period should be compared with the industry payback period ante if this project accepted by the other companies in the same industry what would have been their payback period right if tcs accepted this project what would have been its project payback period if mahindra satyam tech mahindra accepted this project what would have been its payback period if wipro accepted this project what would have been its payback period that is what we call industry payback period you always have to compare your company's payback period with the industry payback period and when it comes to payback period lower the payback period higher will be the benefit means lower the payback period ante entamma within less time you are able to recover your investment out of 10 years assume that within 3 years you are able to recover your investment that means in the remaining 7 years you are going to enjoy the profits yes or no ante kada amma manaki payback period enta takku unte anta advantage manaki enta fast ga mana investment mana recovery chesukogaligide remaining life mottham kuda mana profits ni enjoy cheyochu so you always always strive for recovering back your investment as quick as possible then the rest of the life of the project you can enjoy the profits yes or no
So that's why if our company's payback period lower than standard payback period, accept the project. If your company's payback period is greater than standard payback period, like your company able to recover the investment in five years, whereas the other companies in the same industry able to recover the uh, investment in three years only. So when other companies are able to recover the investment in three years, why can't our company? Why our company taking five years? There is something wrong. So let us reject this project. Okay, ma'am. And if your payback period is equal to standard payback period, you may accept the project. You may reject the project. That's about the individual project. When it comes to the multiple projects, when it comes to the multiple projects, more than one project is there. That's in if it is a mutually exclusive project, then accept the project with the least payback period method. And if it is a mutually independent project, accept all those projects whose payback period is less than standard payback period. Clear ma. Next. Coming to the payback period method, we have some assumptions to understand. Ma, FM maintain assumptions. FM is all about assumptions because FM discuss about the future. Discuss about the future and future is uncertain. You need to take some assumptions. Basing upon the assumptions only, you will make the decisions. Look at the assumptions here. All the cash flows given in the project uh, problem are assumed to be certain. So what are the cash inflows I am assuming in this particular project? They are certain cash flows. You have to take that particular assumption. Otherwise, you cannot do the problem. Right, sir. Next. All the cash inflows are assumed to be accrued evenly throughout the year. Means, look at here, ma. In year one, I'm getting 365 lakhs. Now, my question is, in which particular day are you getting this 365 lakhs cash inflows at the beginning of the year or end of the year or in the mid of the year? No. I'm getting this project's cash inflows evenly throughout the year means every day my cash inflow is one lakh like that for 365 days 365 lakhs is my cash inflows evenly throughout the year every day i have a equal cash inflows that's the second assumption are you following or not so uh, after completing the answer of the payback period method you have to write must and should you have to write this assumptions compulsorily these assumptions also carries marks more suppose that you got a payback period problem for five marks you have done the answer correctly but you forgot to write the assumptions you will get hardly three to four marks for the answer at least one mark will be deducted for not writing assumptions so keep this fact in mind so with this we have completed the traditional techniques non-discounting techniques okay now now let's move on to the discounting techniques Discounting techniques. Right. Discounting techniques, also known as time adjusted techniques, also known as time adjusted techniques. Okay, ma'am. So far, we have completed non-discounting techniques, also known as traditional techniques. So here, in non-discounting techniques, traditional techniques, that is ARR and payback period method, there are so many important considerations which are missed out, like mainly time value of money principles. Time value of money principles. If you look at the average rate of return, and payback period method, different years cash inflows are directly added. Right, sir. While calculating payback period, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, all the cash inflows are directly added and basing upon which we find out the payback period and basing upon which we made a decision, but which is not correct. We know that different years cash inflows should not be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided directly in order to make the addition or subtraction first you have to uh, bring them into the same time periods only the same time period cash inflows can be added subtracted directly can be compared directly yes or no 
right? If you want to add the two different years cash inflows, first try to bring them into the same time period. Then you can add directly, absolutely no problem. So year one cash inflow, year two cash inflow, you cannot add directly, sir. Either year one cash inflow, you need to take it to the future or year two cash inflow, you need to bring it to present. Then only you can make the comparison or you can make addition or subtraction. But whereas when it comes to the traditional techniques that was not happened, we have simply added different years cash inflows directly. Basing upon which we made a decision which is absolutely a wrong decision. Mom, majority of the circumstances, the financial managers use only the NPV method for making financial decisions. NPV method is the most widely used method for making investment decisions. It is the most widely used method for making investment decisions because it covers all the important considerations like time value of money principles, opportunity cost element, depreciation element, tax impact, everything. Everything it takes into account. So that is why it is the best project evaluation techniques. So how to find out the NPV? Very simple, sir. It is the present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. So you are bringing the cash inflows and cash outflows into the present value terms. And then you are making subtraction based on which you are finding out NPV. Present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. Here your inflows and outflows will be in a different time periods. That's why we are bringing them into the present value terms in Y0 terms. After bringing them into the present value terms, then you can make a subtraction. Then you can find out the NPV. Right? So present value, NPV is equal to present value of cash inflows. Means also we can write it as present value of operating cash inflows plus present value of terminal cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. Okay, right. Next, there is a standard procedure for the finding out of the NPV, sir. In step number one, we will find out the present value of cash outflows. Step number two, we will find out the present value of operating cash inflows. Right, what are the cash inflows you are getting through your day to day business activity? By your day to day business activity, that cash inflows are what we call present value of operating cash inflows. Step number three, we are going to find out the present value of terminal cash inflows, terminal cash inflows, and step number four, NPV, NPV calculation. Right, sir. you can see here. Present value of cash inflows, you got 1,30,000 example and present value of cash outflows, 1 lakh. So NPV 30,000. What do you mean by this 30,000? 30,000 means it is your profit. It is your profit. Right, sir. We are earning after recovering of your investment. 1 lakh investment is recovered and opportunity cost also. And opportunity cost also. So after considering your investment and opportunity cost, Right, sir. After recovering both, whatever the amount is there, that till is your real profits, NPV. Clear, sir. Net present value. It is the net of present values. Net of present value of cash inflows and present value of cash outflows. That is why this is called net present value. Net present value, NPV. And this 30,000 is the amount of the profits which you will earn as on today. Present value times I'm talking about. Okay, now, so look at here. In Y0, you made an investment of 1 lakh rupee. And end of the year one, you're getting 20,000 20, rupees cash inflows at the end of the first year. But for the calculation of NPV, we don't take this 20,000 as cash inflows. We will take the cash inflows as, right? You need to bring them into the present value, right? So it is year one profits now. So assume that the opportunity cost, the cost of capital given is 10 percentage. So you need to take the present value factors at 10 percentage. So one divided by 1.1 for calculating present values, you need to divide division. So the present value factors for the first year 0 0.909, 0 0.909. Okay, ma. so means 20,000 into 0 0.909, you'll get a ma 18,180. While calculating the NPV, we will take only 18,180 as cash inflows, not 20,000. Even though you are getting in year one, 
even though you are getting in year one, right, twenty thousand profits, cash flows after tax twenty thousand. But for the calculation of NPV, we are taking only eighteen thousand one eighty as year one cash inflows, because twenty thousand you are going to get at the end of the first year. But I want present value as and today's value. So what will be the present value of twenty thousand, which you are going to receive at the end of first year? First year end loss is which is going to twenty thousand. Your car present value in the eighteen thousand one eighty rupees. Like that for every year. Suppose that in year two you are getting again twenty thousand rupees. In Y two, at the end of the second year also you have a cash flows after tax of twenty thousand. So second year factor this one number one divided by one point one. Is equal to press twenty first year factor again press is equal to second year factor so twenty thousand into point eight two six you have to take into account twenty thousand into point eight two six only sixteen thousand five twenty for the calculation of NPV sixteen thousand five twenty for year two are you following sir every one of you right now so though you are getting every year twenty thousand. But these are representing future values. I want present values because I am making the decision as on today. So I want the present value of cash inflows. I want the present value of cash outflows. So I have to convert all my future cash inflows into present values. At what rate of interest I have to convert ma? At cost of capital rate. So convert all your future cash inflows into present values by taking cost of cash uh, cost of capital as a base. At cost of capital rate. All your cash inflows should be converted into present values. Then take the total of that present values. That will be your present value of operating cash inflow. Arthamotundama. Next. Next. At the end of the life of the project, you will get terminal cash inflows. Right after the completion of the project, whatever the assets you purchase, that assets you would be sold out. You will get the terminal cash inflows. Suppose that the project life is five years. End of the fifth year, you will sell all the assets. You will get terminal cash inflows. But you are going to get at the end of the fifth year, no? But I want the present value, you know. So then the terminal cash inflows should be multiplied with the fifth year present value factor. Fifth year present value factor. Then that will be converted into the present values. Are you following or not, every one of you? So like that, every cash inflow you have to convert into the present value, and cash outflows. Majority of the circumstances you made the investment in at the beginning of the project only, they always represent present value. So you have the present value of cash inflows, you have the present value of cash outflows. Uh, subtract chain number, you will get NPV. Okay now, every one of you, present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. Clear. Next decision making. So when it comes to the NPV, the decision making will be like this. In the case of the single projects, if NPV is positive, accept the project. If NPV is negative, reject the project. If NPV is equal to zero, you may accept or you may reject. But if NPV is positive, means like that. Suppose that you have NPV of some ten thousand rupees. This ten thousand means after recovering your investment. And after recovering your opportunity cost, still you have a profit of ten thousand rupees. So accept the project. Suppose that you got an NPV of NPV of negative five thousand, NPV of negative five thousand, and that means your project is unable to recover your initial investment and as well as your opportunity cost. Unable to recover your initial investment and opportunity cost. So it's not advisable. It's not advisable to. Accept the project, okay, ma. And when it comes to multiple projects, when more than one project is there, and if the project's nature is mutually exclusive, means you have to select only one project, then select the project with the highest NPV. Accept the project with highest NPV. Let us say the project's nature is mutually independent. Each and every project is independent of the other project. Then you can accept all the projects whose NPV is positive. Select all those projects whose NPV is positive. Okay now next assumptions. Just like we had the assumptions in payback period method, uh, we have assumptions in NPV as well. What are the assumptions? First one, all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be certain. What are the cash flows giving? Like you can see here, uh, problem number eight. Different projects information is provided to user. 
प्रोजेक्ट ये इनिशियल इन्वेस्टमेंट टू लैक्स प्रोजेक्ट बी वन लैक नाइनटी थाउजेंड प्रोजेक्ट सी टू लैक फिफ्टी थाउजेंड एंड प्रोजेक्ट डी टू लैक टेन थाउजेंड एंड आफ्टर दैट प्रोजेक्ट कैश इन क्लोज गिवेट फ्रॉम ईयर वन टू ईयर फाइव दीज आर द कैश इन क्लोज ऑल दीज आर सटेन कैश क्लोज ऑल दीज आर ऑलरेडी रिसीव्ड कैश क्लोज नो दीज आर फ्यूचर कैश इन क्लोज दीज आर ऑल फ्यूचर कैश इन क्लोज फ्यूचर कैश इन क्लोज Yes, sir. So, if I invest cash uh, investment of two lakhs in project A from year one to year five, I'll get fifty thousand per annum as cash inflow. This is my future cash inflow, right? Which involves some uncertainty. But for doing the problems of NPV, we need to take these assumptions. What are the cash inflows we are assuming for a project? They are certain cash flows. Next. All the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be occurred at the end of the year. This assumption is quite opposite to payback period assumption. So no, in the payback period, we have learned that the cash inflows are occurred evenly throughout the year. Every day, I have an equal cash inflow. Suppose that in year one, I have a cash inflow of three hundred and sixty-five lakhs. Payback period saying that from day one to day under three hundred and sixty-five, every day I have an equal cash inflow of one lakh, like that for three hundred and sixty-five days, three hundred and sixty-five lakhs, my cash inflow. But whereas NPV said that from day one to day three hundred and sixty-four, my cash inflows are zero. Whatever the cash inflows I am getting, I am getting only at the end of the year. So day one to day three sixty-four work, your cash inflows are zero, and you are getting all the three hundred and sixty-five lakhs on day three hundred and sixty-fifth only, the last day. And why we are taking assumption? But just because of the Present value factors. What are the present value factors we are seeing in the tables? That factors representing end of the year. See, first year you have a factor of point nine zero nine at ten percentage one year. But this factor is representing end of the year. So has your cash inflow should also represent end of the year. So when your cash inflows and factor is end of the year, you can very easily multiply them. Are you following or not? Next. Third assumption: All the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be reinvested at the cost of capital rate. What were the cash inflows we are getting in the project? All the cash inflows are not putting ideal. We are reinvesting them at a cost of capital rate. Clear, ma? These three assumptions are very, very important assumptions. So after completion of the NPV problem, you have to write the decision depending upon your NPV. And after the decision making, you have to write the assumptions compulsorily. Compulsorily. If you don't write the assumptions, you will lose the marks compulsorily. Clear now, okay now, every one of you. and whenever there is a working capital involving in the npv calculations working capital involving in npv calculations the working capital will be having impact in two steps ma first you have to treat it as your cash outflow in the step number 1 you have to treat it as your cash outflow and in step number 3 while calculating terminal cash inflows you have to consider it as your recovery of working capital as your cash inflow recovery of working capital cash inflow are you following sir every one of you you can see here in problem number 10 we have a working capital of 5 lakhs first it should be treated as your cash outflow at the beginning of the project working capital is a cash outflow at the end of the project same working capital is cash inflow same working capital is your cash inflow 5 lakhs rupees are you following sir see end of the project what are the Investment, a working capital we have invested at the beginning that will be recovered, ma. That is why we have to consider it as terminal cash inflow again. Initially cash outflow, end of the project cash inflow. Clear? That's the nature of the working capital. Look at the problem number ten. We'll do one problem. Problem number ten, shall we, ma? The United Petroleum Limited has a retail outlet of petrol, diesel, and petroleum project. presently it has two pumps exclusively for the petrol right one for non lead petrol and one for diesel 
Free air filling is carried out for vehicles buying the fuel from the outlet. The pumps have a useful life of 10 years with no salvage value at the end of the year. The UPL sells petrol and diesel at 23 rupees and 10 rupees per liter respectively. Existing annual sales petrol 5 lakhs liter and diesel 2 lakhs liters and it is earning 4% as commission on sales. Okay, Due to manifold increase in traffic, the existing pumps are not able to meet the demand during peak hours. The UPL is contemplating to installation of the additional pumps for diesel and petrol at a cost of rupees 10 lakhs together and with additional working capital of 5 lakhs. So that is why in step number one, we have taken the cash outflows. Right. So initial investment 10 lakhs, cost of the new pumps and additional working capital 5 lakhs. So the present value of cash outflows 15 lakhs. Step number one completed. Next, the additional sales of petrol and diesel expected to be 2 lakhs and 1 lakhs liters per annum respectively. As a result of the installation of the new pump, the operating cost would increase by 24,000 annually by way of salary of pump operator. Other yearly additional costs or insurance at 1% of the cost of the pump, maintenance cost 12,000 per annum and power cost 13,000 per annum. Okay, these are some additional costs. United Limited Petroleum pays 35% tax on its income. Depreciation will be on straight line basis and the management of UPL seeks your advice on the financial viability of the expansion proposal. Prepare a report for consideration assuming 12% is a required rate of return. Simple sir. Step number one, we have already done outflows and step number two calculation of the present value of operating cash inflows okay now so depreciation per annum while calculating operating cash inflows first you have to find out the depreciation per annum because in cfat calculation depreciation will be there you have to consider depreciation so and as i said the problem set slm method have to be adopted cost minus salvage value divided by life will give you the depreciation cost of the new petrol pump 10 lakhs rupees and salvage value it is given in the problem zero and life of the project 10 years. Life of the petrol pump is 10 years. So depreciation per annum, you'll get more 1 lakh. Depreciation per annum, you'll get 1 lakh. Okay, sir. Next. What is the inflows you are getting? Sir, additional sales, 2 lakhs liters of petrol at 20 rupee, uh, 23 rupees per liter and 1 lakh liters of diesel at 10 rupees per liter. This will be your sales revenue on which you are getting commission of 4 percentage. So commission is your earning here, not the sales amount, sir. Commission is your profits earning here. So two lakh twenty four thousand, your earning commission, right? Out of which you incurring some expenditure like salary of the pump operator, insurance charges, maintenance costs, power costs. After deducting all this, whatever you are getting is called as PBDD, profit before depreciation and taxes. Out of which you deduct the depreciation, which we calculated in the step number one. One lakh the amount depreciation we calculated, then sixty five thousand PBDD, PBD from which deduct the tax at the rate of 35%, you'll get PAT, add back depreciation, you'll get CFAD. From year one to year 10, you are getting a CFAD of 1,42,250. Since you are getting equal cash outflows after tax, cash flows after tax, from year one to you can, year 10, you can simply apply annuity factor. Equal cash inflows throughout the life of the project. Annuity factor apply chain number at 12% 10 years. So then you will get the present value of operating cash inflows, 8,3,713 rupees. Now coming to the terminal cash inflows, what is the salvage value of the new pump? Zero. Gross sale proceeds, zero. What is the return on value of the new pump? Zero. Because cost 10 lakhs and over a period of 10 years, you claimed a depreciation of 10 lakhs, your return on value will be zero. Capital gains, zero. Zero worth of assets sold for zero. So capital gains, zero. Capital gains tax, zero. And net sale proceeds, zero. Okay, now. See, in the case of SLM method, you can directly go with GSP is equal to NSP. Grass sale proceeds is equal to net sale proceeds, which is equal to zero. In the case of SLM method, return on value method, you have to follow the step-to-step -step procedure. Okay, now. Then add back uh, NSP of the asset zero, add back the recovery of working capital, five lakhs, terminal cash inflows, five lakhs. And this five lakhs you're going to get at the end of the 10th year. Okay now. So, but we want present value because we are making decision in present. Multiply with the 10th year present value factor. It is a single amount now. So you have to take the factor, present value factor, not annuity factor. If it is a series of amounts, annuity factor, single amount present value factor. So 10th year present value factor 0 0.322, then you'll get a present value of terminal cash inflows 1,61,000. Now you can find out the NPV, sir. Present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows, operating cash inflows plus terminal cash inflows minus cash outflows. 
you got a negative NPV of 5,35,287. So look at the decision since the NPV is negative, it's not advisable for the UPL to install the new pumps. Okay now, and after the commission of decision making, you have to write the assumptions. Clear? So that's how you need to do the NPV problems, right? So, so far we have completed traditional techniques, ARR and PBP in discounting techniques and PV completed. The next session, I'll start with the remaining discounting techniques. Amma. Okay, now till then, have a good day and good night. Stay home and stay happy, sir. A very good morning, students. Welcome to the FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we started discussion regarding chapter number two, investment decisions. And uh, in that we have completed introduction to investment decisions. And then uh, we started discussion regarding the traditional techniques, also known as non-discounting techniques. They are average rate of return and payback period method, both are completed. And after that, we started discussion regarding the discounting techniques in which we have totally five discounting techniques, net present value method, profitability index method, internal rate of return method, IRR, and then uh, you have terminal value method, and finally, discounted payback period method. Among these five methods in the last class, we have completed about the NPV net present value method. Right, sir. Now time for the next discounting technique that is profitability index. Profitability index method also known as the desirability factor. Also known as the desirability factor. Sir, what is this profitability index method and uh, how to calculate this? First of all, we have the different names for this method. Profitability index method and also known as desirability factor also known as benefit cost ratio and also known as present value index. In the main exam, right, uh, you may be asked to find out the profitability index or you may be asked about the desirability of the factor. You may be asked about the benefit cost ratio or present value index. All of them are one and the same, same mark, clear. Now, a question arises, when there is a need arises for the calculation of profitability index. Sir, in the last class, we have already learned that NPV is the best project evaluation technique. It is the most widely used techniques by the finance managers across the world. And when we already had a best technique, what is the need of learning the other discounting techniques? What is the use of other discounting techniques? You'll get a doubt, right, sir? See, each and every project evaluation technique has its own advantages and disadvantages, merits and demerits, have their own features, right sir? Now, when it comes to the profitability index method, this method generally we will adapt when we are running out of the funds, when we are in scarcity of the funds. Assume that there are three projects in uh, consideration. All the three projects have the positive NPVs, and we know that if a project having a positive NPV, it is acceptable. So all the three projects are acceptable. But unfortunately, we don't have the sufficient investment to make investment into the all the three projects. We don't have the sufficient funds. We don't have sufficient funds. Now in that scenario, first of all, we should find out the profitability index of each and every project and the decision making should be based on the profitability index. The project which is having the highest profitability index should be chosen first. Next to highest should be chosen second. So like that, the decision making goes on. Clear. So when there is a need arises for the calculation of profitability index, when there is a scarcity of the funds. Profitability index should be calculated when there is a scarcity of the funds for investment. Look at this example, funds available, we have only 10 lakhs with us and three projects in consideration, right? So total three projects, uh, project A having the investment requirement, five lakhs, project B, four lakhs and project C, three lakhs, total investment required for investing in all the three projects, 12 lakhs. And you have a positive NPV in all the three projects, right? Sir? So all the three projects are acceptable, but for investment into the, all the three projects, you need the funds of 12 lakhs, whereas you have only 10 lakhs. So there is a scarcity of the funds, two lakhs. So that means 
among these three projects, you are uh, able to invest only in two projects, not all the three projects. Then a question arises, which two projects should I choose? Whether it is project A and B or B and C or A and C. Now for that purposes, we should find out the profitability index. What is the formula, sir? Very simple formula, sir. We know the formula for the calculation of NPV. What is the formula, sir? Present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. This is a formula for the NPV. Now for the profitability index, very simple, sir. Present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows. That is a formula for the profitability index. So if you subtract, you will get NPV. If you divide, you will get profitability index as simple as it. When present value of cash inflows subtracted from the present value of cash outflows, what are you getting? You are getting NPV. When present value of cash outflows, uh, cash inflows divided with present value of cash outflows, you are getting what? You are getting profitability index. Are you following or not every one of you? Right, sir. Now, find out the profitability index for all the three pro uh, proposals, right? So, present value of cash inflows for project A, 8 lakhs divided by present value of cash outflows, 5 lakhs. So, profitability index, one uh, 1.6. Then for project B, 1.7 and project C, 1.73. For project C, 1.73. Are you following or not, every one of you? Now, in this scenario, observe, sir. What this 1.6, 1.7 and 1.73 indicates, it indicates about for every rupee of investment, we are getting one rupee 65 cash inflows. For every one rupee of investment, we are getting one rupee 65 cash inflows. So if you invest one rupee, ma, you will get one rupee 65 cash inflows. So that means for every rupee of the investment, you are getting an NPV of 65. So profitability index explains about NPV for every rupee invested. See, generally we are having enough funds for the investment. Suppose that for all the three projects, the funds require 12 lakhs. We have 20 lakhs with us. Now in that scenario, you simply go and invest in all the three projects because all the three projects are having positive NPVs. There is no need to calculate profitability index. No need to calculate profitability index. No need to uh, go analysis of every rupee invested. What is NPV I'm getting? There is no need. Are you following, sir? When you have the sufficient funds with you, there is no need of uh, looking into the uh, what is the NPV I'm getting for every rupee invested. But when there are scarcity of the funds, you have to be reinvest each and every rupee very carefully. Yes or no? So when we have sufficient funds with us for doing any expenditure, for meeting any expenditure, we don't think twice. We don't think twice. We'll simply expand expenditure like that. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. When you have sufficient funds with you, yes, I have the funds. But when you are in scarcity of the funds, for every expenditure, you have to Think twice and thrice because you are not having enough money with you. Before COVID, the people are, uh, you know, uh, used to spend the money like anything, like water, right? They throw the money like anything for purchase of anything. But after COVID, the situation got changed. Now the people are thinking twice. Should it be required to us or not? Should I purchase it or not? Right? Do I need to incur this much of money for this? Is there any requirement? Is there any need? So they are thinking twice, thrice after COVID because COVID hits like us anything. There are many people financially we can like anything. Right, sir. So profitability index importance comes to the picture only when the company facing scarcity of the funds problem. Whenever you are in scarcity of the funds, you have to invest each and every rupee very carefully. Clear now, every one of you. Next. So the decision making rule here, you can see when it comes to the single projects, if profitability index is greater than one, accept the project. What do you mean by greater than one? So if profitability index is greater than one means your present value of cash inflows are greater than present value of cash outflows. 
when your numerator is greater than denominator then only you have a resulting value the positive resulting value right so your cash inflows are greater than cash outflows means you have a positive npv accept the project but whereas if your profitability index is less than 1 means your present value of cash inflows lesser than present value of cash outflows which results into a negative npv negative npv reject the project if your present value of cash inflows greater than present value of cash outflows which results into a positive npv accept the project when present value of cash inflows is equal to zero sorry profitability index is equal to zero means your present value of cash inflows are exactly equal to present value of cash outflows right sir so you may accept the project you may reject the project it's up to you sir because your cash inflows are exactly equal to cash outflows clear next when it comes to the multiple projects if the nature is mutually exclusive accept the project with the highest profitability index in the given example in this example suppose that if these projects are mutually exclusive means only one project should be selected which project will you select sir i will go with project c i will go with the project c as it is having the highest profitability index okay now next in the case of mutually independent projects accept all those projects where the profitable index is index is greater than 1 select all those projects whose profitable index is greater than 1 clear this is how you need to make the decision making under the profitability index clear next so that's all about the profitable index sir. now here comes yet another very important topic from this chapter internal rate of return irr internal rate of return here it is so internal rate of return it is an advanced version of irr advanced version of irr average rate of return so the difference is between the irr and irr is irr calculated based on the accounting profits if you remember the formula for the calculation of irr average profit of the tax divided by the average investment into 100 yes or no so average rate of return also known as accounting rate of return why we are calling it as accounting rate of return because it is calculated based upon the accounting profits whereas irr based uh, calculated based on the cash profits fm profit c fact cash flows after tax that is the first major difference between irr and irr next while calculating the arr we ignores the time value of money principles we ignore the time and your uh, time value of money principles and also we considers depreciation but whereas when it comes to the irr we will consider the time value of money principles we need to bring all the cash inflows and our cash outflows into the present values then only we can make the calculations different years cash flows we should not be directly added subtracted division multiplied we cannot compare even so first we need to bring them all of them into the present values then only we can calculate compare and we can do anything so while calculating irr we will consider the time value of money principles and we ignore the depreciation even though we calculating the cfad like you might have remembered that format pbdt minus depreciation pbt minus tax pat add back depreciation so even though we are deducting initially depreciation but later part of time we are adding back so the impact will be zero and why we are doing like this once we are deducting and after that we are adding back the reason is being we are claiming the tax benefit on depreciation that's it so that means we are technically speaking we are ignoring depreciation we just considering only the tax benefit on depreciation that's it yes or no every one of you next it ignores the opportunity cost while calculating arr we ignores the opportunity cost element but while calculating irr we also considers the opportunity cost element so these are the differences between arr and irr whatever the drawbacks are there in arr all the drawbacks were overcome in irr so by overcoming all the drawbacks in arr a new technique a new technique has been developed and that new technique is called irr 
the concept is same the theme is same arr and irr theme is same but only thing is that under arr there are so many drawbacks under arr all the drawbacks were eliminated overcome clear sir irr is the maximum rate of return one can expect from the given project it is a maximum rate of return we can expect from a given project irr is equal to 15% it is a maximum cost you can bear see irr we can understand in two different ways from return point of view and as well as from cost point of view see whenever you are considering a particular project let us say there is a project x where the investment required 10 lakhs now when you are considering this project should i accept this or should i reject this when you are considering this project first you should find out the irr from this project how much irr i am going to get from this particular project are you following sir why we need to calculate the irr because suppose that for this 10 lakhs you have many options like you can raise the funds by issuing the equity shares by issuing the preference shares by issuing the debentures by bank loan by loan from relatives and friends you have multiple option for the procurement of the funds are you following sir suppose that when you are going for the equity capital option the cost of equity is 20 percentage when you are going for the preference share capital option the cost of preference share 16 percentage when you are going for the debentures option the cost of debentures is 14 percentage you have the different cost elements first of all you need to find out the irr from the project so as to know that whether my irr is covering all these costs or not without knowing irr suppose that you opted for equity share capital option by issuing the equity shares you raised uh, you raised the funds of 10 lakhs you procured the funds of 10 lakhs are you following sir now with that 10 lakhs you made investment into this particular project and after that you got to know that you are getting only 12% rate of return from this project right sir but what is the cost you have incurred for this project you have incurred a cost of 20 percentage but end of the day you are getting a return of 12% only so means this project is not viable not suitable to you you shouldn't have made investment into this project yes or no right but you already made investment this is an investment decision which involves the huge amount of investment of your business which is which is having a long term impact these decisions are irreversible you cannot take in back your decision man so you have to face that losses for a longer period at one point of time you are always in a danger of shutting down your business so that's why without knowing the return element from a project you should not accept the project first find out the return which you are going to get from that particular project when you know that i am going to get only 12% rate of return from this particular project you shouldn't have opt for these options none of these options should be exercised for the procurement of the funds you might look for another option which having a cost of less than or equal to 12 percentage suppose that one of your friend came out and your friend is ready to give you a loan and he is charging just a rate of interest of 10 percentage yes this option is viable to you because you are incurring a cost of 10 percentage whereas the project is giving you 12 percent rate of return yes now this project is viable to you are you following or not so that is why everyone first should find out the irr then only you have to make a decision whether this project is viable to us or not after finding out of the irr you need to compare that irr with the cost of capital if your irr and the project return is greater than cost of capital yes accept the project if your irr is less than cost of capital reject if your irr is equal to cost of capital you may accept the project or you may reject the project every one of you following now right sir next so that is why it is a maximum rate of return one can expect from a given project and it's the maximum cost you can bear suppose when you know that your irr from the project is equal to 12 percentage and when you are looking for the procurement of the funds you have multiple options available you have multiple options available which option will you choose generally the option which is having the cost less than or equal to 12% so you can set to your suppliers of the funds 
you can say to your lenders dear lenders i can bear a maximum cost of 12 percentage only because my project is giving me only 12 percent rate of return so that's why irr can be discussed in both ways number one it is a maximum rate of return one can expect number two it is a maximum cost you can bear for the project clear so that is why at irr npv is equal to zero npv is equal to zero are you following sir right at irr rate of return your npv is equal to zero it is a rate of return which equates your present value of cash inflows is equal to present value of cash outflows which equates equals present value of cash inflows is equal to present value of cash outflows every one of you following now next for the calculation of irr you have a different uh, scenario summa and first of all before going to that you can see the other names of irr in the main exam you may be asked to find out yield on investment what do you mean by yield on investment nothing but irr you may be asked to find out the marginal efficiency of capital nothing but irr you may be asked about the rate of return over cost what is rate of return over cost nothing but irr time adjusted rate of internal return irr productivity of the capital marginal rate of return all these are the other names of irr okay now now different scenarios for the calculation of irr first one for an investment with a single cash flow means look at here you made an initial investment of 20000 and uh, after 2 years you are going to withdraw an amount of 25992 so in y0 you made an investment of 20000 rupees at the end of year 2 you are going to get an amount of 25992 now you know the present value you know the future value you know the number of years as well 2 years what is missing amma rate of interest rate of interest missing right sir these kind of models we have done in the first chapter itself time value of money right sir now either here you can apply future value of single amount formula or you can apply present value of single amount formula whereby you can find out the r rate of interest clear that's first scenario second scenario single cash outflow with multiple equal cash inflows means here in y0 you made an investment of 10 lakhs and your cash inflows are like this year one two lakh fifty thousand year two two lakh fifty thousand year three two lakh fifty thousand so on up to year six every year you have a equal cash inflows so you know the present value 10 lakhs rupees you know the periodical payments this is present value of annuity because there is a series of payments which are occurring at the regular intervals in equal amounts. So you know the present value of annuity, you know the periodical payments, you know the term of annuity as well. How much amount? Six years. What is missing, sir? Rate of interest. So apply the present value of annuity formula and find out the rate of interest. This model also we have done in the first chapter. Okay. Scenario four. Before scenario three, first I have discussed here scenario four because scenario four is the present value of perpetuity. Single cash outflow with multiple uniform cash inflows for infinite period means you made an investment of one lakh in year zero. Sorry, ten lakhs in year zero. You made a deposit of or investment of right ten lakhs in year zero, and from year one till year infinity you are getting a cash inflow of 1 lakh every year. Right, sir. Present value of perpetuity. You know the present value of perpetuity. You know the annual cash inflows. We know the formula that present value of perpetuity is equal to annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest. Yes or no? Present value of perpetuity is equal to annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest just a second sir annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest now rate of interest is this question number rate of interest is equal to annual cash inflows divided by present value of perpetuity yes or no so that's the formula we have used here annual cash inflow 1 lakh and present value perpetuity 10 lakh so the rate of interest 10 percentage 
that's scenario 4 now coming to the scenario 3 single cash outflow with multiple cash inflows not in uniform over its life right sir so means like example in year 0 you made an investment of 10 lakhs and your cash inflows like year 1 2 lakhs year 2 3 lakhs year 3 4 lakhs so you can see here there is no uniform cash inflows every year there is a change in the cash inflow like some year 4 250000 year 5 some 220000 uneven cash flows throughout the life of the project uneven cash flows now in that scenario for the calculation of irr you have two methods available number one trial and error method number two interpolation technique trial and error method and number two interpolation technique how to find out when it comes to the trial and error method trial and error method step 1 calculate the npv at a guess rate first for the given cash inflows find out the npv at a guess rate take any guess rate like 10% 12% 15% any guess rate calculate the npv if npv is positive increase that guess rate when your npv is positive increase the guess rate and find out npv again if your npv is negative decrease the guess rate and find out the npv again suppose that at 12% guess rate you have a positive npv of 10000 you have positive npv so you need to increase the guess rate means you need to find out the npv either at 14% or 15% suppose that you find out the npv at 16% you got a negative npv of 2000 you got a negative npv of 2000 so means you need to decrease the guess rate let us find out that at 15% you got npv is equal to 0 so now your irr is equal to 10 percentage so this is how one has to find out the irr by using the trial and error approach right this process continue until npv is equal to 0 the discounting rate at npv at which npv becomes zero that is your irr so under trial and error method first we have to calculate the npv at a given guess rate a particular guess rate a guess rate entirely that's depends upon your choice mid 10% to start chestara 15% to start chestara your choice are you following sir every one of you right next answer second guess rate how to take the second guess rate suppose sir at 10% you started you got a positive npv of 10 lakhs so when you have a positive npv you need to increase the guess rate now immediately don't calculate the npv at 11% because see the guess rate at which npv is equal to 0 is your irr so your npv should become 0 and your npv should be reduced by 10 lakhs right if you increase the guess rate by just 1 percentage your npv should not be reduced by 10 lakhs in order to reduce the 10 lakhs you have to go for a long jump means the second guess rate should be at 20 percentage 11 percent 12 percent 13 percent no there is a huge amount to be reduced inga 10 lakhs taggalamma npv zero avali ante 10 lakhs taggali 10 lakhs needs to be reduced in order to make your npv zero so you have to take a long jump for the second guess rate are you following or not every one of you so so wisely you have to select the guess rate and the process continues until your npv becomes zero the guess rate at which your npv becomes zero that is your irr clear so trial and error gives the most accurate answer but lengthy process and lot of calculations involved okay now coming to the interpolation technique coming to the interpolation technique the process is step number 1 calculate the npv at the two guess rates higher guess rate and lower guess rate are you following sir higher guess rate say 10 percentage sorry 15 percentage fifteen percentage lower guess rate ten percentage right sir and while selecting this higher rate and lower rate there are two principles to be satisfied number one at one guess rate the npv should be positive at the other guess rate npv should be negative npv should be negative 
are you following sir every one of you at one guess rate npv should be positive at the other guess rate npv should be negative next the gap between these two rates should be as low as possible so means it must be some 10% to 11% like the 10% to 12% so you have to make sure that the gap between the two guess rates is as low as possible if you are satisfying these two principles at the two guess rates ma then you will get most accurate answer so at one guess rate your npv should be positive at the other guess rate npv should be negative and the gap between these two guess rates should be as low as possible clear now after finding out the npv at the two guess rate now apply this formula interpolation technique we have a formula l1 plus npv at l1 divided by npv at l1 minus npv at l2 into l2 minus l1 l1 is a lower guess rate and l2 is a higher guess rate okay the interpolation technique which gives you the most accurate most approximate sorry ma most approximate irr it is involving a simple process less calculations clear ma in the main examination like generally the students follow and we also such as interpolation technique only because trial and error method takes a lot of time which involves a lot of calculations but whereas under interpolation technique ma simply find out npv at the two guess rates and after that apply the formula find out the irr that's it even the icai is also suggesting interpolation technique for the finding out of the irr clear next after that irr decision making techniques ma you can see here in the case of single projects i have already discussed if irr is greater than cost of capital accept less than cost of capital reject is equal to cost of capital may accept or may reject in the case of multiple projects mutually exclusive means only one project should be selected select the project with the highest irr in the case of mutual independent we can select more than one project so select all those projects whose irr is greater than cost of capital clear ma every one of you okay now now in the irr also you have some assumptions just like you have the assumptions in uh, npv the assumptions will be right the first assumption all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be certain certain cash flows certain cash flows number 2 all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be occurred at the end of the every year and number 3 all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be reinvest assumed to be reinvest at irr rate of return so generally in npv ma if you remember under npv we also learned three assumptions the first two assumptions are same that is certain cash inflows and number two all the cash flows are assumed to be occurred at the end of the every year and number three all the cash inflows are assumed to be reinvest at cost of capital rates so this is the difference between irr assumptions and npv assumptions under irr all the cash inflows are assumed to be reinvested at irr rate of return whereas when it comes to the npv all the cash inflows are assumed to be reinvested at cost of capital rate clear very good ma so with that irr completed sir just go through it once and ask the doubt if any sir completed sir now let's moving on to the next model payback period reciprocal now what is this concept of payback period reciprocal very simple concept ma 
payback period reciprocal is nothing but the reciprocal of the payback period the reversal of the payback period reciprocal so the formula you can see here payback period reciprocal is equal to 1 divided by payback period into 100 1 divided by payback period into 100 so reciprocal payback period is equal to 1 divided by payback period we know the payback period formula what is it ma initial investment divided by annual cash inflows but annual cash inflows take to the numerator so the payback period reciprocal is equal to annual cash inflows divided by initial investment reversal ma clear so generally why are we calculating this payback period reciprocal simple answer sir we are calculating the payback period reciprocal only with a view to uh, estimating the irr it is a rough estimation of irr sir payback period reciprocal is a rough estimation of irr right sir see while calculating irr for a given project for a rough estimation you can go ahead with the payback period reciprocal right so you can see if a particular company's payback period is five years the payback period reciprocal is equal to one divided by five means 0.2 or 20 percent you can say from this project roughly we can get an irr of 20 percentage right but of course we cannot use this irr as a decision making technique here whatever the irr you find out by using the payback period reciprocal is not an accurate an irr it is just a rough estimation but of course while calculating the irr by using payback period reciprocal method first of all there are two conditions to be satisfied number one there must be equal cash inflows throughout the life of the project number two the life of the project must be at least twice the payback period twice the payback period like in this case we have said the payback period is five years now in this case the life of the project must be 10 years suppose that the life of the project is six years and you find out the payback period which comes out to be four years now in this case payback period reciprocal is equal to one divided by payback period means one divided by four that is equal to 25 percent so irr for this project 25 percent no because the second condition was not satisfied here. The life of the project must be at least twice the payback period. What is your payback period? Four years. Twice the payback period means eight years. So the life must be eight years in this case. Then only you can say this 25% is a rough estimation of IRR. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Next. That's the payback period reciprocal, sir. And after that, discounted payback period method next model sir discounting payback period method of course in discounting techniques as you all know that totally five techniques are there first one npv discussion completed then irr discussion completed then profitability index discussion completed then terminal value method discussion not yet completed and finally discounted payback period method now we are going to discuss so then what about this terminal value method sir? this terminal value method i'm going to discuss in the advanced concepts in investment decisions i've already told you that this investment decision chapter divided into three parts this is the first part we are learning basics second part advanced concepts in investment decisions and third part risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions okay ma so among the five discounting techniques four discounting techniques i'm going to discuss here the last discounting technique terminal value method i will discuss in the advanced concepts in investment decisions every one of you following now okay ma now coming to the discounted payback period method now what is this concept all about very simple concept sir we already know the traditional payback period method right sir we have seen that when there is uniform cash inflows throughout the life of the project, there is a formula we have learned initial investment divided by annual cash inflows. When there are uneven cash flows, then you have to find out the accumulated cash inflows. Then after that, you need to apply a formula. Kurtunda, year up to which the accumulated cash inflows, the accumulated cash inflows lower than the initial investment plus unrecorded investment divided by the cash flows, uh, cash inflows for the next year. Yes or no? But the major drawback under the traditional payback period method is it ignores time value of money principles. We simply add, accumulate the different years cash inflows directly. Yes or no? Like that, 
sir year one your cash in close sorry sir your cash in close let us say year one 1 lakh year 2 1.5 lakh year 3 2 lakh year 4 2.5 lakh you have the cash in close like this right sir in accumulative cash in close what are you going to do 1 lakh 2.5 lakh 4.5 lakh 7 lakh so you are simply adding sir you are simply adding so different years cash flows you are simply adding but as per the golden principles of the time value of money we know that very well right the worth of 1 rupee today is not equal to the worth of 1 rupee tomorrow you cannot simply add the different years cash flows directly right sir but whereas in payback period method we simply added them we ignore the time value of money principles but under discounted payback period method we will consider the time value of money principle and that means first we will discount this cash in close amount what are the different years cash in close are there these different years cash in close discounted first let us say the cost of capital given in the problem 10% so we will take the present value factors at 10 percentage so 0.909 0.826, 0 0.751, 0 0.683. Then we'll find out the present value of cash inflows. Now this present value of cash inflows will be cumulated. After the present value of cash inflows, next cumulate to present value of cash inflows. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. So discounted cash flows will be cumulated. And after cumulating, apply this formula for the finding out the. Discounted payback period method year up to which the present value of cumulative cash inflows are lower than initial investment plus unrecorded investment divided by present value of cash flow after tax for the next year. So the major difference between the traditional payback period method and discounted payback period method is under traditional payback period method we ignore time value of money principles. We will simply added the different years cash flows directly. But under discounted payback period method, we will consider the time value of money principles. Only the discounted cash flows will be accumulated. Clear. Next. After that, you have one more topic called capital rationing. The last topic of the chapter: capital rationing. Now, what is this concept of capital rationing? Look at here. Capital rationing concept we will apply only when there is a scarcity of the funds, right, sir? Sir, when we have scarcity of the funds, we all know that the decision making should be based on profitability index method, yes or no? Right. So when you have sufficient funds, go ahead with the NPV. Right. Select the projects which are suggested by the NPV. But when you are in scarcity of the funds. Go ahead with the profitability index. The projects which are suggested by the profitability index should be selected. Okay, now sir, right? Next. So when it comes to the multiple projects, especially and mutually independent projects, mainly, see mutually exclusive only one project should be selected. So the project which is having the highest profitability index, directly we will select. No problem at all. But when it comes to the multiple projects. Which are mutually independent, where we can we can select more than one project, where we can select more than one project. Now there arises a question: which project should be selected? Right? Which are the projects should be selected? More than one project together. Suppose that there are four projects: project one, project two, project three, and project four. All the four projects having positive NPV. All the four projects having positive NPV, so means all the four projects can be selected. But for making investment into all the four projects, you want fifty lakhs funds, but you have only forty lakhs funds. You're running out of the funds. You have only forty lakhs. Means among these four projects, only three can be selected. Only three can be selected. Now you will get it out. Which three projects should be selected? Right, sir. Now, in that scenario, you have to go for the capital rationing. The project selection should be based on the capital rationing. Okay, now, now what is the process of capital rationing? Step one: calculate the profitability index for all the projects. First, find out 
the profitability index for all the given projects and step two assign the ranks based on the profitability index assign the ranks to the projects assign the ranks to the projects basing upon the profitability index how sir sir the profitable uh, the project which is having the highest profitability index should be given first rank the project having the next highest profitability index should be given the second rank like that you can go ahead let me give you an example yeah look at here sir there are totally five projects in proposal five projects one second sir so that totally there are five projects in consideration now look at here sir uh, the funds required for all these five projects you can see 7 9 14 16 17 22 lakhs at the funds required sir 22 lakhs now you can see i have given the uh, yeah funds required for investing on in all the projects 22 lakhs and funds available for the investment just 20 lakhs so from the above calculation it is clearly evidencing that the stress tolerance limited is in scarcity of the funds therefore the discussion as to which project should be selected based upon the capital rationing so all the five projects you can see that all the five projects have the positive npvs so all the five projects are acceptable but we don't have enough funds to make investment into all the five projects so means here we have to select only four projects or three projects so which four projects which three projects should be selected that should be based on your your capital rationing so in the step number 1 we have to find out the profitability index yes we did that profitability index and in step number 2 we need to assign the ranks to the projects basing upon the profitability index you can see here project e having the highest profitability index 1.82 so given the first rank then project b next highest 1.64 second rank project d next highest 1.5 third rank like that you need to assign the ranks and after assigning the ranks then you have to make the decision making which projects or projects should be selected so the selection of the projects based upon the rankings look at here in this concept sir you have uh, one more uh, concept like the projects in nature types of the projects divisible projects and indivisible projects divisible project means part investment also allowed ante eh? if you are not having enough funds to invest in a particular project suppose that after investing project a c and d in a c d you made a full investment only project b is left over where the funds are required let us say 5 lakhs rupees but you left with only a fund of rupees 2 lakhs so you don't have sufficient funds to make investment in project b you have only 2 lakhs no problem this 2 lakhs you can invest part investment is allowed 2 lakhs you can invest and proportionate npv will be allowed see if you made an investment of 5 lakhs let us say your npv is say 3 lakhs so for 5 lakhs investment you are going to get an npv of 3 lakhs but for 5 uh, 2 lakhs investment what will be the proportionate npv calculate cheyandi amma 2 lakhs into 3 lakhs divided by 5 lakhs so you will get ma 1.2 lakhs so proportionate npv will be allowed to you are you following sir every one of you right this is the nature of divisible projects when it comes to the indivisible project part investment is not allowed if you have enough funds come and invest otherwise get lost okay now so in this case only project a c d can be selected b no not possible because you don't have the sufficient funds right sir so like this divisible projects and indivisible projects here look at ma first in divisible projects the projects nature have taken divisible projects so when it comes to the divisible project you have to go with the rankings first rank goes to who first rank goes to project e so the investment first should be made in project e investment required 5 lakh 50000 and after investing 5 lakh 50000 the surplus investment available 14 lakh 50000 npv 4 lakh 50000 you are getting an npv from project e how much amma from project e you are getting an npv of 4 lakh 50000 for the investment of 5 lakh 50000 clear next goes to the project b second rank 
then third rank project, then fourth rank project. Now, after making investment in these four projects, you have a surplus funds of three lakhs. You have a surplus funds of three lakhs. But when it comes to project C, what is the funds required? Amma? Five lakhs. You have left with only three lakhs. You have left with only three lakhs. Only that three lakhs can be invested. And proportionate in uh, NPV, you will get. For the investment of five lakhs, two lakhs will be NPV. For the investment of three lakhs, how much? The proportionate NPV, you will get more. Are you following or not? This is the way of making decision making under the capital rationing when it comes to divisible project. When it comes to indivisible projects, you have to invest in the projects uh, lump sum. All right, you need to select more than one project at a time in a lump sum manner. So you can see here, I've selected project A, B, C, E, where the investment required 20 lakhs, supply investment zero, I'm getting NPV of 11 lakh 10,000. You can try the different permutations and combinations. And while you're trying the term permutations and combinations, you have to make sure that your entire investment is to be used. Right, sir. So here I've used our entire investment, 20 lakhs. There is no investment left with. That is why I'm getting the highest NPV, 11 lakh 10,000. I have one more option, ACDE. But whereas my funds involving is only 19 lakh 50,000, I left with a surplus investment of 50,000. That's why my NPV is just 10 lakh 50,000 only. Clear now? Like this, you need to try for some different combinations. And while trying the different combinations, make sure that your entire investment is used. Then only you will get the highest NPV. Clear? So that's why you need to make the decisions with respect to indivisible projects. Clear? So that's about the capital rationing concept. So with that, we have completed all the theory topics of this chapter. Okay, Nase? Right. So see you in the next class here. Just uh, so in the next class, I'm going to start with the cost of capital chapter marathon. Okay, ma. So yet another important chapter, cost of capital, capital structure. These two chapters, from these two chapters, we can expect at least one question, sir. One problem compulsory for eight marks. The next two chapters, cost of capital and capital structure. Okay, ma. So. See you in the next class here. Till then, have a good day and good night. Stay home and stay safe. A very good morning, students. Welcome to the FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we have completed discussion regarding chapter number two, investment decisions. Right, Ma? Now, time for the chapter number three, cost of capital. <clears throat> cost of capital. Now, what is cost of capital and what are we going to learn from this chapter? So the weightage of the chapter, we can expect one question from this chapter for eight marks. And these are the different models uh, from this chapter. Cost of debentures, KD. Cost of reference shares, KP. Cost of equity shares, KE. Cost of retained earnings, KR. And weighted average cost of capital, WACC, denoted with KO overall cost of capital. These are the different models we are going to learn from this particular chapter. Now, what is cost of capital? <clears throat> it's nothing but the cost associated with source of capital. See, what, for the procurement of the funds, for the procurement of the funds, you will be having different options now. Like you will be having the options of uh, procuring the funds by issuing the equity shares, Procuring the funds by issuing the preference shares, procuring the funds by issuing the debentures or bonds, procuring the funds through loans from the banks, relatives, friends, right? Sir? So like this, you have different options. For every option, you have a cost element. For every option you're selecting for the procurement of the funds, you have a cost element. Like for equity shares, cost of equity means dividends plus appreciation in the market price. I've already mentioned here, dividends plus appreciation in the market price. Preference shares, preference dividend is a cost. Debentures, debentures interest is a cost. Loans, interest on loans is a cost. So for every source you are selecting for the procurement of the funds, there is a cost element associated with it. And this is what we call cost of capital. 
this is what we call cost of capital the cost associated with each source of capital every one of you following now now the same is called as the same is called as investors expected rate of return see from one person point of view it is a cost from the other person point of view it is a return yes or no from one person it is a cost from the other person point of view it is a return from company point of view it is a cost from investor point of view it is a return right so, so from investor point of view it is the expected rate of return from ace investment so when a equity shareholder investing into the equity shares of a company for company the cost of equity is a cost element and from the same from the investor point of view it is a return from his point of view right sir look at here sir <clears throat> example that you have a funds of rupees 10 lakhs with you now you would like to make a fixed deposit you would like to make a fixed deposit you you have chosen two options fixed deposits into sbi and fixed deposits into hdfc right one is a government bank the other one is a private bank now coming to the sbi sbi offering you six percent rate of interest on fixed deposits and the fd into sbi is a risk-free investment because it is a government bank even in future if that bank is unable to pay you the interest or unable to pay you the principal government will come forward and government will take the responsibility to pay you but whereas the investment into hdfc is a risky investment because hdfc is a private bank even though it is a number one private bank for the for the time being it stood in the number one rank the private banks list but when it comes to the private banking sector always the investment in private banks is always a link up with the risk element because today hdfc is in the first position tomorrow it won't be earlier ic is a bank in the first place now it is in some top three or top four or top five five sir so top one position is not permanent to anyone when it comes to private industry clear so always a risk element is involving if in future if hdfc made any default in the payment of interest or principal to you whether the government will take responsibility no the government won't take responsibility because it is a private bank yes or no right sir now when sbi and hdfc offering you the same rate of interest which option will you choose obviously we'll choose sbi only obviously we'll choose sbi only because it is a risk-free investment but how come the hdfc will attract the depositors account holders hdfc will attract the account holders by offering more rate of interest suppose that if hdfc is now providing 10 percent per annum interest on fixed deposits now definitely some of the account holders will turn to hdfc sir hdfc a risky investment yes but the returns is higher no see whenever you are ready to take the high element of risk you can expect high amount of returns you can expect high amount of returns when you are taking only low amount of risk then you should expect low amount of returns only you should expect low amount of returns only so whenever you are making investments to risk-free investments the returns are lower whenever you are opting for risky investments then only you can expect higher returns you can expect higher returns but guarantee there is no guarantee that you will get higher returns see by taking the higher element of risk there is no guaranteed higher returns but the only thing you can expect higher returns if you get them very happy are you following or not see investment into the real estate sector is a high risky investment because the returns also higher but we don't know that when the real estate will have the boom and when the real estate will have down investments into the stock markets also a high risky element right thereby you can expect high amount of returns but we don't know how the stock markets behaves yes or no right how the stocks behaves so whenever you are choosing for risky elements you will get higher returns but there is no guarantee you can expect higher returns clear sir so when hdfc offering 10 percent rate of interest at least 50 percent of the investors will turn towards hdfc out of this 10 percent six percent we can say risk-free rate of investment risk-free rate of return 
because any half six percent is offered by the SBI risk free rate of in uh, return, right? And the additional four percent offered by the HDFC is now what we call a risk premium RM risk premium. Risk premium is nothing but the additional return expected by the investor for accepting the additional risk. So whatever the additional risk is accepting for additional risk, he will expect some additional returns and that additional returns is what we call risk premium. Everyone following now. So from the above discussion, we can conclude that investors expected rate of return is equal to risk free rate of interest plus risk premium clear so the same will become the cost of capital from company point of view whatever we are discussing investors expected rate of return from investor point of view the same will become the cost from company point of view cost of capital then a question arises so why should we calculate cost of capital what is the need of calculating cost of capital mainly two reasons number one for the calculation of npv for the calculation of npv cost of capital is must Without knowing the cost of capital, you cannot calculate NPV, sir. Yes or no? You can see in every NPV problem, every NPV problem, you have cost of capital information. Let me take you there. So NPV started from here, net present value. And you can see in every problem, you can see. The company's cost of capital is 10 percentage. Now here, the cost of capital of ABC Limited is 12 percentage in problem number eight. Problem number nine, uh, yeah. The cost of raising the additional capital is 12 percentage. Problem number 10 now. Problem number 10 now. Assuming 12 percent required rate of return. From investor point of view, rate of return, the same becomes cost from company point of view. Problem number 11. Problem number 11, uh, somewhere it must have been provided. Uh, actually here, what happens? The present value of future cash inflows directly given in the problem. Hence, the cost of capital information is not given. Generally, with the help of the cost of capital only, we will calculate the present values of all future cash inflows. So already present value of future cash flows are provided directly in the problem itself. That is why cost of capital information is not given in the problem number 11. Now look at the problem number 12 considers 12% to be an appropriate after tax cost of capital, 12 percentage. Problem number 13, 13, uh, where it is, where it is cost of capital, 12 percentage. Clear, sir, every one of you. So for the finding out of the NPV, cost of capital information is must, right, sir? Right. For evaluation of the investment proposals, cost of capital is a must ingredient. Number two, for making decisions by using IRR. IRR even in the case of ERR also. If you remember the decision making rule under ERR and IRR, ERR and IRR should be compared with the cost of capital. And after that, we have to make a decision. So without knowing the cost of capital, you cannot make the decisions under IRR. So these are the two main reasons why we are calculating the cost of capital clear. And as we see the models already, the first model cost of debentures, cost of debentures, sir, for the debentures word, there is a prefix already, always there is a prefix. Like whenever you're observing the debentures word, you observe a prefix, 10% debentures, 12% debentures, 15% debentures like this clear. Whatever the prefix providing here, this prefix is a coupon rate of interest. It is not the cost element. It is just coupon rate of interest. The rate of interest offered by the company on such debentures. Coupon rate of interest. Now cost of debentures is equal to coupon rate of interest for which we need to make certain adjustments plus or minus some adjustments we have to make. Thereby you will get the cost of debentures. What kind of adjustment? Look at the first one. Debentures are issued at par but redeemed at premium. You should at 100 rupees, but at the time of repayment, you are paying 120 rupees. So there is a loss to you. So whereby your cost of debentures increases. Next, debentures are issued at discount, redeemed at par, issued at uh, 90 rupees, but you are redeeming at 100 rupees. So at the time of issue, you received only 90 rupees from the investor, but at the time of repayment, you are paying 100 rupees to the investor. You are paying. 100 rupees to the investor. So here also 
the cost of debentures increases it's a loss to you the cost of debentures increases next debentures are issued at premium redeemed at par issued at 110 rupees so you collected 110 rupees from the investor but at the time of repayment you are paying only 100 so whereby your cost of debentures decreases tax savings on interest debentures interest is a tax deductible expenditure it is a charge against to profits you can debit the interest to the profit and loss account whereby your profits will gets reduced whereby your tax liability will gets reduced tax benefits on interest so by adjusting this tax benefit your cost of debentures will gets reduced flotation cost flotation cost are nothing but issue expenses right whatever the expenses we have incurred in relation to the issue of debentures in relation to the issue of debentures they are called as a flotation cost right sir so debentures assume that you have issued 50 lakhs worth of debentures you have incurred flotation cost of 2 lakhs so net sale proceeds you can take only 48 lakhs though you have issued 50 lakhs worth of debentures ultimately you received only 48 lakhs so it's a loss to you whereby your cost of debentures increases so like this we need to make some adjustments to the coupon rate of interest thereby you will get a ma cost of debentures clear so here the debentures are mainly into two types irredeemable debentures redeemable debentures and when it comes to redeemable debentures again two sub categories redeemable at once redeemable in installments okay first one cost of irredeemable debentures means these debentures are not going to be redeemed during the lifetime of that company during the lifetime of that particular debenture these are irredeemable non repayable clear so pre tax cost of debentures before the tax element if tax rate is not provided then you have to find out the ki the formula will be interest divided by net sale proceeds interest divided by net sale proceeds this formula we have derived from the concept of present value of perpetuity present value of perpetuity do you remember the formula present value of perpetuity is equal to present value of perpetuity is equal to annual cash inflows annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest now if you find out the rate of interest the formula will be annual cash inflows divided by present value of perpetuity yes sir no this formula already we have learned in the first chapter so here we are finding the rate of interest so nothing but cost of debentures is equal to annual cash inflows what is the cash inflow to investor interest interest divided by present value of perpetuity how much is investing in lump sum net sale proceeds right sir so this formula is derived by using the concept of the present value of perpetuity perpetuity means what forever unlimited yes or no here also this is irredeemable debentures once you made investment into this irredeemable debentures you are going to get the interest forever for infinite period you are going to get interest clear now next post tax cost of debentures if tax rate is provided if tax rate is provided then from the interest element deduct the tax element then you will get the post tax cost of debentures kd i into 1 minus tax rate divided by nsp net sale proceeds the other formula is cost of post tax cost of debentures is equal to ki into 1 minus tax rate in this formula also you can find out okay now so t stands for tax rate nsp is called to net sale proceeds nothing but issue price minus flotation cost issue price minus flotation cost clear sir so that's about the cost of debentures right you can see one example here debentures worth 10 lakhs issued coupon rate of interest 10 percentage the interest per annum becomes how much amma 1 lakh and when you ask to find out the ki means pre tax cost of debentures what is the formula interest divided by net sale proceeds interest per annum 1 lakh divided by net sale proceeds 10 lakhs so ki is equal to 10 percentage ki is equal to 10 percentage got it everyone right sir now coming to if tax rate is provided 30 percentage tax rate information is provided 30 percentage kd you need to find out the kd post tax cost of debentures kd is equal to i into 1 minus tax rate divided by net sale proceeds so interest 1 lakh we know 1 minus tax rate 1 minus 0.3 tax rate given 30 percent no in decimals 0.3 divided by net sale proceeds 10 lakhs so the formula will be 
seventy thousand interest after tax seventy thousand divided by natural proceeds ten lakhs. So KD is equal to seven percentage. We also learn one more formula. KD is equal to KI into one minus tax rate. KI we already find out ten percentage into one minus tax rate one minus point three. So KD is equal to seven percentage. In this formula also you can find out. But this formula you have to use only when there is no flotation cost. Only when there is no flotation cost. Every one of you following the next. Sir, in case a flotation cost information is provided, then KI is equal to interest divided by NSP interest one lakh, natural proceeds nine lakhs. Because the issue price is ten lakhs minus flotation cost one lakh, so the natural proceeds nine lakhs. So one lakh interest divided by natural proceeds nine lakhs. So cost of pre-tax cost of debentures is equal to eleven point one one percentage. Okay now. This is with respect to the cost of irredeemable debentures. Now coming to redeemable debentures. Yeah, here it is. Calculation of cost of redeemable debentures. As we all know that there are two sub models: redeemable at once, redeemable in installments. Redeemable at once means, sir, uh, we have issued the debentures in Y zero, and we have told to the investor in Y ten we will redeem your debentures. So at the end of the tenth year, the debentures will be redeemed. So we can say redemption period is equal to ten years. N is equal to ten years. So the debentures are redeemable, and we are going to redeem at once. Clear. So in this case, for the calculation of the cost of debentures, we have two methods available. One is IRR method, and the other one is shortcut method. IRR method and shortcut method. Okay, ma. Now coming to the IRR method, how to calculate? Very simple, sir. Uh, in investment decisions chapter, we have learned how to calculate IRR. How to calculate IRR? The same process you have to follow. First, you have to define the cash flows for the given situation. After defining your cash inflows and cash outflows, then either you can follow trial and error approach or you can follow the uh, interpolation technique for the calculation of IRR. Find out the IRR, then the same will become cost from company point of view. From investor point of view, it is IRR. From company point of view, it is cost element. Next, the second method available is a shortcut method. We have a formula approach. Pre-tax cost of debentures is equal to interest plus RV minus NP divided by N whole divided by RV plus NP divided by two. RV stands for redemption value. NP stands for net sale proceeds. N is equal to Redemption period number of years, clear, sir. So, what is the meaning of this formula? Very simple, sir. Let us assume that uh, let us assume that we have issued debentures worth ten lakhs. We have issued debentures worth ten lakhs. And we have incurred some flotation cost of rupee one lakh. So that means your net sale proceeds nine lakhs. Your net sale proceeds nine lakhs. Assuming that the redemption period is equal to five years. The rate of interest, uh, the coupon rate of interest, coupon rate of interest offered by the company. Let us say ten percentage. Now, what is interest per annum? Interest per annum is equal to ten lakh into ten percentage one lakh. Now, apply this formula, sir. Interest one lakh plus redemption value. If the question is silent about the redemption value, you have to take the assumption that the debentures are going to be assumed to be redeemed at par. The debentures are assumed to be redeemed at par. So, redemption value ten lakhs. Minus net sale proceeds nine lakhs divided by redemption period five years. Now first look at the numerator. In the numerator, we always have to take the cost element. So interest is one part of our cost. One lakh we have taken plus plus. You also have one more cost element. Though you have issued ten lakhs worth of debentures, but you have received only nine lakhs. But at the time of repayment, you are going to repay ten lakhs to the investors. And the one lakh nick loss on it again. That one lakh is also a cost to you, and that one lakh you have not incurred at the 
year one or year two or year three that one lakh is a cost for the entire life of the project so per annum what is the cost element see here here we are finding out the cost of debentures per annum so i want the interest per annum i want the cost per annum so that is why divided by number of years so one lakh is your additional cost element here divided by number of years so means every year you are incurring an additional cost of 20000 so 1 lakh is the interest element 20000 is the additional cost you are incurring total cost you are incurring how much amma 1 lakh 20000 so the numerator 1 lakh 20000 divided by denominator rv plus np 10 lakhs plus 9 lakhs 19 lakhs divided by 2 how much amma 9.5 lakhs so this will be your cost of debentures 1 lakh 20000 divided by 9.5 lakhs 12.63 percentage is your cost of debentures. 12.63 percentage. You can see here the coupon rate of interest is just 10 percentage, but the effective cost of debentures is 12.63 percentage. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. And this is because the flotation cost. One lakh you are incurring as flotation cost. Clear. Now, in case if you ask to find out the post tax cost of debentures, the only difference is in uh, i into 1 minus tax rate interest into 1 minus tax rate plus rv minus np divided by n whole divided by rv plus np divided by 2. this is how you need to find out the redeemable debentures which are redeemed at once now when it comes to redeemable debentures redeemable in installments the only method available to you is irr method is irr method there is no option available to use here irr method only you have to use See, shortcut method apply chayali and there are some conditions. There should be no changes in your interest throughout the life of debentures. The rate of interest should not be changed. The interest amount should not be changed. Right. When, when it comes to redeemable in installments, the interest amount will be changes year to year. First year, it is 10 lakhs into 1 percentage. So, 1 lakh is the interest. Second year, in the first year, 2 lakhs worth of debentures were redeemed and for second year only the principal worth of 8% in position so 8 lakhs into 10 percentage 80,000 is the second year interest third year 6 lakhs into 10 percentage 60,000 is the amount of interest you can see there is a change in the amount of interest so you cannot apply the shortcut method here every one of you following now right sir. next so with this, we have completed the debentures concept, cost of debentures concept completed, sir. Okay, now, next, uh, we have a new concept called theatrical market price. So next concept, theatrical market price. Now, what is this concept of theoretical market price? So first of all, let us try to understand the other names of this concept. Theoretical market price, also called as fair price of an asset and also called as equilibrium price of an asset. So theoretical market price, fair price, equilibrium price, all these are one and the same, same concepts. Okay. Now, TMP, theoretical market price, what is this concept? It is a maximum price at which the investor is ready to purchase the debentures, bonds or shares. So whenever you are investing into a particular company shares or debentures or bonds, Right. Suppose that a company offering you shares for 200 rupees per share. Right, sir. Now, before you are making investment into this company shares, first of all, you have to analyze. So investing 200 rupees per share into this company, is it viable to me or not? Is it profitable to me or not? Right. Are the shares of this company really worth 200 per share? You have to make a proper research analysis. After that only, you have to make investment. Suppose investor made some research and end of the research, he find out the maximum price he can make investments into this company shares is 180 rupees per share. Now, this is what we call theoretical market price. This is what we call theoretical market price. Ma, theoretical market price is different. Actual market price is different. Whatever the market price at which the shares are trading in the stock markets is the actual market price and that cannot be find out. Right, sir. It, it cannot be find out by any person in the world. 
right? At, at what price these company shares are going to be trade in the tomorrow's session? No one can tell. Everyone can predict, but no one can tell exactly. Yes, at this price, these company shares are going to be trade in the tomorrow's markets. No one. There is no standard procedure, no logic, no theory behind that for the calculation of actual market price. Everyone does only predictions. Okay, in tomorrow's markets, this particular Adani Power Company shares are going to be traded at 20% increment, 30% increment. Today's market price some 220 rupees. Tomorrow it will be traded in between 235 to 245. So they will they will say a price range. And that is only a prediction, not exact amount. Right, sir? So actual market price cannot be find out, sir. Whatever all we are doing is theoretical market price. The maximum price at which the investor is ready to purchase a debenture. Suppose that a company offering you, right, shares at 100 rupees per share and you are going to get interest of 10 rupees per share uh, at the end of every year like that for five years and end of the fifth year it is going to be redeemed at 110 rupees sir every year 10 rupees interest was in the like that for five rupees so 50 rupees and redemption value of 110 rupees was in the end of the fifth year totally 160 rupees or sunai. So I've just made an investment of 100 rupees and where I'm getting a return of 160 rupees. So I'm getting a benefit of 60 rupees. So it is beneficial to invest. No, you should not do the calculation like this. If you do the calculation like this, the time value of money principles are not considered. You have just ignored time value of money principle. See, whatever the interest you are receiving in year one and whatever the interest you are receiving in year 10, both are having the same value. No then how can you add the same 10 rupees and 10 rupees? You cannot add, right? Different years time cash flows should not be added, subtracted, yes or no? First, you have to bring them into the same time period. So whatever the future cash inflows you are getting, all that future cash inflows, you have to bring them into present values. You have to find out the present value of this future cash inflows. Are you following, sir? Right? Now, after finding the present value of all these future cash inflows, total. And whatever the value you are getting here, that is what we call theoretical market price. So theoretical market price is nothing but some of the present value of future cash inflows discounted at the investor's expected rate of return. So whatever the future cash inflows you are going to get, first convert them into the present values. And at the time of conversion, you need to use your expected rate of return. You must be having some expected rate of return with respect to that investment. Clear. Now, after bring them into the present value, total it, and that is your theoretical market price. Clear. Now, let us assume that a theoretical market price is 95 rupees and the company offering you at 100 rupees. You decided that the maximum price I can invest in this company shares 95 only. So the situation is theoretical market price lesser than actual market price. It is a kind of overvaluation situation. That means these company shares are overvalued in the market. So not advisable to invest. Not beneficial to invest. Clear. Suppose that if companies, we find out the theoretical market price as 110 rupees. So the situation is theoretical market price greater than actual market price. So you're ready to invest at 110 rupees, but the company offering you at 100 rupees only. Blindly, you can invest into this company shares. So here we can say that the company shares are undervalued in the open market. So it is ready to invest. It is advisable to invest. You can see the situations I have explained here. <laughs> Okay, now, so that is the concept of the theoretical market price. Next. After that. So with that, we have completed cost of debentures model, sir. And then moving on to cost of preferences. Cost of preferential capital, KP. Just like in dividends, we have the two models here. Also, we have two subcategories, irredeemable preferences, redeemable preferences. 
when it comes to irredeemable preferences the formula is i have already told you in the numerator you always have to take the cost element when it comes to preferences what is the cost preference dividend divided by net sale proceeds preference dividend divided by net sale proceeds now coming to the redeemable preferences again two sub models redeemable at once redeemable in installments redeemable at once you have two methods available irr method and approximate method also known as shortcut method irr method just like uh, the same way you find out the irr in the investment decisions in the same manner you have to find out the irr end of the answer right end of the answer you have to treat it as cost of preference share capital from investor point of view it is irr from company point of view it is a cost of preference share capital clear amma next coming to the approximate method also known as shortcut method the same formula sir right instead of the debentures interest you have to write the preference dividend here that's it preference dividend plus rv minus np divided by n whole divided by rv plus np divided by 2 clear next preference dividend is not a tax deductible expenditure so that is why you don't have post tax cost of preference shares okay na right in case if preference dividend tax rate information is given dividend tax rate not income tax rate dividend distribution tax ddt dividend distribution tax if dividend tax information is given then the formula for the calculation of preference shares preference dividend plus dividend tax divided by net sale proceeds in the numerator generally we will take in preference dividend divided by net sale proceeds if dividend tax information is provided na add dividend tax that's it because dividend distribution tax is paid by the company only sir so for company it is a additional cost element so in addition to the preference dividend it is also incurring an additional cost called dividend tax so that's why preference dividend plus dividend tax divided by net sale proceeds clear that's it so this is cost of preference shares just go through it once Completed. Next, moving on. Next concept: uh, cost of equity shares. Yes, here it is. Cost of equity shares. K E. So there are different methods available for the calculation of cost of equity shares, like dividends price approach, earnings price approach, realized yield approach, and capital asset pricing model approach (CAPM) approach. Okay, sir. Now, first, let us see the dividends yield approach. calculation of the cost of equity dividends price approach so before going to learn uh, about the dividends price approach first let us try to understand the operating profit statement it starts with the ebit earnings before interest and taxes from which you have to deduct the interest on debentures then you will get ebt earnings before tax from that deduct the tax element then you will get eat earnings after tax from which you deduct the preference dividend element less preference dividend then you will get the earnings available to equity shareholders right sir so then after that take the number of equity shares so earnings per share is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares let us assume that earnings available to equity shareholders is equal to 10 lakhs and number of equity shares issued 1 lakh now what will be the eps earnings per share 10 lakhs total earnings distributed among the 1 lakh shareholders so each shareholder will get 10 rupees per share each shareholder will get 10 rupees per share earnings per share okay now now let us assume earnings per share is equal to 10 rupees option 1 the company have two options either it can declare the entire earnings as dividends or it can retain the earnings right our certain portion will be distributed as dividends certain portion will be retained okay now let us assume that the company is maintaining dividend payout ratio 40 percentage and out of the total earnings of 10 rupees 40 percent will be distributing as dividends and 4 rupees is distributing as dividend dividend per share is equal to 4 rupees 
okay now so now from this example we can write some formulas like dividends per share is equal to dividends per share is equal to earnings per share into dividends payout ratio earnings per share 10 rupees into dividends payout ratio 40 percentage 4 rupees okay now now retention ratio is equal to 1 minus dividends payout ratio right sir so that means 1 minus 0.4 that is equal to 0.6 or we can say 60 percentage and okay? out of the total earnings 40 percent distributed as dividend remaining 60 percent retained as earnings okay now that's the meaning sir clear now everyone now dividends price approach we have two models ma number one no growth in dividends number two growth in dividends no growth in dividends means the company is maintaining 100 percent dividend payout ratio when company is not retaining any earnings whatever the earnings are coming and uh, uh, earned by the company the entire earnings will be distributed among the uh, shareholders every year in year one it has got earning of 10 lakhs entire 10 lakh distributed as dividends in year two it has earned some 15 lakhs profit entire 15 lakhs distributed as dividends so whatever the earnings it is getting every year distributing the same as dividends nothing will be retained for the future investment right sir. when every each and every penny earnings distributed as dividends now when you don't have any retained earnings it is not possible for you the future investments in the future if you get any profitable investment opportunities you don't be having any funds to you right you won't have any funds to make investment into that future profitable opportunities there will be no growth in your earnings right sir. no growth in your dividends look at this year one dividends 10 rupees year two dividends 10 rupees year three dividend 10 rupees you can see every year the same amount of dividend distributed to the shareholders there is no growth in dividends so whenever a company is distributing 100 percent of the earnings as a dividends there won't be any growth in dividends clear next so no growth in dividends assuming you have to take the assumption that the company is maintaining 100 percent dividend payout ratio the company is maintaining a 100% dividend payout ratio. Retained earnings, nil. So it is not possible for the company to go for expansion, diversification, or to accept the profitable investment opportunities. Hence, there will be no growth in profits. Hence, there will be no growth in dividends. In that scenario, cost of equity is equal to DPS1 divided by MP0. DPS1 means dividends at the end of the year, end of the first year, divided by current market price mp0 dividends at the end of the year one or you can also call it as expected dividends expected dividends divided by mp0 now by using the same formula if you ask me to find out the mp0 mp0 will go to this side and cost of equity will become denominator dps1 divided by cost of equity dps1 divided by cost of equity okay ma next so dps1 is equal to dividend per share at the end of the year one or we can also call it as expected dividend mp0 means current market price or net sale proceeds clear next so look at this example mp0 100 rupees dps1 10 rupees right sir and a return on investment 10 rupees divided by 100 rupees 10 rupees is your dps1 divided by mp0 100 rupees so return on investment 10 percentage from company point of view it is cost of equity from company point of view it is a cost of equity equity shares now we are learning equity shares are irredeemable in nature so from year one to year infinity you will get a dps dividends per share of 10 rupees clear you are getting this dividend for the investment of 100 rupees so 10 rupees cash inflow for the investment of 100 rupees so 10 percent is a rate of return the same will become cost from company point of view okay now next cost of equity dividends price approach growth in dividends the second sub model growth in dividends again we have two concepts here constant growth in dividends non constant growth in dividends ma constant growth in dividends and look at this example year 1 10 rupees dividends year 2 11 rupees year 3 12 rupees year 4 13 rupees so every year you can see the increment in the dividend 1 rupee 
your dividend is increased by one rupee equal amount of growth but this cannot be the example for growth in dividends here growth means to be not the amount of the growth uh, it is a percentage of the growth the percentage of the growth should be equal then only you can apply this concept of constant growth in dividends look at this example year 1 10 rupees year 2 11 rupees year 3 12 rupees 10 paise and year 4 13 rupees 31 paise you can see the rate of growth in dividends from year 1 to year 2 the rate of growth is 10 percentage year 1 10 rupees year 2 11 rupees so there is a growth of dividend of 1 rupee so 1 rupee growth you have achieved for the base of 10 so 10 percent is a growth rate now year 2 to year 3 there is a growth of again 10 percentage there is a growth of again 10 percentage year 2 to year 3 right sir year 3 you got a dividend of 12 rupees 10 pies year 2 11 rupees so there is a growth of 1 rupee 10 pies so 1 rupee 10 pies growth you have achieved from the base of 11 rupees again 10 percent growth are you following my everyone so you can see every year there is a 10 percent growth ma so this is the constant growth in dividends now the formula is cost of equity is equal to dps1 divided by mp0 plus g normal case ma what is the formula dps1 divided by mp0 and this is a growth in dividends now so add back growth this is a formula for cost of equity dps1 divided by mp0 plus g and now by applying this logic if you find out the mp0 the formula will be dps1 divided by ke minus g okay sir this formula is nothing but the concept of present value of growing perpetuity do you remember the formula for present value of growing perpetuity cash flows at the end of the year one cash flows at the end of the year one divided by r minus g right sir so dps1 cf1 and nothing but dps1 divided by r minus g are from investor point of view rate of return from investor point of view we are finding out from company point of view so ke minus g the same logic clear next finding out of the growth rate sir in case if the problem is silent about the growth rate right then how to find out the growth rate very simple sir look at this example dps1 10 rupees and dps2 12 rupees so you have earned a growth of 2 rupees from the base of 10 rupees unit percentage so into 100 the growth rate is equal to 20 percentage sir if the gap is one year only you can apply this logic but if the gap is more than one year look at here dps1 10 rupees dps6 15 rupees so here the growth is almost five years now you cannot apply this logic now in that scenario apply either present value concepts or future value concepts dps1 10 rupees whatever is there this you should be assumed as your present value dps6 15 rupees as your future value and number of years is equal to five years so you know the present value you know the future value you know the number of years what is missing rate of interest easily find out and whatever the rate of interest you are going to be fine that is your growth rate so that is how you need to find out the growth rate ma okay now next after that new formula for the calculation of the growth rate you have a formula for the calculation of growth rate ma growth rate is equal to b into r retention ratio into rate of return see whatever the retained earnings you have that retained earnings you are going to be reinvest from this reinvestment you will get some in uh, uh, returns yes or no you will get some returns so your retention ratio into the rate of return on retained earnings this will give you the growth amount clear next 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 second model cost of equity earnings price approach earnings price approach right sir no coming to this concept earnings price approach so again two models
So two sub models. Number one, no growth in dividends. Number two, growth in dividends. No growth in earnings and growth in earnings. Just like dividends price approach, ma. No growth in earnings. The formula should be cost of equity is equal to EPS divided by MP zero. When it comes to dividends price approach, we have written the formula dividends price per share divided by MP zero. Now this is earnings approach. No, instead of DPS, you have to write the EPS. Cost of equity is equal to EPS divided by MP zero. That's it. Now coming to the growth in earnings again, two sub models: constant growth in earnings, non-constant growth in earnings. Constant growth in earnings, the same formula, ma. When it comes to dividends price approach, we have written like DPS one divided by MP zero plus G. This is earnings price approach, no? Instead of DPS one, you have to write watcher. You have to write EPS. That's it. EPS divided by MP zero plus G. Clear, ma. Next, realized yield approach. The third model under cost of equity realized yield approach. Look at this example. In P zero, that means in the Y zero, as and today, I've invested into the company equity shares at ten rupees. Right, sir. And I've held that shares for one year. I held that shares for one year. I hold that shares for one year. End of the one year, I am going to sell it for twelve rupees. Ten rupees could not answer twelve rupees. Ki sale just now. Since I have hold the shares for one year, I also got a dividend of two rupees. Now the total return to the investor four rupees. Hello, Chandma. You made an investment of ten rupees. For this, you get a dividends two rupees and capital gains two rupees. Twelve rupees per share you sold, ten rupees at you purchase, two rupees your capital gains. Total four rupees is a returns to the investor. Yes or no? Now among these four rupees, dividend yield is two rupees. Formula: dividend yield is equal to DPS one divided by MP zero into hundred. So dividend yield twenty percentage. Then capital gains yield. Twelve rupees you have sold at ten rupees you purchase. You got a capital gain of two rupees. P one minus P naught divided by P naught into hundred. So capital gain yield twenty percentage. Now return on investment, dividend yield plus capital gain yield. Or you can also write the formula like this: DPS one divided by P naught plus P one minus P naught divided by P naught. In the P naught common thing is say DPS one plus P one minus P naught divided by P naught into hundred. This is a return on investment from company point of view. It is a cost of equity. So find out the returns from the shareholder point of view, right? And what are the return information you got? Answer you got the same will become the cost from the company point of view. Clear, everyone. Next, the last one CAPM approach, capital asset pricing model approach, right, sir? Now in this mainly we are going to focus on risk return trade off. Risk return trade off. I've already told you that whenever you are making investments into the high risky ventures, high risky ventures, so higher the expectations towards returns. Low risky ventures, lower should be your expectations towards returns. Are you following, sir? Sir, if you are taking high element of risk, you guarantee get the high amount of returns. Absolutely wrong. ఎంత ఎక్కువ రిస్క్ తీసుకుంటే అంత ఎక్కువ రిటర్న్స్ వస్తాయి అనేది రాంగ్ ఎగ్జంప్షన్ మా రాంగ్ ఎక్స్ప్లెనేషన్ ఇఫ్ యు ఆర్ టేకింగ్ హై ఎలిమెంట్ ఆఫ్ రిస్క్ దెన్ యూ కెన్ ఎక్స్పెక్ట్ హై అమౌంట్ ఆఫ్ రిటర్న్స్ వెన్ యు ఆర్ టేకింగ్ లో ఎలిమెంట్ ఆఫ్ రిస్క్ దెన్ యూ షుడ్ ఎక్స్పెక్ట్ లో అమౌంట్ ఆఫ్ రిటర్న్స్ లో అమౌంట్ ఆఫ్ రిటర్న్స్ దట్ ఈస్ కరెక్ట్ ఎక్స్ప్లెనేషన్ ఓకేనా now the same which i have already explained to you at the beginning of this chapter funds available 10 lakhs sbi fixed deposit hdfc fixed deposit the same i have already explained sir right types of risks here the risks are defined into mainly two categories amma unsystematic risk systematic risk unsystematic risk ante it is a diversifiable risk company specific risks some may be these are easily avoidable by making investments into different portfolios different portfolios the second one is systematic risk non diversifiable risk these are industry specific or market specific risk which cannot be avoidable 
systematic risk the company all the company can do is just it has to face that systematic risks that's it and this risk is measured by using the beta factor ma beta factor and we know that the investors expected rate of return is equal to risk free rate of return plus risk premium at the beginning of the chapter we have learned this formula so the same will become the cost from company point of view cost of equity is equal to rf risk free rate of return nothing but rf plus risk i have already told you is measured with beta so risk into risk premium beta into rm minus rf this rm minus rf explains about the risk premium okay now next so this is how we need to find out the cost of equity under capm approach all the four models completed under equity approach cost of equity approach next after that you have cost of retained earnings ma so far whatever we have completed debentures preferentials equity shares these are external sources so obviously we will be having cost element for debentures interest for preferentials dividend for equity shares equity dividend and appreciation in the market price these are all the cost elements these are all cost elements but when it comes to retained earnings it is internal source of financing it is internal source of financing like our reserves and surplus retained earnings for internal source of financing what is the cost element it's nothing but opportunity cost foregone by the equity shareholders and how you get retained earnings ma suppose look at this example sir you have a profit after tax of 10 lakhs profit after tax of 10 lakhs clear now out of 10 lakhs you have declared dividends as 2 lakhs rupees the remaining 8 lakhs you have retained as earnings clear every one of you now sir here the profit after tax 10 lakhs whatever is there this is earnings available to equity shareholders these are the equity shareholders funds but you have not distributed the entire funds to the equity shareholders you have retained 80% of the funds with you only had you distributed the same to the debenture holder uh, equity shareholders and the equity shareholders would have get dividends of 10 lakhs assuming that there is uh, 10000 total number of equity shareholders so each equity shareholder would have get 10 lakhs total funds available divided by 10000 shareholders each equity shareholder would have get 100 rupees as dividend suppose that i have 500 shares with me so 500 shares into 100 rupees i would have received 50000 rupees as dividend now 50000 suppose that even if i made investment into a bank where the bank are offering me 10% rate of interest i would have get 5000 interest amma i would have get 5000 interest but now the company has declared only 2 lakhs as dividends which is distributed among the 10000 equity shareholders instead of 100 rupees i get only 20 rupees per dividend per share 500 shares into 20 rupees i have received only uh, how much amma 10000 rupees dividend so 10000 into 10% i am receiving only 1000 interest earlier i used to get 5000 as interest but now i am getting only 1000 interest from that deposits and hey, this 4000 interest loss is there no that is my opportunity cost and this opportunity cost being a shareholder this is an opportunity cost to me and i am facing this opportunity cost because the company retained the earnings now what are the opportunity cost i am facing here i will expect the same from the retained earnings why the company retained earnings for further investment from the further investment i will expect the recovery of this opportunity cost so that is why cost of retained earnings is nothing but opportunity cost foregone by the equity shareholders okay ma next cost of retained earnings there are different models available for the calculation of cost of retained earnings number 1 dividends price method number 2 earnings price method and number 3 growth method coming to dividends price method formula kr is equal to dps1 divided by mp0 earnings price method eps divided by mp0 and growth method dps1 divided by mp0 plus g if you look at all these formulas these formulas are nothing but cost of equity formulas 
cost of equity under dividends yield approach under earnings price approach under constant growth the same formulas you have learned now that is why cost of rate and earnings is equal to cost of equity but if you want to take this equation there are some conditions to be satisfied this equation holds good subject to the following conditions there are no flotation cost and there are no shareholders personal tax rate if the problem having flotation cost information or if the problem given shareholders personal income tax rate then this equation doesn't hold good okay next and the last model of this chapter weighted average cost of capital wscc overall cost of capital ma the overall cost of capital should be calculated only when the company is opting for more than one source of capital for the procurement of the funds look at this funds required 100 lakhs 100 lakhs right here see for the raising of this 100 lakhs if you choose an only one source of capital like equity shares so you have raised entire 100 lakhs by issuing equity shares it is enough to find out the cost of equity compare the cost of equity with irr and made a decision if you raise the entire 100 lakhs by issuing preference shares calculate the cost of preference shares compare with the irr make a decision if you raised 100 lakhs by using debentures find out the cost of debentures compare with the irr make a decision but this 100 lakhs if raised with multiple sources more than one sources look at here 50 lakhs i've raised by issuing equity share 25 lakhs i've raised by issuing debentures 25 lakhs i've raised by issuing preferences i have used multiple sources now in this case I, i need to find out the weighted average cost of capital then i need to compare this weighted average cost of capital with irr then i have to make a decision clear sir when a specific source is selected find out the cost of that specific capital then compare the cost of that specific capital with irr make a decision but when your multiple sources are used multiple options sir you have selected for the procurement of the funds then you need to find out the overall cost of capital compare the overall cost of capital with irr then make a decision clear now how to calculate weighted average cost of capital you have different alternatives amma first alternative tabular format tabular format source of capital take equity preference debentures weights and nothing but the amount of the capital you are procuring by issuing that source by issuing equity shares we are raising 50 lakhs by issuing preference shares and debentures we are raising 25 lakhs each respectively then take the specific cost of capital and the cost of equity cost of preferences cost of debentures then total weights w into x weights into specific cost of capital then find out the sigma wx the total of the total weights so the formula is weighted average cost of capital is equal to sigma wx divided by sigma w sigma wx divided by sigma w that is a weighted average cost of capital okay ma this is how you need to find out alternative one alternative two the same calculations without table 50 lakhs into 20% 25 lakhs into 18% 25 lakhs into 15% divided by total weights 100 lakhs same answer you will get 18.25% third one third alternative third alternative is just like uh multiplying the specific cost of capital with the weightage of that source so the specific cost of equity 20% into cost of equity weight ante equity capital you have raised 50 lakhs by issuing equity capital out of 1 crore 50 lakhs you have raised ante what is the weightage of that equity in the total capital employed so specific cost of capital into weights specific cost of capital into weight clear now so then you will get the weighted average cost of capital so there are three alternatives in the examination point of view you can follow any alternative absolutely no problem clear next while calculating the weighted average cost of capital you have two alternatives ma one by using the book values as weights number two by using the market values as weights okay now now when it comes to the market value as weights first you should find out the market value of equity sir market value of preference and market value of debentures how to find out very simple sir 
number of equity shares into market price per share number of preference shares into market price per preference share number of debentures into market price per debenture that will give you the market values so generally here in the step number 1 you will find out the specific cost of capital if not provided by the problem step number 2 you need to find out the market values of different sources and step number 3 weighted average cost of capital three steps procedure okay now that's how you need to find out the weighted average cost of capital so with that we have completed the entire theory explanation with respect to cost of capital so cost of capital chapter marathon completed so for three chapters completed amma time value of money investment decisions cost of capital In the next marathon i'm going to take the capital structure okay sir every one of you right see you in the next class till then have a good day and good night stay home and stay safe a very good morning students welcome to the fm marathon classes So in the last class we have completed discussion regarding chapter number three, cost of capital. Now time for the chapter number four, capital structure. Okay, sir. Now what is this capital structure is all about? Now first look at the weightage of this chapter. You can see uh, weightage of this chapter. We can expect one problem for eight marks. So chapter number three, cost of capital, and chapter number four, capital structure. From these two chapters. we can expect one problem we can expect at least one problem for eight marks and in some times you can expect two problems from these two chapters two very easy chapters ma and if you get two problems from these two chapters i can say that that attempt fm paper was very 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 easy right so this chapter deals with the procurement of the funds and as we learned in the first chapter that is introduction to financial management the entire financial management is discussed about only two main things number 1 procurement of the funds and number 2 investment of the funds each and every chapter of the financial management either deals with the procurement of the funds or deals with the investment of the funds yes or no right sir chapters so far we completed like time value of money which deals with the fundamentals of financial management chapter number 2 investment decisions which deals with the investment of the funds into fixed assets chapter number 3 is completed cost of capital deals with the procurement of the funds chapter number 4 capital structure deals with the procurement of the funds right sir so here what do you mean by the capital structure it's nothing but it is the structure of our capital capital structure explains about what am i explains about structure of our capital suppose that you have employed 30 lakhs worth of capital into your business 30 lakhs worth of capital into your business and how did you procure that 30 lakhs 20 lakhs by issuing the equity shares 5 lakhs by issuing the preference shares and 5 lakhs by issuing the debentures right sir so this is your capital structure now look at this example totally you have employed 50 lakhs into your company right and how did you raise that 50 lakhs by issuing the, the equity capital 25 lakhs by issuing the debt capital 25 lakhs so that is your capital structure so in your capital structure you have equity capital and as well as you have debentures capital debt capital clear now what is the importance of capital structure suppose that the funds required 50 lakhs rupees funds to be raised to 50 lakhs rupees and you have multiple options available and i have given only three options here option 1 25 lakhs through equity capital and 25 lakhs through preference capital option 2 25 lakhs through equity capital 25 lakhs through debentures capital option 3 25 lakhs through preference capital 25 lakhs through debentures capital so three different options available Now, among these three options, which option should be exercised for the raising of the funds? Which capital structure should I choose for the procurement of the funds? Now, the decision making should be the capital structure which maximizes the shareholders' wealth. See, the ultimate objective of the financial management is wealth maximization of the shareholders. 
right sir again in the introduction to financial management uh, chapter we 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 have learned objectives of financial management profit maximization wealth maximization what is the primary objective wealth maximization wealth maximization of whom wealth maximization of the shareholders so whatever the financial decision you are going to made into your company the underlying objective should be the wealth maximization of the shareholders you have to make sure that yes this financial decision is going to positively impact my shareholders wealth clear so when it comes to capital structure decisions also whenever you are selecting the capital structure you have to make sure that by selecting this capital structure this will result into wealth maximization of the shareholders clear now what are the different models we are going to learn from this chapter first one ebit eps analysis second one end difference level of ebit and financial break even point third one capital structure theories and fourth one concept of arbitrage concept of arbitrage three more uh, four models totally ebit eps analysis end difference level of ebit and financial break even point capital structure theories the most important topic of this chapter and the last one arbitrage these are the four models now let us go ahead with the first model ebit eps analysis sir ebit ecs analysis it explains about the decision making regarding the optimum capital structure we will be provided with some two or three capital structures in the problem among the two or three capital structures you asked to find out the best capital structure you asked to select the optimum capital structure then how should be the decision making process step number 1 you have to find out the eps for the given capital structures step number 2 select the capital structure with the highest eps select the capital structure with the highest eps that is the optimum capital structure because highest eps means what highest earnings per share earnings per share is the return to the shareholders yes or no right so when returns to the shareholders increases in that particular capital structure so that itself is the best capital structure clear so the capital structure which is having the highest eps selected that's it now operating profit statement this we all know already ebit earnings before interest and taxes from which deduct the interest and debentures you will get ebt deduct the tax eat earnings after tax deduct the preference dividend you will get the earnings available to equity shareholders then number of shares then find out the eps earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares that will give you the earnings per share okay ma'am now look at here look at the problem number 1 you have three options given sir and for these three options first find out the eps earnings per share you can see here at the option number 2 you got the highest eps 4 rupees 60 paise now look at the decision making since eps is higher under option 2 it is advisable to raise the additional funds by issuing 16% non convertible debentures totally here you have given the three options amma option 1 uh, entire equity option 2 debt and option 3 i guess 25 lakhs through equity and 25 lakhs through debentures yes okay now so we have chosen the option 2 as it is having the highest eps clear so that's ebit eps analysis now in this model itself we have one more uh, variety of a uh, topic ebit mps analysis so generally in the problem if pe ratio information is provided to you then the decision making should be based on market price per share instead of earnings per share if p ratio information not provided the decision making based on eps select the capital structure with the highest eps end of the answer but if p ratio information is provided price earnings ratio p ratio what am i price earnings ratio if p ratio information is provided then the decision making as to what is the optimum capital structure it should be based on mps market price per share not based on the eps okay now so generally the routine procedure from the operating statement first find out the eps then go for the mps calculation how to calculate mps formula is given ma eps into pe ratio and how did you get that formula generally the pe ratio formula is pe ratio formula price earnings ratio mps divided by eps this is price earnings ratio formula now you want mps so denominator will go this side when denominator is going to outer part of the is equal to it becomes a multiplication so 
that will be given you MPS formula. Now MPS formula becomes MPS is equal to EPS into P ratio. Okay, ma. So EPS into P ratio. That is how the formula what arrived is here. Now the decision making select the capital structure which is having the highest MPS. So the capital structure which is giving you the highest market price per share would be selected. Now look at this problem number three, sir. Uh, in problem number three, I think uh, we have a printer solution for this. Problem number three. Yes, printer solution available for problem number three. Okay, let's see the printer solution also, the problem number three. Is. Yeah, here it is. You can see, ma'am. Generally, we will find out the EPS routine manner. EBIT minus interest, EBT minus tax, EAT minus preference dividend, earnings available to equity shareholders divided by N, you will get the EPS. In the problem, PE ratio is also given. So this is PE ratio for option one, eight times for option two, 10. Then multiply the EPS with PE ratio, you will get the MPS, market price per share, 4.33 into 10, 40 rupees, 33 pies. So for option one, market price per share, 32 rupees, 76 pies. Option two, 40 rupees, 33 pies. You can see the conclusion. The objective of the financial management is to maximize the benefits to equity shareholders. Since the market price is high in option two, it is beneficial to raise the funds of rupees 20 by lakhs by way of the equity shares. Okay, ma. Right? Next. So that's the model number one, EBIT, EPS analysis, EBIT, MPS analysis. Now, coming to the model number two, we have two different topics, indifference level of EBIT, and the financial break-even point. First, let us go with the indifference level of EBID. Now, what is this indifference level of EBID? Look at the definition. It is the level of EBID at which EPS will be same under the given two financing options. So you will be provided with the two financing options. Now, the level of EBID at which EPS will become same, will be same under these two financing options, that level of EBID is what we call them indifference level of EBIT. Every one of you following now? This indifference level of EBIT also called as EPS equivalency point. So the EPS become equal. The EPS become equal at the given two financing options. And the level of EBIT at which EPS becomes equal, that level of EBIT is what we call indifference level of EBIT. Clear now? Now how to calculate? This indifference level of EBIT. Process of calculating indifference level of EBIT. Step number one. Frame the two financing equations. LHS, RHS. So you would be given with two financing options. Huh? Now frame the two financing options into two financing equations. Right sir. LHS, RHS. Left hand side, right hand side. Generally, we know the formula for the EPS. Earnings available to equity shareholders divided by N. Number of equity shares. Okay, now, now we are going to elaborate this formula like EPS is equal to EBIT minus interest. EBIT minus interest gives you what am EBT. EBT into one minus tax rate. EBT into one minus tax rate gives you what am EAT, earnings after tax. Earnings after tax minus preference dividend gives you what? Earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares. The same formula, but we have elaborated EBIT minus interest will give you EBT from EBT direct the tax that will give you EAT from EAT direct the preference dividend that will give you earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares same formula but in an elaborated manner so LHS RHS the two financing options take one option at LHS side take the other option at RHS side okay now Right now, let X be the end difference level of EBIT. You don't know this, right? EBIT, you don't know. So this should be taken as X. So on the LHS side, you will get one X and RHS side, you will get the X. Two equations will be formed. Solve the equations and then you will get the end difference level of EBIT. Okay, now, now look at this problem number five. Alternative A, equity capital 10 lakhs. 15% debentures capital 5 lakhs, 5, uh, equity capital 5 lakhs. So means total funds to be raised at 10 lakhs amount. Option one, the entire 10 lakhs you are raising through equity capital. Option two, 5 lakhs you are raising through debt capital, 5 lakhs you are raising through equity capital. 
two financing options lhs rhs okay now let x be the indifference law of ebid first one ebid we don't know so x minus interest in the option number one you don't have any interest because entire 10 lakhs you're raising through equity capital so interest becomes zero into one minus tax rate one minus tax rate given 50 percent 0.5 minus preference dividend zero because in none of the options you have the preference capital clear then divided by number of equity shares totally 10 lakhs you are raising divided by the equity share uh, uh, per share price these number then you will get the number of equity shares if you go through the problem you will get to know let me take you to the problem number five here is a problem number five sir and we are doing this alternative a 10 lakhs equity share capital option one 5 lakhs debentures and 5 lakh equity share capital okay now and here they said that the issue price of the equity share taken at per 100 rupees per share so that is why we have taken here ma totally 10 lakhs we are raising divided by 100 rupees per share you will get a number of equity shares ma 10000 shares okay now 10000 shares this is lhs equation rhs equation option 2 you need to take the option 2 ebit we don't know so x minus interest yes in option 2 we have interest because we are raising 5 lakhs through debentures so 5 lakhs into what is the coupon rate of interest amount 15 percent so 75,000 is the interest 75,000 into 1 minus tax rate 1 minus 0.5 minus preference dividend 0 divided by number of equity shares in option 2 we are raising only 5 lakhs by issuing the equity capital so 5 lakhs divided by 100 rupees per share 5000 shares okay now the first solve the denominations 5001 job 5002 job and then make cross qualification uh, calculation see first uh, numerator solve chain number uh, x minus 0.5x so 0.5x divided by 2 clear and uh, here numerator solve chain number so 0.5x minus 37500 because 0.5 into x 0.5x 0.5 into minus 75,000 minus 37,500. Now 0.5 x is equal to so cross calculation just say 2 into 0.5 x 2 into minus 37,500 minus 75,000. Now x is equal to 75,000 divided by 0.5 x is equal to 150,000. So this is indifference level of EBID. So at this level of EBID, the EPS will become same under two given options. Look at here cross checking also I have done. EBIT take both the options at 150,000 minus interest and debentures in option one. There is no interest as the entire 10 lakhs we are raising through equity capital. Option two, yes, we have an interest of 75,000. Then EBT 150,000 and here 75,000. Less tax at the rate of 50%, 75,000 and here 37,500. Then earnings available to equity shareholders. 75,000, 37,500. Number of equity shares in option one, 10,000 shares. Option two, 5,000 shares. You'll get my EPS 7 rupees 55, 7 rupees 55. You can see the EPS is equal under the two given options. So at this level of EBID, the EPS become equal. So that is why indifference level of EBID for this alternative year is 150,000 rupees. Clear everyone? Okay now. So that is how you need to find out the indifference level of EBID. Next model financial break even point so now what is a financial break even point it is a level of ebid it is the level of ebid at which eps becomes zero the level of ebid at which eps becomes equal that is indifference level of ebid but this is the level of ebid at which your eps is equal to zero financial break even point you might have learned about the concept of break even point in marginal costing in the cost accounting subject break even point means what am break even means no profit no loss situation no profit no loss situation and it means whatever the profits you have earned that are equal to your expenses so you are in no profit and also no loss situation that is break even point okay now so whenever you are producing a new product first you always thrive for the break even point once you reach at the break even point then okay fine we, you will be on the safe side you will be on the safe side because there is no profit and no loss and even after reaching the break even point level still you are able to sell the product still you are able to generate the profit that is your real profits 
Okay now, similarly in the financial management also, we have a concept called financial break-even point. So it means whenever you are procuring the funds, you have to make sure that the returns from this particular funds first, at least they are in a position to meet your financial commitments, right? Once your EBIT meets your financial commitments, you are on safe side. So what is financial commitment? Like debentures interest and preference dividend. These are your financial commitments. I can say fixed financial commitments. Okay, now, irrespective of the financial position of the company, debentures interest, you have to pay compulsorily. Yes or no? Preference dividend, yes. If you have the profits, you have to pay compulsorily preference dividend. Yes or no? Every one of you, right? Now, so first of all, you have to make sure that your EBID, your operating profits are able to meet your financial commitments. Clear, then you will be on the safer side, right? Now look at this example. EBID given 1 lakh, interest and ventures 30,000, EBD 70,000, tax and earnings available equity shareholders, then EPS. So here you can see the EPS doesn't become zero. So this one lakh EBIT is not your financial break even point. Clear. You have a positive amount of EPS, three rupees 50 pies. The level of EBIT at which EPS becomes zero, that is your financial break even point. In this example, at what level of EBIT your EPS becomes zero? At 30,000 rupees. Because in this operating profit statement, you can find that there is only one fixed financial commitment. There is only one fixed financial commitment. What is that, Amma? Debentures interest. So it is enough that your EBIT is able to meet your debentures interest. That's it. So that means the minimum level of EBIT you have to maintain 30,000 rupees, which meets your financial commitments. Then your EPM becomes zero. So in this case, if you have only debentures interest, financial break even point is equal to interest on debentures. Okay, next, second example. Look at here, here you have two financial commitments, debentures interest and preference dividend. So 20 plus 20, 40,000. So when my EBIT is 40,000, so that is my financial break even point. No, because sir, interest is a before tax item and preference dividend is an after tax item. It is an after tax item. You should not add them directly. You should not add them directly. All of you following now. So you have to bring the preference dividend into the before tax element. So the formula should be interest on debentures. It is always before tax item plus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate. So when you're doing this, that means you are bringing the preference dividend into before tax category. So your interest on debentures before tax item Preference dividend before tax item. Now you can add them. Now you can add them. So choose my example. You got the answer 48,571. So apply chest student EBIT 48,571 minus interest on debentures 20,000. So EBIT 28,571. Tax 8,571. EAT 20,000. Preference dividend 20,000. Earnings available to equity shareholders zero. Your EPS becomes zero. So at this level of EBIT, your EPM equal to zero. Clear. So when only interest and debentures is there, then formula financial break even point is equal to interest and debentures. If interest and debentures and the preference dividend is also there, formula financial break even point is equal to interest and debentures plus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate. Following, sir, everyone. Right. So with that, we have completed the two models. With that, we have completed two models. Number one. EBIT EPS analysis, EBIT MPS analysis. Number two, indifference level of EBIT and the financial break even point. Clear. Now let's move on to the third model, capital structure theories, the most important model of the chapter. Okay, now, right. So next, moving on to the model number three, capital structure theories. Right. Now, what are we going to learn from this particular topic? Look at this example, sir. This is my existing capital structure where I have equity capital 80 lakhs, debt capital 20 lakhs, my total capital employed 100 lakhs. And at this juncture, my market value of the firm is 120 lakhs. 
okay now so out of the total 100 lakhs averaged 80 lakhs through equity capital 20 lakhs through debt capital so what is the debt equity ratio here debt equity proportion 80 is to 20. now i have changed this proportion the proposed capital structure proposed capital structure equity capital 60 lakhs debt capital 40 lakhs the total capital employed 100 lakhs see here the important point is that i am not going to procure any additional funds my total capital employed is not going to be changed i'm just changing my capital structure uh, proportion earlier 80 percent equity capital 20 percent debt capital now i have reduced the equity proportion to 60 percentage and increased the debt proportion to 40 percentage now in my capital structure 60 percent is the equity capital 40 percent is the debt capital now when i changed my capital structure here what happens to my market value of the firm will it remains to be same or will it remains to be change so whenever there is a changes in the capital structure what happens to the market value of the firm market value of the firm whether it is remains to be constant or the market value of the firm also changes that's what we are going to learn from this capital structure theories whether market value of the firm changes with the changes in capital structure some people said yes some people said no some people said yes belonging to relevant theories so look at here option one market value of the firm changes with the changes in capital structure relevant theories there are two theories supporting this theorem one traditional approach and two net income approach ni approach and there are other other category of people also just like you have the two sides to a coin heads and tails and there are two opinions to this topic some people said yes the market value of the firm changes some people said no the market value of the firm remains to be constant irrespective of the changes in capital structure these people believes that changes in capital structure is your internal matter and that internal matter doesn't affect your market value of the firm did you raise any additional funds no sir did you go on for expansion no sir did you go on for diversification no sir did you have started any new project no sir what you have done i've just decreased my equity capital increased debt capital now how can this have impact on your market value of the firm if you go for expansion or diversification or starting up a new project this will result into changes in your market value of the firm that will change your market value of the firm just by reducing equity capital increasing market uh, the debt capital doesn't have any impact on your market value of the firm these people believe this okay now so these are belonging to irrelevant theory sama one NOI approach net operating income approach and the other one is a modigliani and miller approach okay now m and m approach okay first let us start with the net operating income approach NOI approach it belongs to what are irrelevant theories what is your opinion market value of the firm remains to be constant irrespective of changes in capital structure sir what is market value of the firm we know the formula that market value of equity plus market value of the debt market value of the firm is equal to market value of equity plus market value of debt okay now now first let us find out the market value of equity then market value of the debt okay now thereby we are going to find out the market value of the firm clear everyone right first let us find out the market value of equity cost of equity and relationship between the market value of equity and cost of equity okay ma first we know the formula that cost of equity is equal to dps1 divided by mp0 plus g this formula we have learned in cost of capital chapter in the topic cost of equity constant growth in dividends concept yes or no sir dps1 divided by mp0 plus g here from this step we have eliminated g because here we have some general assumptions for capital structure theories and one of the general assumption that the company maintains 100% dividend payout ratio. Let me take you to that general assumptions. 
yeah here it is this is a topic sir capital structure theories we are dealing now in this the following assumptions are made to understand this relationship uh, here you can see the payout ratio is 100 percentage company maintains 100 percent payout ratio clear sir so that's why we have eliminated G. Whenever a company maintaining 100% dividend payout ratio, the growth would be zero. There won't be any growth. So G eliminated. Now, in this step, we have written the formula like DPS1 divided by MP0. Now, cost of equity is equal to in the place of DPS1, I have written EPS because where 100% dividend payout ratio existing, DPS equal to EPS. Look at here, when my earnings per share 10 rupees, dividend payout ratio, 10, 100 percentage so that means the entire earnings are distributing as dividends so eps equal to dps now in the place of dps i have written eps now next step i am taking the mp0 this side now the cost of equity becomes denominator mp0 is equal to EP, eps divided by cost of equity this will give us the market price per one share now when i would like to know about the total number of equity shares market price because I want market value of equity, not market value of one share. Clear. So market value of equity is equal to EPS divided by KVE into N. When I'm multiplying with the number of equity shares, I'll get the total number of equity shares market value. So market value of equity is equal to EPS divided by KE into N. Okay, now. Now, in the place of EPS into N, I'll simply write earnings available to equity shareholders because we know the formula EPS is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by N. Now, when I want to know about the earnings available to equity shareholders, what would be the formula? EPS into N. Okay, now. Now, in the place of EPS into N, I have written earnings available to equity shareholders. So, that gives me market value of equity. So, what is the formula, sir? Market value of equity is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by cost of equity. Applying the same formula, now I would like to know the cost of equity. Now, cost of equity will go this, uh, go will that, uh, that side and market value of equity becomes denominator. Cost of equity is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by market value of equity. Okay, now, every one of you. Now, look at here. Let us see the relationship between cost of equity and market value of equity. Look at this example, sir. EBIT less interest on debentures. And here, one of the general assumption is that you can see there are only two kinds of funds are available. That is debt and equity. Whenever the company wants to raise the funds, whenever the company wants to raise the funds, right? It will raise the funds uh, by using only two sources. That is debt and equity. That is debt and equity. There are no other options available to the firm. No other options available to the firm. That's the assumption, sir. See, for understanding the capital structure theories, all these general assumptions have to be satisfied. Right, sir. So, since you don't have any preference share capital and there are no taxes as well, you can see another assumption here. Taxes are not to be considered. You just ignore the taxes. You just ignore all other sources of uh, uh, financing, right? Only two sources available, data and equity. Clear, sir. So whatever the answer you are getting, this itself is the EBT, earnings before tax. This itself is your EAT because there are no taxes and this itself is the earnings available to equity shareholders. There are no preference share capital. 60,000. Let us assume cost of equity 15%. Now, what is your market value of equity, Emma? 4 lakhs. Earnings available to equity shareholders divided by cost of equity. 4 lakhs is your market value of equity. Okay, now, now if cost of equity is greater than, uh, sorry, increases to 18%, what happens to market value of equity? Your market value of equity reduced. 3,33,333. When your cost of equity decreases to 12%, your market value of equity increases 5 lakhs from 4 lakhs to 5 lakhs. So from the above calculations, we can conclude that there exists inverse relationship between the market value of equity and cost of equity. If cost of equity increases, market value of equity decreases and vice versa. So, so far, we have learned cost of equity, market value of equity and its relationship. Now, similarly, Market value of debt, cost of debt, and it's a relationship. Now, what is the market value of debt formula? Simple, sir. In the numerator, you have to take the cost element. Right. What is the cost, ma? 
sorry the returns to the debenture holders you have to take what is the returns to debenture holders interest because when you are finding out the market value of equity in the numerator we have taken earnings available to equity shareholders yes or no so here also in the numerator you have to take the earnings available to debenture holders what is that interest divided by here we have taken cost of equity here you have to take cost of debt here sir now applying the same logic cost of debt is equal to interest divided by market value of debt now again look at the relationship the relationship is same inverse relationship right there exists inverse relationship between the market value of debt and cost of debt if cost of debt increases market value of debt decreases and vice versa similarly find out the market value of the firm overall cost of capital and its relationship market value of the firm sir for market value of equity in the numerator we have taken earnings available to equity shareholders in the market value of debt we have taken the numerator earnings available to debenture holders that is interest so now we want to know the market value of the firm that means market value of equity plus market value of debt so means earnings available to equity shareholders plus interest and then nothing but your ebid your ebid so market value of the firm the numerator becomes ebid and denominator you have to take the overall cost of capital ko overall cost of capital because for market value of equity we have taken cost of equity for market value of debt we have taken the cost of debt and for market value of the firm we have taken the overall cost of capital of the firm now applying the same logic when you would like to find out the overall cost of capital ko is equal to ebit divided by market value of the firm and if you observe the relationship between these two again same inverse relationship there exists inverse relationship between market value of the firm and overall cost of capital means when ko increases market value of the firm decreases and vice versa okay now now specific assumptions under envoy approach there are two specific assumptions amma see whatever given here these are all general assumptions these are all general assumptions applicable to the four capital structures theories equally these are all common assumptions for all the capital structure theories now apart from that apart from that each and every capital structure theory has its own its own specific assumptions has its own specific assumptions just a second sir right so whatever the assumptions mentioned here these are all general assumptions common to all the four capital structure theories now apart from that each and every theory has its own specific assumptions right ma so like that here for envoy approach we have two specific assumptions number one cost of debt remains to be constant irrespective of level of gearing in total capital employed means whatever the debt capital you are introducing into your capital structure will it be 20% 40% 60% your cost of debt remains to be constant are you following sir suppose that in existing capital structure you already have 20 lakhs debentures now additional debt you are introducing 20 lakhs even this additional debt also you are going to get at the same rate of interest 12 percentage in future you are going to raise additional debt of 20 lakhs again you are going to raise additional 20 lakhs again even that additional debt capital you are going to procure at the same rate of interest 12 percentage so the cost of debt remains to be constant irrespective of level of gearing in total capital employed level of gearing means percentage of debt capital whatever might be the percentage of debt capital the rate of interest the cost of debt remains to be same that's the first specific assumption look at the second one as the debt proportion increases in the total capital employed the risk perception levels of equity shareholders also increases as a result cost of equity increases whenever you are introducing additional debt into your capital structure equity shareholders feels more risky because see when it comes to the distribution of the profits the first priority is given to the debenture holders yes or no 
right? Because it is a fixed financial commitment. After distributing the profits to the debenture holders, whatever the profits left over, only that profits are given to the equity shareholders. So when your debt capital increases, na, the returns to the shareholders will decrease. That's why they feel more risky. When they are feeling more risky, their expectations towards the returns increases. As a result, cost of equity increases. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. That's the second specific assumption. Now look at here. Diagram. Let me draw again here. Right on uh, x-axis, you have to take the percentage of debt capital, and on y-axis, you have to take the cost of capital, like cost of equity, cost of debt, and overall cost of capital. As per the specific assumption number one, the cost of debt remains to be constant. Cost of debt remains to be constant, irrespective of your level of gearing. Means whether you are maintaining twenty percent debt, forty percent debt, sixty percent debt. 80 percent debt. Your cost of debt remains to be constant. But whenever you are moving towards debt, whenever you are moving towards debt, what happens? The equity shareholders' risk perception levels increases. Yes or no? So means whenever you are moving towards debt, the cost of equity increases. Cost of equity increases. Sir, whenever you are moving towards debt, whether it is advantage or disadvantage, the answer. You have advantage and as well as you have disadvantage. What is advantage? When you are moving towards debt, means you are moving to the cheapest source of finance. Debt is the cheapest source of finance. Yes or no? Right? Because the rate of interest is very lesser, and the interest is a tax deductible expenditure. You will get the tax benefit out of it. Right? That's why the debt is the cheapest source of finance. Equity is the costliest source of finance. Equity is the costliest source of finance because there is no restrictions with respect to the expectations of equity shareholders. You can put restriction to the expectations of debenture holders. See, when I said coupon rate of interest twelve percent, the company is bound to pay twelve percent. Even if the debenture holder expecting more than twelve percent. Not required. Only we have to pay twelve percentage. There is a restriction, but whereas coming to the equity shareholders' expectations, there are no restrictions. Okay, now, right? An equity dividend is not a tax deductible expenditure. It is not a charge against to profit. It is an appropriation of profit. You won't get the tax benefit as well. So that's why the cost of equity is the costliest source of finance. Are you following, sir? Every one of you, right? No, so when you are moving towards debt, you have an advantage that is you are moving towards cheapest source of finance. This is your advantage, but you also have a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that when you are moving towards debt, your cost of equity increases. Your cost of equity increases. So there is an advantage and there is a disadvantage. Both these advantage and disadvantage will be set off exactly set off. Then your overall cost of capital remains constant. Both advantage and disadvantage got set off, and your KVR remains constant. Sir, when your KVR remains constant, what happens to market value of the firm? We have learned that we have learned that there existing inverse relationship between KVR and market value of the firm. If KVR increases, market value of the firm decreases. When KVR decreases, market value of the firm increases. When KVR remains constant. Your market value of the firm remains in constant. So that is what NY approach. What NY approach said, Amma? NY approach said, you can see here, the opinion of the net income approach, net operating income approach. The market value of the firm remains constant irrespective of changes in capital structure. Proved, ah? When KVO constant, your market value of the firm constant. So as long as your KVO remains constant, your market value of the firm also remains constant so you can see here whenever you are making changes to your capital structure like 20% debt 80% equity what is your kvo remains same when you moving towards debt 40% debt 60% equity kvo remains same 60% debt 40% equity kvo remains same yes or no 
కేవో కాన్స్టెంట్ గా ఉందమ్మా ఏ ప్రపోర్షన్ దగ్గర కూడా కేవో చేంజ్ అవ్వలేదు యాజ్ లాంగ్ యాజ్ యువర్ కేవో కాన్స్టెంట్ యువర్ మార్కెట్ వాల్యూ దిఫామ్ కాన్స్టెంట్ దట్ ఈస్ నెట్ ఆపరేటింగ్ ఇన్కమ్ అప్రోచ్ ఓకేనా నా లెట్స్ మూవింగ్ టు ద నెట్ ఇన్కమ్ అప్రోచ్ నెట్ ఇన్కమ్ అప్రోచ్ బిలాంగింగ్ టు రెలవెన్స్ థియరీస్ నెట్ ఇన్కమ్ అప్రోచ్ బిలాంగింగ్ టు రెలవెన్స్ థియరీస్ and here these people said market value of the firm changes with the changes in capital structure whenever you are making changes to your capital structure your market value of the firm also changes the change may be positive may be negative but your market value of the firm will change and the two specific assumptions under this chapter uh, under this concept cost of debt remains to be constant irrespective of level of gearing in the total capital employed this is just like the first specific assumptions under noi approach now second assumption increase in debt proportion in total capital employed does not change the risk perception levels of equity hold shareholders as a result the cost of equity also remains constant so first specific assumption they are saying cost of debt remains constant and in second specific assumption they are also saying cost of equity also remains constant right sir now look at the diagram your cost of e- debt constant cost of equity constant now, as a result what happens ma your kvo will get changes are you following sir every one of you see as long as your cost of debt constant and your cost of equity constant so when you are moving towards debt then what happens your overall cost of capital decreases when you are moving towards debt when you are moving towards equity then your kvo increases your kvo increases are you following sir so here you have advantage whenever you are moving towards debt capital you have an advantage you are moving to the cheapest source of finance we know that when kvo increases market value of the firm decreases when kvo decreases market value of the firm increases you can see whether your kvo remains constant no it is changing sir when you are moving towards debt it is decreases when you are moving towards equity it is increases when you are moving towards equity now it will increases clear and the kvo constant ga ledamma either increasing or decreasing means your market value of the firm also either increases or decreases that is what ni approach is ni approach said what ma your market value of the firm changes with the changes in capital structure clear next traditional approach traditional approach also belonging to relevance theories market value of the firm changes with the changes in capital structure same concept amma same concept right idella untundante sir it is a mixture of noi approach and ni approach these people said up to certain level up to certain level of uh, debt equity proportion okay that's acceptable right certain level varaki debt ni introduce cheyadam anedi acceptable right you can see here phase 1 phase 1 when you are moving towards debt right and uh, here these people said like up to that particular level your cost of debt and cost of equity remains constant when cost of debt and cost of equity remains constant your kvo will be reduced it is in decreasing stage okay now right this is phase 1 now phase 2 look at here you are still moving towards debt inka meru capital structure lo ki more and more debt you are introducing now from this level what happens your cost of equity slightly increases slightly increases so your cost of equity is in increasing trend cost of debt remains constant one advantage and one disadvantage so your kvo line remains constant okay now this is phase 2 now in the phase 3 what they said is in the phase 3 still you are moving towards debt now from here onwards the cost of debt increases and cost of equity already is in increasing stage when both cost of equity and cost of debt increases your kvo also increases your kvo also increases at this level both are constant amma 
so that's why your ko is in decreasing trend but at the phase 2 your cost of equity remains constant but cost of equity is in increasing trend as a result what am i saying your overall cost of capital constant but in the phase 3 you can see your cost of equity increasing your cost of debt increasing as a result your ko also increasing but you can see more you can see here in all the three stages at one stage overall cost of capital decreases at the other stage overall cost of capital increases ante now you tell me sir whenever you are moving towards debt or moving towards equity whether your overall cost of capital remains constant no it is changing when your ko changing your market value of the firm also changes okay now so that's what traditional approach okay now finally mndm approach modi gilani and miller approach here it is fourth model mndm approach modi gilani and miller approach now in this approach sir right this approach is belonging to irrelevance theories belonging to irrelevance theories opinion market value of the firm remains to be constant irrespective of changes in capital structure clear sir so mndm approach is an extension of net operating income approach sir modi gilani and miller approach is nothing but an updated version of net operating income approach updated version of net operating income approach clear sir the only difference is only difference is mndm approach we have the taxes element as well right mndm approach without any taxes mndm approach with the taxes tax element also introduced here the as per the general assumptions taxes not to be considered but in the real world the taxes impact will be there sir you have to consider the tax impact so an mndm approach developed a theory by taking into account the taxes impact as well the concept is same as envoy approach but under envoy approach there are no taxes no taxes but under, under mndm approach the tax impact also considered that's the only difference approach between the envoy approach and the mndm approach clear sir next so that's it sir coming to the capital structure chapter right uh yeah here you have one more topic like mndm approach with corporate taxes i have already told you the formula would be market value of the levered firm ma levered firm ante the firm which is having debt capital as well firm which is having equity capital and as well as debt capital unlevered firm ante the firm having only equity capital only equity capital no debt capital in the unlevered firms 100% equity financed companies are called as unlevered companies but in your company's capital structure if you also have the debt capital then your company is called as a levered company so when you ask to find out the market value of a levered company the formula should be market value of unlevered firm plus tax shield on debt See the only difference between unlevered and levered is the debt. Now, because of the debt capital, levered firm enjoys the tax benefits on the debt capital. Just simply add the tax benefits to the market value of unlevered firm. You will get a market value of the levered firm. Clear, sir? Every one of you. Right. So we also have one more concept called tax uh, arbitrage. Arbitrage. Clear. and this concept of arbitrage a very simple concept but uh, lengthy in writing means if you get a problem from arbitrage now for doing this problem at least it will take you 20 to 25 minutes amma very easy very easy but uh, the procedure is very lengthy clear so first let me introduce this concept of arbitrage right now look at this example sir X Limited is there. Market value twenty thousand. Sorry, twenty lakhs. Actually, it should be. And Y Limited is there. Market value fifteen lakhs. Now look at this concept. When two companies which are belonging to the same risk class, their market values should also be same. Sir, X Limited and Y Limited both are belonging to the same risk class. The risk return characteristics of these two companies are same. 
when the risk return characteristics are same then market values should also be same but in this case you can see x limited having market value 20 lakhs y limited only 15 lakhs if in any case their market values are not in equilibrium stage then we can reach equilibrium position with the help of arbitrage okay now by using the concept of arbitrage we can bring these two companies market values at equilibrium position how look at here arbitrage process x limited y limited both are having same risk return characteristics equity capital 20 lakhs and debt capital nil so market value 20 lakhs now so the market value of the x limited 20 lakhs coming to y limited equity capital 10 lakhs debt capital 5 lakhs totally market value 15 lakhs okay now here you can see that there are these two companies market values are not in equilibrium position now what happens here is the shareholders from the high market value company in this example x limited they will switch their investment to y limited y limited to the low market value company why sir because of this the shareholder will have an advantage whenever he is switching his investments from high market value company to low market value company he will be having some ad advantages what are they number one he can get more returns with the same amount of investments right sir now look at here he is invested one lakh rupee where he is earning 15 uh, 15000 rupees returns 15000 rupees returns now here sir when he invested the same amount of one lakh in y limited he will get more than 15000 returns clear with the same amount of investment he will get more returns clear the first advantage second advantage he can earn the same amount of returns with less amount of investment with less amount of investment clear see he he would like to continue the same amount of return 15000 rupees there is no need to invest the entire 1 lakh two advantages but at a time he can enjoy only one ad advantage either he can invest same amount get more returns or he can get the same return with less amount of investment are you following sir these are the advantages that is why the shareholders from high market value company switch out their investment to low market value company and at one stage what happens whenever the shareholders are switching to y limited what happens to the market value of x limited it decreases falls 20 lakhs 19 lakhs 18 lakhs 17 lakhs 16 lakhs and what happens to y limited company shares market values it will increases whenever more and more investments into a particular company more shareholders for purchasing the shares of a particular company that particular company shares market value increases so 15 lakhs 16 lakhs 17 lakhs at one stage these two companies market values reaches to equilibrium position right so this is how one can achieve the equilibrium position of the two companies market values with the help of arbitrage once the company's market value is equal that will be the end of the arbitrage process clear so at this juncture the shareholder is indifferent between the investment into x limited and y limited at this juncture whether he is investing in x limited whether he is investing in y limited that will give you the same advantage that will give you the same benefit to the shareholder clear so that's the concept of arbitrage okay sir so with this we have completed the capital structure chapter marathon four chapters marathon completed sir okay now so in the next class i'll start with the leverages a small chapter leverages marathon okay a small chapter but very important chapter till then have a good day and good night stay home and stay safe sir So a very good evening students. So welcome to the FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we have completed chapter number four, capital structure. Right, Ma? So far, we have completed four chapters. Now time for the fifth chapter, leverages. A very small chapter, but very important chapter, leverages. Now what is this concept of leverages and what are we going to learn from this chapter? Okay, sir. First of all, look at the weightage. We can expect one problem from this chapter for five to eight marks. Sometimes you will get a direct problem from this chapter or sometimes this concept 
combined with the concept of ratios analysis or combined with the concept of capital structure. Then a question will be asked, a consolidated question, leverages come capital structure or leverages come ratios analysis. Clear, sir. Right? No. So first of all, what do you mean by the leverages? Leverages explains about getting the more returns with less efforts. Leverage. What is the leverage effect? Leverage and down to Saramana. Right? So getting more returns with less efforts. How? See here, uh, leverage explains about the relationship between two interrelated variables. One must be independent variable. The other one must be dependent variable. So between these two relative uh, variables, what is the relationship existing? And that relationship is explained by the leverages. Like example, general example, acceleration and speed. Acceleration is an independent variable. Speed is a dependent variable. Whenever you're accelerating the bike, your speed increases. When you're decreasing the acceleration, your speed decreases. Yes or no? So your speed of the vehicle depending upon the accelerator. Clear now? Right? So next, results and efforts. Efforts and the results. Effort is an independent variable. Results is a dependent variable. Your results is purely depends upon your efforts. Your results purely depend upon your efforts. If you put more efforts, you will get good results. If you put less efforts, you will get less results. Yes or no? So result is a dependent variable. Effort is an independent variable. This is a general sense. Now coming to the financial management sense. In financial analysis, leverage represents the influence of one financial variable over the other financial variable. Here financial variables could be sales, variable cost, fixed cost, EBIT, EBT, EPS. These are all the financial variables. These are all the financial variables. So here leverage explains about the influence of one financial variable over the other financial variable. If that financial variable changes, how it is going to impact the other financial variables? Clear, sir. Right? Like risk and returns. Risk is an independent variable. Return is a dependent variable. Your returns are purely depends upon the element of risk you are taking. If you are taking the higher risk, then you can expect higher returns. You can expect higher returns. When you are taking the lower risk, then you have to expect lower returns. Higher the risk, higher will be expectations towards returns. Lower the risk, lower will be the expectations towards returns. Okay, now. Now, types of risks. We have three different types of risks here, ma. Operating risk, financial risk, and combined risk. Operating risk measured by operating leverage. Financial risk leveraged by financial leverage. Right? And combined risk measured by the combined leverage. Only three formulas here. Operating leverage, EBIT divided by EBT. Sorry, contribution divided by EBIT. Financial leverage, EBIT divided by EBT. Combined leverage, contribution divided by EBT. End of the chapter. That's it. Only three formulas. Okay. Operating leverage. Right? We have already learned leverage means it explains about the relationship between two variables. Here, two financial variables. Now, operating leverage explains the relationship between sales and EBIT. Financial leverage explains the relationship between EBIT and EPS. Combined leverage explains the relationship between sales and EPS. Sales and EPS. Two financial variables. There is increase in the sales. How your EBIT going to be affected? If there is a decrease in the sales, if there is a decrease in the sale, how it is going to affect your EBIT? So increase or decrease in the sales, how it is going to be impact your EBIT? That is what explained in the operating leverage. Then changes in EBIT, how it will have impact in EPS? Explained in the financial leverage. Then changes in the sales, how it is going to be affected your EPS 
explain in the combined leverage okay now now let us try to understand each and every leverage in a detailed manner first one operating leverage it is a measure of operating risk operating risk exists with the existence of fixed cost ma operating risk ela ostundha ma scene loki manaki with the existence of fixed cost if fixed cost is higher your operating risk is said to be higher if fixed cost is lower your operating risk is said to be lower if there is no fixed cost no operating leverage are you following sir clear now look at this example sir first look at the existing situation only in existing situation you have 10000 units you are producing 10000 units and the entire 10000 units you are selling out and the selling price per unit 10 rupees 10 rupees into 10000 unit your sales revenue 1 lakh minus variable cost variable cost per unit 5 rupees into 10000 units total variable cost 50000 so contribution 50000 minus fixed cost 20000 rupees ebit 30000 this is your existing scenario let us suppose that let us suppose that your sales increases by 20 percentage you put more efforts right and uh, 20 percent sales were increased okay now so now the sales becomes 12000 units into sales revenue 10 rupees per unit 1 lakh 20000 is your sales revenue variable cost amma variable cost per unit remains to be seen your variable cost amount to changes but variable cost per unit will remains to be constant yes or no amount paranga variable cost maartunde tappa per unit cost variable cost maaradu so 12000 units into 5 rupees per unit variable cost become 60000 contribution 60000 minus fixed cost see at 10000 units level your fixed cost is 20000 now your sales in units increases to 12000 will it have any impact on your fixed cost no fixed cost remains to be fixed irrespective of your level of activity yes or no whether your level of activity increases or decreases the fixed cost amount remains to be same amma 20000 rupees now your ebit 40000 look at here changes in the ebit from 30000 to 40000 ebit increased 10000 rupees 10000 increment is there from the base 30000 as a percentage student amma you will get your ebit increases by 33.33 percentage but then amma when your sales increases by 20% your ebit would also increase by 20% but how come your ebit increases 33.33 percent because of the existence of fixed cost are you following sir right so if sales increases by 20% your ebit increases by 33.33% less efforts more returns mere 20% efforts perte 33.33% returns ochaya amma meeku that is the beauty of leverage and here you are getting the leverage advantage because of the fixed cost now look at the other side of the coin look at the other side of the coin suppose that sir because of the covid right covid pandemic situation your sales decreases by 20 percentage now you are able to sell only 8000 units sales decreases by 20 percent so sales revenue 80000 minus variable cost 40000 contribution 40000 sir me sales taggai kada ani cheppi me fixed cost emanna taggutund amma no just because your sales reduces whether your fixed cost reduces no whether your sales increases or decreases fixed cost remains to be same 20000 now your ebit 20000 now from the base level of 30000 your ebit reduced it to 20000 reduction in ebit 10000 from the base level 30000 as a percentage student amma 33.33 percentage when your sales decreases by 20 percentage your ebit decreases by 33.33 percentage are you following sir so you can see degree of operating leverage explains the relationship between sales and ebit sales is an independent variable ebit is a dependent variable your ebit is purely depends upon your sales now the formula for the degree of operating leverage when two levels of activity is given in the problem like you asked to find out the operating leverage at 
10,000 units level, 12,000 units level. So two levels of activity is given. Then the formula should be percentage change in EBID divided by percentage change in sales. Apply the same logic into our formula, uh, into our example. Percentage change in EBID, 33.33% and operating leverage, uh, sorry, uh, percentage change in sales, 20%. So your degree of operating leverage, 1.67 times, which means if sales changes by one percentage, EBIT changes by 1.667 percentage. That change could be either increase or decrease. Okay, now, now the other formula, sir, if only one level of activity is given, you ask to find out the operating leverage only at 10,000 units level, then formula should be contribution divided by EBIT. Contribution 50,000, EBIT 30,000, so 1.67 times. Okay, now, now. If fixed cost increases, operating cost increases, operating risk increases. As a result, operating leverage increases. When fixed cost decreases, operating risk decreases. And as a result, operating leverage will also decreases. Okay, now, now, right, sir. Now look at here, the same concept I've explained through example here. In existing scenario, your fixed cost is 20,000, where your operating leverage 1.67 times. Now, when your fixed cost increases to 30,000, instead of 20,000, you have to reduce the fixed cost 30,000 from the contribution. Your EBIT become 20,000 only. Now, operating leverage should number, you will get 2.5 times. When your fixed cost increases, your operating leverage increases. Increase in the leader. Fixed cost increase in the operating leverage increases. Okay, now, next. If there is no fixed cost, your degree of operating leverage is equal to 1. Had there been no fixed cost, like sales revenue, 1 lakh, minus variable cost, 50,000. So contribution, 50,000, minus fixed cost, nil. And then you will get EBIT, 50,000. Now, what is the formula for operating leverage? Contribution divided by EBIT. What is the contribution amount? 50,000. Divided by what is the EBIT amount? 50,000. What is your operating leverage amount? 1. So had there been no fixed cost, your operating leverage would have been equal to 1. If there is a fixed cost, then there will be operating leverage. Clear now. That's about the degree of operating leverage. Okay, now. now. Second one, degree of financial leverage. Degree of financial leverage. My degree of financial leverage is a measure of the financing risk. Measure of the financing risk. And financing risk exists with the involvement of fixed financial commitments. Sir, in your cost statement, in your operating profit statement, if you have debentures interest, if you have preference dividend, that means you have a fixed financial commitment. Whenever you are raising the funds through debentures, whenever you are raising the funds through preference share capital, means you are accepting a fixed financial commitment. You are accepting a fixed financial commitment. Clear, sir? Because payment of the debentures interest is a fixed financial commitment. Irrespective of your financial position of the company, you have to pay the debentures interest mandatorily. It is your financial commitment, which is fixed. Preference dividend. Whenever your company is running in profits, payment of preference dividend mandatory. It's mandatory. Clear now, right? So whenever there is an existence of fixed financial commitments in your operating profit statement, it gives rise to the financing risk. And the measure of the financing risk is your financial leverage. Degree of financial leverage explains the relationship between EBIT and EPS. EBIT is an independent variable. EPS is a dependent variable. Your EPS is purely depending upon your operating profits. Yes or no? Look at this example. EBIT 1 lakh. Interest and debentures, EBT, tax, earnings available to equity shareholders. Then you find out the EPS, your EPS become 4 rupee 20 buys. Assume that your EBIT increases by 20 percentage, 1 lakh 20,000. Interest and debentures, because interest and debentures is a fixed commitment. Whether you are in running in profits, whether you are running in losses, it's a fixed commitment. It doesn't change. So you will get calculation here, UPS you get here, 5 rupees 60 pies. What is the increase in the EPS amount? 33.33 percentage. 
See, when your EBIT increases by 20 percentage, your EPS increases by 33.33 percentage. Less efforts, more returns. But look at the other side of the coin also, right? Because of the coronavirus, COVID pandemic situations, our profits got reduced by 20 percentage. But profits reduce AI ka daan chapi, debenture interest on a thakudunda? No. Just because there is a reduction in profits, the debenture holders won't reduce their interest amount. They will ask for same 40,000. Now you can see here, your EPS comes down to 20, 2 rupees 80 buys from the base 4 rupees 20 buys. Your EPS decreased by 33.33 percentage. Okay. Now the formula said percentage change in EPS divided by percentage change in EBIT. In our example, your EPS changes by 33.33 percentage for the 20% change in EBID. So degree of financial leverage is equal to 1.67 times. 1.67 times, right? This explains about if EBID changes by one percentage, your EPS changes by 1.67 percentage. This change could be either increase or decrease. Either increase or decrease. Okay, now, now the other formula for financial leverage Degree of financial leverage is equal to EBIT divided by EBD. Okay. Now, if fixed financial commitment increases, your financing risk increases. As a result, your financial leverage also increases. Right. When your financial commitments are lower, the financing risk is lower. As a result, your financial leverage is also lower. So, lower the financial commitments, lower will be financial leverage. Higher the financial commitments, higher will be the degree of financial leverage. Okay. That's about the financial leverage. Coming to degree of combined leverage. It is a measure of combined risk means the total of operating risk and financing risk. Operating risk and financing risk. It measures both the joint impact of the operating leverage and combined uh, financial leverage. Combined risk is a total of operating risk and financial risk. Combined risk exists with the existence of fixed cost and fixed financial commitments. Now it explains about the relationship between sales and EPS. Sales is an independent variable. EPS is a dependent variable. Okay, ma. How the financial variable sales is going to influence the other financial variable EPS? Explained under the degree of combined leverage. Okay, now the formula part, degree of combined leverage is equal to first formula operating leverage into financial leverage. Operating leverage into financial leverage. Second formula, sir, operating leverage key, we have learned one big formula when two levels of activity is given. What is the formula, sir? Percentage change in EBIT divided by percentage change in sales. So as for financial leverage, Percentage change in EPS divided by percentage change in EBIT. Now, percentage change in EBIT, percentage change in EBIT crosses. Then the formula for degree of combined leverage is equal to when two levels of activity is given. Percentage change in EPS divided by the percentage change in sales. Okay, ma. Third formula. So we have learned another formula for operating leverage when single level of activity is given. Contribution divided by EBIT. So as per financial leverage, EBIT divided by EBD. Ma EBIT, EBIT cross chain, the ultimate formula for the combined leverage, contribution divided by EBD. Okay, now you can use any of these three formulae and you will get the same answer. Sir. So this is about the operating leverage, financial leverage and combined leverage. Just go through it once. Now let's moving on. Impact of few combinations of 
operating leverage and financial leverage right sir when operating leverage and financial leverage both are in higher position your operating leverage is high financial leverage is high the impact will be it is a very risky situation ma see your operating leverage high and financial leverage high means what your fixed costs are higher and your fixed financial commitments are higher operating is risk is high financing risk is high very risky situation try to avoid these kind of situations see when your cost elements are higher when your commitments are higher now what is the profits you are going to enjoy what are the returns you are going to enjoy the returns to the shareholders will be reduced try to avoid this situation look at here ma look at here higher operating leverage means it means what sir high fixed cost structure high financial leverage high level of debt financing this combination is very risky having both high leverages it shows that the firm is employing excessive assets for which it has to pay fixed cost simultaneously it is also using large amount of debt capital this combination should normally be avoided not a beneficial situation to the equity shareholders ma whatever the financing decision we are taking you always have to think from the equity shareholders point of view because the ultimate objective of the financial management is to increase the wealth of the shareholders maximization of the wealth of the shareholders yes or no right now second position higher operating leverage sorry lower operating leverage lower financial leverage సార్ రెండు హై ఉంటే వద్దన్నారు అవాయిడ్ చేయమన్నారు కదా సో లెట్ మీ ట్రై టు మెయింటైన్ బోత్ ద లివరేజెస్ ఎట్ లోవర్ లెవెల్ దట్ మీన్స్ యువర్ ఫిక్స్డ్ కాస్ట్ ఆర్ లోవర్ యువర్ ఫిక్స్డ్ ఫైనాన్షియల్ కమిట్మెంట్స్ ఆర్ లోవర్ సో దట్ మీన్స్ ద కంపెనీస్ ఫాలోయింగ్ ఎ కాషియస్ అప్రోచ్ దిస్ సిచ్యువేషన్ షుడ్ ఆల్సో బి నార్మల్లీ అవాయిడెడ్ సి టూ కాషియస్ అప్రోచ్ ఇస్ టూ డేంజరస్ ఎస్ ఆర్ నో రైట్ ఎందుకు సార్ అంటే వెన్ యు ఆర్ నాట్ ఇంట్రెస్టెడ్ ఇన్ టేకింగ్ అప్ ద రిస్క్ ఎలిమెంట్స్ యువర్ రిటర్న్స్ విల్ బి లోవర్ దెన్ హౌ కెన్ యూ మ్యాక్సిమైజ్ యువర్ షేర్ హోల్డర్స్ వెల్త్ క్లియర్ నా లుక్ ఎట్ హియర్ లో ఫిక్స్డ్ కాస్ట్ స్ట్రక్చర్ అండ్ లో డెట్ క్యాపిటల్ దిస్ రిప్రజెంట్స్ ద సిచ్యువేషన్ మేనేజ్మెంట్ ఇస్ మేకింగ్ ఎ కాషియస్ అప్రోచ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ పాసిబుల్ ఫర్ ఎ కంపెనీ టు మ్యాక్సిమైజ్ ద రిటర్న్స్ టు ద షేర్ హోల్డర్ ఇన్ దిస్ టైప్ ఆఫ్ సిచ్యువేషన్ సో దిస్ సిచ్యువేషన్ షుడ్ ఆల్సో బి అవాయిడెడ్ third situation higher operating leverage lower financial leverage means you are having high fixed costs and lower fixed financial commitments even this is also not advantageous to equity shareholders normally avoid it because see lower fixed financial commitment means what you are using high equity capital low debt capital debt is a cheapest source of finance you are using lesser amount of cheapest source of finance and more amount of costliest source of finance not an advantageous situation to the shareholders normally avoid it look at here third scenario high fixed cost low debt capital this situation is not advantageous to shareholder this situation does not take the true advantage of debt financing because through the debt financing you can enjoy the tax are you following sir every one of you clear no so that is why the third situation is also normally avoidable clear next fourth scenario look at the fourth scenario lower the operating leverage higher the financial leverage now this is an ideal situation because you are using more debt capital in your capital structure which is the cheapest source of finance your cost of capital will be reduces return on equity increases advantages to equity shareholders so this is the ideal situation maintaining operating leverage at lower level financial leverage is higher level is the ideal situation sir look at here low fixed cost high level of debt financing this is considered to be the ideal situation for the maximization of the profit with minimum risk maximization of profit with minimum risk since operating leverage is low full advantage of debt financing can be taken to increase the return on equity okay now so that's about the different 
impact of the different leverages. Next. Next, next, next. That's it, sir. So, and uh, I'd like to tell you one more thing here uh, regarding the degree of financial leverage ratio. So, we, we have already learned that the degree of financial leverage is equal to the formula. We have learned that degree of financial leverage is equal to EBIT divided by EBD. This is a general formula, sir. EBIT divided by EBD. But whenever the preference dividend is given in the problem, the formula slightly changes, sir. In this scenario, degree of financial leverage is equal to EBIT divided by EBIT minus interest. Up to this, the same formula. Numerator EBIT remains same divided by EBT. My EBIT minus interest is nothing but EBT only, no? Minus, you have given with the preference dividend, minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. Now, this divided by one minus tax rate, you have to put only for preference dividend, only for preference dividend. So this should be the degree of financial leverage formula when preference dividend is given in the problem. Okay, now, right? So normal cases, this is a formula EBIT divided by EBT. When preference dividend is given in the problem, this is a formula EBIT divided by EBIT minus interest minus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate. Clear? So with this leverages chapter marathon also completed. Totally five chapters marathons completed ma. In the next chapter, I'm going to deal with the working capital management. Chapter number six, working capital management. Yet another very important chapter. Clear? So till then, have a good day, sir, and good night. Stay home and stay safe. A very good morning, students. Welcome to the FM marathon classes. In the last class, we completed a discussion regarding chapter number five, leverages. Now, time for the chapter number six, management of working capital. Also known as working capital management, right? Famously known as working capital management. Right, sir. So one of the very important chapters of the financial management Right. So look at here, working capital management. Basically, from the subject financial management, there are two chapters from which you will get a definite problem. That is investment decisions and as well as working capital management. In investment decisions, you will get one question compulsory for eight marks and from working capital management, one question compulsory for eight marks. Right, sir. You can take any attempt financial management paper. You will definitely find questions from these two chapters. And not only the problems, you can also find sometimes theory questions also from these two chapters. So from the theory question point of view also, these two are very important chapters. Clear, ma? Out of this investment decision, we have already completed. Now time for the working capital management. Now, first, let us start with the introduction to this. Question number one, what do you mean by the working capital management? It's nothing but sir, working capital management is nothing but management of working capital. See, we know that financial management, what do you mean by the financial management? Nothing but management of finances. Management of finance is called financial management. Then after that, we have learned what do you mean by the finance? And then we later understood what is the concept of financial management. Similarly, working capital management means to be management of your working capital. Then now it's time to understand what do you mean by working capital? So that's our question number two. What do you mean by the working capital? So look at here. Working capital means it is a capital 
it is a capital required for just a second sir it is a capital required for smooth functioning of the day to day business functions right sir so whatever the day to day routine operational activities are there for the smooth functioning of that routine functional activities whatever the funds are required whatever the capital required that capital is what we call working capital working capital the name itself indicating it is a capital required for working it is the capital required for working that is why it is called as a working capital clear so working capital refers to funds in the business for a short period usually up to one year so this capital is a kind of a short term capital that is why it is also known as a short term capital also known as a circulating capital so working capital and a short term capital and a circulating capital and a all are one and the same right so what are the capital we are raising these capitals we are raising only for one year max one year and after that the same capital will be reintroduced into the business right and the same capital is circulating in the business that is why it is called as a circulating capital right sir like example suppose that you are running a petrol bank you are running a petrol bank you have two petrol banks in your petrol pump two pumps are there right sir one for petrol and one for diesel and today you got the stock of some 50000 liters of petrol and 50000 liters of diesel and you have spent an amount of rupees 10 lakhs for this right sir with an investment of 10 lakhs rupees you have uh, taken 50000 liters of petrol and 50000 liters of diesel and after you got this stock what are you going to do with it you are going to sell it you are going to sell it so buying and selling of the petrol and diesel is your business activity right sir now whatever the amount you are spending for buying of the petrol and diesel that is your working capital see just having a platform just having an establishment two pumps workers everything you cannot run the business you must have the stock first you must have the petrol and diesel first yes or no and whatever the petrol and diesel you purchased assume that within one month it was completed the entire petrol and diesel were sold out what next see by selling the petrol and diesel you might have received your 10 lakhs back along with profit element now with the same 10 lakhs for the next month again you will purchase 50000 liters of diesel 50000 liters of petrol and the same lakh is getting circulating in the business so that is why it is called as a circulating capital so working capital or short term capital or circulating capital all these are one and the same okay ma'am next investment of the funds in this chapter we are going to discuss about both investment of the funds and as well as procurement of the funds but mainly about the investment of the funds so investment of the funds into fixed assets this is a investment decision which we have already completed chapter number 2 now coming to the investment in current assets now we are going to discuss in working capital management so working capital management we are going to learn about the investment of the funds and in which asset you are investing ma you are investing in the current assets investment in current assets are going to be dealt by the working capital management now in accounting terms in accounting terminology in accounting language working capital means to be it is the difference between the current assets and current liabilities you might have studied this formula in your accounting working capital is equal to current assets minus current liabilities yes or no right so working capital management means management of working capital now what do you mean by working capital current assets minus current liabilities so that means that employs management of working capital is nothing but management of your current assets and current liabilities are you following sir management of your working capital is nothing but management of your current assets and current liabilities clear now coming to the current assets we have lot of current assets in our balance sheet yes or no like closing stock debtors cash bank short term investments prepaid expenses input tax credit of gst all these are comes under current assets category but what are the major current assets out of all these current assets what are the major current assets the major current assets for any business undertaking is a closing stock debtors 
and cash and bank balances are you following sir so working capital management is nothing but management of working capital working capital means current assets minus current liabilities so management of working capital means management of current assets and the management of current liabilities and in the current assets we are going to manage what we are going to manage the closing stocks debtors and cash and bank balances okay so management of closing stock inventory so we have a topic called inventory management this inventory management is similar to the concept of eoq this you might have learned in the chapter materials in the cost accounting subject yes or no in your cost accounting you might be having the chapters like materials labor overheads yes or no first chapter should be the cost sheet then materials then labor then overheads then you will be having standard costing marginal costing yes or no so in the materials chapter you have a concept called economic ordering quantity square root of 2a o by c something you have a formula right economic ordering quantity it is a level of quantity at which your transaction cost is is equal to means your carrying cost is equal to your interest cost and the total cost is minimum right sir you might have learned this concept of eoq at what level of quantities we need to maintain the inventories in our business unit at the higher level so at what level of quantities we need to maintain at the higher level or lower level right sir so whenever you are doing the business whenever you are maintaining the inventory so there is a question arises at what level we need to maintain the inventories so then expert said like you need to maintain the inventory at eoq level economic ordering quantities because if you maintain the stocks at higher level then carrying cost will be incurred carrying cost will be uh, means you know it will be increased right when you are maintaining the inventory at the lower level then ordering cost will be increased so that is why expert said eoq level maintain the stocks at the eoq level economic ordering quantity level right it is a level of quantity at which your transaction cost means your carrying cost are equal to your ordering cost and the total cost is minimum yes or no so the same concept amma right here in working capital management also so that is why in working capital management chapter we are not going to discuss about the inventory management because it is same as eoq concept in your concept uh, cost accounting next after that debtors management this is very important topic from examination point of view i have already mentioned here very important topic from examination point of view sir working capital management i have already told you that it's a guaranteed question chapter and from this chapter there is uh, higher chances that you will get a question from the topic of debtors management managing the debtors next after that cash management preparing the cash budgets then uh, optimum cash balances models bommel's model miller or model these are we are going to learn in the cash management next after that management of current liabilities here we are going to discuss about the sundry creditors creditors management are also known as a management of payables so these are all the topics which we are going to learn from the working capital management and this is about the introduction to working capital management clear sir every one of you now moving on to the very first model of this chapter estimation of working capital so this is all the theory i mentioned in the textbook right sir so the very first model estimation of the working capital clear so inventory management same as eoq concept payables management nothing but creditors management right and then cash management receivables management nothing but debtors management this is cash management right sir so model number 1 you can see here sir estimation of the working capital requirement right now sir whenever you are going to start a business first of all you need to estimate what is the working capital requirement or whenever you are going to start your new financial year yours is an existing business unit you are in this business since last 10 years 
but for every year you need to estimate the working capital requirement so what is the working capital required for this year for this project for this new business undertaking right just like you estimate the funds required for starting the business right whenever you are you, you are going to start a business suppose that uh, i would like to start a new educational institution right now what is the capital required for it so i need to purchase or i need to have the buildings land furniture plant and machinery equipments then i must have some working capital with me also yes or no for smooth functioning of the day to day classes without any financial disturbances i need to maintain some working capital right so what is the working capital required what is the working capital required first of all we need to estimate the working capital requirement for this year for this new unit for this new project yes or no now how to estimate that working capital we have three options available ma number one based on the turnover right estimation of the working capital as a percentage of turnover look at this example last year 2019 20 where your turnover is 50 lakhs and you have maintained a working capital of 10 lakhs now working capital you have maintained as a percentage of turnover 20% of turnover you are maintained as working capital now current year 2021 your estimated turnover is 60 lakhs so this year you are going to estimate the turnover 60 lakhs now what is the working capital to be required simple ma last year how much you have maintained 20% of turnover i maintained as working capital so maintain the same in this level also in this year also what is your estimated turnover for this year 60 lakhs into 20% so this year maintain a working capital of 120000 are you following or not every one of you then you will get a doubt sir if it is an existing business unit we definitely have the last year's turnover details and last year working capital details based on which we can percentage uh, find out the percentage and the same percentage we will maintain this year also but what if it is a new business what if it is the a new project for the first time you are starting out we don't have any previous year data with us no problem sir even if it is a new business unit even if it is a new project you must have some turnover on your mind you must have some estimated turnover on your mind or for you it is a new business but there are some already existing people see i am going to start a new software unit for me it is a software is a first a first time i am entering into the software industry but there are so many people like tcs vipro satyam mahindra satyam now yes or no already the software giants are existing in the business unit yes or no right now take the similar level right see for me tcs vipro uh, tech mahindra these are all large players i'm a medium player so take your level of software company right look at them how much working capital they are maintaining so you uh, try to maintain the same level of working capital try to maintain the same level of working capital are you following or not right sir next that's the first option available second option based on the total assets means as a percentage of total assets so last year how much total assets you maintain and for the total assets how much working capital you maintain take the percentage and apply the same percentage on the current year's total assets third one most important one estimation of the working capital based on operating cycle so 90% of the cases financial managers uses third method for the estimation of working capital that is based on operating cycle see based on as a percentage of turnover as a percentage of total assets very few people uses these methods for the estimation of working capital but when it comes to 90% of the financial managers they will use a third model only estimation of the working capital based on operating cycle now let us try to understand what do you mean by operating cycle simple sir it is a time required for converting the cash into cash it is a time required for converting the cash into cash that is what we call operating cycle what do you mean by it very simple sir see whenever you are starting you a business you will start with the cash okay i'll i'm ready with 10 lakhs funds with me now with this 10 lakhs i'll purchase what am i out of this 10 lakhs 5 lakhs i spent on raw materials so first i'll purchase what raw materials then the raw materials i'll issue into the production process they will be into work in progress then from the work in progress after completing its production then it will be turned into finished goods 
and the finished goods will sell on credit basis then data comes into picture yes or no and from the data will collect the money then the cash will be realized so i started with the cash with the cash i purchased the raw materials raw materials are issued into the production process work in progress after completing the production they will be turned into fixed goods uh, sorry finished goods and the finished goods i have sold on credit basis data will be arised and from the data i'll collect the money so then i'll get back my cash so what over the time required for this converting the cash into cash that is what we call operating cycle that is what we call a operating cycle every one of you following now from the day one let us assume that from the day one i have made investments i purchased raw materials i purchased work in progress i purchased means i made some investment into finished goods then debtors and finally i collected the money from debtors then i'll get the cash back clear and this operating cycle is also known as working capital cycle and cash cycle in the main exam you may be asked to find out the operating cycle or working capital cycle or cash cycle clear next moving on components of operating cycle what are the components first one you can see raw materials holding period raw materials holding period what do you mean by it very simple sir whenever you are starting business the first activity you are going to do is procuring the raw materials suppose that i am engaging in the business of car manufacturing cars manufacturing is my business activity so first of all what i have to do ma for manufacturing of the cars first i have to procure all the materials all the raw materials are required for the cars manufacturing yes or no right so every day i am procuring 1000 units every day i am procuring 1000 units for the cars manufacturing like that from day 1 to day 30 i just spend my time on procuring the raw materials the first 30 days i have spent my time on procuring the raw materials right sir you you will get a doubt here so why on day 1 you already procured 1000 units of raw materials which are used in the manufacturing of cars immediately you can issue the same 1000 units into production process why are you waiting up to day 30 30 days why because suppose that if i am issuing the raw materials on a continuous basis for manufacturing purposes on daily basis you know what will happen suppose that if uh, due to pandemic covid situation we were under lockdown for almost 2 months a complete lockdown for 2 months in that 2 months time period right sir my production will get stopped because i am unable to procure the raw materials see if on a particular day if i am unable to procure the raw materials on that particular day my production will stops yes or no suppose that there is no lockdown nothing sir but the raw materials were in scarcity shortage <laughs> i am unable to purchase the raw materials from my regular suppliers right so that on that particular day the production will be stopped suppose that my raw materials supply ready to supply the raw materials but there is no transportation all the trucks went into strike all the truck drivers unions went into strike so i am unable to get the goods to my factory sir even the trucks are available but there is some natural calamity floods earthquake unable to procure the raw materials so there are no calamities but there are some riots civil disturbances unable to procure the raw materials so there are so many unexpected things you might face on procuring of the raw materials so that's why right. you always have to keep certain quantity of raw materials you are go down every day like like so at least for 20 days or 30 days raw materials you should be maintain in your go downs so even if you are unable to procure the raw materials for a continuous 20 days it won't stop your production because you already have in your go down raw materials for 20 days 20 days ke sari pada raw materials mir already go down lo maintain chestunnar amma but a 20 days raw materials ni mir production lo issue chesukochu so even if you are unable to procure the raw materials for a continuous period of 20 days your production will not stop because you already had a stock of 20 days so that is why 24 by 7 365 days you must maintain certain quantity of raw materials in your go down so that's why on the first 30 days i've just procured the 
goods raw materials and stored in my godown so even day 31 onwards also i am procuring the raw materials amma 365 days i will procure the raw materials i never stop procuring the raw materials but from day 31 onwards i will issue the raw materials into production process also right sir see up to 30 days i have procured 30000 units of raw materials from 31st day onwards what happens amma i'll procure the raw materials 1000 units and i will issue the raw materials of 1000 units into production process so means at the end of the 31st day also i have over 30000 units of raw materials into my godown now day 32 again i'll procure 1000 units of raw materials again i will issue 1000 units of raw materials into production process so end of the day 32 also in my godown i'll be having 30000 units of raw materials like that you can go to the godown any day you will find 30000 units of raw materials into your godown and of course i am going to follow the fifo method on issuing the raw materials into production process first in first out fifo method are you following or not so like that 24 by 7 365 days you can go to any day into your raw material your go down you will find 30000 units of raw materials right sir suppose that raw material cost per unit 10 rupees 1000 units into 10 rupees 10000 rupees investment in raw materials i said 30000 units of raw materials you are maintaining into your go down all the time 24 by 7 365 days and how much investment is blocking in raw materials 30 days every day 1000 units you procuring into 10 rupees per unit 3 lakhs rupees is a investment in raw materials so you can go to your raw material go down any day ma you will find 3 lakhs worth of raw materials into your go down are you following sir raw materials holding period this is what investment in raw materials clear now moving on to the work in progress holding period what is this so from day 31 onwards i have started issuing the goods into production process i assume that my production process takes place of 15 days see if on day 31 morning i will issue the raw materials for production by day 31 evening i'll get a car no car manufacturing takes time sir poddina me raw materials issue just evening kalla car ready ayipoy vachadamma time padutundi will take time for manufacturing of the car so 15 days i assume that the work in progress period right sir that means whatever the raw materials i issued on day 31 it will complete its production process by day 45 so on day 45 evening i'll have 1000 cars 1000 finished cars like that on day 32 again i might have issued 1000 units into production process and that will complete its production process on day 46 again 1000 cars will be manufactured so that means from day 45 onwards every day i am going to get I'm going to get a 1000 cards finished goods every day from day 45 onwards. So whatever the 15 days production time is there now, but production challenge, you might have some investment. You might incur some investment uh, like inventory expenses, labor expenses, overhead expenses. So for all these 15 days, whatever the investment you are incurring investment in work in progress. And this 15 days is what we call work in progress holding period. Okay, ma next after that finished goods holding period Amma, from day 45 onwards you are getting 1000 cars every day you will get 1000 cars whatever the finished goods you are getting are you going to issue the same into your depots your uh, you know branches for the selling purposes no today if you receive 1000 finished goods you don't issue the same into your depots or branches for sale because see if you issue only 1000 cars assume that you book you got an order for 5000 cars you, you are unable to meet that order because you don't have the sufficient finished goods with you you have only 1000 quantity of finished goods with you right now so that's why that's why generally the large manufacturing units what they will do sir they will maintain certain buffer stock maintain certain quantity of finished goods into their go downs Suppose that even though you are getting 40, uh, 1000 cards on day 45, you won't issue them for sell. You won't issue them for your depots, your branches, your outlets for the selling purposes till day 75. You will maintain 30 days finished goods with you. Means around 30,000 
units 30000 cars you will maintain in your finished goods go down why because see if you issue 1000 units on a daily basis and if you get some bulk orders you are unable to meet if you are unable to meet you might lose that bulk order so that's why in order to make you ready for bulk orders you have to maintain certain quantity of finished goods with you that is what we call finished goods holding period so that means whenever you are maintaining finished goods into your go down you have to incur some carrying costs that go down rent electricity charges right uh, that uh, guards will be there salaries everything investment in finished goods and then after that from day 76 onwards we started issuing the units into outlets for the selling purposes day 76 onwards you are going to sell them goods and nowadays majority of the goods we are selling on credit basis yes or no why because cutthroat competition we are living in a cutthroat competition see when your competitors are selling the goods on credit basis you also have to sell the goods on credit basis yes or no so whenever you're selling the goods on credit basis debtors comes into picture and debtors yes you have to give them some time for the payment so no if you sell the good in morning and if you ask him to pay in the evening what is the credit period you are given to him one day one day there won't be no person to purchase they will ask for some two months time or three months time for the repayment that is what we call debtors collection period clear sir so assume that you have given 30 days time for the payment so even though you sell certain quantity of goods on day 76 you are going to get the amount when day 105 are you following sir now here you have to find out the investment in debtors how much investment is blocking in debtors clear then after this you will get a gross operating cycle period gross operating cycle period is nothing but the total of raw materials holding period work in progress holding period finished goods holding period debtors collection period that is what we call a gross operating cycle period and whatever the investment blocked in this period is what we call gross working capital so the first four we have taken current assets now from that you have to deduct current liabilities because we know that working capital is equal to current assets minus current liabilities right just like you given the credit period to your debtors you will also get certain credit period from your suppliers see i'm purchasing the raw materials no from my supplier x so that supplier x will also give me certain credit period for the payment so that's an advantage for me suppose that i purchase the raw materials from him and he has given me 15 days credit period so i'm am i going to pay that credit period uh, amount immediately no even though today i procured the raw materials i am going to pay him after 15 days so that's an advantage to me right thereby it will reduce us my working capital requirements sir. so that 15 days you have to deduct from the gross operating cycle period finally you will get a net operating cycle period 90 days nocb net operating cycle period then you know cash cycle and you working capital cycle and whatever the credit amount is giving to you let us assume some 5 lakhs rupees that will be reduced from your gross working capital finally you will get a bottom net working capital right 25 lakhs so here your operating cycle period is 90 days for converting your cash into cash how much time requiring amma 90 days so day one roj mere investment start cheste a day one roj nunchi mere edaithe investment start chesaro a investment meek tiri raavadaniki pattina time period endamma 90 days then operating cycle period antamu whatever the investments you started from day one all that investments for getting back all that investments you are taking 90 days time period and that 90 days time period is what we call operating cycle period and for this 90 days time period what is the working capital required 25 lakhs this is how you need to estimate the working capital based on operating cycle okay next the important points here calculation of investment in debtors but for calculating the investment in debtors we have three models available sales value method total cost method variable cost method three methods available now among these three methods which method should i adopt while calculating investment in debtors the answer is amma if problem is specifically mentioned like calculate the investment in debtors based on sales value method adopt the sales value method only 
ఈ ప్రాబ్లమ్ స్పెసిఫికల్లీ మెన్షన్ లైక్ క్యాల్కులేట్ ద ఇన్వెస్ట్మెంట్ ఇన్ డేటర్స్ ఆన్ టోటల్ కాస్ట్ మెథడ్ ఫాలో ద టోటల్ కాస్ట్ మెథడ్ ఓన్లీ బట్ ఇఫ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ ఇస్ సైలెంట్ ఇఫ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ ఇస్ సైలెంట్ అబౌట్ how to calculate investment in debtors on what basis we have to calculate investment in debtors the problem is silent then in that scenario go for the variable cost method evaluate the investment in debtors based on variable cost method because it is the most logical and reasonable method sir why because look at this example sir for the production uh, for uh, manufacturing of a particular unit assume that you have incurred a variable cost of 60 rupees per unit fixed cost of 40 rupees per unit so the total cost comes out to be 100 rupees per unit where you have added your profit element of 20 rupees so selling price per unit is 120 rupees okay ma so selling price per unit is 120 rupees per unit now so first of all look at here while evaluating the investment in debtors if you are adopting the sales price per unit sales value method then you have to take 120 rupees per unit okay now nah? uh, if you adopt total cost method you have to take 100 rupees per unit if you adopt variable cost method then you have to adopt 60 rupees per unit clear now why i said variable cost method is logical simple sir sir if you adopt 120 rupees selling price per unit 120 rupees so now my question is whether your profit is your cost see this 120 you got after adding the profit element of 20 rupees but my question is whether profit element is your cost no uh, did you incur anything out of your own pocket of 20 rupees no your profit element is not a cost to you then how come you trade you treat 120 rupees investment is blocked in debtors you sold it for 120 rupees sir to the debtors right but how come you treat that 20 rupees as your investment it is not a cost to you you have not expedite expenditured any 20 rupees cost here okay now investment means whatever you made out of your pocket is your investment but 20 rupees is a profit element which cannot be your investment so that's why sales value method is not correct okay fine in that case total cost method is correct no sir even in total cost also sir how did you get the total cost variable cost 60 rupees after adding fixed cost of 40 rupees you got a total cost of 100 rupees now my question is sir whether this fixed cost of 40 rupees you have incurred whether did you incur this 40 rupees exclusively for this product exclusively for this unit no fixed cost remains to be fixed irrespective of your level of activity whether you produced this unit or not you have to meet that expenditure so did you exclusively incurred an expenditure of 40 rupees for this unit answer is no so then how come this 40 rupees become your investment okay now so you have exclusively incurred only 60 rupees for this unit so out of your pocket you have spent 60 rupees for producing this unit so that is why only 60 rupees is blocked in investments in debtors not 120 rupees so logically speaking variable cost method is correct ma but of course if the problem specifies certain method you have to follow that method only like look at here ma look at here sir in the problem number one it was specifically mentioned value investments in debtors at sales value so while calculating investment in debtors it is clearly mentioned based on sales value in problem number two look at ma investment and debtors has to be valued at total cost so then while you are calculating investment in debtors you have to calculate at total cost basis clear ma if the problem is silent go for the variable cost next next sir while estimating the working capital we have two methods available sir one cash cost basis and two total cost basis while estimating the working capital we have two methods available cash cost basis and total cost basis means sir cash cost basis means we have to consider only cash expenses only 
uh, then cash receipts incomes that means you have to just ignore depreciation while calculating working capital based on cash cost basis sir if you include depreciation while estimating your working capital it means you have estimated the working capital based on total cost basis are you following sir every one of you the problem will specifically mention whether to consider the depreciation or whether to ignore the depreciation if nothing is mentioned now you just estimate the working capital on total cost basis if specifically mentioned now then estimate the working capital on cash cost basis okay ma so all this was already mentioned in theory sir you can see here depreciation right an important point in estimating the working capital requirement is a depreciation right depreciation on fixed assets is not considered as working capital estimation because it is a non cash expenditure there is no funds locked in depreciation therefore it should be ignored depreciation neither included in the valuation of work in progress nor in finished goods the working capital calculated by ignoring depreciation is known as cash cost basis working capital in case if the depreciation is included in working capital calculations such estimation is known as a total cost basis working capital clear ma next sir for estimating this investments in raw materials work in progress we have formula sir right so raw materials inventory look at the formula budgeted production in units budgeted production because we are estimating sir we are estimating for the next year upcoming year so you have to take the budgeted production only not the existing production budgeted production estimated production in units into raw material cost per unit amma up to this formula what are you going to get up to this formula you are getting total raw material cost total raw material cost for the budgeted production divided by 12 months divided by 12 months means you will get what amma total raw material cost per month total raw material cost per month into average inventory holding period let us suppose that your inventory holding period is 1 month so then you will get amma investment in raw materials how much investment is blocking in raw materials for that 1 month let us assume that suppose that your budgeted production in units your budgeted production in units let us assume that uh, some 50000 units raw material cost per unit let us say 100 rupees per unit so now when you are multiplying budget production in units 50000 units into 100 rupees ma you will get ma 50 lakhs rupees 50 lakhs rupees is your what sir total raw material cost divided by 12 months so 50 lakhs rupees divided by 12 months you are getting 4 lakh 16000 Six hundred and sixty-seven rupees. This is raw material cost per month. Assume that you are maintaining two months worth of raw materials into your godown, into two. You are getting eight lakhs thirty-three thousand three thirty-three. So that means, what is the investment blocking in raw materials? The investment blocking in raw materials is eight lakh thirty-three thousand three hundred and thirty-three rupees. so you can walk down to your raw material go down any day you will find 8,33,333 rupees worth of raw material are you following sir that's the meaning of this formula if the problem specifies the number of days then divided by 365 days number of weeks divided by 52 weeks clear next coming to the work in progress inventory here ma while calculating work in progress you have to take the raw materials for 100 percentage whereas labor and overheads unless otherwise specifically provided in the problem you have to take them at 50 percentage you have to take them at 50 percentage 
because work in progress involves all the three materials labor overhead right materials at 100% you have to take the cost element 100% you have to take labor and overheads you have to take at only 50 percentage clear sir right and now what is the formula same budget production units into cost per unit of work in progress this will give you the total cost of work in progress divided by 12 months so you will get per month cost of work in progress into holding period so for that holding period what is the investment blocking you will get to know next finished goods inventory budget of production units into manufacturing cost per unit that will give you the total manufacturing cost divided by 12 months per month manufacturing cost you will get into finished goods holding period you will get ma what is the investment blocking finished goods for that holding period okay then investment in debtors budgeted credit sales look at here credit sales ma while evaluating the investment in debtors you have to take the sales for the first three you might have observed that budgeted production budgeted production and here also budgeted production but whereas in the debtors you have to take the sales information budgeted sales into cost of sales per unit here either you have to take the sales value or total cost or variable cost depends upon the information given in the problem then divided by 12 months per month cost you will get into debtors collection period clear and apart from that cash and bank balances this prob uh, information will be given in the problem company wants to maintain 25000 rupees cash company wants to maintain 35000 rupees into cash this will be directly given into the problem sir you will simply add it to the current assets that's it then estimation of current liabilities trade creditors budget of production in units into raw material cost per unit this will give you the total raw material purchases total raw materials purchases value divided by 12 months that will give you per month purchases value into credit allowed by creditors clear next direct wages budgeted yearly production into direct labor cost per unit that will give you the total labor cost per annum divided by 12 months you will get per month into average time lag in payment of wages generally the time lag in payment of wages yes you have to take uh, one month right sir basically you know the month of march will be payable in the month of april month of april uh, wages of the april will be payable in the month of may so mostly it will be for one month sir then overheads budgeted yearly production in units into overhead cost per unit that will give you the total overhead cost divided by 12 months and per month overhead cost into average time lag in payment of overheads like rent so march month rent payable in the april month april month rent payable in the may month so may basically even the time lag in payment of overheads also maximum one month next and then statement of working capital so you have a standard format in this format you have to estimate the working capital first it goes through current assets right now what is the current assets raw materials whatever the formula you have used here raw materials inventory right by using this formula whatever the answer you got 8,33,333 here you have to mention 8,33,333 so like that work in progress then finished goods then debtors cash prepaid expenses if any prepaid expenses it is our current asset ma yes or no so then that will give you the gross working capital the total of current assets known as gross working capital from which you have to deduct current liabilities creditors for raw materials creditors for wages and overheads total current liabilities now net working capital a minus b total of current assets minus total of current liabilities that will give you the net working capital for which add provision for contingencies if any safety margin what we call a mass safety margin here you have because whatever we are doing here is just estimation sir sir we have estimated the working capital requirement 10 lakhs it's just an estimation sir you are not god nuvem devudu god sir exactly any working capital requirement 10 lakhs ay untundi ani cheppadaniki it may be more than 10 lakhs or it may be less than 10 lakhs possibility is there because it is just an estimated amount so that's why for compensating that contingencies right sir what we'll do is we'll maintain a safety margin like 10 percentage or 20 percentage 
like if the problem said like the company is maintaining 10% safety margin 10% of what 10% of your working capital so 1 lakh in totally we will raise 11 lakhs working capital so though you estimated 10 lakhs only 1 lakh you are maintaining as a spare safety margin even in future if some increment in the expenses raw material cost increased the overhead increased you are unable to estimate that. So for all that contingencies, we will maintain a safety margin clear. So though you estimated 10 lakhs, you have to maintain 11 lakhs working capital clear. Amma? Next that's what safety margin. And these are some additional assumptions, sir, whatever the estimations we are doing, all that estimations are based on some assumptions, right? Sir? Like you can see here. After the completion of one problem, I've given that assumptions. Yeah, look at here. First assumption you have to take in the case of work in progress, raw materials assumed to be completed to the extent of 100%, whereas wages and overheads are assumed to be incurred to the extent of 50%. That I've already told you. Raw materials you have to take for 100%, wages and overheads you have to take it for 50%. Next, all the purchases are assumed to be based on credit basis. Unless otherwise specifically mentioned, you have to assume all the purchases are on credit basis. One year is equal to 52 weeks and level of activity will remains unchanged level of activity. Your production means you have estimated that this year production will be one lakh units. So this one lakh units remains same as it is. There is no higher production, low, lower production. Only we will produce one lakh units. Next, various components of operating cycles will remain unchanged. Means raw metals holding period, work in progress holding period, finished goods holding period like this. These components are not going to be changed. Next, data are being valued on sales value basis. You may value on sales value or total cost or variable cost. If you valued on sales value basis, now you have to write an assumption. Data are being valued on sales value basis. Alternatively, it can also be calculated on total cost basis and variable cost basis. Last assumption, cost structure will remain unchanged. Cost structure. What is the cost structure? Cost structure means you can see here in the problem they have mentioned like here, raw material cost 80 rupees per unit, direct labor cost 30 rupees per unit, overhead cost 60 rupees per unit. So total cost 170 rupees per unit. Profit 30 rupees, so selling price per unit 200 rupees. This is what we call cost structure. The mana cost structure amma. Ardha mautunda. So whatever the cost structure we have estimated, that remains unchanged. I've estimated raw material cost 80 rupees per unit. So the raw material cost 80 rupees per unit throughout the year it will be same. It remains same. Clear. So that is what the estimation of the working capital in the case of the existing business units. Okay now, so just go through it once and ask the doubt if any. Completion, now let's moving on. So for existing firms, estimation of the working capital is very easy, sir. It's very easy. But when it comes to the new firms, it is somewhat difficult. I'll tell you, ma. So estimation of in the working capital, when it comes to the new firms, right, new business units, look at here, sir. Right, this is a model estimation of working capital in the case of the new firms. Sir, in the case of the existing companies, you can see here the following equations holds good raw materials purchases is equal to raw materials consumption, sales is equal to production, collections from data is equal to total credit sales. So the above equations holds good on satisfaction of the following conditions. See if all these four conditions are satisfied, these equations are holds good, right? So what is it? There is no change in the level of activity means whatever the level of activity we estimated some 1 lakh units to be produced in this year, that 1 lakh units we are going to produce no change. 
right? And there is no change in the cost structure, like raw material cost per unit. We have estimated some 50 rupees per unit. Wages, 30 rupees per unit. Overheads, 20 rupees per unit. Like this, we have estimated the cost elements. And these cost elements are going to be same. There is no changes. No increments in the raw materials cost per unit. No increases in the wages and no increases in the overheads. Neither the decreases, right? Whatever the estimations we have made, there is no change at all. Next, no change in the inventory norms. Like we have estimated that raw material holding period, say one month. Means we decided that one month's raw materials we will maintain in the godowns all the time. Work in progress holding period. We have estimated that raw materials took 15 days for completing its production process. For completing its production process. Right, ma'am. So work in progress holding period, we have estimated 15 days. So the raw materials conversion takes 15 days time period. And in future also, like the working progress holding period remains to be same 15 days. Means in this year, the estimated year, right, sir? And there is no change in the inventory norms. There is no change in the credit norms. Means we have given the debtors collection period, credit period, two months. So within two months, we are going to collect the money from the debtors. And no changes in future, like see in the 2020-21, right? Uh, we have given the debtors collection period two months. Two months. In 21-22 also, you are going to maintain the same two months collection period. You're not going to give you additional time period. You're not going to give additional time period to your debtors for paying the amount. Sir. Are you following every one of you? Right. So if all these four conditions are satisfied, then these conditions holds good. These equations. When these equations are holds good, then the estimation of the working capital in the case of the existence becomes easy. Right. Because while you're calculating the investment in raw materials, you will take raw material consumption. While you're calculating the creditors for raw materials, you will take raw material purchases. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Next. The IBO equations doesn't hold good in the case of the newly formed companies as the opening stock in the newly formed companies is zero. Example, Chonama, raw material consumption is equal to raw material purchases. We have taken this equation and this equation holds good in the case of the existing firms. Why? Because my raw material consumption formula in the opening stock of raw materials plus raw material purchases minus closing stock of raw materials. That's the formula. Right now, opening stock of raw materials 2000 units. I assume that closing stock of raw material 2000 units. Why? Because there is no change in the inventory norms. Clear, sir. La last year, whatever the raw material holding period we are maintaining, say, let us suppose that one month holding period we are maintaining means last year's closing stock will be one month's raw material, becomes this year opening stock, one month's raw material. And this year also, we are maintaining the same raw materials holding period one month. No change in the inventory norms. Kada. This year also, we are maintaining same raw materials holding period one month. And this year closing stock also is going to be only one month stock of raw materials. Are you following, sir? So opening stock, one month stock of raw materials. Closing stock, one month stock of raw materials. So plus minus, it will be, you know, striked off as the same quantity is there. So whatever you left to my raw material consumption is equal to raw material purchases. Clear. This is holds good in the case of the existing firms. Whereas in the case of the new firms, there will be no opening stock. The opening stock is zero. Right, sir. So opening stock zero plus raw material purchases. Let us suppose that you purchase 10,000 units of raw materials minus closing stock of raw materials, 2,000 units. So your raw material consumption become only 8,000 units, whereas your raw material purchases 10,000 units. So that is why raw material consumption not equal to raw material purchases. So in the case of the new firms, as there is no opening stock, these equations doesn't hold good. Raw material consumption not equal to raw material purchases. So while estimating the investment in raw materials, we want raw materials consumption. So we have taken into account 8,000 units. While estimating the creditors for raw materials, we want raw material purchases where we are going to take 10,000 units for calculation. There is a difference now, right? So that is why estimation of the working capital in the case of the new firms is a little bit difficulty, sir. Earlier, 
raw metal purchase or raw metal consumption same so in raw materials inventory investment in raw materials creators for raw materials both you got the same value same answer like uh, i'll show you one example here you can see estimation of current assets investment in raw materials 30000 rupees current liabilities creators for raw materials 30000 rupees because this is existing unit right sir i'll show you one more example look at this investment in raw materials 693333 creators for raw materials 693333 because in both the cases we have taken the same 1,4000 units into 80 rupees per unit 1,4000 units into 80 rupees per unit are you following sir everyone but this is not holds good in the case of the new firms in the case of new firms raw material consumption is different from raw material purchases so these values will not be same it will differs it will differ are you following sir every one of you right next impact of double shift working on working capital requirements look at this example single shift when you are working in a single shift where you are producing 10000 units working capital required 5 lakhs rupees right sir now when you are shifting to double shift you are going to work for 16 hours a day double shift so your production will gets doubled obviously when you are working for 8 hours a day your production is 10000 units whereas when you are working for 16 hours a day your production will gets doubled 20000 units okay ma now in that scenario working capital requirement how much so for single shift it is 5 lakhs you are going to work for double shift two shifts a day so 5 lakhs into 2 10 lakhs is your working capital requirement absolutely wrong answer when you are working in double shift ma you will get some advantages and because of that advantages your working capital requirement for double shift will get reduced for single shift it is 5 lakhs for double shift it should be less than 10 lakhs for both the shifts put together for double shift working now hardly it will be some 3 lakhs so 5 plus 3 8 lakhs working capital requirement for both the shifts 8 lakhs why sir the production is getting doubled so as my working capital requirement also should be gets doubled no because sir look at this when you are working in a single shift when you are producing only 10000 units your raw metal cost per unit is 10 rupees per unit your raw metal cost is 10 rupees per unit whereas when you are working for double shift when your production is getting doubled your raw metal requirement will gets increased earlier you used to purchase only 10000 units of raw materials now you are going to purchase 20000 units of raw materials when the quantity increasing you can ask for quantity discounts you can bargain more you can get quantity discounts where you can bargain for raw metal cost per unit just 9 rupees per unit just 9 rupees per unit alane you will also have some benefits like fixed overhead recovery rate will gets reduced suppose that the rent of the building is some of uh, 50000 per month earlier you are using to work only for one shift 8 hours a day where your production is just 10000 units so when rent per unit we are apportioning the rent amount for every unit it will be like 50000 per month divided by 10000 units so 5 rupees per unit so while you are calculating the total cost of production to that unit rent amount you will apportion 5 rupees per unit but when you are working in a double shift rent amount is it going to be increased no whether you are using the building for 8 hours a day whether you are using the building for 16 hours a day it doesn't change your rent amount sir rent we are paying per month not per hour not per hour per month so the rent amount remains to be same when you are apportioning the rent per unit na now it will be 50000 rupees divided by 20000 units so it will be now 2 rupees 50 rupees per uh, 2 rupees 50 paise per unit you can see here overhead recovery rate reduced or not because of this what happens your total working capital requirement will gets reduced that's the advantage of working for double shift when you are working for third shift also you will get more advantages that's why now many of the mncs you can see they'll work on shift basis they'll work on shift basis three shifts a day they will work enjoys the overhead recovery rates benefits enjoys the quantity discounts everything clear sir that's the concept of estimation of working capital and double shift working okay now 
So there is only one problem available for this concept, ma, right? So with this, we have completed model number one and model number two. Model number one, estimation of the working capital, right? In the case of the existing firms, and then in the case of the new firms also completed, and then model number two, impact of double shift working on working capital requirements. This is also completed, sir. Clear? Next. So in the next session, I'm going to start with the model number three, different approaches of financing the working capital, aggressive approach, conservative approach, right? We have different approaches. What about that? Uh, what are that approaches? What are their characteristics? All this we are going to discuss in the next session. Clear, sir? So chill that. Have a good day. And uh, meet you in the next session, sir. Stay home and stay safe. A very good morning, students. So welcome to the Sresta FM Marathon classes. So in the last class, we have started a discussion regarding chapter number six, working capital management, and uh, in which we have completed model number one, estimation of the working capital, and number two, estimation of the working capital when it comes to the double shift workings. Okay, mom. Right. And uh, we have also learned about the estimation of the working capital with respect to the existing business units and as well as of the new business units. Right. Sir. Now, time for the model number three, different approaches in financing the working capital. Okay, sir. Right. Now, sir, there are three mainly different approaches in financing the working capital needs. Aggressive approach moderate approach and conservative approach right sir. so look at the running notes for this right sir uh, let us assume that we have a working capital requirement of 10 lakhs so in step number one what we have done sir we have estimated the working capital requirement now we have estimated that we have a working capital requirement of 10 lakhs now for the financing of this working capital needs we will be having different options like short term sources long term sources short term sources like bank overdraft cash credits commercial papers like commercial papers are nothing but money market instruments like a pro note short term loans loans from the friends and relatives these are all the short term sources for financing the working capital and the long term sources like equity shares preference shares, debentures, bonds, long-term loans, etc. So we will be having different sources for the financing of our working capital. Then there is a question arises. For financing my working capital requirement, which source should I select? Should I go with the short-term sources or should I go with the long-term sources? Or should I mix up the short-term sources and long-term sources? Right, sir. Now look at here. While selecting these sources, short term sources or long term sources, you have to keep in mind certain important considerations. Right? What are they? Look at here. So short term sources and long term sources, their characteristics, risk, cost, returns and liquidity problems. These are the four main important considerations. Now, when it comes to the risk factor, short term sources, the risk is higher because they are repayable on demand. They are repayable on demand. There is no fixed tenure for the short term sources. Like uh, if you take the example of bank overdraft, there is no fixed tenure for the bank overdraft. As and when the banker asks you to repay the bank overdraft, you have to repay, right? So the risk of repayment is always higher. Risk of repayment is always higher. Whereas when it comes to the long term sources, the risk of repayment is very low because there is a fixed tenure. Like if you take the example of debentures, you have issued a debentures for 10 years. So that means from year one to year 10, there is no risk of repayment. The risk of repayment comes only at the end of the year 10. Right, sir. Even if the debenture holder asks you to repay, meet up the term of the debentures, like on year six, like a, a debenture holder came and asked for money, there is no need to pay because there is a fixed term of 10 years. Only at the end of 10th year, you are bound to be reading the debentures. So the risk of repayment is lower. Coming to the cost element, when it comes to the short term sources, the cost element is lower. Why? Because you are going to pay the cost only for a short period like one year, max one year, right? So even though the rate of interest is higher, 
but you are going to pay only for one year right but when it comes to the long term charges you are going to pay the cost for a longer period even though the debentures rate of interest is lower but you are going to pay for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years the cost is higher equity shares the costliest source of finance are you following sir next returns when it comes to the short term sources the returns are higher because whenever you are taking the high element of risk you can expect high amount of returns but when it comes to the long term sources the returns are lower because the risk is low now when the risk is lower the expectations towards the returns should also be lower liquidity problems when it comes to the short term sources the liquidity problems are higher liquidity problems means what am like see uh, you actually depend on a loan from a friend you have estimated working capital requirement of 10 lakhs you ask your friend and your friend promised to pay within one week don't worry you are working capital needs i will take care of don't worry i'll give you 10 lakhs rupees within one week believing that friends words you have not gone for the another option after one week assume that your friend not able to provide you the 10 lakhs funds he said like sorry uh, there was some unexpected payment was made so i was unable to provide you the 10 lakhs working capital needs means working capital means what am i it is a capital required for working of your business when you are unable to provide the working capital funds your business working will get affected even for meeting some petty expenses you are not in a position to have the funds with you so that means you are facing liquidity problems you don't have the liquid funds with you for working of your business that is what liquidity problems so when it comes to the short term sources the liquidity problems are higher because short term sources the procurement of the funds are not guaranteed the banker said you like okay we will provide you bank od but after one week what happens assume that your credit rating drops from a plus to b double plus or b plus your credit rating was dropped by the credit rating agencies now after looking that credit rating the banker withdrawn his bank overdraft again you have to face the liquidity problems but when it comes to the long term sources the liquidity problems are lower because you are going to raise the funds at a time for a longer period of 10 years or 15 years right you will be having more funds than what you required so that's why long term sources the liquidity problems are lower now here you can see advantages and disadvantages short term sources you have two advantages what is that advantage ma the cost is lower returns are higher cost lower returns are higher this is the advantage but what is the disadvantage associated with it the disadvantages are risk is higher and liquidity problems are higher two advantages two disadvantages whereas when it comes to the long term sources again you are going to have two advantages two disadvantages advantages in the risk lower and liquidity problems are lower advantages disadvantages in the cost higher and returns are lower so two advantages two disadvantages again in the long term sources two advantages and two disadvantages in the short term sources now which one will you adopt which source you are going to tap for procuring the working capital funds the answer is it's purely depends upon the individuals risk taking perspective risk taking uh, behavior right sir see not all the financial managers thinking will be same not all the financial managers will be uh, will not think in the same manner some financial managers are more aggressive they are ready to take any amount of risk because they believe that only when you are taking the risk you will get returns some financial managers are more conservative in nature they don't want any more risk they don't want risk they are satisfied with the low returns but they don't want to face any liquidity problems any risk right sir so those who are more aggressive in nature more risk taking personalities are there they will go with the short term sources there are some people who are not at ready to take the risk element not yet uh, ready to face the liquidity problems they will go for the long term sources and there are third category of persons they will mix up short term sources and long term sources so that's why we have three approaches right ma what are they aggressive approach conservative approach and moderate approach
అగ్రెసివ్ అప్రోచ్ లో ద మోర్ డిపెండింగ్ ఈజ్ ఆన్ షార్ట్ టర్మ్ సోర్సెస్ లెస్ డిపెండింగ్ ఆన్ లాంగ్ టర్మ్ సోర్సెస్ వాట్ ఎవర్ ద వర్కింగ్ క్యాపిటల్ నీడ్ ఈస్ దేర్ ఓన్లీ టు దాట్ ఎక్స్టెండ్ దే విల్ రేజ్ ద ఫండ్స్ నో ఐడిల్ ఫండ్స్ నో లాస్ ఆఫ్ ఇంట్రెస్ట్ కాస్ట్ విల్ బి లోవర్ రిటర్న్స్ విల్ బి హైయర్ బట్ ఎట్ ద సేమ్ టైమ్ లిక్విడిటీ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ ఆల్సో హైయర్ దిస్ అగ్రెసివ్ అప్రోచ్ ఈస్ ఆల్సో నోన్ యాజ్ మ్యాచింగ్ అప్రోచ్ ఆర్ హెడ్జింగ్ అప్రోచ్ ఓకే మా కన్జర్వేటివ్ అప్రోచ్ హియర్ ద మ్యాక్సిమమ్ వర్కింగ్ క్యాపిటల్ రిక్వైర్డ్ ఈజ్ ఫండెడ్ త్రూ ద లాంగ్ టర్మ్ సోర్సెస్ right so what were the working capital requirement is there that is funded through the long term sources more ideal funds hence no uh, there is huge loss of interest risk is lower but at the same time returns also lower liquidity problems lower cost will be higher because you are maintaining more ideal funds there is a huge loss of interest and this approach is also known as a traditional approach next moderate approach as i said no they will mix up both conservative approach and aggressive approach the average working capital requirement whatever is there that is your minimum working capital plus marginal working capital divided by 2 that average working capital is there no that will be raised through the long term sources if any additional working capital required that will be funded through short term sources so they are going to tap both long term sources and short term sources okay ma'am moderate idle funds there is loss of interest as well but the loss of interest is moderate the risk element cost element liquidity problems are moderate and this approach is known as a trading approach okay ma next so that's your model number 3 different approaches in uh, financing the working capital and then model number 4 operating cycle model number 4 what am i operating cycle yeah here it is operating cycle sir what do you mean by operating cycle we have already learned in the first model itself it is the time required for converting the cash into cash that is what we call operating cycle yes or no we have seen that from day one we will start with right day one we'll start with the investments investments in raw materials then investment in work in progress investment in finished goods investment in debtors and finally that from debtors will collect the money the cash will be received right totally how much days ama 30 plus 15 45 plus 30 75 plus 30 105 days right sir this is your gross operating cycle period from which you have to deduct the creditors payment period then you will get the net operating cycle period okay now there are some important terminologies you have to learn like inventory conversion period icp inventory conversion period this includes raw materials holding period work in progress holding period and finished goods holding period this is what inventory conversion period nothing but this is a time required this is a time required for converting raw materials into finished goods it is a time required for converting raw materials into finished goods that is what we call inventory conversion period in our example it is 75 days right so from day 1 onwards if you started procuring the raw materials it will convert it will complete its conversion and it will be converted into a finished goods within 75 days so for converting a single unit into finished goods the time required is how much amma 75 days inventory conversion period okay now for which add the debtors collection period dcp or receivables conversion period rcp no problem debtors collection period anna receivables conversion period anna okate one and the same this will give you what am gross operating cycle period gross operating cycle period okay sir from which deduct the creditors payment period cpp creditors payment period you will get am net operating cycle period you will get what net operating cycle period or simply operating cycle or working capital cycle or cash cycle clear you can see here you got a net operating cycle period of 90 days assuming that one year is equal to 360 days number of operating cycles in a year so how many operating cycles we are going to have in a year so the formula could be 360 days divided by net operating cycle period 360 days divided by 90 so four cycles net operating cycle uh, sorry number of operating cycles in a year four cycles for every 90 days one cycle will gets completed from day 1 to 
day 19 first operating cycle period first operating cycle will be from day 91 to day 180 second operating cycle second operating cycle like that okay ma'am next assuming that the total operating cost is equal to 12 lakhs total operating cost means the total working capital requirement per the year for annum 12 lakhs rupees now working capital requirement per operating cycle so this is for 360 days this is for 360 days for full year what will be the working capital requirement per one operating cycle so the formula could be total operating cost divided by number of operating cycle total operating cost 12 lakhs divided by number of operating cycles four so the working capital requirement per operating cycle will be three lakhs so that means on day one if you want to start your business it is enough to have a working capital of three lakhs there is no need to maintain 12 lakhs rupees sum up you have estimated working capital 12 lakhs but that is for annum you have a working capital cycle of 90 days so what mean that means whatever the investment you made on day one that investment is getting back to you on day 190 on day 90 so the meaning in the day one roj manum three lakhs working capital to start out on sir right we are going to start with the three lakhs working capital on day one and this three lakh working capital will be get back to us on day 90 on day 90 now on day 91st the second operating cycle will be starts so bring back the same three lakhs into your working capital and this will be reverted on day 180 the say three lakhs will be received by you end of the operating cycle no so the same cash will be come back to you three lakhs now with the same three lakhs start the third operating cycle are you following or not every one of you right so even though you have an annual requirement of 12 lakhs but for starting of the business it is enough to maintain three lakhs rupees the same three lakhs will be circulating in the business that's it that is why it is also called as a circulating capital yes or no next so you have the problems as well so whatever the theory i'm explaining sir with the help of that theory uh try to do the problems and if you come across any doubts now you can ping me sir either uh, to telegram or uh, to whatsapp or my email or you can also call me back directly no problem at all okay sir so look at here operating cycle right so operating cycle the same diagram we have taken cash with the cash we purchase the raw materials then they will be sent into work in progress for the production then after the completion of work in progress finished goods will be uh, arrived then the goods will be sold to the debtors receivables comes into picture from the receivables we'll collect the money though we'll get back the cash net operating cycle period you can see the formula here total operating cycle period minus deferral period dp stands for deferral period nothing but create as payment period right or the other formula icp plus rcp this will give you the total operating cycle period minus db and for finding out of the raw middle conversion period finished goods conversion period you have the formula as well look at here ma average raw material stock how are you going to get this opening stock of raw materials plus closing stock of raw material divided by two that will give you the average raw material stock divided by the total raw material consumption total raw material consumption how are you going to find out ma? you have the formula right opening stock plus raw material purchases minus closing stock that will give you the raw material consumption right so average raw material stock divided by raw material consumption into 365 that will give you the raw material conversion period see here we have the answer in number of days that is why we are multiplying with the 365 if the problem specifically mentioned one year is equal to 360 days here you have to take 360 instead of 365 you have to take 360 if the question is silent about the number of days in a year you can directly go ahead with the 365 are you following or not if problem specifically mentioned that one year is equal to 360 days then in every formula you have to take 360 days only otherwise go ahead with the 365 next work in progress conversion period average stock of work in progress means opening stock of work in progress plus closing stock of work in progress divided by two divided by total cost of production how did you get this ma total cost of production right you have a formula right in your uh, uh, cost sheet you might have learned already about the cost of production 
right? Uh, apply the same logic here into 365 days. That will give you the work in progress conversion period. Then finished goods conversion period, average stock of finished goods, opening stock of finished goods, plus closing stock of finished goods divided by two. That will give you the average finished goods divided by total cost of goods sold into 365. Then receivables conversion period, average receivables, opening debtors plus closing debtors divided by two. That will give you the average debtors divided by total credit sales. So since you are finding out the receivables conversion period, you have to take credit sales into 365. Then deferral period, also known as creditors payment period, average creditors, opening creditors plus closing creditors divided by two. That will give you average creditors divided by total credit purchases into 365. Clear now. Okay. See, for raw materials conversion period, in the denominator, you have to take what am I? Raw material consumption. Okay. For work in progress conversion period, cost of production. Finished goods conversion period, cost of goods sold. Receivables conversion period, credit sales. Deferral period, credit purchases. Okay, sir. So whatever you are finding, Danik related to one of these column. You are finding receivables conversion period, debtors. For debtors, what is related factor? Cre uh, credit sales. Credit sales. And you are finding deferral period. For deferral period, what is related? Credit purchases. Are you following or not? Next. Here in this problem, you can see my assume one year is equal to 360 days. So in every formula, you have to take 360 days. Clear now? Right. So that's the end of the model number four. That operating cycle. Now coming to the, the most important model of this particular chapter most 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 important model of this particular chapter that is management of receivables model number five management of receivables nothing but debtors management among nothing but debtors management okay sir now look at here Here it is, management of data. Now, first of all, a question arises, sir, management of data, data management. What is the need of managing the data? What is the need of managing the data? Why there is a need arises for managing the data? Can anyone? See, the answer is very simple, sir. The answer is very simple. Sir, whatever the investments we have made from day one, right, sir? We are starting with the cash now. With this, we are procuring the raw materials, the raw materials into the work in progress, and the work in progress converted into finished goods. And then these will be sold to the debtors, customers on credit basis, debtors will be arised. So from day one, whatever the investments you are making, Suppose that you have procured the raw materials worth 50 lakhs. You have procured the raw materials worth 50 lakhs. And you made investment of work in progress 20 lakhs. Investment of finished goods worth 10 lakhs. Totally 80 lakhs investment is blocked in debtors. So by whatever the investment you are made from day one, the entire investment will be blocked in debtors. Will be blocked in debtors. See, if you are selling a particular product on credit basis, let us say the selling price per unit is 100 rupees. 100 rupees per unit. And how did you arrive at this 100 rupees? You will take the raw materials, right? Labor, wages, overheads, everything into consideration. Cost of production, cost of goods, so you will find you will add back your profit element. Then you will arrive at the selling price per unit. You will arrive at the selling price per unit. Cost sheet, you might have learned already. And when you're selling this unit to the debtors, the entire amount of 100 rupees will be blocked, you know. The entire investment of 100 rupees will be blocked in debtors. Suppose that if you're not properly managing the debtors, suppose that if data turned into a bad debt, this entire 100 rupees is a loss to you. Yes or no? If you're not properly managing your debtors, what happens? You have to face the bad debts. You have to face the bad debts right the data is not going to repay to you he'll just he taken the goods from you and he's enjoying the goods and he's not repaying you 
the entire investment is blocked in data and you're unable to uh, properly manage your data. No, your investment completely lost and you're in a position to shut down your business. Data are the most important factor of every business organization. There are so many business organizations which are failed just because of the poor data management systems they have employed. Because the entire investment is blocked there itself only, no? Clear, sir. Now, what do you mean by managing the data? See, managing the data means you have to like uh, evaluate the proper credit policies. You have to offer cam some cash discounts for the early payments from data. You have to continuously follow up them for the payments. You have to continuously remind them for the payments. Just like whenever you purchase a particular product on EMI basis. Suppose that uh, example, I've recently purchased an air conditioner, right, sir? And I purchased through EMI basis. My first EMI is going to be due on May 2nd, May 2nd. But since last one week, I started getting messages from that particular financing company that your first installment is going to be due on May 2nd and make sure that you are going to have enough funds in your bank account. A continuous reminding for every two days or three days. Yes or no? Sometimes even the people will come over the call, sir, your EMI is becoming due, hoping that you have enough funds in your bank account. Yes or no? Right. Continuous follow-up. Preparing the efficient credit policies. Offering the cash discount sometime for the early payments from the debtors. These are all comes under the management of debtors. Are you following, sir? When you're adopting all these policies, then only you are able to get the entire funds from the debtors. Right, sir? See, even after deploying all these policies, there is a normal bad debts, routine bad debts of 10% minimum, sir. In every organization now, 10% bad debts common. In spite of following all the credit policies, offering the cash discounts, yes or no? And assume that if you are not adopting any of these, you just estimate your bad debts. It will be some 50%, 60%. And assume that if you made it sales of 10 crores, you're able to collect only four crores or five crores. That the remaining amount loss. Are you following, sir? Every one of you. Now here, we are going to discuss about in the management of debtors, mainly two things. Number one, framing the efficient credit policies. Number two, offering the cash discount discounts now first look at the first one evaluation of the credit policies right so there are two approaches available in the evaluation of the credit policies number one total approach and number two incremental approach majority of the problems we are going to solve under the incremental approach because as it is very easy and as well as uh, involves less calculations now there is a standard format for evaluation so look at here first we'll take the incremental sales revenue by adopting that particular credit policy, by adopting that credit policy, what happens, Amma? Our sales revenue will get increased. So go ahead with the incremental sales revenue from which deduct the incremental variable cost. That will give you the incremental contribution from which you have to deduct incremental bad debts and incremental collection charges, if any, and incremental admin charges, if any, administration charges. So from the contribution, from the contribution, deduct the bad debts, Collection charges, administration charges. That will give you the incremental PBT, incremental profit before tax, from which you deduct the tax element. Then you will get the incremental profit after tax. Next, you have to find out the incremental investment in debtors. These calculations are very important. Calculation of incremental investment in debtors. I'll tell you with the help of one problem, sir, how to calculate. I'll tell you with the help of one problem. Don't worry. Okay, now, incremental investment in debtors. Right. And then you have to find out the incremental opportunity cost of loss of interest. And finally, from the incremental profit after tax, deduct the incremental opportunity cost of loss of interest. Deduct the incremental opportunity cost of loss of interest. And then you will be arrived at what am I? Incremental net benefit. This will decide whether that credit policy should be adopted or not. Okay. Now look at here. If this incremental net benefit is positive, Suppose that you got incremental net benefit of 1 lakh positive, positive 1 lakh, then it is advisable for the company to accept the proposed credit policy. Suppose that if that incremental net benefit is a negative, you got a negative 1 lakh, 
it is not advisable to accept the proposed credit policy not advisable mera credit policy adopt cheyadam valla meek benefit em raavatla despite you are getting a loss in spite of that you are getting a loss so it's not advisable for the company to adopt the credit policy clear sir next for the calculation of investment in debtors as we all know that we have three methods available sales value basis total cost basis and variable cost basis if the question is silent we have to go with what ama if the question is silent we have to go with the variable cost basis but if question specifically mentioned something yes we need to follow the same clear now look at here sir evaluation of the credit policy look at the problem number 11 X Limited wishes to increase its credit period from net thirty five to net fifty days. Net thirty five to net fifty, and that means earlier we used to give the credit period of thirty five days only, and that means if we made the credit sales on day thirty five, uh, day one, the debtors have to repay us within thirty five days. We have given thirty five days time period for the debtors for the repayment. Now this. Credit period we are going to increase from thirty five to fifty days. Man, it is just normal credit period. We increase just normal. So more and more customers come forward and more and more sales we can enjoy. You can see here, it expects the sales increases from one twenty lakhs to one eighty lakhs. So that means we can take the incremental sales sixty lakhs. Existing sales already one twenty lakhs. So now, ma, after increasing this credit period, you are going to achieve one eighty lakh sales. So what is incremental sales? Increase in sales sixty lakhs, and the average collection period to increase from thirty five days to fifty days. The bad edge loss ratio and collection cost ratio will remain at five percent to six percent respectively. The company's variable cost ratio is eighty five percent. Company's variable cost ratio eighty five percent, and the tax rate is fifty percent. And the after tax required rate of return is twenty percent. This we have to be considered while calculating the opportunity cost of loss of interest. Advise the X Limited based on the variable cost valuation, sales valuation. Right. Look at the answer. Incremental sales revenue. I've already told you sixty lakhs. How did you get this? Proposed sales one eighty lakhs minus existing sales one twenty lakhs. Okay. Then incremental variable cost. In the problem, it was mentioned variable cost ratio eighty five percent, right, sir? So, incremental sales revenue into variable cost ratio. See, whenever the variable cost is given in a ratio, we always have to apply it on sales revenue. So then you will get the variable cost fifty one lakhs. So sales minus variable cost will give you contribution nine lakhs, from which you have to deduct the bad debts at the rate of five percent and uh, collection cost at the rate of six percent. Apply on the incremental sales ma, you will get bad debts and collection cost. So from the incremental contribution, from the incremental contribution, direct the bad debts and uh, collection cost, you will get incremental PBDT, profit before tax. From which direct the tax element, you will get a ma incremental profit after tax. Now here comes the most important part: investment in debtors. How to calculate investment in debtors? Look at the working notes. Calculation of incremental investment in debtors. Right. See here in the problem, we asked to find out on variable cost valuation and as well as sales valuation. First, look at the variable cost valuation. Investment in debtors is equal to variable cost into debtors collection period divided by three sixty. What is your variable cost? Right. Sir. See, when it comes to the existing situation, the increment, uh, the total sales under existing situation one twenty lakhs. Into variable cost ratio eighty five percent. This will give you variable cost into debtors collection period under existing scenario thirty five days divided by three sixty days. So you will get the answer of nine lakh ninety one thousand six hundred and sixty seven. Sir, if we made the sales on day one, we are going to get the amount on day thirty five. On day, our investment is blocked for thirty five days, sir. For this thirty five days, how much investment is getting blocked? The answer is nine lakh ninety one thousand six hundred and sixty seven rupees. Nine lakh ninety one thousand six hundred and sixty seven investment is blocked in our debtors. That is what we call investment in debtors. You made the sales and credit basis on day one, but you are not getting amount immediately. You are getting amount on day thirty five. And day thirty five days, can you investment block in a day? 
next coming to the proposed situation where your sales are 180 lakhs into 85 percent this will give you the variable cost into 50 divided by 360 under proposed situation the credit period is 50 days divided by 360 the answer you will get a mark 21 lakh 25 thousand that means if we made the sales on day one we are going to get the amount on day 50 and in this 50 days the investment is blocked where am I? the investment is blocked in debtors how much investment is blocking ma? 21 lakh 25 thousand clear now we are finding out the incremental basis no so take the incremental investment in debtors so under existing situation it is 9.91 lakhs the investment is blocking under a proposed situation 21.25 lakhs so what is the incremental investment in debtors 11 lakh 33,333 okay or the alternative way to calculate very simple sir right for existing sales that is 120 lakhs into 85 percent this will give you your variable cost into sir existing situation any of 35 days investment is blocking additionally how much investment is blocking for additional 15 days the investment is going to be blocked because under proposed situation the credit period is 50 days already existing at 35 days allow a block out the but additional existing sales low in any road like any investment block out on for how many days your investment is going to be blocked with respect to the existing sales how many additional days additional days 15 days summer this will give you four like twenty five thousand okay and add proposed sales 180 lakhs sorry the incremental sales you have to take here that is 60 lakhs into 85 percent into 50 days divided by 360 so all chenama you will get seven lakh eight thousand three thirty three total chenama you will get eleven lakh thirty three thousand three thirty three for the incremental sales anyhow it is going to be blocked for 50 days anyhow it is going to be blocked for 50 days for the incremental sales for the existing sales additionally it will be blocked for 15 days for incremental sales it will be blocked for 50 days total put together you will get a incremental investment in data okay so 11 lakh 33333 now find out the opportunity cost of loss of interest this much amount is investing in your debtors blocking in debtors in which you are going to get a loss of interest at the rate of 20 percent the problem specifically mentioned after tax opportunity cost of interest is 20 percent so the loss of interest from this investment and take 50 days key in the investment block order mulla you can the loss of interest in the ma 2 lakh 26,667 rupees is a loss of interest okay now this loss of interest have to be deducted from your incremental profit after tax then you will get the incremental net benefit how much you are getting sir a negative of 1,6667 since your incremental net benefit is negative it is not advisable for the company to extend the credit period right it's not advisable to go ahead with the 50 days proposed credit period let's continue with existing credit period of 35 days only are you following sir every one of you right this is how you need to find out investment in debtors and opportunity cost of loss of interest clear this is one model under debtors management the other model is that evaluation of the cash discounts yeah evaluation of the cash discount policy now what is this evaluation of cash discount policy look at these examples sir we have made a credit sale of 100 lakhs and the credit period given is 30 days and at day one we have made a credit sales of 100 lakhs and this 100 lakhs we are going to receive back on day 30 yes or no right now new credit terms after we made the credit sales we have come up with a new credit terms like 2 by 10 net 30 2 by 10 net 30 what do you mean by it but this 30 representing the credit period allowed you've already allowed a 30 days credit period this 10 representing payment period and two representing the rate of cash discount rate of cash discount and day what does it mean it means if you repay 
if you repay within 10 days then you will get 2% cash discount then you will get 2% cash discount see without waiting for 30 days actually i have given you a credit period of 30 days actually i given you a credit period of 30 days but if you pay within 10 days if you pay within 10 days then you will get 2% cash discount without waiting up to day 30 suppose that you made a payment on day 10 day 10 day me pay chesaru so you are eligible for 2% cash discount ardham avutundi sir ante instead of 100 lakhs it is enough to pay 98 lakhs it is enough to pay 98 lakhs are you following or not every one of you right sir so like this sir why are we offering cash discounts the answer is that we are offering cash discounts for the early payments for the early payments from the customers earlier you have to wait up to 30 days to get back your investments to get back your investments but now within 10 days you are going to get your money sir within 10 days you are going to get your money because you are offering cash discount at least certain portion of customers will come forward and will make the payment in order to enjoy the cash benefits cash discount benefits at least even 50 percent of the customers come forward and make the payment within 10 days and the 50 lakhs you are going to get within 10 days itself early recovery of the funds that's the main objective and because of this early recovery you can make more and more investments you can accept more and more projects and you can enjoy more and more returns and the probability of bad debts also will get reduced these are all the advantages of the cash discount policy again same thing sir we need to calculate the incremental net benefit if the incremental net benefit is positive uh, go ahead with the cash discount if it is negative uh, it's not advisable for the company to offer the cash discount as simple as it cleared right sir look at this problem uh, you have incremental net benefit of 55,700. Since there is an incremental net benefit of 55,700, it is advisable for the company to adopt the liberalization scheme. Okay, now, like, look at the problem number 17. Here it is. A company presently having a credit sales of 12 lakhs existing rate sales the existing rate terms are 1 by 10 net 45 days so that means actual credit period is given 45 days but if anyone paid within 10 days he is enjoying 1% cash discount he is eligible for 1% cash discount average collection period is 30 days okay the current bad debt loss is 1.5% in order to accelerate the collection process further and also to increase the credit sales the company is contemplating liberalization of its existing rate terms to 2 by 10 net 45 days so earlier if anyone paid within 10 days he is eligible for only 1% cash discount but now he is eligible for 2% cash discount so more cash discount is offering it expects that the sales are likely to increase right uh, one third of existing sales existing sales in the mark 12 lakhs one third of existing sales and in the mark 4 lakhs and the total sales in the mark 16 lakhs Bad debts increases to 2%. Earlier it is 1.5%. Now it is increasing to 2%. Average collection period declined to 20 days. Earlier it is 30 days. Now it is declined to 20 days. Contribution to sales ratio is given 22%. Contribution ratio is given 22%. Dama. Our variable cost ratio. Variable cost ratio is nothing but 1 minus contribution ratio. You might have learned in your cost accounting. Means 1 minus 0.22. That is 0.78 or 78%. So you have to take the variable cost ratio 78%. Opportunity cost of investment in receivables is 15% pre tax. Okay. 50% and 80% customers are availing the cash discount benefits under existing and liberalization scheme. Tax rate given 30%. Should the company change its credit terms? Assume 360 days in a year. There is a question, sir. And the answer you can see here. And here we have evaluated this cash discount policy under the total approach not under incremental approach but total approach lo chesamo okay like first we have taken the sales revenue then variable cost that will give you contribution 
bandits, right? And apart from bandits, you also have another cost here that is cash discount. Cash discount. So from the contribution, deduct the bandits and cash discount, you will get PBT. Next, find out the investment in debtors for which you need to see the working notes number two investment in debtors. Existing sales amount 12 lakhs is a total sales. And we have given the credit period of 45 days, but average collection period is 30 days. No. So on an average, we are collecting our funds within 30 days. Okay. Now, so 30 divided by 360 into since we need to adopt variable cost method because for the evaluation of investment in debtors, if the problem is silent, we have to go for the variable cost basis. So 78% variable cost ratio. So under the existing scheme, the investment in debtors is 78,000. Under the liberalization scheme, 16 lakhs is your total sales and the investment is going to block for 20 days. So what is a 20 days investment? And we need to find out on variable cost basis into variable cost ratio. You get 69,333. Take the investment in debtors and then apply the rate of interest given 15 percentage. Right, sir. And the important point here, they were uh, they, they mentioned like the rate of opportunity cost of interest is given pre tax. Pre tax. So that's why while evaluating the answer, also you have to take the pre tax. That is why we find out the PBT directly. We have gone for investment in debtors and opportunity cost of loss of investment, loss of interest. We have not directed tax element here. Even though we have the tax rate information in the problem, since the loss of interest concept is given pre-tax, you have to deduct it from profits before tax only, not from profits after tax. Okay. Find out the loss of interest, deduct it from profits before tax, then you will get the net benefit. Find out the incremental net benefit. So incremental net benefit is positive. It's advisable for the company to adopt the liberalization scheme. So this is how you need to evaluate the cash discount policy. Clear, sir. Now, after that, we have a concept called factoring. The data management model, you have one more concept called factoring. Right, sir. Now, what is this concept of factoring and how to evaluate the factors proposal and everything? And uh, with this, we'll complete the data management. Next, we'll be having cash management. Then we'll be having creators management. So another half an hour to complete this marathon of working capital management clear so that i will complete in the next session sir so till then have a good day and good night sir stay home and stay safe clear a very good morning students welcome to the stray stop fm marathon classes so in the last class we have started discussion regarding our chapter number six working capital management and we have completed the first four models that is model number one, estimation of the working capital. Model number two, estimation of the working capital in the case of the double shift working. Model number three, we have learned about the different approaches or different sources available for financing the working capital. And model number four, we have learned about the operating cycle. And model number five, we are discussing about the receivables management, also known as debtors management in which we have completed two sub models that is evaluation of the credit policies and evaluation of the cash discount policies. Now time for the 5.3 third sub model in the model number five that is concept of factoring. Today's first topic concept of factoring. So now what is this concept of factoring? Look at here sir concept of factoring. Yeah. So outsourcing of Debtors management is what we call factoring, outsourcing. So generally, debtors management is a responsibility of the company. Yes, sir. Right. So that organization, that company have to take care of the debtors management. But company, that organization is busy in doing the business. Right. The financial manager is busy with taking the financial decisions procurement of the funds, investment of the funds, a lot of decisions he has to take. He is always busy. Then who will take care of this debtors management? So many of the organizations, what they are doing is they are doing the outsourcing of the same to the private companies or other companies, other institutions. Right, sir. See, nowadays, just like whenever there is some recruitment is happening, whenever there is a new placement is happening, background verification 
will be done by not by the same company will be done by the other companies so that background verification of that candidate that uh, candidate's uh, qualifications experience all this background verification will be done by the other company not by the company which is recruited to you which is recruited you are you following or not right sir so in the similar manner even the data science management also majority of the organizations outsourced there are some expert companies which are experts in this particular concept of data science management right sir so for them this work will be assigned right so for that companies the list of data will be given the aging schedule everything will be given right so accordingly that other company will take care of our data right sir so this is a concept of factoring outsourcing of the data science management is called as factoring the person or the company who providing the data science management services called as factor whoever providing that services to us the data science management services to us they are called as factors the agreement between you and that factor is called a factoring agreement factoring agreements so generally what are the different services offered by the factor the services offered by the factor number 1 credit analysis services means whenever you want to make credit sales to a group of customers first give that list of group of customers to the factor now he will verify that particular customers repayment capacity right sir his financial strengths his financial weakness the entire background verification who particular who persons uh, are the promoted this company what are the financial positions of this company what are the projects this company are handling and what are the projects these companies were handled already what are the projects they are going to be handle in the future financial strengths weaknesses what are the loans they have taken repayment history everything will be analyzed by the factor and then they will come up with a report called a credit analysis report sir you are uh, you want to sell to the 100 customers no out of this 100 customers 80 customers promptly uh, will repay you they are financially very strong 20 customers uh, they are uh, their financial position is not as good as you expecting so it's better to avoid this 20 customers so thereby what happens you know see without taking this credit analysis services from the factor if you blindly sell the goods to this 100 customers in future you are going to face 20% bad debts but now by taking the credit analysis services prior to the selling of the goods to the customers you can successfully avoid that probable bad debts yes or no second one collection agent services you have sold to the 80 customers now as per the credit analysis report given by the factor now from that 80 customers right you can do the task to the factor to collect the money from them so on a timely basis the factor will approach the debtors and collect the money from them and will be remitted to you collection agent services number 3 advances against debtors suppose that today you made sales what rupees some 10 crores and you have given a credit period of 60 days that means you are going to get back this 10 crores only after 60 days right sir but assume that on 10th day you have a contingent liability contingent liability which was uncertain you don't know on 10th day you happen to pay certain money assume that you happen to pay certain money of 5 crores rupees immediately but your funds are blocked in debtors that funds are going to be released after 60 days only now what you can do is you can give this debtors to the factor on a security basis from them you can get the advances okay factor you know that i have sold goods to this group of customers worth 10 crores take my debtors as a security and give me some advance money and uh, you can get back this advance money after 60 days anyhow after 60 days you are going to collect the money from them now you are going to collect 10 crores now out of 10 crores 5 crores you can retain along with the interest amount so that is the third service they are going to pay providers advances they will provide us the advances against our debtors and number 4 buying the debtor set a lump sum consideration means here you are not giving the debtors as a security you are selling the debtors as a lump sum consideration for a some lump sum consideration suppose that on 10th day you come up with a proposal okay factor i would like to sell off all my debtors for 9 crores if you are interested you can purchase 9 crores 10 crores worth of debtors we are selling for 9 crores 
right sir so the by the factor if he is interested he can purchase our entire data for that lump sum consideration now after 60 days he can collect 10 crores from the data so 1 crore profit to factor are you following now but what if the case if he is able to collect only 9 crores no profit no loss what if the case if he is able to collect only 8 crores there is a loss of 1 crore to factor but of course we have a concept called recourse factoring non recourse factoring that's a different case where you are going to learn in the final level amma okay now next come back now sir so by taking the services from the factor what are the advantages what are the benefits available to us what are the benefits we are going to enjoy number 1 savings in bad debts you can successfully avoid the bad debts savings in administration cost because you are not administering your debtors who is administering your factor is administering savings in collection charges yes your factor is going to collect the money from them savings in opportunity cost of loss of interest if you successfully avoid the bad debts see 20% of the customers probable bad debts and this you going to you are knowing this fact before you are making the sales so you can successfully avoid this 20% customers see without knowing this fact if you sell the goods to these customers unnecessary loss of interest on it again, the investment will be blocked in that particular 20% customers to that extent there is a loss of interest so these are all the advantages by availing the factoring services but whenever you are getting advantages you also having some cost now factor will provide you all the services not at free of cost he will charge how much he will charge factors commission 2% 3% of the collections then factor service charges and interest on loans and advances if any loan or any advance is given to you against the debtors on that particular loan on that particular advance he will charge interest he will charge interest so these are all the costs of availing the factor services end of the day what you have to see if your benefits are greater than costs advisable to avail the factor services by availing the factoring services you are getting a benefit of some 10 lakhs and uh, you are incurring a cost of some 8 lakhs so 2 lakhs net benefit positive positive so avail the factor services if benefits are lower than cost sir you are getting a benefit of only 8 lakhs but you are incurring a cost of 12 lakhs so there is a negative net benefit for availing 8 lakhs benefits 12 lakhs incurring cost we are incurring a cost of 12 lakhs not advisable to avail the factor services this is how you need to make the decision when it comes to the factoring services okay ma'am look at this problem number 18 evaluation of the factors proposal first take out the savings savings in administration cost savings in bad debts total savings 8 lakh 60 thousand total savings 8 lakh 60 thousand now coming to the cost factors commission is charging a cost of 3 lakh 60 thousand commission and uh, interest and advances 4 lakh 500 the total costs are 760500 now you can see the net benefit you are getting a benefit of 860000 against which you are incurring a cost of 760500 so there is a positive net benefit 99500 there is a positive net benefit of 99500 since there is a net benefit of rupees 99500 it is advisable to accept the factors proposal this is how you need to make the decision clear ma every one of you so with that, we have completed the debtors management concept. Okay, ma. Model number five completed. Now time for the model number six, cash management. Management of the cash, management of the bank. In this model, we are going to learn about the cash budgets and optimum cash balances models. Cash budgets. It is similar to uh, like in your uh, Accountancy, you might have learned about the cash flow statements. Cash flow statements. Actually, cash flow statements and funds flow statements earlier forming part of the financial management subject only. But recently, these subjects, uh, these chapters were removed from the syllabus and some new chapters were added, like risk analysis and capital budgeting decisions, dividend decisions analysis. Yes or no? Lease financing. Of course, now lease financing is covered at the final level, ma. But now at inter level, risk analysis and capital budgeting decisions, dividend decisions analysis, these two are covered. Yes or no? Right, sir. So cash flow statements, where you used to prepare the cash flow statements. No. At the same time, in the cost accounting also, especially in the chapter called budgetary control, where you are going to prepare some budgets like production budget, sales budget, purchases budget, expenses budget, 
cash budgets yes sir same model here we are going to prepare the cash budgets clear sir now what are we going to do in the cash budgets nothing but sir scheduling of our payments and receipts scheduling of of the payments and the receipts so when we are going to have the probable payments and when we are going to have the probable receipts by scheduling the payments and receipts we are going to find out what are the time periods where we are going to have the excess cash balances with us and what are the time periods where we are going to running out of the cash shortage of the cash balances yes or no by preparing the cash budgets you are going to get no yes sir in the month of june we are going to have some excess cash balances and there are no upcoming payments in the month of june july august so that means 3 months you are going to have the excess cash balances with you now accordingly what you can do is you can invest into the marketable securities so whenever you find that there are some excess cash balances with us and there is no nearby payments within 2 3 months there are no payments what you can do is you can invest that excess cash balances into marketable securities only into marketable securities and not into the equity shares debentures because you know they are not convertible easily into the cash marketable securities yes which can be easily convertible into the cash okay now for that short period of 2 3 months you can enjoy the interest benefits at the same time by preparing the cash budgets you are going to know the time periods at which you are going to running out of the cash or shortage of the cash balances okay in the month of october november there are no receipts for us only payments so we are going to running out of the cash so we have to make sure that in the month of october and november we are going to have the enough cash balances with us see you are preparing budget when amma at the beginning of the year budget is always for the future not for the present yes or no see for the year 2020 to 23 the budgets will be prepared in the 21 22 itself yes or no right sir or at least at the beginning of the 22 23 itself the budgets will be prepared so thereby at the beginning of the financial year itself you are going to know in which month you are going to running out of the cash in which month you are going to having the shortage of cash balances so in the month of april itself you get to know that in the month of october you are going to have a shortage of cash balance so that means from the month of april itself we have to make the necessary arrangements that in the month of october i am going to have the enough cash balances to meet my payments are you following or not ardham avutund sir every one of you right so if we have to make the necessary arrangements for the procurement of the funds for short term purposes so in the month of april itself or in the month of june july itself you need to go for the short term sources for the procurement of the funds you need to intimate your banker dear banker in the month of october i am going to have a shortage of cash balance please provide me bank overdraft in the month of october so when you are priorly intimating to the banker the banker will also get ready in the month of october he will provide you the bank overdraft are you following or not so these are all the advantages by preparing the cash budgets amma and how to prepare the cash budgets you know very well clear next next model sir optimum cash balances models right in which we are going to have the bommel's model and as well as uh, miller or model right so optimum cash balances model in this concept we are going to learn about what is the cash balance to be maintained to meet our all expenses what should be the cash balance should i maintain suppose that we have estimated the working capital 10 lakhs now out of this 10 lakhs what should be the cash balance to be maintained how much cash balance should i maintain what is my optimum cash balance out of 10 lakhs working capital also includes cash balance amma because working capital nothing but current assets minus current liabilities current assets lo what are covering amma stock debtors cash and bank balances yes or no so certain portion of your working capital is cash balances so how much cash balance should i maintain to meet my expenses at what level at higher level should i maintain or at lower level should i maintain right so that is what we are going to learn in this model optimum cash balances clear sir so first model in that william j bommel's uh, suggested ma right and it is similar to the concept of evoq economic ordering quantity optimum cash balances what are the bommel suggested 
that model is similar to EOQ concept of your materials chapter cost accounting, economic ordering quantity, right? So there you might have learned a formula called square root of two AO by C. Same on my curve. Optimum cash balance is C. Formula is equal to square root of two FT by R. Two FT by R. F stands for your annual cash requirement, ma. T stands for transaction cost and R stands for rate of interest. Optimum cash balance means to be the level of cash balance to be maintained where the interest cost is equal to your transaction cost and the total cost is minimum. Your interest cost must be equal to your transaction cost and the total cost must be lower. So the level of cash balance is where these two points are getting satisfied. That level of cash balance is what we call optimum cash balance. Are you following, sir? Right. Just like your EOQ concept, economic ordering quantity is a level of quantity at which your ordering cost is equal to your carrying cost, and the total cost is minimum. Yes or no? Every one of you, right? Here, interest costs are representing. The carrying cost amount. See, by maintaining certain cash balance with you, you are going to have some loss of interest. So let us assume you are maintaining a cash balance of one lakh with you, right? Sir? Had this one lakh would have been in the bank account, you would have received some interest now. But if one lakh me bank account lo unte me konta interest osun diga. But a one lakh ne me bank lo petto kunda cash lo me dakre pet kora malle mo to nama. Because one lakh me do you interest nik loss on it ega? That is was interest cost. Had you deposit the same one lakh into your bank account, you would have received some interest now. But by not putting the same one lakh into the bank account, you are maintaining that one lakh in cash with you. You are losing that interest now. That interest is called ma interest cost. And transaction cost is actually means to be ordering cost. Transaction cost means it is the cost you are incurring for converting your Marketable securities into cash. Every time, whenever you are need of in need of money, every time whenever you are in need of money, what you will do, ma? You will convert your marketable securities into cost. That conversion cost is what we call your transaction cost. Are you following, sir? Right. The total of interest cost and transaction cost is your total cost. Clear, sir? Right. So look at here. Yeah. Cash management, Baumol's model formula. You can see here square root of two FT by R, right? And uh, F stands for total cash requirement during the year. Annual cash requirement you have to take. T stands for transaction cost. The cost of each transaction between cash and marketable securities. R stands for rate of interest on marketable securities. By using this formula, you have to calculate the optimum cash balances model. Optimum cash balances. You can see here, sir. Right in the problem number twenty-two, you have given some lot sizes. Right, I, in that lot size, you might be asked to find out the economic lot size. Right, how to find it, ma? Right, you need to select the lot size where your transaction cost is equal to your holding cost, means your interest cost, and the total cost is minimum. Look at here, ma. At the lot size of two lakhs, your transaction cost five thousand rupees and holding cost five thousand rupees. Equal, ma. Both are equal, na. And the your total cost is minimum among all these five. Lots. The total cost is ten thousand. Is minimum at the economic lot size of two lakhs rupees. Okay, Nama. So finally, look at the conclusion. As the transaction cost is equal to your holding cost and the total cost is lower at two lakhs lot size, economic lot size is equal to rupees two lakhs. The same answer you can get by using the formula as well. Formula approach, Chudan Nama. Your annual cash requirement as given in the problem ten lakhs. Transaction cost as given in the problem one thousand rupees. Rate of interest five percent per annum. Apply the formula. Square root of two FT by R. Two into annual cash requirement ten lakhs into transaction cost thousand rupees. Divided by rate of interest by converting into decimals five percent. Ma, convert change into decimals. Look at five divided by hundred. You will get ma point zero five. And calculate ma, you will get two lakhs. Economic lot size. Okay now. And the most important point here is while calculating the holding cost. Right, you have to take the average cash balance into rate of interest. What is average cash balance, Emma? Opening cash balance plus closing cash balance divided by two. 
clear just like where you are uh, used to calculate in the carrying cost in the evq concept opening inventory plus closing inventory divided by 2 average inventory you will take into account similarly here also you have to take a average cash balance clear every one of you next after that you will be having the next model in the optimum cash balances model that is miller or model sir bommel model is already provided a concept a formula right optimum cash balance is equal to square root of 2ft by r by using this formula you will get some answer just like in the last problem you got a answer of 2 lakhs that means what bommel suggested you have to maintain 2 lakhs rupees cash balance in order to meet our all expenses but i have a doubt is mr bommel is a god no he is also just making an estimation he had applied some logics and based on that logics he is saying certain amount yes this amount you have to be maintained and this is your optimum cash balance but what if the case at the end of the day if our cash balance uh, required is more than 2 lakhs this 2 lakhs is just an estimated amount not an exact amount sir edo konni logics rules apply chesi end of the day babu meku 2 lakhs maintain cheyandamma idi mi optimum cash balance ani cheppadu kani adi kuda oka estimation e kada that is also an estimation and estimation may go wrong end of the day suppose that you ended up paying an expenditure of 2 lakh 50000 but look at your cash balance you have only 2 lakhs with you so 50000 shortage of the cash yes or no right so that's why what miller or suggested instead of maintaining a single amount an exact amount for optimum cash balances it is advisable to maintain a range okay uh, you maintain your optimum cash balance uh, your optimum cash balance is 2 lakhs to 3 lakhs so maintain your cash balance in these two limits 2 lakhs to 3 lakhs maintain your cash balance in between these two limits it should not be reduced by 2 lakhs it should not be increased by 3 lakhs so your optimum cash balance falls in between these two limits now what happens right sir if you are end of the day if you are having a expenditure amount of some 2 lakh 50000 anyhow you are maintaining your optimum cash balances in these two levels yes or no so means you are able to meet your 2 lakh 50000 cash expenditure yes or no so if you maintain exactly 2 lakhs you ended up with facing the liquidity problems but you are maintaining the cash balance in between a limit see whenever you are estimating now you are estimating between a limits are not exact see in may 2022 you are going to writing your exams amma after the completion of your exams i asked you how many marks you are expecting in the fm paper in the paper number 8 fm and economics for finance what you are going to tell me sir sir i am expecting in between 70 to 75 sir and some people said like sir i am expecting in between 80 to 90 sir and they they are going to tell a range only no not an exact amount of the marks sir i am going to get exactly 77 marks how come he sure when you are estimating you cannot estimate an exact amount right you estimating 77 exact marks but in future you may get more than 77 or in future you may get less than 77 but if you estimating in between sir i am expecting in between 70 to 80 marks end of the day after declaration of results you got 78 marks so well within your range only now yes sir no right so that is why miller or said whenever you are estimating your estimation should not be an exact amount it should be in between a range he has given ranges upper limit and lower limit so you have to maintain your cash balance in between this upper limit and lower limit so in this example the lower limit is 2 lakhs and the upper limit is 3 lakhs are you following now look at this diagram upper limit and lower limit this is your lower limit this is your upper limit okay now and in between you have a limit called a reorder level a reorder level so whenever you are having continuous cash receipts with you continuous cash receipts that means your cash balance is going to be increased 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 and fin finally your cash balance touched the upper limit right still you have a still you have a cash receipts with you then what the 
Miller or suggested is immediately purchase the marketable securities. Thereby, thereby your cash balance will get reduced. Right, sir. So purchase the marketable securities till your cash balances touches the reorder level. Once the cash balance touches the reorder level, stop purchasing the marketable securities. Stop investing in the marketable securities. Okay. Right, sir. Next, sir. Sometimes you might be having a continuous payments, whereby your cash balances are going to be reduced. Reduce, 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 and it will touches your lower limit. Still, you are having continuous cash payments. And if you make the continuous cash payments, you are going to see your cash balances falls below than lower limit. Then immediately, what Miller or suggested is sell off your securities. Sell your marketable security. Whatever marketable security you purchase here now, sell them until until your cash balance reaches to the reorder level. So when you are selling securities, no, you are getting money. You are getting liquid cash, whereby your cash balances increases, right? Until which point you have to sell, ma? Until your cash balances reaches to reorder level, return point. Okay, now once your cash balances reaches to return point, stop selling the securities. Clear? So this is what Miller or suggested. Your cash balances shall not exceed the higher limit. Shall not falls below the lower limit. Maintain the cash balances in between these two limits. That is your optimum cash balance. Now, how to find out all these? Very simple, ma. You have formula. Upper limit H is equal to three Z plus L. Return point R is equal to L plus Z. Now, what do you mean by the Z here? Z is equal to cube root of three T V divided by four I. Cube to root of three TV divided by four I. T stands for transaction cost. V is equal to variance of daily cash flows. I is equal to rate of interest. Okay now. Now spread. Spread means the difference between the upper limit and lower limit. The difference between upper limit and lower limit. That is what we call spread. H minus L and average cash balances four R minus L divided by three. Okay now. So by using these formulas, you need to find out the necessary amounts. Now, process for finding out nth root of a number, because here you have cube root. In your calculator, you have only square root. You only have the square root button, not cube root button in your calculator. And scientific calculators are not allowed into our examination hall. Then how, sir? How to find out the cube root? I have a, a process mentioned here, ma. By following this process, you can easily find out the. Cube root, or for that matter, any root, by using your calculator. Okay, ma'am. Look at here. Uh, I'll explain you some examples here. Process for finding out of the nth root of a number. Step number one: Type the number for which uh, the nth root is required. Right, sir. Uh, suppose that. <clears throat> right. Suppose that you want to know the uh, cube root of two, right? And the answer you got the eight, ma. Answer you got the eight, right? So you need to start with the number eight. Clear. <clears throat> so that means uh, cube root of eight. This is you want to find out, sir. Cube root of eight. So then you need to start with the eight. Type the number for which nth root is required. Type eight on your calculator. Then press the square root button for twelve times. Right uh, on your calculator, you will be having square root button now. Press it for twelve times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Then subtract one from whatever the answer you got on your calculator now. From that. Value deduct one, subtract one, so minus one. Then whatever the answer you got, divide it by three. So divide it by three. Now whatever the answer you got for which add one, plus one, plus one, and final step. Listen carefully. Press into multiplication button. Into and is equal to buttons in combination for twelve times. In combination means. Simultaneously, like into is equal to into is equal to into is equal to simultaneously. So into is equal to one time into is equal to two times like that for twelve times. Press it for twelve times. Three, four, five. 
So when you pressing it, the is equal to button for twelfth time into is equal to for twelfth time. Now, right, you will be having the answer to on your calculator. Are you following, sir? Every one of you, right? So that is how you need to make the cube root of any given number, any given number. Clear, sir? So here you have. Uh, the cube root of this particular number, how much, Amma? Three hundred and seventy-five, thirty-seven thousand five hundred crores. Thirty-seven thousand five hundred crores. For which value you have to have, get the cube root? Cube root of thirty-seven thousand five hundred crores. Follow the same procedure. Follow the same procedure. Three seventy-five, and then nine zeros, na? Right, your calculator will be full. Three seventy-five nine zeros thirty-seven thousand five hundred crores. For which you want to know the cube root. Same process. Press the square root button for twelve times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Then minus one. Then divided by three. Then plus one. And finally, into is equal to button for twelve times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so end of that twelfth button. Whenever you're pressing the twelfth button, no, uh, into and is equal to, then you will be having the answer seven three five one point six something like that. You will get. You can round it up to seven three five two seven thousand three fifty two. The square root of, uh, sorry, cube root of thirty seven thousand five hundred crores is seven thousand three fifty two. Seven thousand three fifty two. You can write down your calculator. Approximately, you will get now seven thousand three fifty two. Approximately, you will get clear, sir. Next, and once you get the z value, you know the remaining calculations are very simple. And after that, in the cash budget, uh, in the uh, model itself, we have the sub models called concentration banking and log box approach. Concentration banking and log box approach. You now, what are these concepts? First, look at the concentration banking and lockbox approach models. Uh, first, let us try to understand. First of all, the main important point here is at present days these concepts are not having any relevance. Amma, these concepts have the relevance in the years nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, and even that prior period nineteen sixties, nineteen fifties, where there are no concept called internet banking, no concept called internet banking, no concept called IMPS. RTGS, NEFT, UPI payments, right, ma? When the days where all these facilities are not available, right? Only in that particular days, these concepts have some relevance. Concentration banking and lockbox approach. At present days, ma, these are not having any relevance at all. Because first, let us try to understand the concept. Suppose that. You are having your uh, outlet, your place of business in Hyderabad, and you are having the customers across the India. You have the customers in Delhi. You have the customers in Bangalore. You have the customers in Chennai. You have the customers in Kolkata. Right in all the metropolitan cities, you have the customers. Now look at the example. Uh, Hyderabad, from where you are selling the goods to Delhi, from one of the customers, uh, worth rupees five lakhs. In the credit period given is sixty days. Look at this example. On fifth of May, nineteen eighty-seven, we have sold the goods. Credit period given sixty days. That means if you sell the goods today, after sixty days only, you are going to get your money. And anyhow, for the sixty days, there is an opportunity cost of loss of interest, right? Sixty days, the investment block out on the investment means the loss of interest. Yes or no? Next, next, sir. On fourth of July, nineteen eighty-seven. So, if you calculate the sixty time, sixty uh, days time limit, amma, uh, like uh, the sixty days time limit is going to be end with fourth of July. On fourth of July, he draw a check, right? He draw a check on our name, five lakhs rupees, right? And he sent through post, right? Ma, man, pay me the check draw check, sir. Draw check, see through post. Dwara manak pumpit sir. He sent through post, and when are we going to get that post? Immediately. Morning post just evening kala Hyderabad ko chhasda. Demi Hyderabad lo na Delhi sugna kono Amir Pet ko Amir Pet nochi 
సనత్ని వరకు వెళ్ళడం కాదు రైట్ సార్ ద పోస్ట్ షుడ్ కమ్ ఫ్రమ్ ఢిల్లీ ఆల్ ద వే టు హైదరాబాద్ రైట్ సో ఇట్ విల్ టేక్ టైమ్ సార్ ఓల్డ్ అండ్ డేస్ వీఆర్ ఇన్ ద ఓల్డ్ అండ్ డేస్ నైన్టీన్ ఎయిటీస్ నైన్టీన్ సెవెంటీస్ వేర్ వీ డోంట్ హ్యావ్ ఈవెన్ ద ప్రాపర్ ట్రాన్స్పోర్టేషన్ ఫెసిలిటీస్ ఆస్ వెల్ ద పోస్టల్ వ్యాన్ విచ్ స్టార్టెడ్ ఇన్ ఢిల్లీ ఇట్ విల్ రీచ్ హైదరాబాద్ ఓన్లీ ఆఫ్టర్ వన్ వీక్ బికాస్ ఢిల్లీ టు హైదరాబాద్ దెర్ ఆర్ సో మెనీ స్టేట్స్ there are so many post offices that postal van will go to the head post offices of every state and city collect the posts which are having the destination to hyderabad or nearby places right ma then it will reach us to hyderabad after one week only seven days right the seven days time period is what we call mailing float next finally on 11th of july 1987 check reaches to hyderabad and received by our company immediately after receiving the check you don't send the check for collection because you are going to send a bunch of checks for collection not a single check for collection yes or no generally in the organizations what happens no whenever they are going to send the checks for collection they won't send a single check they will send bunch of checks they will wait until a bunch received a bunch of 20 checks or 30 checks see from different customers you are going to receive the checks every day on an average right once a bunch of 20 checks received then you will send the checks to banker for collection meanwhile the check will be lying with you only you will make the proper accounting entries and everything books of accounts lo entries pass cheskone any cheskone sariki 4 5 days pattuddamma by the time of 4 5 days you will receive a bunch of checks then you will send the checks for collection the five days even after the check received to you the check will be with you for five days this is what we call a processing float and finally a bunch of checks received and you deposited in the bank for collection immediately the banker will uh, get the money and will realize to your account will credit to your account no sir if it is an intra branch check means you and your customer have the account in the same bank and in the same branch it will take at least one day for realization and creating the money to your account if it is an inter branch check means you both are having the account in a same bank but in a different branches you have sbi dilchuk nagar account right and your customer having sbi jantar mantar branch account in delhi there is a place called jantar mantar very famous place right so both of you having the same account uh, uh, account in the same bank sbi but the branches are different you having in a hyderabad branch and your customer having in a delhi branch inter branch checks it will take at least 3 days for clearance 3 days for clearance and uh, creating the amount to your account if it is an inter bank checks assume that you have a account in sbi you are customer having an account in icici it will take at least one week for the check clearance and creating the money to your account suppose that in our case 3 uh, days time limit was taken right uh, within 3 days the bank money uh, was realized and created to our account and this 3 days is what we call banking float totally chudamma you have a mailing float of 7 days processing float of 5 days and 3 days banking float totally 15 days ante even after the check was drawn on your name you are going to get the money only after 15 days of any how i already have a 60 days opportunity cost of loss of interest in addition to that now in additionally 15 days also i have to face the opportunity cost of loss of interest చెక్ మన పేరు మీద రాసి పంపించినప్పటికీ కూడా ఆ చెక్ రియలైజ్ అయ్యి అమౌంట్ మన అకౌంట్ కి క్రియేట్ అవడానికి పదిహేను రోజులు టైం పడుతుందమ్మా డిస్పైట్ ఆఫ్ ద ఫ్యాక్ట్ దట్ ద చెక్ వాజ్ డ్రాన్ ఆన్ యువర్ నేమ్ బట్ ద అమౌంట్ వాజ్ రియలైజ్ అండ్ క్రియేటెడ్ టు యువర్ అకౌంట్ ఓన్లీ ఆఫ్టర్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ డేస్ సో దిస్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ డేస్ ఆల్సో యూ హ్యావ్ ఆపర్చునిటీ కాస్ట్ ఆఫ్ లాస్ ఆఫ్ ఇంట్రెస్ట్ దిస్ ఇస్ వాట్ వీ కాల్ టోటల్ ఫ్లోట్ పీరియడ్ డిలే పీరియడ్ in order to reduce this float period the following concepts have been introduced number one concentration banking number two lock box approach now what is this concentration banking very simple amma very simple right uh, first of all you have to identify where your customers are locating major customers so my major customers are locating in delhi okay fine in delhi where they are locating they are locating in the jantar mantar okay ma'am jantar mandir is a place for protest is a famous for protest you have seen anna hazare protest for lokpal bill where ma jantar mandir so no 
the farmers have fight against the uh, the farmers new farmers reformation bills where am i jantar mantar yes or no right so for every area every city ma there are some places we have some places for protesting against to some bills and rules and laws in hyderabad we have a place called gun park indira park necklace road tank band secretariat these are all the famous places for protest okay now so your majority of the customers are locating in jantar mantar area sir now what you have to do is you have to open a bank account in that particular area and you have to give instructions to all the customers who are there in the jantar mantar are nearby to deposit the checks into that particular bank are you following sir and you have, i have another customer major customers in chennai where in uh, nungambakkam there is a place called nungambakkam in chennai right uh, then you have to go there and open a bank account in the nungambakkam and you have to give the instructions to uh, your uh, customers to deposit directly the money into that particular bank account in kolkata your major customers are locating in uh, rajarhat rajarhat there is a place called rajarhat new town new town new town rajarhat in kolkata majority of the customers are locating there then you have to go there and open a bank account and you have to give the instructions to the customers to directly deposit into that particular bank so first of all what you have to do is you have to identify where your major customers are locating go there open a bank account and give instructions to your customers to deposit the money directly into that particular bank account are you following sir every one of you so thereby what are the advantages to you mailing float will be reduced the customer from delhi there is no need to send the check from delhi to hyderabad mailing float completely eliminated processing float see when you receive the check to your company then only you will be having processing float you need to wait for the bunch of checks you need to wait for the accounting treatment everything but when check was directly deposit into the bank there is no processing float and you might be having mostly banking float amma adu kuda hardly 2 or 3 days and your total float is just 2 days earlier amma total float 15 days now it has been reduced to 2 days and 13 days nike endamma 13 days nike kuda float period reduce ayindiga and to that extent there is a savings in opportunity cost of loss of interest anta ayiga yes or no right so here whether adopting the concentration banking system advantages or not how to identify very simple amma you have to uh, find out the cost of concentration banking system and then you have to identify what are the benefits from concentration banking system if benefits are more than cost go for the concentration banking system if benefits are lower than cost not advisable to adopt next lock box approach what is this lock box approach very simple amma here also same you have to identify where your major customers are locating and in that places what you have to do is instead of opening a bank account right sir what you have to do is you have to take a postal box on rental basis a postal box on rental basis okay now post boxes in post offices you might find the first boxes right sir so take a post box on rental basis and you have to give instructions to your customers to drop the uh, drop the checks in that particular post box or you can go to the bank and in that bank you can take a drop down box on higher basis drop down box okay now because if you ask your customer to go to the bank and deposit the check into the bank he may hesitate to go to the bank and deposit the same into your bank account because old and see now where does it sell people go to the bank on a monday morning you will find lot of queues yes or no right but look at the situation of 1970s 1980s imagine how the banks are crowded they don't go sir they don't want to waste their time in banking queues that's why you just take a drop down box on rental basis in the banks you just give instructions to your customers to drop the checks into that particular drop down box matter of 5 minutes yes or no right 
So, and then you have to give the instructions to the banker to see the drop down boxes, to see the post boxes on a regular time intervals, morning ones, afternoon ones, evening ones. If any checks were dropped into that particular box, take out the checks and deposit it into my account. This is what log box approach. Okay, now. So, again, you need to see the benefits and costs, right? If you have the benefits more than cost, advantageous to adopt log box approach. If your benefits are lower than cost, not advantageous. Okay, ma? Right. Next. Next, we have a concept called MPBF, Maximum Permissible Banking Finance, MPBF. Uh, this is actually whenever you are going to the bank for the working capital loans. Suppose that you, you went to the bank for a working capital loan of 20 lakhs. Working capital loan of 20 lakhs. The banker will not give you the entire amount as working capital loan. Because while the banker giving the working capital loans, he has to follow the Tandon committee recommendations. Tandon committee has made some recommend, uh, recommendations to the bankers to be followed at the time of issuing the working capital loan. They have to comply with the Tandon committee recommendations. What the Tandon committee suggested, recommended. Look at here, Ma. X Limited have a current assets of 100 lakhs, which includes core current assets 10 lakhs. And they have a current liabilities of 60 lakhs. So means the working capital requirement is 40 lakhs. Current assets minus current liabilities is a working capital, yes or no? So they are having a working capital requirements of 40 lakhs a month. Now look at the method one, what suggested by the Tandon committee. The Tandon committee suggested when a person coming to you for the first time for the working capital loan, you have to give only 75% of the working capital as loan. Only 75%. You come for working capital loan of 40 lakhs a month. And the low 75% in the 30 lakhs. So give him only 30 lakhs working capital loan because see, there must be certain portion from the contributor itself, right? Proprietor itself. See, I'm a proprietor of a business. I went to a bank for the working capital loan of 40 lakhs. Then immediately banker asked me, sir, out of this 40 lakhs, what is your personal investment? personal investment in later, but double is only business just count up. Right, but no loss of several more by the banker both other. Banker get out, last face face, they knew the own double name invest in it. Yes or no? The banker will definitely ask you, what is your personal investment in this particular 40 lakh? If you said like, no, sir, I don't have any personal investment. Just you give me money, enter 40 lakhs. I'll do the business. If I get the profits, I will enjoy the profits. If I get the lots, you have to face the losses. Whether the banker accepts, if you get the losses from the business, who is going to suffer a month? Not you, because you have not invested any your personal investment. No, who invested the banker? No, you simply do one thing that is what we call a ma? insolvency petition. Insolvency petition. Or you fly away to foreign countries just like Vijay Malia, Nero Modi. Yes or no? Right? So that's why what the Tandon committee recommended. Make sure that 25% of working capital is funded by the proprietor himself. Only 75% you have to give. That's the method number one. 0.75 uh, into current assets minus current liabilities. And the current assets minus current liabilities and the your working capital. So only 75% of working capital requirement should be given as loan. Next, method two. When he is coming second time for working capital loan, then what you have to do is, only 75% of current assets you have to consider for working capital minus current liabilities. What is your current assets? 100 lakhs. 100 lakhs into 75%. 75 lakhs. Minus current liabilities? 60 lakhs. So only 15 lakhs loan you have to give. Only 15 lakhs loan you have to give. And when he's coming third time for the working capital loan, what Tandon committee suggested out of the total current assets, core current assets must be funded by the proprietor himself. Core current assets and very important current assets, 10 lakhs. These must be funded by the proprietor himself. With respect to core current assets, we don't give even one rupee as a loan. 
the full core current assets should be funded by proprietor himself on the remaining current assets now consider only 75 percent means so 0.75 into current assets minus core current assets minus current liabilities and the third time you are going to get a loan of only 7.5 lakhs look at amma first time when you go on for the loan you get 30 lakhs second time 15 lakhs and third time just 7.5 lakhs only and they, the working capital requirement loan the working capital loan sanctioned by the banker is getting reduced time by time my initial days the banker is giving you 75 percent because you are need of money but over the time after four or five years you will be having the enough profits with you you will be having the enough return earnings with you that's why the banker will provide you very less amount as working capital loan are you following or not this is what the tandem company suggested clear this is the concept of maximum permissible banking finance mpbf clear next after that the last model that is management of payables management of payables nothing but creditors management also known as what among creditors management now you will get a doubt here sir we learned the concept called data management you said the data management is very very important because our entire investment is blocked in data if you are not properly managing the data we are going to face the losses sometimes we need to shut down the business but why why there is a need to manage the creditors are they are equal important to data creditors are equal as equal as importance to data as important as debtors answer is yes debtors management yenta important ho creditors management kuda ante important amma whatever the priority you are giving to the debtors management the same priority you should give to the creditors management because there is a old saying in english there is a old saying in english what is that the old saying if you want to sell well first you have to buy well you always have a target of selling 1 lakh units in a month 1 lakh units in a month that's your target but if you want to reach your target first you might have purchased 1 lakh units no so when you have a purchase of 1 lakh units then only you can sell 1 lakh units if you purchase 10,000 units you are going to sell only 10,000 units na? right the quantity you purchase the same quantity you are going to sell so if you have a high target of sales you must purchase high target yes or no so if you want to sell well first you have to buy well one lakh units target reach all and day first one lakh units container the target reach so that's why creators management as equal as as important as data management clear now creators management what are we going to do in this model Sir, just like when we offering the cash discount to our customers for early recovery of the money, so as our creditors, for our creditors, we are debtors. Our creditor could have money cash discounts offer just sir. Our creditors will offer the cash discounts to us. Now the question arises: Should I avail this cash discount or not? Should I avail this cash discount or not? If I avail this cash discount, what are the advantages and disadvantages to me? If I am not availing this cash discount, what are the advantages and disadvantages to me? This you have to analyze here. Look at this example, sir. Availment of cash discount. Suppose that your creditor offered you credit terms like this 2 by 10 net 30. 2 by 10 net 30. And that means actually the credit period given to you is 30 days a month. But if you pay within 10 days, then you can enjoy 2% cash discount. You can enjoy more 2% cash discount. Right, sir. So you have to make the payment of 98 rupees only, but within 10 days. Suppose you purchase for 100 rupees a month. Cash discount 2% and no net and the pay chali 98. You have to pay 98 rupees within 10 days. No, sir. I would like to pay uh, uh, within 30 days then you have to pay 100 rupees. When you are not availing cash discount, you have to make the payment of 100 rupees within 30 days. 
right sir so either you have to pay on day 10 you have the options on day 10 if you wish to pay you have to pay 98 rupees later sir i would like to pay on day 30 on day 30 then you have to pay ma on day 30 100 rupees you have the advantage if you pay on day 10 98 rupees you are going to pay sir right sir these are the two options you have if you opt to pay on day 10 you have to pay 98 rupees if you opt to pay on day 30 you have to pay 100 rupees now sir when you availing the cash discounts what is the benefit you are getting amma two rupees benefit you are getting two rupees benefit you are getting sir cash discount rupam lo two rupees benefit of sunmego now you have to compare this two rupees benefit with opportunity cost of investing this 98 rupees for 20 days sir suppose that if you invest this 98 rupees for 20 days assume that you are going to get a benefit of 3 rupees right sir and they, for availing 2 rupees benefit you are losing 3 rupees benefit 3 rupees opportunity cost you are losing so it is not advisable to avail the cash discount right see you have the money with you but if you invest that money right for the 20 days more on day 10 instead of paying 98 rupees to the creditor if i invest at 98 rupees for another 20 days right i will get interest now for the 20 days that interest is let us say 3 rupees but if i avail the cash benefit uh, cash discount i'm getting only 2 rupees benefit i'm losing interest of 3 rupees what is the point in it so it's not beneficial to avail the cash discount suppose that if i invest this amount for 20 days Suppose that I am going to get only one rupee interest. Now it's benefit to avail the cash discount. Adamotunda. Avail the cash discount, pay the amount in 90, uh, pay the amount in 10 days, pay 98 rupees, enjoy 2 rupees cash discount. Clear. This is how you need to make the analysis of availing the cash discount or not. And for finding out, we have a formula, sir. Opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount, D divided by 100 minus D into 365 days divided by N minus P. D stands for cash discount, N stands for credit period, that 30 days is a answer in our question and P stands for payment period, 10 days. Apply the answer, ma. Uh, the credit terms given how much, ma? 2 by 10 net 30. Gada. So D, cash discount, then the ma, 2 percentage divided by 100 minus D, 100 minus 2 into 365 divided by N minus P. N and N, ma, credit period, total credit period given, 30 days. Minus P and 10, ma, payment period. What is the payment period? Ma, 10 days. 30 minus 10. So 2 divided by 98 into 360 divided by 20. Calculate chenna, ma, you'll get opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount 37.24%. Right, sir. 37.24%. Suppose that the rate of return on investment of 98 rupees for 20 days. Right? So 20 days, mere investment chase on day, 98 rupees. Ni, you are going to get an opportunity cost of 40% per annum. 40% per annum. So if opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount is greater than return on investment, advisable to avail the cash discount. If opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount is less than return on investment, suppose that your opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount is 37.24%, where the rate of return on investment is, uh, just a second, sir. Yes, if uh, opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount is less than written on investment, your opportunity cost of foregoing cash discount 37.24% and your written on investment 40%. And instead of going for cash discount, it's better to reinvest. Right, sir? Better to invest that 98 rupees for 20 days, enjoy 40% rate of return. Okay, now. Hardly you are foregoing just 37.24% benefit, but you are getting 40% ben 40 benefit here. It is advisable not to avail the cash discount. Are you following, sir, every one of you? Clear? Next. And there is one more formula for the calculation of opportunity cost of foregoing the cash discount. The formula is 100 divided by 100 minus D square root of uh, whole root of 365 divided by T minus 1. Where D is the cash discount and T is a net period. And nothing but credit period minus discount period. In our example, 
క్రెడిట్ పీరియడ్ గివెన్ థర్టీ డేస్ మైనస్ డిస్కౌంట్ పీరియడ్ టెన్ డేస్ అంటే మీకు ఆన్సర్ ఎంత వస్తుందమ్మా ట్వంటీ డేస్ వస్తుంది ఓకేనా దిస్ ఫార్మ్లో యూ హ్యావ్ టు అప్లై వెన్ దెర్ ఈస్ ఎ రీ ఇన్వెస్ట్మెంట్ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ ప్రొవైడెడ్ ఇన్ ద క్వశ్చన్ దెర్ ఈస్ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ రిగార్డింగ్ ద రీ ఇన్వెస్ట్మెంట్ ఇఫ్ వీ రీ ఇన్వెస్ట్ దిస్ మచ్ అమౌంట్ ఫర్ దిస్ మచ్ డేస్ యూ విల్ గెట్ దిస్ మచ్ రేట్ ఆఫ్ రిటర్న్ ఇఫ్ రీ ఇన్వెస్ట్మెంట్ రేట్ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ ఇస్ ప్రొవైడెడ్ ఇన్ ద ప్రాబ్లమ్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు అప్లై దిస్ ఫార్ములా సార్ లైక్ లుక్ ఎట్ ద ప్రాబ్లమ్ నెంబర్ ట్వంటీ సిక్స్ ఐ విల్ షో యూ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ సార్ యా దిస్ ఇస్ అ ప్రాబ్లమ్ నెంబర్ ట్వంటీ సిక్స్ look at here uh, abc limited has been offered great terms of its major supplier of 2 by 10 net 45 hence the company has a choice of paying 98 rupees per 100 right and that means if the company able to pay within 10 days enough to pay 98 rupees instead of 100 or to invest 98 rupees for an additional 35 days and eventually pay the supplier 100 per 100 right sir when you opted to pay within 45 days not within 10 days then you have to pay 100 rupees no ardham avutunda so 98 rupees ni for additional 35 days you can reinvest clear so there is a information regarding reinvestment the decision as to whether the discount should be accepted depends upon the opportunity cost of investing 98 rupees for 35 days what the company should do if the opportunity cost is 25% so reinvestment rate information provided sir that is why we have used the second formula if this information is not provided then you can use the first formula d divided by 100 minus g into 365 divided by n minus p that formula you can use clear so with this we have completed the management of payables that is creditors management so we have completed both management of current assets and management of current uh, liabilities that means we have completed the management of working capital and the working capital management chapter completed clear amma so with this totally six chapters completed sir out of the total 10 chapters six chapters completed and uh, i can say that these six chapter weightage is almost 75% because the remaining four chapters uh, advanced concepts in investment decisions risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions dividend decisions analysis ratios analysis these four chapters okay now and in that you know only the ratios analysis will have the uh, lengthiness remaining three chapters now very less time we can complete clear sir every one of you okay now so in the next class i am going to start with the advanced concepts in investment decisions okay right so till then See you in the next class here. Have a good day and good night. Stay home and stay safe. A very good afternoon students. So welcome to the Stray Star FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we have completed a discussion regarding chapter number six, working capital management. Now time for the chapter number seven, advanced concepts in investment decisions. Right, sir. See, we have already learned chapter number two, investment decisions. Yes or no, ma? Chapter number two, we have learned investment decisions. In this chapter, we have learned all the fundamentals, basics of this investment decisions chapter. Like we have learned about the various project evaluation techniques, like traditional techniques, average rate of return, payback period method, and uh, discounting techniques like NPV, IRR, profitability index yes or no they are all the fundamentals basics of investment decisions part one and this is part two advanced concepts in investment decisions now we are going to see the advanced concepts if you remember sir in the discounting techniques totally we have five techniques in chapter number two we have discussed about only four techniques four discounting techniques we discussed about what we discussed about npv then irr then profitability index method and we also discussed about the discounted payback period method one method we have ignored in chapter number two that is terminal value method and this terminal value method we are going to cover in this chapter terminal value method which is also known as a modified npv method clear sir right now in this chapter what are we going to learn in this chapter we are going to learn about the different topics like 
important adjustments in the investment decisions analysis while you are making the investment decisions analysis there are certain expenses you have to be ignored and there are certain expenses you have to be considered and then block of assets method replacement analysis method modified npv or terminal value method then modified irr method and finally npv irr conflicts okay ma let us see one by one so first model number one important adjustments in investment decisions analysis just now i said no while making the investment decisions there are certain expenses there are certain expenses to be ignored and there are certain expenses to be considered so what are the expenses to be ignored and what are the expenses to be considered let us see one by one first expenses to be considered so while making the investment decisions you have to consider certain expenses like opportunity cost opportunity cost of investing that particular money in the project suppose that there is a project x where i am investing 10 crores rupees right sir now if i invest this 10 crore rupees in project y the same 10 crore rupees assume that i am going to earn some 2 crores rupees returns this is my investment Ten crores is my investment, and my returns are two crores. But instead of investing in the project Y, I am investing in project X. Now the returns from the project Y, that is two crores, will become opportunity cost for project X, two crores. Now from the project, if I am able to collect the returns more than two crores, then only the project is viable to me. Yes or no? If from the project I am able to generate only some 1.5 crores return or 1 crore return then selecting the project is is not a wise idea wise decision because already project y is there which is giving you 2 crores returns now instead of investing in project y you are investing in the project x and where you are getting returns of only 1 crore or 1.5 crores so not a wise decision Project is why project X is viable only when the returns from the project X is more than two crores. So if the project X X is able to recover my opportunity cost of two crores, then only my project X is viable to me, advisable to me. Yes or no? So that's why opportunity cost should be considered. And the second one, the fixed cost exclusively incurred for the project. Whatever the fixed cost you are incurring exclusively for this project. that fixed cost you have to be considered normal fixed cost you have to be ignored amma but the fixed cost which are exclusively incurred for the project that fixed cost you have to be considered compulsorily okay ma these two are the main expenses to be considered next next there are certain expenses to be ignored there are certain expenses to be ignored what are the expenses to be ignored like first one depreciation because it is a non cash expenditure depreciation is a non cash expenditure hence we have to be ignored while making the investment decision yes or no right but of course we are considering the depreciation only for the purpose of taking the tax benefits out of it do you remember sir while calculating the cfat pbdt minus depreciation pbt minus tax pat add back depreciation cfat so once we are deducting and later we are adding back so the ultimate impact will be zero sir next second one sunk cost sunk cost means the cost which are already incurred in the past past expenses so past expenses you have to just ignore ma suppose that you already purchased a land in the year some uh, 2000 you purchased a land just a second sir you purchased a land for 10 crores right sir and this land you have purchased during the previous year 2020 2021 2020 now assume that during the previous year 2023 24 you are going to construct a building on it right sir on that particular land now whether the construction of the building is viable or not construction of a factory building on that particular land is viable or not 
Now, while you're making this decision, the cost of the land, you have to be simply ignore because you have not purchased the land for the construction of this building, right? It's already incurred. It's a past expenditure. You have not purchased this land exclusively for the construction of this building. Clear. So all the sunk costs, you have to be ignored while making investment decisions. Overheads allocated, right, sir? See, if you have some five departments and assume that you have incurred an overhead of, let it be some 100 lakhs. You have incurred overheads of some 100 lakhs, right, sir? Now, when you're allocating the overheads to this particular departments, four departments, assume you that four departments. Overheads incurred in the month, overheads incurred 100 lakhs. So 100 lakhs divided by what? 100 lakhs divided by four departments you have. So overheads allocated in the cinema, 25 lakhs or cinema. Overheads allocated 25 lakhs per department. Suppose that you have increased one more department. So 100 lakhs, the same 100 lakhs you are going to allocate between the five departments. Earlier you used to have only four departments. Now you have five departments. Now you have the five departments. Okay, sir. So now it will come. So how much, sir? It will come to be 20 lakhs. Every one of you following now. So over it's allocated. You are not incurring that indirect expenditure exclusively for this project. Whether you had this department or not, the overheads allocated, the amount of overheads will remain to be same 100 lakhs. Right. If you take the example of a departmental store like DMART, Big Bazaar, Spencer's, Suppose that they have only four departments in their departmental store, like stationery, groceries, right, Ma? And then uh, you will be having some footwear and some uh, clothes. Now you have added five, fifth department as well. Right, so fifth department also you have added. So earlier four departments are there where the overheads are 100 lakhs. Now the fifth department were added in the same building. So whether you are going to pay any additional salary to the, uh, the, the security guard of that building, dear security guard, we have added one more department here. So we are increasing your salary. No, you're not going to increase. Whether you are going to increase any rent amount to your uh, landlord, we have added in the same building, in the same space, you have added one more department. Are you going to pay an additional rent to the landlord? No, you're not going to pay any additional rent to the landlord. So the overheads will remain to be same. Earlier, the same allocated between four departments. Now the same allocated between five departments. Right, sir. So you are not incurring any additional overheads exclusively for the fifth department. Now, what are the fifth department getting allocation of 20 lakhs overheads? That should be ignored while making investment decisions. Next, common cost. Common cost means whether this department is existing or not. These expenses are common, like some advertisement expenses. You are going to advertise your shop as a whole, your branch as a whole, not for department wise, right? Common cost. So all that common cost you have to be ignored. So these are the important consideration while uh, you have kept in mind while you're making the investment decisions. Okay, now next. Replacement or modernization decisions. Replacement decisions. But generally in the chapter number two, whatever you have done is a single decision. Should I purchase a plant and machinery or not? Only one decision. But now in chapter number seven, you are going to make two decisions. Number one, should I dispose of my existing machinery should I dispose of existing machinery or not number two should I purchase a new machinery or not Two decisions. Should I continue with the existing plant and machinery or should I replace the existing plant and machinery with the new machinery? Two decisions you have to make. 
replacement decision should i replace my existing machinery with the new plant and machinery or not right sir now here for making the replacement decisions you have two options available number one uh, by using the total approach under total approach have to make a decision sir first you have to find out the npv under total approach and uh, uh, means npv under existing situation and npv under proposed situation compare both of these npvs if npv under proposed situation is greater than npv under existing situation then it is advisable to go for the replacement decisions it is advisable to replace the old machinery with the new machinery right so here you have to find out the npv two times under existing situation under the proposed situation under total approach uh, you know it is normally be avoided because it will take lot of time a lot of calculations will be involved right now the second method available is incremental approach under incremental approach we will consider only the incremental information that means by installing the new plant and machinery in the place of the old plant and machinery what are the incremental sales i am getting what are the incremental cash inflows what are the incremental cash outflows only the incremental information you have to take into account and thereby you need to find out the incremental npv if incremental npv is positive accept the project if incremental npv is negative reject the project are you following sir every one of you that is how you need to make the decisions under incremental approach replacement decisions clear every one of you and while you are doing this problems under replacement decisions now there are some additional steps you are going to have generally npv consisting of four steps what are the four steps amma step number 1 calculation of present value of cash outflows step number 2 calculation of present value of operating cash inflows step number 3 calculation of present value of terminal cash inflows and step number 4 calculation of npv right these are the four steps while we are calculating the npv but here while you are making the replacement decisions na when additional working notes comes into picture this is additional working notes calculation of net sale proceeds of the existing machinery as and today because you are going to calculating the npv by assuming that i am replacing the old machinery with the new machinery so when you are taking the assumption that you are replacing the old machinery with new machinery means what ma you are going to sell your old machinery you are going to sell your old machinery now when i am selling the old machinery as done today what is my net sale proceeds the additional working note you have to do look at here sir uh, if you go through the problem the information will be provided there uh, here it is problem number 3 here is more an existing company has a machine which has been in operation for 2 years already we had in existing machinery which has already been in operation since 2 years its remaining useful life is 10 years in cut 10 years life undi ma both put together means the total life of the machinery is 12 years with no salvage value at the end and the end of the 12th year end of the life of the machinery there is no salvage value its current market value is 1 lakh as on today its current market value is 1 lakh so that is why here we have taken a gross sale proceeds 1 lakh return on value of the machinery the cost of the machinery how much sir purchase price of the existing machinery 2 lakh 40000 right life 12 years salvage value zero we know the depreciation formula cost of the machinery 240000 minus solvage value 0 divided by life 12 years depreciation per annum 20000 so and you have used the machine for 2 years it's already been in existence for 2 years so 2 years depreciation in the amount 40000 so what is the present return on value 240000 original cost minus 40000 depreciation for 2 years so the return on value as and today 2 lakhs but 2 lakhs worth machinery you are selling for 1 lakh so there is a capital loss of 1 lakh since you have a loss you will get tax shield tax benefit at the rate of 50 percentage 50000 tax benefit so by selling the machinery you are getting 1 lakh plus tax benefit you are getting 50000 so that means the net sale proceeds 1 lakh 50000 net sale proceeds in the ma 1 lakh 50000 
right so by selling the plant and machinery as on today you are going to get a benefit of 150000 rupees this additional working load you have to be considered and now this impact will have in your step number 1 cost of the new machinery 4 lakhs from which you have to deduct the net sale proceeds of old machinery your cost of new machinery 4 lakhs amma there is no need to pay 4 lakhs out of your pocket by selling old machinery you are getting 150000 So four lakh low, one lakh fifty thousand. You are getting sale proceeds of old machinery. So additionally, what is your cash outflow? Ma, two lakh fifty thousand. Right. So you are going to additionally incur for the new machinery only two lakh fifty thousand. Clear. So that's the impact. Clear now. And at the same time, in step number three also, sir, while calculating the terminal value of cash inflows, right. So first you should take. the nsp of the new machinery from which you have to deduct the nsp of the old machinery net sale proceeds of the old machinery clear sir right thereby you will get the terminal cash inflows right so that's how you need to make the decisions with respect to replacement decisions analysis and then after that you have npv irr conflicts npv and irr conflicts then you will get a doubt here sir what is the reason behind npv and irr conflicts asli renditi mandi conflict chandu ko sai sir right so reasons for conflicts number 1 nature of the projects sir if the given projects nature mutually exclusive that means we have to select only one project mutually exclusive means we have to select only one project now look at this example sir npv project 1 you have positive 5 lakhs project 2 positive 4 lakhs in both the projects you have a positive npv right sir so that means both the projects are acceptable we know that if npv is positive accept the project yes sir next look at the irr in the project 1 it is 15 percentage project 2 18 percentage and cost of capital 12% for both the projects in both the projects irr is greater than cost of capital and when you are making decision by using irr you can select both the projects sir if the given projects nature is mutually independent there is no problem at all we can select both the projects as both the projects npv positive as both the projects irr is greater than cost of capital the real problem comes into picture only when the given projects nature is mutually exclusive clear sir means we are going to select only one project now which project should be selected npv suggesting project 1 irr suggesting project 2 project 1 npv is higher so npv suggesting project 1 project 2 irr is higher so irr suggesting project 2 so there is arising a conflict between npv and irr next that's the first reason second reason investment disparity also known as size disparity generally the projects which are having the higher investment obviously will have high npv but whereas when you are talking the profits as a percentage the percentage is lower like i'll tell you example mukesh ambani investing in the reliance jio he will made the investments in thousands of crores he invested some 20000 crores right sir and he is enjoying an npv of uh, let us say some 2000 crores but as a percentage when you are talking he is getting only 10% rate of return okay now whereas whereas there is a small departmental st uh, store owner who invested hardly some 20 lakhs rupees but he is enjoying almost 5 lakhs rupees of returns now as a percentage you can see the rate of return to him 25 percentage so when your investment is higher your npv will be higher but as a percentage if you talk the percentage is lower but when your investment is lower your npv would be lower but as a percentage you talk 25 percent rate of return are you following sir so the projects generally which are having the high investment will have the low irr the projects which are having the low investment will have the high irr so again there is a conflict npv suggests the bigger investment projects irr suggests the lower investment projects right so this is another reason for conflict between npv and irr next life disparity yes obviously apply the same logic 
a project having the higher life will have the higher npv but as a rate of return it will be lower a project which has having a lower life will have the lower npv but as a percentage when you are talking about the rate of return is higher so again npv suggests the projects having higher life ir suggested irr suggesting the projects having the lower life again there is a conflict between npv and irr fourth case cash flows disparity cash flows disparity sir if you are earning the major cash flows in the initial years now definitely your project will have a highest npv but if you are having your major cash flows in the latter years now then your npv will be lower look at the project one its major cash flows occurring in the initial years first three years so its npv will be high sir whereas project two its major cash flows occurring in the latter part of the project last three years of the project so its npv will be lower and generally npv suggests the projects where the cash flows are heavier in the initial years but irr doesn't differentiate the timing of occurring of cash flows clear so the cash flows disparity is also another reason for irr and npv conflicts now you will get a doubt here so whenever there is an irr and npv conflict now which project should i select right should i go with the npv project should i go with the irr project simple answer sir generally the financial management basic objective primary objective in terms wealth maximization of the shareholders now among the npv and irr project evaluation techniques npv is the most widely used technique and npv is a technique which satisfies the primary objective of the financial management npv discussed about the amount of returns irr discussed about percentage of returns are you following sir npv prevails over irr whenever there is a conflict between npv and irr npv always prevails over irr you have to go with the projects which are suggested by npv npv suggests chesna projects ne select cheyalamma endukante first one npv discussed about the amount of returns the investor as a investor you always looking after your returns rather than the percentage of returns amount of returns as a shareholder you understood only the amount of returns what is the amount i have invested what is the amount i got that's it nen ent invest chesanu naaku endo ochindi aa lakshya invest chesanu 2 lakhs lo ochindi okay 1 lakh profit are you following sir i invested 1 lakh i got 2 lakhs in return so 1 lakh is my profit that's it end of the day but he is need not worry about his percentage of returns amma he is least bother about percentage of returns he is always concerned about amount of returns and that amount of returns explained under where amma npv yes or no second reason two projects npv can be additive you can add the two projects npv directly suppose that project 1 npv like here we have example project 1 npv 5 lakhs project 2 npv 4 lakhs the total npv from the these two projects i can say 9 lakhs total npv now what is the total irr from these two projects sir 15 plus 18 the total irr from this project 33 percentage no wrong answer two projects npv cannot be added directly you cannot add directly sir two projects npv uh, two projects irr npv you can add but two projects irr you cannot add the second reason third reason ma npv calculations are very easy and somewhat accurate but when it comes to irr there are so many problems involving in irr the problems are like if you give a particular data to 10 people for the calculation of irr 10 people will come up with the 10 different answers right sir because irr calculation is purely based on your guess rates and not all the 10 people will take the same guess rates you will be having a concept of multiple irrs now among the multiple irrs which irr is correct is a mil million dollar question but npv na if you give data for the calculation of npv for 10 people almost all all the 10 people will come up with the same npv yes or no 
So these are all the major advantages under NPV ma. So that's why NPV is always prevails over the IRR. Clear, right? So generally, you have to go with the projects which are suggested by the NPV. Clear. Next. When you have life disparity in asset, uh, you know, for life disparity, you have uh, uh, different methods like you need to find out the equal like equivalent analyzed criterion, right? Uh, like means analyzed NPV, you need to find out, right? NPV per annum. Look at this example. NPV of the machine one, one lakh, NPV of the machine two, one lakh, 80,000. Just a second, sir. Yeah, sorry. NPV of the machine one is one lakh and NPV of the machine two, one lakh, 80,000. Sir, here you cannot directly go with, okay, I'll select machine two as it is having highest NPV. You should not go like that because there is a life disparity. Are you following, sir? Machine one having the life of three years only. Whereas machine two having the life of six years. So machine two obviously having the highest life will have the highest NPV. See these two machines are not having equal lives. So that is why their NPVs are not equal. So first of all, here, what you have to do is you have to find out the annualized NPV, find out a annualized NPV, how to find out total NPV divided by present value of annuity factors divided by, uh, sorry, R percentage and number of years. Are you following, sir? Total NPV divided by present value annuity factors. So for project uh, machine one, one lakh divided by 10% three years annuity factor 2.487, you'll get a NPV per annum 40,209. For machine two, it is one lakh 80,000 divided by 10% six years. The life is six years now, 4.355. You'll get a 41,322 per annum. Clear. So the conclusion, since the annualized NPV of the machine two is higher, it is advisable to select the machine two. It is advisable to select the machine two. Clear. But sometimes if there is no sufficient information for the calculation of annualized NPV under life disparity method, you have to follow this method, sir. Equated annual cost. Equated annual cost. In that particular problem, now you will be having only cost element. There is no sufficient information for the calculation of NPV. You have only cost element. Then go with the cost only. Total maintenance cost divided by present value and factor. First, find out the total maintenance cost divided by present value and factors for the given percentage and life number of years. You will get equated annual cost per annum. So for both the projects, you will get per annum cost. Compare the cost and select the project which is having the lowest cost. See, if it is an NPV, select the project with highest NPV. If it is a cost, select the project with the lowest cost. Are you following, sir? So that is how you need to resolve the conflict between NPV and IRR if it is arising because of the life disparity. Next. And after that, model number four, modified NPV, also known as terminal value method. Modified NPV, also known as terminal value method. Now, what is this concept all about? So generally, while calculating the NPV, we will take some assumptions like all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be certain. First assumption. Second assumption, all the cash flows arising in the problem are assumed to be occurred at the end of the every year. And number three, all the cash inflows generating out of this project are assumed to be reinvested at cost of capital rate. So the third assumption, whatever the cash inflows we are getting, we are not going to putting them idle. We are reinvesting them at what rate am I? At cost of capital rate. That's the third assumption. So as long as your reinvestment rate is equal to your cost of capital, normal NPV, modified NPV, both are one and the same. Both are one and the same. But in case if your reinvestment rate is not equal to cost of capital rate, then there is a need arises for the calculation of modified NPV. In that scenario, normal NPV is different, modified NPV is different. So look at here, when reinvestment rate is different from the cost of capital rate, then there is a need arises for the calculation of modified NPV. Clear, sir, every one of you. Okay, now, if the problem specifically mentioned about the reinvestment rate, 
like look at the problem number seven. This is a problem number seven. So it mentioned cost of the machinery 10,000, life three years, cash inflow 6,000 every year for three years, cost of capital rate given 15 percentage, cost of capital, and the reinvestment rates given separately, sir. The expected interest rate at which the cash flows are reinvested. First year cash inflows, you're reinvesting at 12%. Second year cash inflows, you're reinvesting at 10%. Third year cash inflows, you're reinvesting at 9 percentage. Okay, now state whether the project should be accepted under terminal value method. Here, the cost of capital rate different from reinvestment rates. So that's why there is a need arises for the calculation of modified, sorry, terminal value method, modified and BV. Okay, now, so look at here. How to calculate? First of all, step number one, find out the terminal values here. So take years one, two, three, cash inflows every year, you're getting 6,000. Number of years can be reinvest. Now, first year cash inflows, right? This is your Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. Every year you are getting a cash inflow of 6,000. Okay, now, and as per our assumption, we are getting this cash inflow at the end of the every year. Clear. Now, at the end of the first year, you got 6,000 cash inflows. And for how many years you are going to reinvest it, Amma? You are going to reinvest only for two years now. End of the first year you are getting, so year two, year three, only two years left for reinvest. So maximum this first year 6,000 cash inflow can be reinvested for two years. End of the second year, again, you got a 6,000 rupees. And this is maximum you are going to reinvest for one year. And end of the year three, you also got another 6,000. And this how many years you are going to reinvest? Zero. That is the end of the project life now. The project life is only three years. End of the third year, you got 6,000. Right, sir. So the third year cash inflow will not fetch you any interest. So the reinvestment rate, as mentioned in the problem, 12%, 10% and 9%. Take the future value factors, future value factors, not present value. We are finding out terminal value amount. We are bringing all these cash inflows into future value, right? So you'll get the terminal cash inflow. At the end of third year, you're going to get 20,124 rupees. But we want NPV as on today. So convert this terminal cash inflows into present value. At what rate am I? At cost of capital rate. So after three years, you are going to get 20,124 cash inflow am I? But what is its present value? So while converting your terminal cash inflows into present values, ma, now this you have to use a cost of capital rate. So the present value of terminal cash inflows 13,242 from which deduct the present value of cash outflows. How much you're investing amount? 10,000. So your modified NPV, 3,242. Since modified NPV is positive, it is advisable to accept the project. Clear, sir. That is how you need to find out the modified NPV, the terminal value. Next. After that, modified IRR. So now what is the need of finding out modified IRR? Actually, under traditional IRR method, under traditional IRR method, there are some drawbacks among the drawbacks are number one, there is a concept called multiple IRRs. Multiple IRRs. And that means I've already told you that if I give the data to 10 people, the same data for the 10 people for the calculation of IRR, 10 people will come up with the 10 different IRRs. Right. So that traditional IRR method, there is a problem. Multiple IRRs will be there and uh, it is not uh, easy to select what is the correct IRR. That's the first main problem under traditional IRR method. And the second problem is, and the second problem is reinvestment rate issues. The second problem is reinvestment rate issues. Um, while we are calculating the traditional IRR, we have taken some assumptions. Number one, all the cash inflows given in the problem are assumed to be certain. Number two, all the cash inflows are assumed to be occurred at the end of the every year. And number three, all the cash inflows are assumed to be reinvested at IRR rate of return. The third assumption is not logical, not uh, practical. See, whatever the cash inflows you are getting, you're not putting them idle. You're going to reinvest them. 
what is your assumption sir you are going to reinvestment uh, them at the same rate as your project giving your project giving 25% rate of return sir now what are the cash flows generating from that project if i reinvest this cash flows into the open market now on this reinvestment also i am get same 25% rate of return that's the assumption the third assumption meaning the cash inflows are assumed to be reinvested at irr rate of return sir ee project lo nik enta return aithe vastundo ee project dwara ochina cash flows kuda teeskelli ni byte investors naku ante return vastadu anedi enta varaku practical it's not that practical you may get more than the 25% rate of return you may get less than 25% rate of return yes or no so reinvestment rate issues these are the major two drawbacks under traditional irr method by overcoming these two major drawbacks we have come up with a concept called modified irr in modified irr method these two drawbacks have been overcome now how to calculate modified irr it is similar to the calculation of modified npv first you have to find out the terminal value same manner years the cash inflows how many years we are going to reinvest them and all this cash inflows bring into the future value find out the terminal value amma so in y0 you have a cash outflow and in y5 the life of the project is here five years end of the five year you have a cash inflow of 213587 so you know the present value you know the future value you know the number of years find out the irr either you can adopt here future value of single amount model or you can adopt here is present value of single amount model and then find out the irr you know present value you know future value you know number of years what is missing amma rate of interest is missing that is your irr clear sir so here modified irr we find out 9 percentage clear that is how you need to find out modified irr okay ma so with this we have completed all the models in this chapter sir right and that block of assets concept is similar to section number 32 of income tax act same concept amma right uh, like this this particular concept plays a role where if the asset is existing in the block after selling this asset if there are some other assets are existing in the block you have to calculate the depreciation for the entire life of the asset like i'll tell you sir here here i'll show you block of assets and depreciation in the problem number 9 you can see uh, there is a asset yeah look at this provision there is no other asset in the same block of assets after selling this asset the model number 1 or model number 2 right after selling this asset there are no other assets left in the block and as we know that we need to calculate the depreciation on satisfaction of two conditions number 1 there must be at least one asset in the block number 2 there must be some value for the block here you are going to have value in the block but there are no assets so you have to calculate the depreciation from year 1 to year 4 only the life is given 5 years kada only from year 1 to year 4 you have to calculate the depreciation for year 5 the depreciation should not be calculated should not be calculated calculate cheyyadamma endukante asset ledhuga block lo there are no assets in the block so you are not eligible for depreciation in the year 5 right sir now look at the problem number 10 there are several assets in the same block of assets and they after selling the plant and machinery in the question you have many more assets in the same block so the life is given 6 years amma so from year 1 to year 6 you can eligible for depreciation you can claim depreciation so that's the only impact in this problem amma clear right so with this we have completed the marathon for chapter number 7 advanced concepts in investment decisions in the next session i am going to start with the chapter number 8 risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions okay ma right till then have a good day and good night stay home and stay safe a very good evening students welcome to the stressta fm marathon classes in the last class we have completed uh, our discussion about the chapter number 7 that is advanced concepts in investment decisions right ma now time for the chapter number 8 risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions 
so this is nothing but the part three of investment decisions chapter in the part one that is chapter number two we have discussed the basic concepts fundamentals part two that is chapter number seven advanced concepts in investment decisions and part three risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions all these are belonging to same chapter of investment decisions first part we have learned fundamentals second part we have learned advanced concepts and third part we are going to learn risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions right sir now what is this risk analysis in capital budgeting decision let us have some introduction sir basically whatever the project evaluation techniques we have learned in the first part investment decisions like we have learned the project evaluation techniques like arr payback period method these are comes under the traditional techniques right ma'am and when it comes to discounting techniques we have learned like npv irr profitability index method terminal value method and discounted payback period method all these project evaluation techniques are based on some assumptions so out of all these project evaluation techniques the major technique which we are used is npv net present value method is the most widely used prior uh, project evaluation technique and if you remember npv calculation is purely based on three assumptions number 1 all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be certain number 2 all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be occurred at the end of the each year and number 3 all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be reinvested at cost of capital rate these are the three assumptions yes or no by taking these three assumptions only we are calculated npv and based on that npv we have made some decision without taking these assumptions you cannot calculate npv sir these three assumptions are compulsorily you have to take for the calculation of npv yes or no right so these assumptions we have taken only for the purpose of our convenience only for the purpose of convenience for easy understanding of the project evaluation techniques for easy understanding easy understanding of the project evaluation techniques we have taken this assumption based on this assumptions we have calculated npv based on the npv we have made a decision in order to understanding the concept of project evaluation techniques we have taken some assumptions based on the assumptions we have calculated npb irr payback period like that yes or no but when you are thinking from a real time point of view right in a real time world whether these assumptions holds good answer is no what is the first assumption ma all the cash flows given in the problem are assumed to be certain so whatever the cash flows i am taking for the calculation of npv all they are estimated cash flows estimated for year 1 i have estimated that my cash flow will be 1 lakh for year 2 1 lakh 50000 for year 3 2 lakhs these are all estimated cash flows amma are you following sir and estimations may go wrong there is always a scope for wrong estimation for year 1 you have estimated 1 lakh but end of the year 1 in a real time scenario after the completion of the one year you might ended up getting cash in flow of 1 lakh 50000 1 lakh 80000 2 lakh 50000 but you have estimated only 1 lakh or sometimes you may get less than 1 lakh yes or no right second assumption all the cash flows are assumed to be occurred at the end of the year in a real time world whether this assumption holds good or not absolutely no sir because whenever you are doing business every day there is some cash inflow there is some cash outflow how come you expect all your cash inflows and cash outflows are at the end of the year suppose that in the year 1 you got some 3 lakh 65000 amount and when are you getting that 1 3 lakh 65000 npv said from year, uh, day 1 to day 365 from day 1 to day 365 sorry day 364 my cash flows are zero 
what all the cash inflows i am getting i am getting only on the last day of the year is that possible in the real day world every day there are some cash inflows yes or no so the second assumption not holds good reinvestment at the cost of capital rate you may reinvest at cost of capital rate or you may not so all these assumptions doesn't holds good in a real time scenario and that means whatever the npv you calculated by taking this assumption by that npv you may ended up by taking a right decision or there is a possibility that you may taking uh, ended up by taking a wrong decision suppose that by taking these assumptions you have calculated npv you got a positive npv of some 1 lakh since the npv is positive you may ended up by taking the uh, decision that okay since the npv is positive accept the project but this npv 1 lakh is purely based on these assumptions are you following sir so at the end of the one year or at the end of the life of the project in a real time scenario you might be having a positive npv of 1 lakh or you might not are you following sir so there is a certain element of risk involving in the investment decisions and that risk we are going to be measured in this chapter and why the risk comes into picture amma because whatever the decision making you are taking by using the npv or irr all that decision making sir purely depends upon some assumptions projections estimations right these are all for your future future by definition it is uncertain uncertainty gives rise to risk and that risk we are going to measure here are you following or not look at the introduction part amma look at the introduction part here right in capital budgeting techniques we assumed that the investment proposals do not involve any risk and cash flows of the project are known with certainty this assumption was taken to simplify the understanding of the capital budgeting techniques the assumptions we have taken only to understand easily understanding the capital budgeting techniques however in practice this assumption is not correct in fact investment projects are exposed to various degrees and types of risks right there are various risks some um, internal risk external risk market specific risk product specific risk industry specific risks there are if, whenever you are going to make an investment decision na see by taking this assumption calculation of npv is hardly a matter of 15 minutes 20 minutes and within 20 minutes you can take a decision but in a real time scenario now for an investment decision financial manager will take a minimum of one month time one month time 30 days 30 working days i'm talking about right here you are doing npv decision within 30 minutes calculating npv by taking assumption within 30 minutes you are getting an npv answer basing on that answer you are making a decision this is completely different theory is completely different from practice right sir your theoretical knowledge will help you only up to a certain extent in the practical world practical knowledge is completely different amma see i am teaching financial management since 11 years but right now i am working in a pub, uh, government undertaking right where i am observing i am looking at the financial management is in a complete different scenario here so whatever i am teaching financial management is completely different from whatever i am experiencing in my company are you following this theoretical fm knowledge is helpful but only a, to certain extent in the practical world every one of you following now right sir now so risk and uncertainty a decision to take up or leave out a project depends upon taking up or leave up a project depends upon the expectations of the future cash flows from the project and such expectations are purely based on the information that is currently available with us the future by definition is uncertain the cash flows when they occur are likely to be differed from what we were expected we were expected year 1 cash flow 1 lakh but end of the year 1 in a real time scenario you might getting some 80000 or 70000 are you following sir or you might get more than 1 lakh as well 
See, if you get more than one lakh, very happy. Anyhow, you estimated one lakh, you got more than one lakh, happy, sir. But you expected one lakh, but you got only seventy thousand. Then there is a problem. Clear. So the uncertainty about the future cash flows gives rise to risk. Clear, sir. But however, the risk and uncertainty is not the same because risk can be measured. There are some techniques. There are some theorems for uh, analyzing the risk, for measuring the risk. But there is no theorems, no logics, no uh, concepts for measuring the uncertainty. Are the most under. So risk can be measured, but uncertainty cannot be measured. Clear, sir. And how we are going to make that analysis of the risk, right? And how we are going to be overcome that risk element? All this we are going to be learned in this chapter. Okay, now. So risk analysis in the capital budgeting techniques, where it is. Yeah. So we have different the uh, methods, sir, uh, for analyzing the risk, right? Uh, they are like number one conventional techniques we have, where we are going to have the first one RADR risk adjusted discounting rate. RADR stands for risk adjusted discounting rate, and number two CEF certainty equivalent factors. Certainty equivalent factors. And coming to the statistical techniques, right? Uh, here we are going to find out the expected NPV, and uh, statistical techniques we are going to have probability distribution, variance and standard deviation, and coefficient of variation. But these are all just like uh, the concepts which you have learned in your subject called statistics at your CPT level. At your CA foundation level, in your CA foundation, you have a subject called statistics. In that subject, you might have learned already all this probability, variance, standard deviation, coefficient of variance, same concepts, Amma. Nothing more than that. Clear. And other techniques, actually, frankly speaking, these techniques are purely for CA final level. CA final level topic, Samma. Right? In CA final level, you are going to learn SFM, strategic and financial management. Strategic and financial management, SFM, hundred mark subject, where you are going to have all these topics once again, but in a depth manner. Here, sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis, simulation, decision trees, very uh, introductory level. Now, among all these, now sensitive analysis is important. Remaining all the three, you can blindly ignore. Scenario analysis, simulation, decision risk. You can you can blindly ignore ma for examination purposes. Concentrate only on sensitivity analysis. That's it. Frankly speaking, sir, uh, from this chapter you will get one question for five marks only, five marks, and mostly the questions are from either from RADR or CEA factor or the statistical techniques. Are you following, sir? Right. See, uh, the majority of the problems I have mentioned here. Are only from these two topics. In total, Lina, in this chapter we are going to have the problems. Uh, how many problems we are going to have, Ma? Fourteen problems. We have fourteen problems from this chapter. Out of fourteen problems, now you can see the first model here. We are going to see the statistical techniques. Probability and expected cash flow, statistical techniques, Amma, and then uh, expected NPV, also forming part of statistical techniques, standard deviation, variance, coefficient of variance, statistical techniques only, right? You can see eight problems from the statistical techniques. Eight problems, clear, and risk adjusted discounting rate method, model number four, uh, traditional techniques, Amma, be. Certainty equivalent factor again, traditional techniques. Model number five. You can see here twelve problems only from the first two topics. Only from the first two topics. Traditional techniques four problems and uh, statistical techniques eight problems. Twelve problems out of fourteen problems. So the remaining two problems now nah, I've given under sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis problem number thirteen. Scenario analysis problem number fourteen. That's it. End of the chapter. I have not even given the problems for simulation and a decision trees because they are not uh, important from examination point of view. Are you following, sir? So whenever you are preparing this chapter, whenever you are preparing this chapter, just focus only on the first two models: conventional techniques where we have four problems, and static uh, statistical techniques we have eight problems. Out of fourteen problems, twelve problems only from these two topics. Clear now, every one of you, right? 
now moving on so first let us see one by one the models the first model is about the probability and expected cash flow very simple sir you know very well about the probability right probability is the chance of occurrence or non occurrence of an outcome if you toss a coin there is 50% probability that you are going to get heads and 50% probability that you are going to get tail only two possible outcomes so one by two one by two clear if you throw a dice there is one by six chances are there to get the answer either one two three four five six if you throw a dice one by six chance outcome six outcomes are there no so one by six that is what the probability is clear so the aggregate of all the probables when you aggregate all the probables no it must be equal to one clear for example if there is a 70 percent chance that there is a rain today that means the remaining 30 percent water ma there is no rain today so when you said 70 percent chances are there yes there is a rain today that means the remaining 30 percent water ma no rain clear okay now so probability distribution very simple sir you get the problem number one you are given the best assumption best guess high guess and low guess and cash flows associated with that particular guesses and their probabilities and you ask to find out the expected cash flows very simple sir cash flow into probability that's it three lakhs into 0.3 it will get a uh, how much you are getting sir ninety thousand two lakhs into 0.6 one lakh twenty thousand one lakh twenty thousand into point one twelve thousand the total uh, comes out to be two lakh ten two lakh twenty two thousand that's the end of the answer two lakh twenty thousand expected net cash flows and look at here problem number two find out the expected investment you are given the investments and probabilities 30 lakhs into sorry 30 lakhs into 0.25 uh it will give you how much 7.5 lakhs huh? yes 7.5 lakhs and 40 lakhs into 0.5 means 20 lakhs 50 lakhs into 0.25 12.5 lakhs 27.5 plus 12.5 so 40 lakhs the expected investment 40 lakhs end of the answer so like this you need to calculate sir like this you need to calculate now this is the first model right now coming to the second model expected in pv expected in pv now here how to calculate expected in pv i've given the procedure for every model sir right look at here step number one find out the expected cash flows find out the expected cash flows that means cash flow into respect to probability just like we have did in the problem number one i think the moment problem one which is in the cash flows into probability whatever the answer you are getting here this is expected cash flow now right that's your step number one step number two find out the present values of expected cash flows once you get the expected cash flows now multiplied with the present value factor you will get the present value of expected cash flows step three find out the expected npv from the present value of expected cash flows deduct the investment right so what is npv formula sir npv is equal to present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows this will give you npv that's it clear see normal npv expected npv the only difference is under expected npv first we are converting the cash flows right uh, we are finding out the expected cash flows by using the probability factors expected cash flows like look at this problem number four uh, let me show you the answer further problem number four problem number four yes look at here this is a problem number four right so problem number four you can see project a project b two projects information is given and the possible events respect to cash flows and probabilities clear and the discounting rate given 10 percentage present value of investment initial investment 10,000 rupees now first you need to find out the present value of cash inflow simple expected cash flows into probability that's it so 8,000 into 0.1 uh, it will give you 800 10,000 into 0.2 2,000 12,000 into 0.4 4,800 14,000 into 0.2, 2,800 and 16,000 into 0.1, 1, 1,600. You'll get a expected cash flow. How much you're getting? 
12000 rupees ma expected cash inflows 12000 rupees and this you are going to get at the end of the first year you can see here first i find out the expected cash flows step number 1 I find out the expected cash flows. How much I got? Ma, twelve thousand. Just now I said no, twelve thousand. And then I'm converting that present value, uh, converting this twelve thousand because this twelve thousand I'm getting. I put ma at the end of the first year, but I want present value of cash inflows. So multiply it with the first year present value factor at ten percent one year. So twelve thousand into point nine zero nine, ten thousand nine not night. This is my present value of expected cash inflows. This is my what ma? Present value of expected cash inflows ten thousand nine not eight minus present value of cash outflows. What is initial investment given ten thousand? So my expected NPV nine not eight rupees. And same as for the project B, first convert uh, find out the expected cash inflows, then find out the present value of expected cash inflows, and finally the expected NPV. Expected NPV clear everyone. That's how you need to find out the expected NPV. Now, next after that, standard deviation, variance, and coefficient of variance. Standard deviation, variance, and coefficient of variance. Standard deviation, right, sir? Ah, uh, let me explain you with the help of the notes. Look at the concept of standard deviation. You might have already learned in your CA foundation level, CA uh, CPD level. Suppose that I've expected the cash flows like this. Yes, cash flows. Year one, two, three. So year one, I've expected one lakh. Year two, one lakh fifty thousand, and year three, two lakhs. These are the cash flows I've expected, sir. Right. Now, first you need to find out the mean for these cash flows. Four lakh fifty thousand. So means comes out to be four lakh fifty thousand divided by three. It comes out to be one lakh fifty thousand. Right, sir. Now you have to find out the deviation from the mean. What is the mean we find out, sir? We find out one point five lakhs. Right, sir. You need to find out the deviation for this, right? So year one, you expected one lakh cash inflow, and the mean cash inflows comes out to be one lakh fifty thousand. The deviation is negative fifty thousand. Year two zero and year three positive fifty thousand. And then after that, you need to find out the deviation square. Then this deviation square should be multiplied with the probabilities. You will get the PD square, right? Sir. And after that, you will having uh, you will be having a formula for the calculation of standard deviation. See, first of all, theoretically understand the concept. What is deviation? You have estimated one lakh, but you got only eighty thousand rupees cash flows in year one. You estimated a cash flow of one lakh, but you actually got eighty thousand only. So there is a deviation of twenty thousand rupees. Right, sir. Standard deviation. Deviation. What you actually expected, what you actually got. That deviation between these two cash flows. Yes or no? Obviously, all these are estimations, amma. Whatever you estimate, uh, taking the cash flows here, they are estimated. So th there is always a deviation from the expected cash flows, and that deviation we are finding out here. Are the mouth in this, sir? Look at here. Project cash flows are forecasts. And forecast cannot be accurate because we are not God, right? We are just human beings. Clear, and there can be a margin of error. The risk associated with the project can be expressed as the extent to which the actual value of outcome will differ or deviate from the expected value, right? The extent up to which extent the actual value is deviated from the expected value. Clear and the risk is measured here is what we call standard deviation. This risk is measured with the help of a statistical tool known as standard deviation. Standard deviation is nothing but the standardized unit of deviation 
from what from mean that is why first i've calculated mean here from mean what is the deviation that i've calculated are you following or not every one of you completed sir right next so the standard deviation is a standard unit of deviation from mean and this measure is denoted by the symbol sigma symbol sigma and the square of standard deviation is known as variance square root of standard deviation that will be your variance higher the standard deviation means higher will be the risk involved in the project so whenever the deviation is higher you est you, you estimated 1 lakh in the year 1 but you actually got only 20000 the deviation is very huge and the risk is very higher suppose that you estimated 1 lakh ma but end of the year 1 you actually got 90000 and from your estimation There is a deviation of hardly ten percent only. Okay, acceptable. Ten percent deviation is quite acceptable, sir. But here the deviation is almost eighty percent, which cannot be acceptable. That means the risk is very huge. So that is why higher the standard deviation, higher will be the risk. Lower the standard deviation, lower will be the risk. Okay, now next, how to compute the standard deviation? Look at the procedure, sir. Step number one: compute the expected value. that means uh, you just take out the cash flows given in the problem multiply it with the probabilities you will get the expected cash flows and compute the deviation from the expected value find out the deviation then aggregate the result of step number 2 total chain number and this resultant is known as your variance and find out the sigma how to find out amma square root of variance is your standard deviation square root of variance like uh, let me show you a problem here This is a problem number uh, six. Possible events and cash flows. First, multiply the cash flows. Uh, multiply the cash flows with uh, your uh, probabilities. You just multiply. You will get the expected cash flows, right, sir? Expected cash flows, and you just aggregate it totally. That will be your mean, and find out the deviation, right, sir? So eight thousand minus twelve thousand minus four thousand is the deviation. Ten thousand minus twelve thousand minus two thousand is the deviation. Like that, find out the deviation. Then find out the square of the deviation. Square of the deviation, and then multiply the square of deviation with the probabilities. P D square. This is your standard deviation. Sorry, ah, uh, this is your variance. Variance for forty eight lakhs, and we know that standard deviation is equal to square root of variance, right? Square root of variance. Standard deviation square is variance, ma. Don't confuse. Variance is equal to standard deviation square. P D square, standard deviation square. Clear. And now, if you want to find out the very uh, standard deviation, the square root will come this side. Square root it achcha same hotun, ma. Right. So that is why standard deviation is equal to square root of variance. clear okay now right so find out the standard deviation then finally coefficient of variance ma coefficient of variance standard deviation divided by expected cash flows standard deviation divided by expected cash flows in the problem if you have the information of expected npv standard deviation divided by expected npv clear everyone every one of you next so like that find out the coefficient of variance clear you can see here coefficient of variance the formula you can see here standard deviation divided by expected return or expected cash flows higher the coefficient of variance higher will be the risk involved in the project because see when your deviation is higher means uh, your when your standard deviation is higher your coefficient of variance will also be higher sir because the standard deviation is a numerator no when your numerator is higher obviously the answer will be the coefficient of variance will also be higher means the risk is very high clear right see the coefficient of variance calculate the risk borne by every percent of the expected return standard deviation explains about the risk of the whole project the entire project risk is measured by standard deviation project as a whole but coefficient of variance calculates the risk associated with every percent of your return clear ma next 
and after that you have model number four so with that we have completed the statistical techniques statistical techniques completed amma now time for the uh, conventional techniques risk adjusted rate of return risk adjusted discounting rate clear now what is this concept of risk adjusted discounting rate very simple sir see whatever the assumption the assumption number 3 we have taken no all the cash inflows given in the problem are assumed to be reinvested at cost of capital yes or no see this is purely based on here in this particular concept we are going to measure the risk involving in the reinvestment rate the risk involving in the reinvestment rate are you following sir just a second so in this model we are going to analyze the risk involving in the reinvestment rate clear sir so what is the reinvestment rate we are taking here cost of capital cost of capital clear so assume that your cost of capital is 10 percentage so that means whatever the cash inflows you are going to get all that cash inflows are going to be reinvested at 10% rate of interest but in the real time world you may get more than 10% or you may get less than 10% returns exactly a 10% of say any guarantee in tamma there is no guarantee that your project cash inflows if reinvested will fetch you 10% rate of return there is no guarantee you may get more than 10% or you may get less than 10% so there is certain risk involving in this particular reinvestment rate and that risk we are measuring uh, measuring here with the help of the concept called risk adjusted discounting rate we are going to adjust the risk element to this discounting rate clear sir every one of you right now how to adjust that risk look at here the discount rates in capital budgeting represents the expected rate of return from the project project with higher risk are generally expected to provide a higher return and projects with relatively lower risk expected to provide a lower rate of return so consequently all the projects should not be discounted at the same rates high risky projects should be discounted at the high rate low discount uh, low risky projects should be discounted at the low rates clear sir so kavadi not all the projects having the same risk return characteristics not all the projects cash flows should be discounted at the same rate clear so normally the company's cost of capital so hence the cut off discount rate should be adjusted towards upwards or downwards to take care of the additional or lower risk element and this is referred to as a risk adjusted discounting rate so first step number 1 identify the cash flows step number 2 compute the radr risk adjusted discounting rate how to find out amma for your cost of capital add or less premium for risk risk premium will be given given in the problem amma risk premium ik problem lo ichestadu you simply add that cost of capital add to the cost of capital or less to the cost of capital that will give you the risk adjusted discounting rate and discount that cash flows at radr and find out the npv if npv is positive accept the project otherwise reject the project are you following sir every one of you look at here the formula is a risk adjusted discounting rate is equal to cost of capital plus or minus risk premium look at the problem number 9 invest corporation limited adjusts the risk through discounting rate by adding various risk premiums by adding various risk premiums to the risk free rate you will be given risk free rate amma for which you need to add the risk premiums thereby you will get a risk adjusted discounting rate for low risky projects it will be 12 percentage for medium risky project it will be 15 percentage and for high risky projects it will be 18 percentage clear now you are going to discount the cash flows at this rate amma and then you will find out the npv now whatever the npv you are finding out that is what we call risk adjusted npv and based on that risk adjusted npv you have to make a decision clear sir look at here in the step number 1 i find out the radr 12% 15% 18% then i find out the risk adjusted npv for low risky projects i have discounted the cash flows at 12% for medium risk at 15% and for high risk at 18% i find out the npv sir and here you have a positive npv only at the low risky projects clear every one of you and next
So like that, you need to make a, uh, you need to find out the risk adjusted NPV, risk adjusted discounting rate. And next, the model number five, the second model of conventional techniques, second model of conventional techniques, that is certainty equivalent factors method, CEF. Certainty equivalent factors method. Now look at here. Yeah, model number five, CEF method. In this method, we are going to analyze, we are going to analyze the risk involving in the cash flows. The risk involved in the cash flows. So what are the cash flows we have taken for calculating NPV or IRR? They are purely estimated cash flows, expected cash flows. Clear, sir. So here I have given an example. Year one, the cash flows I have estimated one lakh fifty thousand. Year two, two lakhs, and year three, one lakh eighty thousand. They are uncertain. First of all, you have to convert the uncertain cash flows into certain cash flows by multiplying that uncertain cash flows with certainty equivalent factors. So how certain that cash flows are? Okay, for year one, you estimated one lakh fifty thousand as your cash flow, but how certain you are? Are you hundred percent confident? Uh, hundred percent, not sure, sir, but uh, ninety percent. Okay, that means one lakh fifty thousand you have estimated for year one, but you are not hundred percent sure. You are sure ninety percent only. Okay, so that means for year one, I can say one lakh thirty five thousand are certain cash flows. For year one, okay. Year two, what is your estimated cash flow? Two lakhs, sir. I am expecting uh two lakhs cash inflow for year two. How sure you are? Hundred percent? No, sir. Okay, ninety percent? No, sir. Eighty percent? Ah, okay. Eighty percent, I am guaranteed, sir. That means for second year, the certain cash flows are one lakh sixty thousand. Two lakhs uncertain cash flows, risky cash flows. One lakh sixty thousand risk-free cash flows. Are you following? Risk-free cash flows. So, like that, every year you have to find out the certain cash flows, risk-free cash flows, and how you are getting ma by multiplying uncertain cash flows with certainty equivalent factors. You are getting ma risk-free cash flows or certain cash flows. Now, based on that certain cash flows, you have to find out the NPV. Since these cash inflows are risk-free cash inflows. You have to discount these cash inflows at risk-free rate of return, RF, risk-free rate of return. Finding out now, then you will get what ma risk-free present value of cash inflows from which you have to detect the present value of cash outflows. Then you will get ma risk-adjusted NPV. If that NPV is positive, accept the project. NPV is negative, reject the project. Look at here. Certainty equivalent method. Certainty equivalent factor is the ratio of assured cash flows to uncertain cash flows. Under this approach, the cash flows are expected in a project are converted into riskless equivalent amounts. So we are finding what are ma risk-free cash flows. The adjustment factor we are using here is called as a certainty equivalent coefficient factor. Clear, right? So this varies between zero to one. Always your CEF factors always varies between zero to one. Clear. A coefficient of one indicates that the cash flows are certain, hundred percent guaranteed. Clear. The greater the risk in a cash flow, the smaller will be the CEF factor. Clear. Risk a kunte any CEF factor lower go onto the ma. Risk ta kunte any CEF factor higher go onto the. Every one of you following now. Right, sir. Next. Since the risk involved in the cash flows are already incorporated. The appropriate discounting rate for the project valuation will be the risk-free rate. Clear? So, how to find out the NPV here? Number one, convert your uncertain cash flows to certain cash flows. Ella by multiplying with certainty equivalent factor. Step two, discount the certain cash flows at risk-free rate of interest to arrive at the NPV. Step three, decision. If the resultant NPV is positive, accept the project. Otherwise, reject the project. Otherwise, reject the project. As simple as that. Look at one problem here. Problem number eleven. First, what I've done, sir. First, I've taken the uncertain cash flows. I'm multiplying this uncertain cash flows with certainty equivalent factor. Then I will get what am I? 
certain cash flows. And after that, the certain cash flows multiplying with what, sir? Multiplying with the risk free rate of interest. At risk free rate of interest, I'm taking present value factors. Now, with the help of present value factors, I'm converting certain cash flows into present value of certain cash flows. Then I'll get present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. Then I'll get a more risk adjusted NPV. Are you following or not? That is the procedure. Clear. Next. After that, you have sensitivity analysis. Right, sir. So this is a CA final level topic. But don't worry, I'll explain here, sir. I'll explain here what is sensitivity analysis. Clear. Though it is a final level topic, in the main exams, HCA inter level, HCA inter level, the probability of getting a question from this topic, I can say hardly 10 percentage from the sensitive analysis because it is a very lengthy concept and the answer will also be very lengthy. Answer could have chala lengthy unto them. Now, first, let me try to understand you the concept of sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis. But so far, whatever the techniques we have learned, like risk adjusted discounting rate myth, uh, method, we have learned. Risk adjusted discounting rate method is going to measure the risk involving only in the discounting rate. Right? Only the risk involving in the discounting rate. That's it. And certainty equivalent factor method is going to uh, analyze the risk involving in the cash flows only. That's it. And standard deviation, coefficient of variance, variance, all these are also are mainly concentrating only one factor, one component. Right, sir. But NPV is not purely depending upon one component. NPV is not depending upon only on cost of capital. NPV is not depending upon only on cash flows. NPV is depending upon so many components of like sales in units, selling price per unit, variable cost, fixed cost cost of capital, life of the project, cash flows, all these influences your NPV amount. Not only cost of capital, not only cash flows, all these components influences your NPV. Clear, sir? Right. In risk adjusted discounting rate method, you have analyzed only the risk involving in cost of capital. But what about other components? You just simply ignore the risk involved in the other components. Right. Similarly, certain equivalent cash flows method, you have concentrated only on the risk involving in the cash flows. What about the other components? Right. So that's why now for analyzing the consolidated risk involving in the all the components which influences NPV, we come up with a concept called the sensitivity analysis. Under sensitivity analysis, we can analyze the risk involving in the each and every component which influences NPV. NPV ni influence se prati component lo unna risk ni manam combined ga consolidated ga analysis chayyachu. Yekada sensitivity analysis model lo. That's the beauty of sensitivity analysis. We can combinedly analyze the risk involving in the each and every component which influences NPV. Are you following, sir? How we are going to be like, look at here, sir. Your estimated sales in units, 1 lakh, 1 lakh units. At that estimated sales in units, your NPV is 5 lakhs. Your estimated NPV is 5 lakhs. But end of the year, you got only 80,000 units sales. You have, you, you able to sold only 80,000 units. Or else take like this. At 80,000 units, your NPV becomes zero. Right, sir. At 80,000 units. At 1 lakh units, you have a positive NPV of 5 lakhs. Just a second, sir. So at 80,000 units of sales, your NPV is going to be zero. And that means, that means how sensitive your sales in units component to the NPV. So from 1 lakh units to 80,000 units. At 1 lakh units, your NPV is 5 lakhs. At 80,000 units, your NPV is 0. And if your sales are decreased by 20,000 units, your NPV decreased by 5 lakhs. Right. So, sensitivity analysis should only 
ఇఫ్ ట్వంటీ థౌసండ్ డిక్రీస్ ఇన్ సేల్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ద బేస్ ఆఫ్ వన్ ల్యాక్ అంటే ట్వంటీ పర్సెంట్ ఇఫ్ సేల్స్ డిక్రీజెస్ బై ట్వంటీ పర్సెంట్ యూ విల్ బీ ఇన్ డేంజర్ యూ విల్ బీ ఇన్ డేంజర్ రైట్ సార్ ఇఫ్ సేల్స్ డిక్రీజెస్ బై టెన్ పర్సెంటేజ్ నో ప్రాబ్లమ్ యూ విల్ బీ హ్యావింగ్ ఎ స్టిల్ ఎ పాజిటివ్ ఎన్పివి విల్ బీ హ్యావింగ్ స్టిల్ ఎ పాజిటివ్ ఎన్పివి if sales decreases by 15% no problem you still in a positive npv but if sales decreases by 25% yes you are going to face a negative npv and ikra by calculating this sensitivity 20% what you are going to get see whenever you are making estimations na you have to maintain a reasonable buffer suppose that you are estimating your sales uh, in units for the year 1 some 120000 units you are estimating but for calculation of npv na take only 1 lakh consider only 1 lakh units you are going to sell in the year 1 don't 1 lakh 20000 don't take 1 lakh 20000 maintain a reasonable buffer because you estimated 1 lakh 20000 you calculated npv at 1 lakh 20000 you got a positive npv you accepted the project you started working on your project but end of the year one suppose that you are able to sell only 90000 units only 1 lakh units and your estimation goes wrong your positive project npv becomes a negative project npv now you cannot reject the project at the end of the year one you have already taken this is investment decision which will be having an impact over the longer period you cannot deny the project at the end of the first year or second year once a project is taken now it will be for 10 years or 20 years like that are you following or not right sir so your estimation goes wrong you are going to face a negative npv you are going to face the losses and you cannot avoid this project if you avoid this project you have to face huge amount of losses which might turn up end up your business are you following sir so that's why even though you estimated 120000 but take only 1 lakh for the npv calculation maintain a reasonable buffer are you following sir now look at here selling price per unit you have estimated your product is going to be sell in the open market at 100 rupees you are believing that yes the customer is ready to purchase my product at 100 rupees but suppose that in the real market if the customer is not interested in purchasing 100 rupees he would like to purchase only at 90 rupees then so that's why even though your estimation is 100 rupees per unit for the calculation of npv take only 90 rupees per unit maintain a reasonable buffer clear sir how much buffer should be taken that's why you need to find out the sensitivity percentage first so first you have to find out at what rate of selling price per unit my npv is going to be zero so you find out that at 90 rupees per unit your npv becomes zero and okay i need to maintain a buffer of 10 percentage and even if my selling price per unit reduces by 10 percentage still my npv is zero and i i am at break even point level no profit no loss situation are you following now clear sir right so you need to maintain a reasonable buffer of 10 percentage clear everyone right and ikra uh, from comparison point of view i can take from the sales in units you have a sensitivity of 20 percentage and selling price per unit you have a sensitivity of 10 percentage and ikra in the sales in units you have a buffer of 20 percentage and even if your estimated sales in units reduces by 10 percentage 15 percentage 20 percentage you are still in a safe position and you have a large buffer but whereas selling price per unit you have a buffer of only 10 percentage and if your selling price per unit reduces by 10 percentage you are in safe position but if you are still your selling price per unit decreases by 15 percent 20 percent then you have to be face the losses that's why higher the sensitivity lower will be the risk higher the sensitivity in the meaning and ma higher will be the buffer lower the sensitivity higher will be the risk because the lower will be the buffer and the buffer chal takkundamma you estimated ki ni actual ki if the gap is more than 10 percentage here you are facing losses but here ma your estimation and actual if the gap is more than 20 percent then only you are going to face the loss estimate chesin dan ki actual ki 
డిఫరెన్స్ అనేది మోర్ దాన్ ట్వంటీ పర్సెంట్ ఉంటేనే ఇక్కడ నువ్వు లాస్ ఫేస్ చేస్తావు బట్ ఇక్కడ మోర్ దాన్ టెన్ పర్సెంట్ ఉంటే నువ్వు లాస్ ఫేస్ చేయడానికి రెడీగా ఉండాలి అంటే ఇక్కడ బఫర్ తక్కువ ఉంది సో లోవర్ ద సెన్సిటివిటీ లోవర్ విల్ బి ద బఫర్ హయ్యర్ విల్ బి ద రిస్క్ సో లైక్ దట్ ఫర్ ఎవ్రీ కాంపోనెంట్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు ఫైండ్ అవుట్ ద సెన్సిటివిటీ and based on that sensitivity analysis you have to identify what is a risky factor risky component and you have to take care of that risky component clear sir uh let me show you some answer for this problem number 13 you have the sensitivity analysis problem and uh, they are saying that find out the sensitivity analysis like at 22.5% advance variance in each variable and what if the sensitivity percentage if your each and every component decreases by 2.5% from what you expected from what you expected clear sir adverse variance and not right so for selling price per chude and ma you actually estimated 100 rupees and adverse variance and ent minus 2.5% and you have to find out at 97.97 rupees 50 paise at 97 rupees 50 paise what is your npv your actual npv is 134.6 amma but when your selling price per unit reduces to 97 rupees 50 paise your npv falls down to 101.19 what is the percentage change in npv 24.82 percentage ante if your selling price per unit reduces by 2.5 percentage your npv reduces by 24.82 percentage so the maximum impact on selling price per unit amma so the most sensitive component here is your selling price per unit you can see here the above table shows that by varying one variable at a time by 2.5 percent while keeping the other con uh, others constant the impact in percentage terms on the npv of the project thus it can see that the change in selling price has the maximum effect on the npv by 24.82 percentage the most sensitive component i can say here selling price per unit and the least sensitive component now this is what is this sir fixed cost per unit you have estimated 50 rupees amma adverse variance annadiga ante 2.5% add cheyandi so that means your fixed cost comes out to be 51 rupees 25 paise your fixed cost increases by 1 rupee 25 paise and what is its impact on npv see here the normal npv is 134.6 and when your fixed cost increases by 1 rupee 50 paise your npv becomes 131.26 ante it is having the lowest impact on your npv just to 2.5% that's it so the least sensitive variable is a fixed cost you need not worry about the increase in fixed cost here but you have to worry about the decrease in selling price per unit nik ekko buffer ledamma 100 rupees estimate chesavu right even if it is reduces by 2.5 percentage even if your selling price per unit reduced to 20, uh, 97 rupees 50 paise your npv reduced by 25 percent amma ardham avutunda every one of you so this is how the sensitivity analysis works out clear sir so with this i am completing ending up the marathon of chapter number 8 risk analysis in capital budgeting decisions okay the next chapter i am going to discuss about the dividend decisions analysis that will be the last chapter of the fm marathon last chapter of the fm marathon i know that i am skipping ratios analysis but this is a marathon sir don't expect 100% almost out of 10 chapters i am covering 9 chapters and 90% of the syllabus i am covering no right if i even cover the ratios analysis what is the difference between a regular batch and marathon batch this is not even a crash batch so don't take uh, expect 100 percentage okay namma and why i am skipping ratios analysis there is a reason behind that because it's purely based on formulae almost 40 50 formulae are there in ratios analysis okay now 40 50 formula explanation itself needed some 5 to 6 hours discussion in my regular class no only for formula explanation i have taken around 8 hours amma i have started problem number 1 of ratios analysis only in the 9th hour of my regular batch so that's why i am not covering in marathon okay so next chapter dividend decisions analysis chapter number 9 the last chapter of the fm marathon okay see you in the next session till then have a good day and good night Stay home and stay safe.
A very good morning, students. So welcome to the Star FM Marathon classes. In the last class, we have completed a discussion regarding uh, chapter number eight, risk analysis and capital budgeting decisions. Okay, ma. Now time for the chapter number nine, dividend decisions. Dividend decisions analysis. In this chapter, we are going to learn about the various models, right? Like Walter's model, Gordon's model, Graham and Dodd, Lindner's approach, Modi Gilani and Miller approach, M and M approach. So these are the different models which we are going to learn from this chapter: dividend decisions. So look at the running notes. Dividend decisions. The weightage of this chapter is we can expect one question from this. Uh, chapter for five marks, one problem for five marks. And the important concept, Walter's model, Gordon's model, and Modigliani and Miller's model. We have plenty of models from this chapter, like I can show you here. Number one, James Walter's model. And number two, Gordon's model. Number three, Graham and Dodd approach. Number four, John Lindner's model. And number five, Modigliani and Miller's approach. But among these, all the five models, the most important models are, I've already listed out, Walter's model, Gordon's model, and m, &M approach. These three models are most important. See, when you're getting a question from dividend decisions analysis now, you will definitely get only from these three models, either from Walter's model, Gordon's model, or m, &M approach, that's it. There is a very less probability to get a question from Graham and Dodd model and Lindner's model. Clear, sir, everyone. Okay, now moving on. Introduction. So what is this dividend decision analysis and what are we going to learn from this chapter? Look at here. Sir, when a particular person doing business and after paying out all his statutory commitments and fixed financial commitments, he left with the profit after tax, right, sir? So generally, you might have seen the operating profit statement like profit before depreciation and tax. From this, we will deduct the depreciation. We'll get PBT, profit before tax, from which we'll deduct the tax. Then we'll get what, Amma? Profit after tax, PAT, profit after tax. Or else we can also call it as EAT, earnings after tax, like EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. We can also call it as EBIT first. It starts with earnings before interest and taxes, from which we'll deduct the interest. We'll get EBT, earnings before tax, from which we'll deduct what am tax element. Then we'll get what am EAT, earnings after tax. Profit after tax or earnings after tax, no problem, sir. Every one of you, right? Earnings after tax or profit after tax, these are nothing but the earnings available to shareholders earnings available to shareholders for distribution earnings available to shareholders for distribution clear now when the profit after tax arrived then the company will be having two options either to declare the profit as dividends or to retain the profits retained earnings two options so then the company has to make a decision between should I declare the profits as dividends or should I retain the profits for my future investment purposes, retained earnings. Now, whatever the decision the company is going to take here, will that a decision has any impact on market value of the firm? Now, the important question is whether the dividend decisions, whether the dividend decisions do have any impact on market value of the firm oh one second okay ma now the question comes into the picture is that whether the dividend decisions do have any impact on market value of the firm right so what is the decision we are going to make here should i declare the dividends or should i retain the profits right now this decision do have any impact on our market value of the firm some people said yes 
dividend decisions will have an impact on market value of the firm right and they are belonging to relevance theories and uh, who are said yes ma'am walter gordon graham and dodd and lindner these four people said that dividend decisions will have impact on market value of the firm and some people said no dividend decisions will not have any impact on market value of the firm they are belonging to whom irrelevance theories irrelevance they said like dividend decisions are irrelevant in making the in determining the market value of the firm and who suggested this m and m approach modi gilani and miller approach even if you remember sir in the capital structure theories he proved that financing decisions are irrelevant in determining the market value of the firm in dividend decisions he is going to prove that even the dividend decisions also are not having any impact on market value of the firm clear sir right so you can see here introduction part dividend is that part of profit after tax which is distributed to the shareholders of the company in other words the profit earned by a company after paying taxes can be used for distribution of the dividends or it can be retained as surplus for future growth when it is distributed it will be called as a dividend when it is retained it will be called as a retained earnings the various models and dividend deals with this is a the 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 theory of the chapter this is a you know theorem of the chapter whether the declaration of the dividend affects the market price or not a single sentence the entire chapter concept in a single sentence whether the declaration of the dividend affects the market price or not the dividend relevance theories argues that declaration of dividends affects the market price of a share here the dividends are said to be relevant in determining the market price and the dividend irrelevance theories argues that declaration of dividend does not affect the market price here the dividends are said to be irrelevant in determining the market price so there are two theories relevant theories and irrelevant theories relevant theories saying that the dividend decisions will affect the share price and market value of the firm they will have a direct impact on market price per share and market value of the firm and irrelevant theories arguing that the dividend decisions will not affect share price and as well as market value of the firm clear sir now let us see the one by one first one walters model look at the walters model relevance theories we are discussing in that the first one walters model walters model belonging to relevance theories and what is opinion of james walter dividends are relevant in determining the market price per share so whether you declaring the dividends or not this decision will have a direct bearing on your market price per share clear sir so profit after tax you have two options option 1 declaring the dividends and option 2 retaining the profits right sir see when you retain the profits see why the company is going to retain the profits amma the simple answer is for reinvestment when a company is retaining the profits right the objective behind that decision is to make reinvestment it will not uh, put the funds idle it will retain the profit only for the purpose of reinvestment into the future projects by reinvesting that retained earnings into the future products the company is going to get what ma the company is going to get required rate of return rate of return so whenever you are investing into a particular project what are you going to expect from the project some returns you are going to expect no clear r and the option one declaring the dividends when company declare the dividends right sir the shareholders will get the money in the form of dividends as as a shareholder assume that i got a dividend of 1 lakh now what i am going to do with this 1 lakh i will reinvest i will reinvest yes or no now by reinvesting this 1 lakh dividends in the open market i will get rate of return from shareholders point of view it is rate of return from company's point of view it is cost of equity yes or no investors expected rate of return is nothing but cost of equity from company point of view yes or no so that's why you need to think see all these decisions all these theories we need to understand from company point of view so from shareholder point of view it is rate of return from company point of view it is cost of equity every one of you following us sir right now so cost of equity from company point of view now the situation if r is greater than ke that means the company's required rate of return let us assume that the profit after tax 20 lakhs amma 
the company opted for option 2 and means the entire 20 lakhs was retained retained and the company reinvested this 20 lakhs into some project x project x where it is earning rate of return of some 18 percentage right assume that instead of retaining the profit the company declared the entire 20 lakhs as dividends entire 20 lakhs as dividends assume that now the shareholders got the money in the form of dividends and shareholders made the reinvestment and shareholders earning a rate of return of just 15 percentage just 15 percentage and that means here the company's reinvestment is better than shareholders reinvestment now the company will say okay shareholders you have a very less rate of return now compared to my rate of return i have some profitable projects in my hand so i am going to retain the profits so when company's rate of return r is greater than shareholders rate of return it's better to maintain optimum payout ratio as zero it's better for the company to retain entire profits don't declare any amount as dividends company manchi profitable opportunities rather than shareholders company have better investment opportunities compared to the shareholders investment opportunities so the company it's better for the company to retain the entire profits are you following or not everyone right now if the situation is reverse r is less than ke see company earning only some 12 percent rate of return from its investments and shareholder having 15 percent rate of return now the company has to accept the truth and the company has to declare the entire amounts as dividends right sir okay shareholder you have the better investment opportunities than me so i am here giving you the entire profits as dividends i'm going to declare the entire profits as dividends so when r is less than ke when company is not having profitable opportunities in hand in future it's better to declare the entire amounts as dividends when r is less than ke optimum payout ratio is 100 percent when r equal to ke in difference point whether the company retaining the profits or declaring the dividends, it doesn't have any bearing on market value of the company. Because when company is getting same 15% rate of return, shareholder earning same 15% rate of return, indifference amount. Declaring the profits as dividends or retaining the profits, it doesn't have any impact on market value of the firm. Clear. Next formula. The formula suggested by the Walter here is D plus R divided by KE into e minus d whole divided by ke now first let us understand the terminology here d stands for dividends per share r stands for rate of return on investment the company's rate of return on investments ke you know very well cost of equity and e stands for earnings per share or you can take total earnings no problem and d stands for dividends per share or the total dividends declared okay now now let us try to understand this formula P0 is equal to, we know the formula D plus R divided by KE into E minus D whole divided by KE. Now I'm going to uh, divide this formula into two parts, into two parts. First part, D divided by KE. Second part, R divided by KE into E minus D whole divided by KE. Any change in the formula, ma? No change. When you take in the KE common, then again, you will get the same problem. D plus R divided by K into E minus G whole divided by K. Same formula you will get. Now, why I have divided this formula like this? But this formula is what? P0, market price per share. Market price per share. Right. And when you are multiplying with the number of shares, you will get market value of the firm. But market price per share. I could have not done the theoretical market price, TMP theoretical market price whatever the market price we are finding out it's nothing but theoretical market price now what do you mean by the theoretical market price theoretical market price is nothing but sum of the present values of all the future earnings future cash and close which are discounted at the investors expected rate of return that's the formula of tmp yes or no now by investing the investing into the equity shares of a company by making investments into the equity shares of a company, what are the earnings that a shareholder is going to get? Answer, number one, dividends, and number two, appreciation in the market price. Clear. So the shareholder is going to get what? 
from year one to year infinity is going to get the dividends and there is appreciation in the market price these are the expectations of the shareholder from his investment clear now the first part part of the formula representing the sum of present values of year one to year infinity dividends year one to year infinity dividends do you remember the present value of perpetuity formula what is the formula sir annual cash inflows divided by rate of interest the same formula annual cash inflows every year i'm going to get dividends divided by rate of interest from the company point of view cost of equity so this will give me the present value of year one to year infinity dividends. So the first part the present value I've taken. Now the second part appreciation in the market price. So now I would like to know the sum of present value of capital appreciation. Now how I am going to get this? Look at it. Look at this example, sir. My total earnings ten lakhs, right? And out of the ten lakhs, I have declared four lakhs as dividends. Now what are my return earnings? Amma six lakhs. Clear. So E minus D, 6 lakhs, uh, 10 lakhs is my earnings, out of which 4 lakhs have declared as dividends. 6 lakhs is my what? Returned earnings. Ante? E minus D represent what? Amma? Returned earnings. E minus D representing returned earnings. Okay. Now, this returned earnings, what I'm going to do? I'm going to reinvest. At what rate of interest? At R rate of interest. Are you following, sir? E minus D representing my returned earnings. This return earnings, I'm going to reinvest at our rate of return. Okay, now assume that the project is having a life of 10 years. Clear. Now, I would like to know the present value of all these future earnings. So that is why divided by KE. Divided by KE. Now, this representing what? The project's present value of future cash inflows. Clear. So when a company returns the earnings, and that earnings are reinvested. Now, what is going to happen to the market value of that company? Market price of the particular company. When a company reinvested its all returned earnings successfully in a most highly profitable investment opportunity, the market price per share will get increased. Yes or no? So this is representing the present value of my capital appreciation. And like this, every year I will get dividends. Every year I will invest into the different projects. Now, when I would like to know the sum of the present value of all that project's cash inflows, I have to divide it by, whole divided by. I have to, again, divide it with cost of equity again. My numerator giving me only one project's present value of cash inflows. Now, when I invested into the 10 different projects, now I would like to know the 10 different projects present value of future cash inflows. That is why I'm dividing again with cost of equity. So that's the meaning of the second part of the formula. My first part of the formula meaning and the first part of the formula meaning is this. Sum of present values of year one to year infinity dividends for which I've used the present value of perpetuity formula. From year one to year infinity, I'm going to get the dividends, right? And in order to know the present value of all such future dividends, I would like to discount them at investors rate of expected rate of return. So divided by cost of equity. Investors expected rate of return, nothing but from company point of view, cost of equity. That's the first part of the formula. Now the second part of the formula is what, sir? Sum of the present value of capital appreciation because when I'm finding out the theoretical market price, theoretical market price is nothing but what am I? The sum of the present value of future cash inflows discounted at the expected rate of return. So I'm getting two cash inflows here, one dividends and number two appreciation in the capital uh, market price. Clear everyone. So that's the meaning of the formula. MP0 is equal to P0 is equal to D divided by KE or else you can go for the single formula D plus R divided by KE into E minus D whole divided by KE. Clear sir. Now by applying that formula, you need to find out the market price per share and as well as market value of the firm. That's Walter's model. Now moving on to the Gordon's model. Reliance theory is low. The next model is Gordon's model. Model number two, Gordon's model. Okay, ma.
Now, Gordon's model also belonging to relevance theories. Relevance theories and opinion dividends are relevant in determining the market value of the company. So whatever the dividend decisions you are going to get, it will have a direct bearing on market price per share of the company and so as on market value of the company. Clear. Now, how he is going to explain his logic theory? Now, again, start with the profit after tax. So when a company having the profit after tax, after paying all its fixed financial commitments and as well as all its statutory commitments, then it will be left with the profit after tax. Then it will be having two options. Either that profit after tax can be declared as dividends or can be retained as retained earnings. Now, first look at the second option. Second option, Chodhanamma. When the company is retained the earnings, what is the advantage to the company? The company's growth will be increased because these retained earnings will be reinvested into the projects. And from that reinvestment, the company will get more returns. And when company is earning more returns, the market price per share of the company increases. The growth will be increases. Growth will be increases. Yes or no? Now, but what is the disadvantage? When company retained the profits, then the risk perception levels of equity shareholders increases. Risk perception levels of equity shareholders increases. Risk perception levels of equity shareholders increases. Means what? Sir, when company retain the profits, the shareholder thinks like, okay, company retaining the profits means the company having profitable investment opportunities in hand. So that means, yes, the company is going to get more returns. And hey, his expectations towards the dividends increases. His expectations towards the returns increases. Are you following or not? All right. So when his expectations towards the returns increases, means from company point of view, cost of equity increases. Cost of equity increases. Yes or no? That's the disadvantage. When it comes to the first option, declaring the dividends, what are the advantage and disadvantage? Simple, Amma. You just simply reverse the advantage and disadvantage of returned earnings. See, the advantage of returned earnings becomes a disadvantage here. And when a company declaring the entire profits as dividends, that means here the returned earnings are zero. The returned earnings are zero. The company is not having any surplus profits with it for future reinvestments. See, when it is not having any surplus funds, how can the company will make investments into the future projects? You may ask me, sir, uh, why not the company go for a bank loan? Why not the company issue fresh issue of equity shares? Why not the company go for issuance of the debentures? See, first of all, whenever you want to make the future investment, now nah, everyone first look for what is a proprietary investment? What is the share of the proprietor in that new investment? At least the proprietor should make investment of 25% to 30% into that project. Then everyone will come forward and will make investment into that particular project. Even if you go to the banker, the banker first will ask you a question. Babu, what is your personal investment into this project? If you said, sir, I don't have any surplus funds with me. Right. So give me the entire amount as loan. I will go and do the investment. The banker will not give you loan. You must have some personal investment then only you will be having some personal care and interest in that project. Yes or no? Right, sir. So that is why. So when you're not having any surplus funds, then you don't make any investments into future. The growth of the company will get decreases. Clear. Next. The disadvantage of the return earnings becomes advantage here. When the company declaring the dividends, then the risk perception levels of the equity shareholders decreases. Because they are getting profits now. They are getting profits now. Yes or no? See, future returns are uncertain. Present dividends are certain. Uncertainty gives rise to risk. But when company declaring the entire profits as dividends now, the, sh the shareholder is going to see some money in his pocket. So his risk perception levels decreases. Are you following now? 
now sir what is the optimum dividend payout ratio here same amma just like walters model when r is greater than ke when company having the better investment opportunities than shareholders the optimum payout ratio should be zero that means the company has to retain entire profits the company has to maintain what amma 100% retention ratio the company has to maintain 100% retention ratio every one of you okay ma now when r is less than ke when company is not having better investment opportunities than the shareholders let the shareholders do their own business let us declare the entire amount of the dividends uh, profits as dividends let the shareholder make his own reinvestments so maintain 100% dividend payout ratio okay now and when r is equal to ke in the friends point okay sir now look at the formula given by the garden formula is current market price p0 is equal to e into 1 minus b whole divided by ke minus br now let us try to understand the terminology used where e is equal to eps earnings per share or you can take total earnings ma when you are finding out the market price per share e stands for eps when you are finding out the market value of the firm as a whole e stands for total earnings depends upon you have to take amma now b stands for retention ratio b stands for retention ratio ke cost of equity you know very well r is the rate of return on reinvestments by the company and we know that b into r is equal to growth rate this formula we have learned in cost of equity gurtunda amma b into r g is equal to b into r we have learned the formula in cost of capital clear so ke minus br instead of that you can also write ke minus g ila kuda write chamma okay now look at the uh, and let us try to understand the formula meaning p not is equal to e into 1 minus b divided by ke minus br and b and range of kunnam sir retention ratio b stands for what retention ratio yes or no now let us assume that the retention ratio is some 70% ipo 1 minus b ante ent amma 1 minus 0.7 that is equal to 0.3 you are getting see when 70% is the retention ratio what is the other 30% payout ratio as simple as that nikachina 100 rupees lo out of 100 rupees you got profit after tax you are retaining 70 rupees as a retained earnings now what are you going to do with the remaining 30 rupees remaining 30 rupees you are declaring declaring as what dividends so 70 rupees retained earnings 30 rupees dividends 70% retention ratio that means the remaining 30% what amma dividends payout ratio ante this 1 minus b representing what sir 1 minus b representing dividends payout ratio dividends payout ratio every one of you following now what is the dividends payout ratio am i here 30% when your total earnings is equal to 100 rupees total earnings is equal to 100 rupees now e into 30% 1 minus b and dividend payout ratio am 1 minus b and dividends payout ratio right your total earnings 100 rupees into dividend payout ratio 30% and you will get what amount 30 rupees what is this 30 rupees nothing but dividends per share ante the numerator representing what e into dividends payout ratio e into dividend payout ratio nothing but dps dividends per share and the numerator this entire numerator representing what amount dividends per share divided by ke cost of equity minus g gurtunda dps 1 divided by ke minus g one formula we have learned p0 is equal to this formula we have learned in constant growth in dividends cost of equity cost of capital chapter lo we have learned the cost of equity in the cost of equity we have seen some models like you know dividends price approach earnings price approach capm approach capital gain yield approach earnings yield approach there in dividends price approach we have learned non constant growth in dividends constant growth in dividends no growth in dividends constant growth in dividends what is the formula you have learned dps1 divided by mp0 plus g and when you want to know about the mp0 dps1 divided by ke minus g the same formulas we are using the same formula we are using constant growth in dividends the original formula cost of equity is equal to dps1 divided by mp0 plus g and when you want to know about the mp0 mp0 will come here now plus g it comes minus g so mp0 is equal to dps1 divided by ke minus g so whatever the formula suggested by the gordon here 
is nothing but constant growth in dividends formula is nothing but constant growth in dividends formula p not is equal to dps1 divided by ke minus g clear sir every one of you so that's about gordon's model now moving on to next model graham and dot approach model number 3 graham and dot approach walters model we have done gordon's model also we have done graham and dot approach now what is this approach about even graham and dot also belonging to same uh, theory ma relevance theories relevance theories even graham and all uh, dot also opines the dividends are relevant in determining the market value of the company but he explained his logics his theorem in a different way so as per the graham and dot approach he said the shareholders prefers the provident, uh, present dividends over the future capital gains right ma shareholder always prefers the present dividends rather than future capital gains future capital gains means when company retain the profits for what purpose is the company is retaining the profits for reinvestments for reinvestment from the reinvestment what the company is going to get the company is going to get the more returns the returns of the company is going to be increased and it will have a positive impact on market price per share suppose that you buy this company shares 100 rupees per share after 2 years the company share price increases to 150 per share now you have sold the shares at 100 rupees you purchased at 150 you have sold and how much capital gains you are getting 50 rupees capital gain you are getting but when you are getting immediately no after 2 years you are getting after 2 years you are getting yes or no so this is a future capital gains 50 rupees is your future capital gain but the shareholder prefers the present dividends present day the company in chapindante if you want i will declare the entire profits as dividends and you will get dividends immediately suppose that you are getting a 20 rupees per share as a dividend so the shareholder prefers the present 20 rupees dividends rather than future 50 rupees capital gains adey entaya you can wait for 2 years you will get 50 rupees returns if you want as of now you will get only 20 rupees returns but the shareholder prefers the present dividends only because future by definition is uncertain he feels the future by definition uncertain okay you are saying like wait for 2 years after 2 years you will get a capital gain of 50 rupees but what is the guarantee whatever the projects it has reinvested the project may go failure the company may face losses the company's market price per share may fall down even i am not able to get my actual investment of 100 rupees who knows anything can happen in the future see before covid 19 after covid 19 the present day scenario we are discussing like before covid 19 after covid 19 who expected ma in the year 2019 who expected the covid no one what about those people who made investments in 2009 for a long term perspective they are all now facing losses yes or no so that's why future by definition is uncertain so that way the present dividends are more certain than future capital gains the shareholders will give the more weightage to the present dividends rather than future capital gains ardham avutundi sir every one of you so that's why gordon suggested only one thing the optimum payout ratio is always 100 percentage you forget about r greater than ke r less than ke you just ignore it Gordon suggested only one thing: whatever the profits you got, declare them as dividends immediately. Don't retain not even a single rupee you retain as profit. Optimum payout ratio, as per the Graham and Dodd, is hundred percent payout ratio. So higher the dividend payout ratio, higher will be the market price per share. Lower the dividends payout ratio, lower will be the market price per share. Okay now he also suggested a formula sir current market price p0 is equal to m into d plus e divided by 3 m stands for a multiplier ma d is equal to dividends per share e is equal to earnings per share right 
but actually graham and dad approach uh, have faced many controversies right because you know uh, graham and dad explain his theory but there is no logic like he he while he is finding out the market price he is multiplying this factor with a multiplier and how did he arrived at this multiplier there is no logic no theorem are you following sir a multi multiplier ma multiplier tho mana multiply chestunnamo d plus e divided by 3 but there is no logic behind how to arrive at this multiplier are you following sir every one of you and when it comes to the shareholders point of view not all the shareholders are risk averse some people are risk takers some shareholders are risk takers okay they will prefer the future capital gains rather than present dividends it's your opinion sir it's graham dot's opinion that shareholders prefers present dividends but being i am a shareholder i might think about my future capital gains rather than present dividends so there is no logic are you following sir so look at here what the graham and dot said his propositions investors assign more weights to the present dividends than retained earnings clear investors use a high discount rate for distant dividends that is capital gains than mere dividends because nearby dividends are more certain than distant dividends clear and uh, criticisms the weightage four times and one time are derived subjectively without any empirical analysis a weights ela assign chesadu a multiplier ela calculation chesadu there is no logic are you following sir that's about the graham and dot model sir and lindner's model i'm skipping because that's a final level concept amma you didn't got a question from lindner's model you need not worry i have already mentioned the most important models from this chapter walters model gordon's model and modigliani and miller approach that's it you don't even get a question from that uh, graham and dot approach are you following now because you can see the answer graham and dot approach very small answer this answer won't give you for 5 marks don't expect for 5 marks for this kind of problems okay now now coming to the last model modigliani and miller approach and he is belonging to what irrelevant theories modigliani and miller is always belonging to irrelevant theories amma if you remember in cost of capital also sorry capital structure also we have learned capital structure theories there also we have seen relevant theories and irrelevant theories relevant theories suggested by net income approach traditional approach irrelevant theories suggested by noi net operating income approach and mndm approach do you remember capital structure theories mndm approach belonging to irrelevant theories and here also in dividend decisions cap uh, mndm uh, also again suggested irrelevant theories market value of the firm remains constant irrespective of your dividend decisions so whether you are declaring the dividends or not whether you retaining the profits or not these decisions will not have any impact on your market value of the firm he proved in capital structure theories financing decisions are irrelevant he proved that market value of the firm remains to be constant irrespective of changes in capital structure see increasing the equity share capital by decreasing debt capital or decreasing equity share capital by increasing debt capital financing decisions these are irrelevant in market value of the determining the market value of the firm in determining the market value of the firm are you following sir because financing decisions are your internal matters ma equity in dagginchi debt penchana vallano equity in penchesi debt tagginchana vallano market value of the firm anedi maradu market value of the firm doesn't change with your debt equity proportions in order to increase your market value of the firm you have to accept the future profitable opportunities profitable projects only the investment decisions affects your market value of the firm neither the dividend decisions neither the dividend decisions ma by declaring the dividends you cannot increase your market value of the firm by not declaring the dividends you cannot decrease your market value of the firm ma dividend declare chese market value peruguddano declare cheyakapothe market value tagguddano all this foolishness foolishness whether you declare the dividends or not this decision doesn't affect your market value of the firm 
Are you following, sir? Logically, this is correct. Your market value will be changes only with your investment decisions. As long as you are making investments into good return projects, your market value of the firm is going to positively affected, positively changes, increased. As long as you're not making investment into profitable projects, your market value decreased. Only the investment decisions will have a direct bearing on your market value of the firm. Neither the financing decisions nor the dividend decisions. Clear. And that's what going to be proved by the Modigliani and Miller approach in this model. Now look at here, ma. The current market price per share. Just a second, sir. So he has given the formula like this current market price P0 is equal to D1 plus P1 divided by 1 plus KE. Right? D1, what is D1 dividends price per share at the end of the first year? P1 market price per share at the end of the first year divided by 1 plus KE. Now let us try to understand this formula. Step number one, multiply the formula with N both the sides. Right? So that means multiply the formula with both the sides. Like right? So that means uh, NP0 is equal to ND1 plus NP1 divided by 1 plus KE divided by 1 plus KE. Okay, sir. Now, now NP0 is equal to ND1 plus NP1 as it is I'm written. Now I have added this plus MP1 minus MP1. I've added plus MP1 minus MP1. What is the ultimate impact? Ma? Plus minus cancel hypothesis. It will be zero. The impact will be zero. The ultimate formula remains to be same. ND1 plus NP1 divided by 1 plus KE. Okay, now. Now, NP0 is equal to P1. P1 common the endomicada. Take the P1 as common. Now, what will be the formula? P1 into N plus M. N plus M. Like, you'll get like this. P1 common, you say N plus N. I've taken the P1 as common. N plus M. N plus M. Plus ND1. Plus ND1. What is missing here, ma? What is missing here? I'm missing here is MP1. Now I would like to write the formula of MP1 here. Now MP1, we have a separate formula. MP1 is equal to I minus E minus ND1. I minus E minus ND1. Now what do you mean by it? Now I is equal to, first of all, M is equal to number of new equity shares to be issued. Number of new equity shares to be issued. P1 is equal to market price per share at the end of the year one. Now, I is equal to investment required, total investment required. E is equal to total earnings available. N is equal to number of equity shares. And D1 is equal to dividends payable at the end of the year one. Now, let us try to understand with the help of example. Total earnings available, 10 lakhs. Amma. Total earnings available, 10 lakhs. Minus dividends paid, 4 lakhs. So, now earnings available for investment, in the 6 lakhs. Earnings available for investment, 6 lakhs. Okay, now. Right? Now. Investment required for project X, 15 lakhs. The investment required 15 lakhs. So investment required 15 lakhs, right? 15 lakhs. Out of which, what is the earnings available with you? The earnings available with you is 6 lakhs amount, right? So here investment required, investment required 15 lakhs minus total earnings available 10 lakhs. Out of which you have declared a dividend of 4 lakhs, uh, 4 lakhs. Okay, now. See, ND1 representing watcher, ND1 representing dividends paid. Dividends paid. So from the total earnings, 10 lakhs available, 4 lakhs you have paid dividends. And A, E minus ND1 ultimately representing watcher. This is ultimately representing your retained earnings. Total funds available, 10 lakhs minus 4 lakhs your dividends paid. So 6 lakhs is your retained earnings. So investment required 15 lakhs. Out of which 6 lakhs you are going to fund it through returned earnings. 15 lakhs make funds call. Amma. 15 lakhs low, 6 lakhs you are funding through returned earnings. And they, the funds to be raised by issuing the new equity shares in the month, 9 lakhs. So this entire formula is representing what? Funds to be raised by issuing new equity shares. So we are issuing M number of equity shares at P1 price to get these funds. We are issuing M number of equity shares. M stands for new equity shares. New equity shares. Are you following, sir? Everyone. So I'm issuing M number of equity shares for at P1 price. At P1 price, I'm going to issue for funds to be procured. 
for the reinvestment. So the total investment required, I'm repeating once again, 15 lakhs, I need investments. Okay. And I have the funds available with me, 10 lakhs. Out of which 4 lakhs I have declared as dividends. And they read and earnings available in the month, 6 lakhs. So 15 lakhs funds are required. Out of which I already have 6 lakhs. And they means what am I? 9 lakhs is the total funds raised. And how I'm going to raise? I'm going to issue M number of equity shares at P1 price. So that's the formula meaning. MP1 is nothing but the number of new equity shares we are issuing at P1 price for the funds to be raised for the investment. Now this formula I am going to replace here in the place of MP1. I am going to replace this formula. You can replace just an M plus MP1 formula M H kunamanam I minus E minus N D1. That is the formula we have learned. Now MP1 place load I am representing this formula. Plus I will become minus I here. Plus I becomes minus I here, right? Because uh, in this place of MP1, I am representing minus MP1, minus symbol. So minus into plus I minus I minus into minus E minus into minus E plus E, right? You a bracket symbol in the other directly minus symbol minus MD1 minus MD1. Clear everyone. Because if we formula and mere multiply just say I minus E minus into minus M out in the map plus ND one out on the yes or no everyone plus ND one out on the clear you put it can you know the minus MP one gather minus MP one gather and to put minus into plus I minus I minus into minus E plus E minus into plus ND one minus ND one whole divided by one plus KE okay now now you put check check and the formula like P1 into N plus M plus N D1 minus I plus E, uh, sorry, minus N D1 minus N D1 whole divided by 1 plus KE. This is the formula. Put plus N D1 minus N D1 cancel. Now, what is ultimate formula? N P0 is equal to 5 minutes. P1 into N plus M minus I plus E whole divided by 1 plus KE. Okay, now every one of you. Clear? Right, sir. So by applying this formula, you need to find out the market price per share of the company, sir. Right? And we have one more formula. MP1, you put a formula in each kind sir. I minus E minus ND1. Now, when I would like to know the M, the total number of new equity shares to be raised into P1 will come this side now divided by P1. So M, the total number of new equity shares to be issued is equal to I minus E minus ND1 whole divided by P1. Clear? Everyone. So that's it, sir. With that, Modigliani and Miller approach also completed. Just a second, sir. With that, Modigliani and Miller approach also completed, sir. You can just go through the problems. And uh, if you come across any doubts by solving the problems at the time of solving the problems, you can directly text me in my WhatsApp number or Telegram, or you can make a mail to me, right? CSAmashwar, the rate of gmail.com is my Gmail ID. You have all the details at the first page of the textbook, ma, right? Uh, let me see whether it is available or not. Index page, shall I, did I given or not? I don't think so. Okay. You can take it down. My mobile number, you know very well. Double nine four eight nine seven two seven five two is my mobile number. Right. You can either WhatsApp or Telegram and my mail ID. csamashiva at the rate of gmail.com this is my mail id sir okay now so either you can mail your doubts absolutely no problem clear every one of you so 
with this we have completed the total nine chapters from the financial management only one chapter i left with that is the ratios analysis and even i have explained the reason behind uh, lefting that chapter in the last class itself clear sir so i wish you a very all the best for your may 2022 examinations and as well as those who are going to write the november 2022 exams for you also very all the best ma would like to see you and would love to see you again in cf final level okay ma right so all the best sir so children have a good day and uh, stay home and stay safe thank you sir